Howdy. During the success of the first run of Beavis and Butthead, show creator Mike Judge began working on another sitcom in a similar yet opposite vein that would go on to become King of the Hill. It featured the Hill family and their neighbors, living in the fictional neighborhood of Arlen, Texas, which was an amalgamation of various suburbs from the state, to the point where I grew up believing my town was the city's real inspiration, before talking with people from other places and finding out that almost every city in Texas makes the same claim. Judge's initial pitch was viewed with a bit of reservation by executives, who then paired him up with Greg Daniels to flesh out the initial scripts a bit more. This resulted in more character development, which, when paired with the more populist political satire of Judge's writing, created a series with characters who were entertaining enough to get us to sympathize with each of their perspectives, as various different views were given on whatever particular issue was being presented. It wrote a thin line flawlessly, of presenting two opposing arguments, and rather than demanding that audiences pick a side, instead asked us to consider the human behind the point first and foremost. The fact that the show presented such an unabashedly normal view of daily life and people gave it mixed reception early on. While many reviewers and columnists recognized the realism and relatability, King of the Hill was also critiqued for its lack of bombastic humor and inability to get a guffaw, audiences typically reacting with a more sensible chuckle. But to others, this accurate observation of life was what made the series worth taking a look at. Even today, two and a half decades after the show first aired, the humor and set pieces stand out as having aged incredibly well, warranting even a second or a third look. This video will be split into individual episode retrospectives, which themselves are split into three sections, recap, review, and wrap up. Recap is a short retelling of the events of the episode, review, a general detailing of my opinions on the episode, as well as some context for those opinions. Wrap up is for anything I couldn't find another place for. Now take off your hat and boots and crack open a cold one as we get right on into this thing. Season 1 Starting us off is an introduction by the band The Refreshments, named Yahoos and Triangles, something they typically performed at sound checks, which fits not only the tone and aesthetic of the show itself, but also serves to give the audience some time for their own sound check. Not just their television set, but expectations as well. Whereas another show might have a big showing of its entire cast or highlight its best moments, King of the Hill is content with showing a time lapse of four middle aged men standing around and drinking beers, while everyone else around them goes along with the uninteresting parts of their day. It concludes with the Hill family recreating a modern version of Grant Wood's American Gothic, a painting that once expressed American authenticity of the time, now replaced by the average American middle class Hills as a more modern mirror of ourselves. King of the Hill came out at a time where the adult animation airwaves were in the wake of The Simpsons' massive success, although that show was already being viewed by critics as having lost some of the original spark. Other competing programs included South Park and, of course, Beavis and Butthead, though the more crude and cold-hearted callousness of the characters there were often viewed with a sense of exhaustion. While each show had its own view on society and the people inside of it, only King of the Hill really took a look at America without adding on some over-the-top fluff and excitement to make the extremes stand out more. It was a show that practically defined itself by its total lack of extremes in anything. As such, it was more commonly compared to live-action sitcoms such as Married with Children or Seinfeld. And yet, despite the potentials of the medium of animation, it still failed to create characters in situations as bizarre as what Jerry or Kramer could get up to. It almost called into question why the show was animated at all. The style film Roman gave to it was crude and scratchy, with many shots being flat three-quarters perspectives of characters from the waist up. Maybe it was the fact that this stylistic choice was established and then the potential never used that actually added to the show's appeal, however. That things could have been so much more, well, animated in the medium, and yet, just as in our day-to-day -day lives, they are not. Pilot Bobby gets hit by a baseball during a Little League game and winds up with a black eye. Later, at the Megalomart, a couple overhears Hank yelling at an employee, and a rumor begins to spread about him beating his son. So a case manager from Child Protective Services comes over to the house and begins an investigation into Hank's anger management issues and whether or not Bobby should be taken into protective custody. The social worker is convinced of a domestic disturbance, but when CPS is unable to find any definitive proof, the case gets called off. 
However, only Bobby is informed of this, and he continues to use the threat of removing custody to harass his father, knowing Hank can't react due to fear of losing his son. But when Peggy Hill learns about the case being resolved, she hears from Bobby that he only lied as he was concerned Hank didn't love him because of his behavior. Ultimately, Hank has an awkward conversation with his son, where he admits that he's never been disappointed in the boy, and the episode ends happily. Hank is the central character of King of the Hill, and the pilot episode is spent establishing his character not so much in terms of who he is, but in how he reacts to the rest of the world. He tries to instill his own code of ethics and discipline into his son, but also tries to hold him at arm's length emotionally. He's frustrated with many of the systems in place in the modern world, while also relying on those systems to keep things functioning. But most importantly to the show's core themes is the fact that Hank is still willing to tolerate even the most absurd of conditions if it means doing what he thinks is right. When he learns that Bobby could be taken away, he starts repressing a part of himself by bottling up anger and becoming less effective at communicating, even if he wasn't always great about it before. But the very fact that Hank was willing to make a fool out of himself in front of neighbors and let Bobby push him around was a more genuine expression of the love he has for his son than the speech at the end of the episode. No matter how much the world angers Hank, he still puts up with anything he has to to try to keep what he's already got, and then the show never mocks him for this. Square Peg Hank and Peggy learn that Bobby is going to be taking sex ed in school, but both of them are staunchly against him learning those sorts of things from a teacher, so they agree not to sign his permission form. But when the two try explaining it to him on their own terms, they find themselves unable to get the words out and begrudgingly agree to let him learn in class. This is complicated when Peggy is chosen to be the substitute sex ed teacher following a threatening phone call from Dale, and she has to deal with the fact that she's incapable of approaching sexuality in any form. But when she's speaking with the other repressed mothers from her circle, Peggy begins to realize how important this sort of conversation is, and forces herself to learn the course material. But Hank is disgusted slash embarrassed with the fact that his wife is considering this, and once again refuses to allow Bobby to involve himself with the lesson. That is, until he realizes that his wife has put extra effort into studying, and in the end, he sends Bobby to sex ed class, only for it to be revealed that none of the other students had their permission slips signed. Hank and Peggy were raised properly and want nothing more than for Bobby to be raised the same way as them. But this type of proper upbringing doesn't exactly coincide with what's right for a child, and in some subconscious way they both know this. Peggy believes that her childhood experiences were typical, and she's right about this, but what her childhood education was not was, well, educational. As a result, she's repressed and ashamed of a completely normal aspect of the human psyche, which makes her fit in with everybody else her age. Hank is the same way, his introduction to human sexuality coming in an inappropriate manner that's caused him to grow up ashamed of himself. So while Hank and Peggy both want what's right for Bobby, they've confused this for what they had, and this is one of the core aspects of King of the Hill. The modern world is changing, for better or for worse, and they have to rapidly adapt, and in this case, the current state of Peggy and Hank's sex life is not only lacking, but hilariously so. The two are so awkward around their own minds that they struggle to function. This is a type of episode where the older generation learns that perhaps things weren't always better in the past, that the new ways of thinking brought on by the advent of the 21st century are actually on course to improve society. And as they learn to accept that fact, they also learn to accept themselves. The Order of the Straight Arrow Hank and his friends take their children out to the woods for initiation into their scout troop, Order of the Straight Arrow. The intention is to expose them to the same kind of initiation that they went through as children as a bit of fun, and they try to borrow some American Indian traditions to sell the false ideas. So the boys are taught about Wima Tanye, which is just a bunch of combined stories about nature punctuated by Hank telling them about propane. But when they're sent on a snipe hunt, that is, to hunt for a fake animal, Bobby ends up finding and then beating a whooping crane. Suddenly afraid that his son has killed an endangered species, Hank tries to hide the body, but Bobby's unwavering faith in his father prevents him from believing him when he says that the test was a fake and that they need to dispose of the corpse. Bobby thinks this is all another test. In the end, they're chased out of the park by a group of environmentalists who wind up cornering them as they're trying to dispose of the crane's body, only for the crane to wake up as it was merely unconscious. In the B-plot, Peggy sneaks out of the city and drives to Lubbock to buy oversized shoes. 
Through this episode, Hank and Dale denigrate the environmentalist efforts of a group of conservationists, calling them hippies and acting in disgust at their lifestyle. But then they also turn around and make a faux celebration of nature and the manliness of the great outdoors. That camping is the type of outdoorsy myths that can toughen them up and turn them from boys to men like it did to them. All of this coming from a version of camping that never sees them too far from a parking lot, nor from their trucks. It creates a source of irony, in the sense that a love of the outdoors is considered a positive trait, while a love of nature is considered negative. But then this episode also touches upon the fact that this sort of ideal isn't something that Hank and Co. came up with on their own. It was merely part of a tradition that's been passed on from a group to group, between generations. They were sent into the woods as a team-building exercise with no real regard for whether it worked or why. Then they try to recreate this sort of team-building as adults, only to wind up instilling onto the boys the wrong lesson. Hank and his friends snuck away from the night, but Bobby actually listened, and in observing these traditions wound up even further away from his father than he would have gotten from disobedience. Hank's Got the Willies Bobby interrupts Hank's dream about Willie Nelson when the man finds his son playing with his guitar, Betsy. Later, he finds Bobby using his mower and his golf clubs, and he starts to fear that that boy ain't right, having no direction in life and no hero to look up to. So Hank takes the boy golfing, and letting him try to tee off, Bobby accidentally hits Willie Nelson with a golf club. Hank tries to apologize, but the delirious Willie drives off in their cart. While lamenting that his chance to meet his hero went wrong, Hank tells Peggy that he regrets bringing the boy golfing, and Bobby overhears this. So he takes Hank's guitar to Willie Nelson's house to try and prove himself to his father, getting along with the guy well enough that he calls over the rest of Rainy Street for a barbecue. While there, Hank spills his problems with Bobby to Willie, and Willie shows him that, for all his mistakes, Bobby really does look up to his father. Meanwhile, Peggy is jealous over the fact that Hank seems to love his guitar more than her, and when she's about to pummel him for this, she overhears him playing a cover of Peggy Sue, which changes her mind. Hank spends the majority of this episode start trying to get Bobby to behave more like himself, teaching him about his hobbies and his dreams. But despite Bobby clearly trying to emulate his father, Hank still doesn't make the connection that his lessons are getting through to the boy, purely because he's not doing so with the same energy Hank himself has put into his hobbies. Bobby is much more bombastic than his father, even if he more or less has the same general interests. Hank may be content to play his guitar in a calm manner, replacing the lyrics to Peggy Sue so that he's singing about a girl named Peggy instead of, well, Peggy, while Bobby is more content with attempting to emulate a comedian's routine. Ultimately, it comes down to Hank not attempting to reach out to Bobby on the boy's own level. If he had shown him proper technique in golf or guitar or even with the mower, then maybe he would be less upset with his son and would begin to see more of himself reflected in him. But because he's focusing on trying to make Bobby more like himself in the present than himself at his son's age, he narrowly misses this connection on his own. Hank lacks the patience to watch Bobby grow up, instead setting an end goal with no plan on how to get there. Luann's Saga Luann breaks up with her boyfriend Buckley and she begins crying all over the house. Hank, who wants Luann out of his den and for her to stop crying, tries to get Peggy to handle the emotional stuff, but when this process takes too long, he simply teaches Luann to bottle up her emotions the way that he does. For a while, the two get along, eating cookie dough and complaining about Buckley. But when Hank tries to get Luann a new boyfriend, she ends up getting a ride home from Boomhauer, which disturbs Hank as Boomhauer is a notorious womanizer. When he confronts Luann about this, she claims that it's none of his business who she spends time around, and Hank kicks her out. But later, during a meeting at a restaurant orchestrated by Peggy, he sees Luann crying, as Peggy claims that she's upset because Hank broke up with her. So he invites her back to the house with all her things back the way they were, inviting Luann to stay with the Hill family full time. Hank grew up in an era where the concept of men showing emotions was viewed with disgust, the commonly accepted way to handle social situations being to repress and bottle up feelings. This works in the short term, but like we routinely see with characters like Bill, can result in these feelings amplifying and coming out in unhealthy ways. Even Hank has an issue with anger management, as we saw in episode 1, showing that his own coping mechanisms often end up controlling him. And while this isn't to say that stoicism is bad, it's clear that when it comes to emotions, everything should be done in moderation, especially moderation itself. Sometimes you do need to have a big emotional moment, and it's a sign of a healthy psyche to recognize when this is. 
so Luann and Hank both had bad coping mechanisms, just on either extreme of the spectrum. While Peggy was facilitating a prolonged emotional outburst, Hank taught her to do the opposite, something that Luann found some success in purely due to it being the opposite of her current tactic. But this is really just a half-truth, as it was Hank's willingness to open himself up emotionally a bit that really caused a common ground to be found, even if he himself would never admit as much. So this episode's moral ends up revealing itself at around the halfway point, only for Hank to forget everything by the end as character continuity resets. Hank's Unmentionable Problem Hank has constipation, though Peggy is more concerned with the issue than he is, as he finds it too embarrassing to talk about. But in Peggy's concern, she starts speaking with the neighbors, who all chip in advice on what he ought to do. Finally, Peggy's concern reaches a breaking point after a bad dream of hers, and she convinces Hank to finally see a doctor, though the doctor finds no obstruction and schedules a surgery to have his colon removed. But wanting to continue living an active lifestyle, Hank starts eating nofu and drinking grease, cutting out the steaks he loves so much for more fiber, and even attending acupuncture. But when all of this fails, he and Peggy finally come to an agreement that Hank would be happier dying with the hamburger in his gut than living off of tofu. But just as he and his wife finally embrace, he feels his stomach rumbling and finally manages to pass the problem. There's a saying that a person has a stick up their butt when referring to a stubborn or uptight individual, and this is given a nearly literal interpretation during this episode. One thing implied at the end of the episode is that Hank's issue is psychosomatic, not a physical one, but a mental issue. Him closing himself off to those nearest to him also closes his bowels, and by hiding his pain and discomfort at eating salads, he's only making the problem worse. But the medical issue brings the family closer together as they all rally behind him, and that's ultimately what causes him to loosen up enough to finally flush. This, then, ties into Hank's earlier issues. He was at first embarrassed about it, going so far as to admonish his family for even trying to bring it up, despite their legitimate concerns for his health. But by the end of it all, he's willing to share how things are going with his friends and neighbors. And while Hank Hill will always be too restrained to allow himself the language, the emotional vulnerability he shows represents a marked improvement over the episode's beginning. It's this, combined with the fear of what he might lose should he lose his colon, that ultimately results in the episode's finale. Not so much a celebration of his ability to use the bathroom once more, but his ability to confide in others. Westy Side Story The neighborhood gathers around to greet the new neighbors moving next door to the Hill family, the Sufa Nusen phones, Khan, Min, and Khan Jr. Hank tries to talk down his fringe's prejudices to introduce himself, though it takes a while for the two to get along, as Khan's dog tries to mount Ladybird, and he cooks with the mesquite instead of propane. But Min and Peggy convince their husbands to try harder to get along, and eventually Hank comes around when he tastes Khan's cooking, until Dale points out that their pet dog is missing, implying they've eaten it. This is made worse when Hank overhears Min calling the pound to ask about it, assuming she's ordering another one. Around this time, Peggy starts to get jealous of the fact that Min was able to recreate her desserts, but with better seasoning. Finally, when Hank learns that Ladyburn is gone too, he demands answers from Khan, though Connie and Bobby admit that this was their fault, as they let the dogs off leash when they saw the two trying to get closer. After this misunderstanding, Hank and Khan both punished their children in the same way, and realize they're not so different after all. Hank spends most of this episode trying to prove that he's not prejudiced against his neighbor due to the color of his skin, but because of the quality of his character. Him and Peggy both leaning into stereotypes about the East to try to prove how accepting they are. But ultimately, despite believing otherwise, he still falls into the use of stereotypes and generalizations to characterize the Sufanus and Phone family once he starts to dislike them, accusing them of eating his dog out of no more evidence than Dale's conjecture. So from this, the narrative made it clear that the Hill family's attempts at proving they weren't racist were less about trying to welcome their neighbors and more to show off that they were doing so. But Khan reacts to the new situation in largely the same way. He characterizes all of his neighbors as redneck trash, and acts under the stereotype that they're all too stupid to really relate to him, something not helped by Hank's constant misinterpretations of his culture and background. So the common ground that the two men find is really less about what they do, and more so from what motivates that. After all, Khan is an anagram of Hank. It takes the two bonding over their treatment of their children and their dogs to finally understand that maybe their treatment of each other was also very similar. Shut 
Shins of the Father Bobby is celebrating his birthday party, and despite Peggy's attempts to prevent it, Cotton Hill receives an invite. He shows up and immediately becomes the life of the party, riding in on a horse and giving Bobby a loaded shotgun. But as he's staying at the house, he starts to grate on Peggy, who resents putting up with his chauvinistic ways, and he starts to rub off on Bobby, who begins to mimic his chauvinist ways. She confronts Hank to convince him to send the man home, but Hank can't bring himself to kick out his own father, who is a war hero. But this arguing ramps up when it's learned that Cotton is intentionally sabotaging his own car so as to continue to stay with them, and it reaches a head when Bobby starts a sexist riot at his school, and Hank learns he's planning on buying the boy a prostitute for doing so. So Hank yells at the man, kicking him out of the house and admonishing him for being a bad influence on his son. Cotton is happy that Hank's finally stood up to him, and after a lecture, Hank is able to teach Bobby not to internalize the behavior of his grandfather. Cotton Hill represents an interesting dynamic within the themes of King of the Hill, this theme being the constant clashing between generations. When new ideas meet old traditions, Cotton Hill exists on the furthest extreme of one end of the spectrum, the oldest part of old school an exaggeration of every single defining trait of his generation for better and for worse. Because he's a war hero who believes in tough love, discipline, and that men should have an extreme amount of confidence in themselves. All good traits in a vacuum, but these ideals tend to clash with reality. Confidence is fine as long as it's warranted. That sense of discipline is a good thing to have, but has to come with an ideology that's beneficial to worship in such a way. And Cotton's expression of tough love is really just a louder version of Hank's emotional distance. So of course, Hank looks up to the man. All of these traits made him into the man that he is in the present, so to dismiss any of his father's grading personality traits or to claim that he's a bad influence on Bobby would be to claim that he was a bad influence on Hank too, and then to claim that Hank's upbringing was imperfect and so is he. But ultimately, Hank ends up finding the confidence to admit that he's not perfect and that Cotton wasn't that great of a father, simultaneously stating that he's going to strive to be a much better one who accepts when he's wrong and adapts a trait that Cotton Hill lacks the emotional maturity to confront, even if he still recognizes the feat. Peggy, the Boggle Champ After winning a few friendly games of Boggle with her neighbors, Peggy hears of a tournament nearby, and despite her initial hesitations about being a casual player, she enters and wins, qualifying her for a state tournament held in Dallas. Hank is unsure about sending her there alone until he hears about a mower show occurring at the same weekend, so he signs on to be Peggy's coach as an excuse to go to the show. The tourney begins and Peggy starts suffering without Hank's support, something he's hesitant to give as he doesn't like walking around in a pink coach shirt while carrying her purse, and he'd rather be at the mower show. But after a while the guilt starts to set in and Hank finally returns to the tourney just in time to cheer her on in the finals, which she wins. Meanwhile, Bobby and Luann are left at home alone and desperately try to remove a stain on the coffee table. Repeatedly through the episode, Peggy's boggle odyssey is compared to Hank's old high school experience going to state with his football team. That's repeatedly mentioned through the series as his peak, the highlight of Hank's life, with his trophy from that run being a prized possession. So when Peggy manages to earn the same sort of attempt at going to state that he once had, he views it with a bit of hesitation, as if her run cheapens the value of his. The fact that Hank doesn't throw his support behind her until pretending to do so so he can see a mower show is proof of this, and while high school football is a much bigger deal in Texas than Boggle, that matters much less than how much it means to the people participating. But another thing that causes some hesitation in Hank is the fact that the optics around supporting his wife look bad to his friends. Wearing a pink shirt, being Mr. Peggy Hill, and carrying her purse for her alongside all the other non-dominant husbands is something that goes against the fiber of his being but ultimately his love for his wife wins out over his desire to appear traditionally manly. Peggy is far from the standard housewife archetype promoted by the conservative American values that Hank tries to define himself by, and this episode is another one that contrasts his desires with his values. Keeping up with our Joneses Bobby and Joseph find a cigarette in a dumpster and Hank catches him smoking, so he forces Bobby to smoke an entire carton until he throws up, assuming that will stop the boy from getting into the habit. But while showing Bobby the right way to smoke, he himself gets hooked again, eventually spreading the itch to his wife as they reminisce about their days smoking together. 
but Hank's punishment only got Bobby hooked, as well as the rest of the family aside from Luann, who's trying to shame the others into quitting again, using the same techniques she's been using to get Ladybird to stop eating her makeup. They try going to support groups and using nicotine patches, but nothing works until eventually Luann locks them in a room until they quit. The next morning, they wake up to a smoke-free lifestyle. Smoking, like almost every other cultural clash so far, is one of those things so thoroughly ingrained into American society that had to be forced out through reason over decades. Today, it exists as a relic of those who refuse to move on to the lives they made for themselves, do more to what it represents rather than anything else, made worse by the fact that nicotine itself is addictive. To Hank and Peggy, smoking is nostalgic, reminding them of the good old days through rose-tinted glasses when the reality of the situation was lung cancer, black teeth, and a smoker's cough. Even Hank's approach to getting Bobby off of smoking was viewed as something wrong to do, despite his intentions being in the right place. The idea that you can get someone off smoking by making them smoke more instead of having your kid listen to reason. Through the episode, we also get subtle indications of how the industries surrounding tobacco have profiteered off of this addiction. Between Dale showing a cartoon aimed at kids to inform Joseph about tobacco, and the advertising targeted towards children that caused Bobby's discomfort. There's a clear signal that an industry will use this sense of nostalgia for old America and the way things used to be in order to hook customers and keep them around. That they can turn a person's consumption into an ideology and later part of their personality means that you can get individuals who will staunchly defend something bad for them as they view data and evidence as personal attacks. King of Ant Hill Hank Hill is celebrating his great lawn, but notices that it's not quite as good as Khan's, so he ramps up his game with St. Augustine. But when Dale comes by to spray his lawn for bugs, he turns the guy down, saying he doesn't want to risk any potential damage right before the street's Cinco de Mayo celebration. So Dale secretly sneaks in the Fire Ant Queen to his lawn, and the following morning there's an infestation. Hank tries a few eco-friendly solutions that Dale also sabotages, and eventually he has to turn back to his old friend to spray his lawn once more. But Dale uses far too much poison, and the lawn dies, causing Hank to collapse from the stress. In the B-plot, Bobby takes a fire ant queen as a pet, only for her pheromones to control his mind into raising the colony, and eventually taking them outside, where he's swarmed by the ants. This then connects to the A-plot, where Hank is about to kick Dale's ass before being interrupted by a swarm of ants attacking Bobby. So Dale volunteers his hand as bait, which the ants take. This saves Bobby at the cost of thousands of ant bites to Dale, though he's resistant to them after years of working with insects. In the end, the neighborhood comes together to offer Hank their own grasses in order to replace his lawn with bits of their own. Lawn maintenance is one of those things so uniquely American that it would inevitably become a part of Hank's identity. Like the previous episode though, it's also one of those things promoted by a corporate interest out of a need to offload excess nitrogen following World War II. This led to a fertilizer boom and the follow-up of chemical companies encouraging Americans to raise lawns as a pastime. Which this combined with the VA loan program, we had a whole generation of people who'd never owned homes before discovering that they had to consume products to raise grass, similarly to the way most traditions in America start. And knowing how this sort of belief got into Hank's mind helps us to understand why it's so valuable to him. He conflates a well-manicured lawn with a resume of sorts, at once espousing your patriotism and work ethic, the two things Hank loves about himself the most. So when his friendship with Dale ends up getting in the way of a well-manicured lawn, it ends up being something that hurts Hank's self-image. He doesn't want the association of a bad lawn, so he breaks things off with Dale. Of course, what's the point of showing off a good face if you're going to be a bad neighbor underneath it all? This is a lesson Hank learns by the end of the episode making up with his friend as a true showing of his character, rather than the optics brought by a well-manicured lawn. Plastic White Female Bobby gets invited to a boy-girl party for Joseph's birthday, but he's nervous about interacting with the opposite sex as he has no experience. This, and the fact that Peggy seems to baby him. But when Luann brings home a plastic head from her beauty school, Bobby notices it and thinks it might make good practice for a real woman. Luann is nervous about her beauty school final and wants to practice on anybody who will let her before styling the mannequin, but Hank is hesitant to allow her near his hair. Meanwhile, Bobby is practicing romancing the head and is starting to become less nervous around women, until learning that Joseph plans on playing spin the bottle at his party. So Bobby prepares to practice kissing on the head when Peggy walks in on him. 
Hank and Peggy are disturbed by the news as they believe it's a fetish thing, but when Bobby goes back to practice again, Hank destroys the head with his skill saw. Luann is distraught over the destruction of her beauty school project, so Hank finally volunteers to replace it. When Luann fails during her final, Hank praises his haircut, which causes the instructor to go back on the failing grade and pass Luann. Back at the party, a nervous Bobby meets with Connie on his way to Joseph's house, and the two agree to practice kissing together, giving Bobby the confidence needed to play spin the bottle, but ultimately going after Nancy Gribble when she walks in on the game. Bobby is emotionally stunted due to the constant split of his brother's coddling, with his father's insistence on treating him like an adult despite this. These mixed messages mostly confuse the boy, who had otherwise been content to take things at his own pace. But the pressure from his father, combined with the lack of experience ensured by his mother, ensures that Bobby gets put into uncomfortable situations with nowhere near enough knowledge to cope with them. So he resorts to the same kind of weird strategies that any overly sheltered kid would gravitate towards, in this case being Luann's beauty school project. Hank and Peggy's reaction to his eccentricity is a negative one, less out of a concern for their son, and more out of a concern for their own parenting methods. If he turns out this way, it reflects poorly on themselves. Yet ironically enough, Bobby's practice actually does result in making him more confident, instead of more weird and isolated. The very fact that he believes he has the experience is enough to get him over the nerves and to realize that women are just people. This is a lesson reinforced at the end of the episode when he and Connie meet up before Joseph's party. She's been around the boy for a while now, and he's never had any awkward feelings with her. So all his hangups are very surface level. The boy ain't right, but he ain't too wrong either after all. Season 2 The first season of King of the Hill stood out due to its subversive nature in the sense that it wasn't subversive at all. The plots were incredibly down-to-earth, the characters relatable and realistic, and this went against the grain of what was typically seen in animation. The second season then doubled down on many of these aspects of the show in the visual department. Most characters were redesigned to have the crudeness buffed out, with fewer off-model shots, reminiscent of Beavis and Butthead, getting through, while a facelift of sorts was given to each major character. And yet, in spite of the added realism to the cast, the plots began to diverge from this trend. While the realm of realism was still very much played straight, the extent to which these boundaries were getting pushed moved outwards. The misunderstandings that fueled plots were often things that no sane person would do, but still things that a sane person could do. Plots were larger than life, but not cartoonishly so. The kind of thing you'd hear about in gossip after it's been passed around a few times. But this isn't to say that any of these changes are false. As with any show, the first season saw a lot of shakiness as characters tried to find their footings. What to really do with each member of the major cast was starting to come together as the writers developed around what was working and what got exhausting too fast. And this compromise with the added realism came through the side characters. New characters would be introduced for a single plotline, with these characters often being the caricatures one would expect from a contemporary show, while keeping the main cast and their reactions consistent. So Hank and Co can stay relatable, while the plotlines themselves grew, giving the show a consistent aspect of heart, while also making a sort of character out of its uniquely mundane setting. How to Fire a Rifle Without Really Trying Hank learns that Bobby is a natural marksman at the state fair, and decides to take him on a father-son shooting trip. But when Hank himself tries to shoot, he finds himself unable to fire without flashing back to his father's verbal abuse. Despite his inability to shoot, Bobby is still smitten with the hobby, and the two sign up for a father-son tournament. Though Hank is struggling to get over his hangups and continuously tries to quash Bobby's interest in the sport, something that Bobby eventually interprets as his father not wanting to spend time with him. But when Peggy tells Hank to get over himself for his son's sake, Hank decides to go to a sports psychologist. The consult eventually results in Hank getting over his fears by thinking about something else, and he's soon able to shoot alongside Bobby once again. On the day of the tourney, the team is performing well, tied for first, until Cotton Hill arrives and starts to taunt Hank. Unable to focus on anything but his father's voice, Hank ends up choking the final shot, but Bobby is still ecstatic about their second place finish, and the two leave the range proudly. Throughout the episode, Hank is trying to lower Bobby's expectations by telling him niceties along the lines of doing your best or only playing for fun, the opposite of what he usually says, calling back to the first episode where the family discusses giving 110% and playing to win. To Hank, these are the words of a quitter, the type of person who's lost before even starting, and he still believes as such, which makes saying it all that much harder. 
Ironically enough, the fact that he was pretending to think this way was ultimately what gave this episode a happy ending. Bobby had been internalizing this method of thinking from the start, so when they got second place, he was content because it wasn't about the trophy. Bobby and Hank are able to bond over shooting instead of bonding over victory. And while contemporary shows may have made a big deal over the episode's central focus, Firearms, King of the Hill manages to ride a more centrist line. Guns are not inherently viewed as a bad thing, but the people who obsess with them are still at the receiving end of many of the episode's jokes. The Arlen Gun Club is portrayed as obsessed lunatics who are more likely to shoot themselves than anyone or anything else. But Hank and Bobby handle their firearms more or less responsibly the whole time, so rather than the episode taking the low-hanging fruit or saying that guns are dangerous, it instead makes the position that idiots with guns are dangerous. The gun itself is a tool like a bandsaw or a hammer. Texas City Twister When Hank receives a notification of six months of owed rent on a trailer house in Luann's name, he realizes that his niece has had a home all along, and that it simply needed to be flipped to be livable. Eager to get her out of his hair, he flips the trailer back so Luann can start arranging it to be livable, but his less than emotional goodbye gets Peggy mad, and he ends up insulting her as she leaves, just in time for a news report about a tornado hitting Arlen. Believing his wife is in danger, he sets out to warn them as Bill is deployed to maintain order, and Boomhauer and Dale use the dead bug truck to catch footage of flying cows. Despite a few obstacles, Hank manages to make it to the trailer park just in time, but Peggy and Luann have already hunkered down just when the tornado arrives. While holding on to a telephone pole for his life, Hank is finally able to bear everything. Emotionally, and when Luann's trailer house is tipped over again, he agrees to let her continue to stay with the Hill family. Hank Hill is not an emotional man, remaining stoic and proud of it in almost any situation, even going so far as to avoid potentially awkward situations where he might be forced to present some vulnerable side of himself. But even though he usually manages to come around by the end of the episode, the in-between often gets him into trouble as his lack of emotional response to what goes on around him can be interpreted incorrectly. People have a tendency to project something they're feeling onto him, such as in this episode when Peggy is sad to see Luann go and conflates Hank's emotionlessness with complacency or satisfaction. She gets mad at him for enjoying the fact that he's kicked his niece out of the house and Hank does not make an effort to make her believe otherwise. So showing emotions can, in many cases, be the right option to prevent further harm later on. It usually takes something over the top to prove that you've changed. To simply return to normal following an event like this will come across as insincere at worst, so Hank could have saved himself a lot of trouble if he'd been more clear with his intentions early on. It's the equivalent of telling somebody no when they invite you to a place you really don't want to go. Awkward to say it in the moment, but it saves you the trouble of faking a smile later. The Arrowhead Hank finds an arrowhead and a few other American Indian artifacts in his yard and sells them to a local archaeologist, Professor Lerner, for a few dollars. Peggy is upset about this, claiming she could have used them to educate Bobby. Then, when Lerner comes back around with a permit to dig in the hills' his yard, she signs it to approve a new site. Over the next few days, Hank's lawn is torn up by the professor, who Peggy looks up to while Hank hates the guy's guts and know-it-all attitude. But when he later sees a Wahasha bracelet on Peggy's wrist, Hank gets jealous and plans to sabotage the professor's career by creating a faked artifact for him to dig up. But Peggy finds it instead and is made fun of for misidentifying it. So Hank confesses his scheme, apologizing to Peggy and admitting that he missed spending time with her. She realizes that she's been too obsessed with the dig lately and that Lerner's ego made him a bad person and then the two make up. This episode doesn't really dissolve the external plot of its story by the end. Lerner still has a permit to dig up Hank's lawn and can't technically be forced to leave. But from his personality, we can tell that this was never the true issue the episode was focused on exploring. The obstacle was not Lerner's violation of Hank's lawn, but the fact that doing so was fueled by his own ego. So by the end of the episode, it's his ego that's damaged by Peggy losing the respect she had for him and looking like a jerk in front of his students. This being resolved, he's less likely to stick around somewhere where he's not wanted at the risk of looking bad. But this episode is much less about the dig site or the professor, and much more about the argument between Hank and Peggy. Hank sells the artifacts at the beginning of the episode without asking Peggy first. This prompts her to try to get revenge by signing off on the dig without asking Hank. Everything surrounding this is merely the result of the two passive-aggressively trying to avoid talking about why they're mad. 
Hank claims it's his lawn, but it's actually Peggy. Peggy claims she's doing this for Bobby's future, but it's really Hank that she has the issue with. So just explaining the problem out loud was all it took to resolve the issue. It's not that anybody even needed to learn a lesson or change their mind, just that they had to reiterate what they were already feeling. Halloween. Hank is put in charge of the school's haunted house, excited to put his craftsman skills to work, but when a litigious evangelical named Junie Harper claims that the holiday is satanic, she gets the haunted house shut down. But Hank wants Bobby to have an authentic trick-or-treating experience and teaches the boy how to put the trick into trick-or-treat by vandalizing Harper's house. She runs over her cat while trying to chase them down and blames the dead cat on satanists, leveraging this to get the holiday banned across the county. Hank is distraught over this, even more so as Harper was able to indoctrinate Luann with a few niceties, who then tries to spread the satanic panic to Bobby. But when Hank learns that Junie is hosting a hallelujah house full of religious fear-mongering and that Bobby's going, he takes to the streets to march and demand the holiday back. The neighbors all join in, even Luann, until they reach Junie's house, where Bobby and the rest of the children realize the fun they're missing out on and go with the Halloween Hellraisers. Junie Harper is an extremely frustrating antagonist for this plotline due to the fact that she really does exist. Maybe not in the exact form of Junie Harper, but everyone growing up knew some hyper-religious type who lauded their virtue over others in an attempt to gain control, banning things less out of actual concern for anyone's well-being than to show off that they could do it. King of the Hill is a very down-to-earth and realistic show, including its characters. As such, it can create fictional characters who are just like the kind of people we know and loathe, and this makes her a much more compelling villain for the Hill family to deal with because everyone knows a Junie. This episode also puts into perspective Hank's desire to raise his kids right, despite knowing contradictory to his own youth. He was a vandal as a kid who disobeyed his parents and acted in an entitled manner towards things like Halloween candy, and yet he tries to raise his son to be like himself as an adult, conflating the good times he had as a kid with his current worldview. It would come across as hypocritical if you didn't think that Hank truly believed in it, and optically this comes across as he tries to encourage Bobby to misbehave in the same vein. This is part of why Bobby is eager to accept the indoctrination of Junie Harper. Jumpin' Crack Bass Hank tries to teach Bobby about the wonders of digging up your own bait to use live worms as he believes it's the only honest way to go fishing. But when they're out there, his car gets hotwired and Hank performs a citizen's arrest on the culprit. Later on, when he's the only one on the lake that day not to catch anything, he tries to find some better bait and gets directed to a street corner where he ends up buying some synthetic bait. Despite his friends pointing out his hypocrisy, they still end up using the bait themselves and are wildly successful until Hank runs out of bait and needs another, stronger batch. In Dale's exterminator wisdom, they've adapted to the new element. When buying more drugs, Hank, and Dale who followed him, get arrested and the judge doesn't buy his fishing bait story. But as he was the judge who presided over Hank's citizen arrest from before, he gives the guy a chance to catch fish using his synthetic bait to prove the story. But when the bait doesn't work, Hank goes back to using worms in secret and manages to catch a fish that proves his innocence. The story here begins with a lie and ends the same way. Hank tries to talk about the virtues of fishing honestly, that enjoying the quiet atmosphere of nature is the true appeal of going out to the lake, but ends up getting jealous of his friends when they catch more than he does. So he lies about his new bait and the advantages it's giving him, betraying his own words of wisdom in favor of having more fun. But this goes wrong and ultimately is about to result in Hank getting arrested for his repeat purchase. It's only by deceiving the judge that Hank is able to earn his freedom, using his old tried and true method to fake an innocent count. And while this comes across as a story about Hank learning the virtues of his own honesty, it really is a story of two wrongs cancelling out to make a right. The episode itself develops in a way that's meant to mimic the habits of an addict. Hank is, at first, secretive about his use of the new bait. He only hesitantly allows his friends to use a bit themselves, and they immediately get hooked, pun not intended. But as the episode goes on, Hank wants another day on the lake again and again, skipping sleep and time with his family to go fishing with his new bait, with less and less of a pretense for why he's going out. A subtle thing this episode also does is establish the Megalomart as a negative force within the town of Arlen. In a brick joke, Layaway Ray burns down his own store for the insurance money due to not being able to compete. This, and Hank's complaints about the Mega Store, set up what would ultimately be the second season's finale, but I'll talk more about that when it comes up. Ha! <sighs> 
Husky Bobby When Bobby is too big to fit into new clothes at a children's clothing store, they're recommended to go to a plus-size store instead. But Hank and Peggy don't want to hurt Bobby's feelings over going to the fat kid store and try to let him down gently, erring too far on the side of caution as Bobby embraces the new fashion. He's offered a role as a plus-sized model, but Hank shoots this idea down, forcing Bobby to sneak out with Luann to attend the shoot instead. This shoot is successful, and he's scouted to go to more and more of them, eventually getting to go to a husky boy fashion show at the mall. When Hank learns about this, he rushes there to stop his son from walking the catwalk and gets there just in time for an argument. But as he's dragging Bobby away, a group of teenagers begin to throw donuts at the fat kids, and Bobby realizes that his father saved him from humiliation. Confidence is important. Having confidence in yourself is one of the key factors to success in anything, because it's what gives us the motivation to bother to start in the first place. Hank and Peggy recognize this, which is why they avoid telling Bobby that he's fat in the first place, using alternative language like special. When he begins to embrace his size, the rest of the world embraces it too. Bobby's confidence is what makes him a good model. But confidence alone only gets you so far, because loving yourself doesn't guarantee that others are going to love you the same amount. Believing that you are going to do well is one thing, but believing that others are going to view your actions the same way is just naivety. Not everyone is going to treat you with respect. Not just a thing for fat models, but general life advice. It's not that you should be ashamed, but you should recognize that some people are going to attack you for any amount of vulnerability whatsoever. And while Hank's actions in shutting down Bobby's dreams of modeling are a bit extreme, he ends up being justified by the narrative in his actions. It would have been far more traumatic for Bobby to get the donut-flavored reality check than to be let down gently as he was by Hank, and even that was not a simple sight. If Hank and Peggy had maybe been a bit more honest with Bobby from the start, he might have been more prepared for this sort of awakening to the cruelty of teenagers, but on the other hand, he likely would have lacked the confidence to get scouted for the fashion show in the first place. The Man Who Shot Kane Skretberg Hank is annoyed at a group of teenagers led by Kane Skretberg who are playing music too loud, so he goes over to complain, but they ignore him and he leaves angrily. But later, when Bobby and Joseph are attacked by the group in a paintball game, Hank gets his friends together to teach them a little bit of respect. But they're humiliated in front of the other adults when the teenagers fire on them despite surrendering. Hank starts to feel like he's becoming an old man, so he challenges them to a rematch, only to lose again. The alleyway starts to fear that they finally become old men, and they resign to their fates, only to get shot at by the teens once again. Not knowing why the teenagers won't leave them alone, they decide to investigate, researching teen attitudes to learn how they tick. The following day, they challenge the band to another paintball batch, wagering Bill's leaf blower against their ability to use electric instruments. They use the teens' cruelty and hormones against them, with Hank finally managing to outsmart and outmaneuver Kane, winning back peace and quiet on the block. Hank, Dale, Boomhauer, and Bill all peaked in high school, the exact moment being during their excursion to the state championship football game. But as it is with people who reach their peak of life satisfaction, they try to cling on to those days. It's why, when Hank tries to intimidate the teens, he references his football career and school days. But when he starts to face the reality of the situation, this crutch of his past no longer works, and he begins to understand that he's old. His old man mentality comes from the fact that he's no longer the guy he imagines himself as. Hank's mental image of himself is how he looked in high school, where he was a person that no longer exists. But he is able to find the motivation to challenge the boys to a rematch after a pep talk from Peggy. During this talk, she doesn't talk about his football career or any of the things he did in high school, but instead references current events of his life, his career in propane, chasing raccoons out of the attic, and being a father. This pep talk doesn't work either, but it does start the trend of actively trying to buck the mentality of being washed up and elderly, which then evolves into their attempts to reclaim their youth, not by simply talking about doing it, but by actively trying to understand teenagers to beat them at their own game. In the end, Hank and Co. only believe themselves to be old. It's their actions that really define their age. The Son That Got Away Connie and Bobby get in trouble at school for disrupting class together, and both their parents are called over to correct them. And while there, they blame each kid's behavior on the other's bad parenting. Both kids are punished, so they decide to get out of the punishment by sneaking away, with Bobby bringing Joseph along too. He suggests that the trio go to the caves to explore, and they get trapped down there. 
While stuck, Bobby begins to notice that Connie and Joseph are getting close, so he volunteers his body as food for them, assuming they'll be trapped down there for a while. Meanwhile, Dale, Hank, and Con set out with the rest of the neighborhood to track down their kids, ultimately learning that they went to the caves, much to Hank's horror as the caves are where Arlen teenagers go to make out. Hank and Con crawl deeper into the caverns, only to get lost themselves, and while down there they start to reminisce about their own teenage years, eventually getting along. Their laughter echoes through the caves, leading the two groups to reunite and eventually be discovered by Boomhauer, who calls the fire department for a rescue. In the end, Bobby and Joseph both claim that Connie has a crush on the other, and the two remain friends. This episode sets up a love triangle between Bobby, Connie, and Joseph, though this is an aspect of the plot that doesn't really stick around for too long afterwards. Largely, this is because it's counterintuitive for a lot of the characterization set up before and afterwards. Most of Connie's hangups around dating Bobby come from her father's disapproval at the girl hanging around rednecks, and this is something that would persist no matter who she chose. Bobby is far too good-natured to ever let a love triangle ruin a friendship, something that he expresses during this very episode as he resolves to sacrifice himself for his friends' sake. And Joseph is still very much being developed as of now, also moving away from this iteration. It's a plot dynamic that the writers established, then realized couldn't be used very much, throwing it out before they risked it getting stale or annoying. Fox initially wanted King of the Hill to be a totally standardized show, the episodes being watchable in any order. But the showrunners recognize the damage this could do to realism. After all, real people hardly stay consistent throughout their lives. So there are subtle traits that change in some episodes to get picked up later. Character relationships will change, statuses change, and the world itself changes too. The Company Man While helping Bobby with a Sunday School report on his hero, Hank Hill, Hank Hill receives word of a new account from a Mr. Holloway, a Boston man who is visiting Texas to choose a gas supplier. Holloway is obsessed with Texas, or at least the idea of it, and wants Hank to give him a tour of cowboys, oil wells, and six-shooters. This goes contrary to Hank's idea of salesmanship, giving an honest examination of the advantages of propane rather than selling the idea of the product. It begins to look as though Hank is about to lose the contract to Thatherton, a man who left Strickland Propane eight years ago and has been poaching their clientele ever since. So he swallows his pride and begins to play up his southern drawl and other fake aspects of who he is. Bobby starts to get a confused idea of who his father is, and soon, Hank is even going to strip clubs to win the client over. But after seeing how similarly dressed he is to a stripper and how similar their behavior is, Hank decides to keep his pride and he turns down the sale. This episode has Hank fighting against the stereotype of Texas as portrayed by spaghetti westerns and Hollywood interpretations of the state. The truth of the matter is that Texas is nowhere near the stereotype that it's portrayed as with tumbleweeds and the like. King of the Hill is actually an accurate depiction of what life is like in the Lone Star State. But there's an interesting hitch to this idea. The Quebec dub of King of the Hill recontextualizes the setting to no longer take place in a suburb of Texas, but instead a suburb in Canada. Nothing else has changed outside of replacing a few flags and a few lines from the script, and yet the show still met an audience up north as well. So how Texan can the show be if it also fits so many Canadian stereotypes? The modern era of society has caused so many changes to culture, specifically the conglomeration of it. Cities will look similar no matter where you go because they're all built out of the most efficient and available materials. Popular food and music becomes much more the same cuisine and culture as it penetrates borders. Texas these days is as much like Canada as Canada has become like Texas, and for the real thinker, propane and propane accessories are often considered fake grilling components. For all the talk around Hank Hill being a true Texan, he grills with the gas equivalent of an automatic transmission. Or, for the computer nerds, it's as though Hank calls himself a tech guy and exclusively sells and uses Macs. The biggest lie King of the Hill ever sold was the lie that Texans grilled with propane instead of a real fuel. Bobby Slam Bobby signs up for a sports class, choosing wrestling as his team of choice. Meanwhile, Connie signs up for General Sports, a class for girls that's being taught by Peggy. General Sports is underfunded and repeatedly kicked out of their practice area. After being turned down for a budget increase, she remembers her childhood, the way that Peggy wasn't allowed to try out for softball because of her gender, and she gets angry. She asks the girls if there are any sports they want to play, and Connie replies that she wants to join the wrestling team. 
The wrestling coach, Kleehammer, is distraught by having to teach a girl, so he takes out his frustrations on Bobby as a way to get back at Peggy. Bobby will be wrestling Connie during the team's tryouts, a lose-lose situation for him. Between his insecurity about how to handle the situation and Connie getting bullied for trying to join the team, both fighters are nervous about the situation. But on the actual day of the fight, Bobby and Connie avoid a real wrestling match, instead staging a grand spectacle with chairs and mind control to ensure that no one loses. Connie and Bobby's fight in this episode is a surrogate for so many other fights from various characters. Hank is trying to promote Bobby's wrestling career as a substitute for his own glory days, living vicariously through his son. Peggy is also trying to encourage the fight as she's hoping to prevent the wrongs inflicted on her as a young girl when she was not taken seriously as a competitor. The wrestling coach and most of the school are trying to enforce a status quo of sorts, with various motivations from plain cruelty to, as it's implied, budgetary concerns that they couldn't find the lavish equipment for the high school football team if they allowed women in sports. Con and Min even try to promote Connie's career in order to improve her college chances, all so they can brag about their daughter. Bobby and Connie are the victims in this, at first only joining the wrestling team because it looked like a way to have fun and then getting swept up into the politics surrounding the sport. Bobby even starts to mimic the regressive attitudes of his father without really understanding why that mentality might cause harm to his friend. And Connie's excited to wrestle as she's internalized the struggles of Peggy and women all over the world. In the end, the politics that the parents try to shove into their kids' sporting events doesn't really benefit anybody, least of all the kids, the real victims in this. The Unbearable Blindness of Laying The Hill family is celebrating Christmas, and Hank's mother, Tilly, is coming over to visit, alongside her new gentleman friend, Gary Kasner. Hank is uncomfortable around his mother's boyfriend, even if the rest of the family doesn't think the same way, and he tries to avoid talking with the guy by pretending to be interested in a televangelist. But later, when Hank accidentally walks in on the two making love on the kitchen table, he undergoes a psychological blindness. He tries to ignore the blindness for as long as possible, eventually going to Cotton Hill's house to celebrate with him, while Gary comes along too. Cotton disparages Tilly while Hank and Gary are over, and Gary yells at him, coming to her defense. Later, Hank seems grateful for this as the two are in line to be healed by the televangelist Hank saw earlier, meant to be a Christmas present from Gary despite their differing fates. And when he finally accepts Gary as his new dad, his vision returns. Like in the season 1 episode, Hank's Unmentionable Problem, this episode deals with a psychosomatic disorder involving Hank that manifests itself physically. And like that episode, Hank refuses to acknowledge this issue and tries to simply live around the problem, hoping things will work out anyway. The difference then comes down to the fact that Hank's blindness is actually diagnosed properly right away. He knows precisely what will fix it, and he simply refuses to do so. Part of this stems from Hank's inability to move on from the past, specifically that he assumes that Cotton's relationship with Tilly was a typical one. He's internalized that his father's cruelty towards women, and rather than uniquely acknowledging that his dad was bad and should not have been looked up to, believes that any man who lives with Tilly will treat her the same way. Between this and a bad first impression, Hank makes up his mind about Gary before they even get to their house. This is made worse when Hank refuses to try to find any sort of conflicting evidence that might make the guy look any better. Instead of trying to face the truth, he intentionally avoids it, so his problems, his eyesight and his stepfather, still remain in his head. Meet the Manger Babies After Luann gets blown off by Buckley, she starts to get depressed, lamenting that nothing good ever happens to her. But she finds a box of puppets at a garage sale and comes up with the idea for The Manger Babies, a puppet show about the animals from Jesus' manger. She performs it at a local Sunday school, but the show ends abruptly and she starts to lose the audience. That is, until Hank steps in to try to fix a loose nail on the set and ends up pretending to have a role that gets the audience's attention back. Luann loves the role Hank played and gives him the future role of God in her next show, which airs live on Sunday. Super Bowl Sunday. Hank refuses to go as he's hosting the game that year, and Luann starts to go back into her melancholic mood from the start of the episode. But when Peggy guilts him by changing the channel to the other station repeatedly, he finally decides to go to the station and reprise his role as God, saving the manger babies. Luann is practically the opposite of Hank emotionally, yet their coping mechanisms are nearly identical. 
While Luann is very outspoken about the way she feels and expresses herself loudly and often, Hank is much more reserved, bottling up his feelings and keeping everything to himself. And when he encounters a situation that he's not emotionally ready or able to handle, his response is to find some sort of busy work to distract from it. Here, Luann is distraught over Buckley, again, and isn't able to control herself until she sets her mind to the puppet show, the amount of work she puts in being sufficient to distract her from a less healthy method of expression without action. It's something that Hank helps to set off, buying the puppets in the first place, and then something that he ends up trying to avoid seeing through to the end, hoping to instead focus on setting up for the Super Bowl party. But as the Manger Babies' success is the axis on which Luann's mental state is hinging, it's much more important to her than he initially realizes, and when she starts reflecting her childhood onto Joe Sixpack, Hank finally realizes this and rushes to her aid. It's not that he was being neglectful willingly, but that his own emotionally stunted mind couldn't realize how important the puppet show was to his niece. Snow Job The town of Arlen encounters bad weather and there's a propane emergency, with Strickland ramping up their sails to accommodate the freeze. But when Buck Strickland has a medical emergency, he needs to elect a new interim manager, and he passes over Hank for a business major named Lloyd Vickers. Vickers immediately begins modernizing the business, putting tattlers on the trucks and price gouging customers due to increased demand. This is made worse when Hank is feeding Buck's hounds and learns that the guy has an electric stove. Then when he confronts his boss, learns that his loyalty to propane gas is merely a business tactic. So Hank goes to a cabin in the woods to unwind, where he decides to open a people-centric general store. Yet, upon returning to Arlen, Hank learns that all of the truck drivers for Strickland have quit in protest of the working conditions, and that people are freezing in their homes. So he rallies up a temporary group of tow truck drivers, as they don't need hazmat certification, to save Arlen, and he returns to his old job. Lloyd Vickers, despite being portrayed as an incompetent businessman who nearly drives Strickland out of business, is, in truth, doing the right thing for the situation based on the ideals of capitalism. Basic economics dictate that raising prices in an emergency is the right thing to do if your goal is to make as much money as possible, and tracking truck drivers to make sure they work more efficiently is just common business sense. But these strategies fail despite being, on paper, correct. And when Hank talks to Buck Strickland about his electric stove and learns that he's just doing what makes the most financial sense, he has a crisis of ideology. The political ideology of King of the Hill is a very consistent one, not lining up with any particular political belief or party platform, but instead is a message of populism. Hank is a loyal American citizen, extolling the virtues of capitalism and the free market. He also feels a strong sense of connection to his community and the things that built that community. But when the free market is what causes so many wrongs to be inflicted to the community around him, the two ideals in his head clash. Ultimately, he does learn that the people ought to come before profits, and that this even has a ripple effect on repeat business and goodwill. And so the messaging of the show isn't anti-capitalism, as it recognizes that people's opinions are a form of capital in itself. I Remember Mono Hank and Peggy regale the tale of how the first Valentine's Day the couple spent together. Peggy was planning on making a meal for him, but he threw out his back and couldn't make it. Convenient, as Peggy had failed at cooking and was not prepared to reveal her lack of abilities, and merely described the meal to him over the phone. But when Peggy is substituting in the records room of his old high school, she learns that he hadn't thrown out his back, but gotten mono, and that he'd gotten it from a girl. Peggy tracks this girl down and learns that the kiss that spread the sickness was a one-off event, but she's still upset that Hank lied to her all those years ago, as that was one of their best stories. Hank tries to win back her affection through a series of romantic gestures, but these don't work, until she's complaining to her friends about them and begins to realize how much the attempts mean, later recreating that same phone call. Meanwhile, Bobby tries to prep for a visit from his secret admirer, who he believes is Olympic athlete Carrie Strug, only to find out that it was really his grandmother all along. A lot of the romance in Peggy and Hank's life comes from momentum, not the affection they show for each other in their day-to-day -day lives, but the grand gestures between the couple in the past, those moments that proved how strongly they felt. So when Peggy learns that one of their biggest early moments was based on a lie, it damages the rest of the relationship as it destroys the foundation upon which it was built. It takes Hank trying and failing to recreate this moment that finally brings her to the realization at the episode's end. Hank and Peggy's relationship is a very strong one for a TV couple, not because of big moments, but because of the thousands of small ones. 
While Hank may be terrible at expressing himself, he does let this guard down a little bit around his wife, who's always been extremely supportive of him during his lowest moments. It's actually Hank's failure to be romantic that proved how bad he was at it, and that being bad at something comes with genuinely trying. It's not that Hank is a romantic guy, it's that he tries to be one. And so in the end, there's no grand gesture that salvages their relationship, but instead, the mere concept of one, fitting in that they initially bonded over the idea of a meal, instead of the meal itself. Three Days of the Condo When Khan's brother backs out of a split condo in Mexico, he decides to rube Hank into splitting the bill with him, inviting the Hill family to vacation with them. The two feud with each other in several small ways as they go south of the border, but when Khan learns that they only rented the bottom floor of the condo, he breaks into the top one and allows the Hills to stay up there. They all go their separate ways upon arriving in Mexico and settling in, with Bobby and Connie buying a massive firework that turns out to be a dud, Luann purchasing banned makeup products that she intends to sneak across the border, and Peggy is asked to deliver a present across the border that Min convinces her is drugs. When the police show up to investigate the break-in of the top floor, Dale followed them and spilled the beans, each of them believes that they're the ones who are in trouble. Ultimately, Hank is ordered to pay 10,000 pesos to the condo owner and has his ID confiscated until he can get the money. But unable to pay, Hank, Con, and Dale simply sneak up north illegally. Hank and Con's relationship is one that varies wildly throughout the show's run. Sometimes they get along, sometimes they hate each other, sometimes their issues get resolved, sometimes they stay upset. But both characters are the type to obsess over similar things. In the realm of appearances, Hank is very concerned with the condition of his lawn and how that reflects on him, while Khan is very concerned with his property and how people compare the two. Yet Khan spends much more time and effort towards these appearances than Hank does, so despite coming across as being more well off, he's actually in a much worse position, seen here when he realizes he can't actually afford a condo for a weekend. But what separates the two is how they approach the idea of appearing well off. When Khan is better at something than somebody, he tries to rub it in, to call more attention to his position to play up his own greatness, a performative act that's for the benefit of himself as much as it is for others. Hank, on the other hand, tries to be better than other people by acting in their benefit. He's a better swimmer than Khan, at least he believes so for a time, so it's his responsibility to show off. In this case, modesty is an additional virtue to brag about. Although, with Hank Hill, this is so internalized that he genuinely believes the words others perform, especially those of Khan, leading to even more strife between the two. Traffic Jam Hank and Khan back into each other and damage their vehicles, with the only way to prevent an increase in their insurance rates being to attend a defensive driving course. They both enroll in Deaf Intensive Driving, which turns out to be a comedy show hosted by Roger Buddha Sack, who focuses primarily on racial humor. Hank hates the show, but when Bobby hears about it, he's interested in the routine, so Hank takes his son to the class to try to demotivate him from getting into comedy, only for the plan to backfire when Bobby ends up looking up to Buddha even more. Hank files a complaint against the teacher and gets him fired, but not before the comic invites Bobby to his comedy jam, though this is only after teaching the boy to get more original material, as he's trying to mimic the black comedy, no, the other kind, of Buddha. Bobby tries to find white experience to make jokes about and winds up on a white nationalist forum when searching for material. And when he tries performing this in front of a mostly black audience, it's up to Buddha to save the day by distracting the audience with jokes about Hank's butt. Hank and Bobby have a similar approach to comedy in this episode in the sense that both characters fail to understand the why of comedy. Bobby is able to parrot some funny jokes, but he doesn't understand why the humor works, and ends up creating a shallow impersonation of a comedian, which ends up biting him when he later tries to sell racial comedy to the wrong demographic. Hank, too, does not understand why the comedy routine at the class is humorous, but unlike Bobby has a negative predisposition to stand up, and therefore doesn't humor the humor. Hank gets a comedian fired for racial discrimination in this episode, making an interesting point about the way that offensive humor works. Racial humor is fundamentally offensive to the group that it targets, but it's also humor, and as long as a joke is more funny than it is offensive, people are willing to ignore it and laugh it off. Like Khan does. 
but when it crosses that threshold of being more offensive than funny, the joke suddenly becomes a problem. This leads to an issue in the information age where a joke can be recorded and played back again and again, being less funny every time as the only thing remaining is the offensiveness. And so Hank's sense of humor exists as a baseline for what happens to a joke once it's reached the age of expiration. Hank's Dirty Laundry Hank and Peggy are out buying a new dryer and try to get a store card with the purchase, only for Hank's application to get declined due to his bad credit. He discovers that his credit is poor due to failing to return a series of pornographic videotapes from Arlen Video, but Hank refuses to pay the bills due to his insistence that he never rented those tapes. When he tries to remove the charges, he ends up on a mailing list that sends a large amount of junk, double entendre, mail to his home, earning him the scorn of his neighbors. He starts to lose more friends as he grows increasingly unhinged in his attempts at destroying the evidence and starting a boycott of the video store, until he receives an anonymous package with a hint on how to prove his innocence. Eventually, Hank is able to prove that one of the tapes rented in his name did not exist on the day he rented it, and he's exonerated by the small claims court. He celebrates the charge being eliminated by purchasing a dryer, which Bobby mistakenly believes is his birthday present, as the whole episode he thought his parents' secrecy was due to planning a surprise birthday party for him. It's interesting, but not unexpected, for Hank to lose all of his friends during this episode as he continuously cracks down on trying to prove his innocence in spite of the evidence against him. We know that Hank is an honest man, but he's also extremely repressed in everything, and the most repressed people outwardly tend to be the most deviant in secret. This is shown during the episode through Bill's perspective on Hank's habit. He's the most outspoken, while simultaneously being the one with the knowledge of smut to exonerate his friend, and there's even somewhat of an implication that Bill himself was ordering tapes under Hank's name the whole time. So everyone now believing they've seen Hank's true nature starts to separate themselves from him as it becomes apparent to them that he's faking a lot about himself for a while. Even Peggy, who is surprisingly tolerant of Hank when she believes that he's been renting smut behind her back, is more upset that he's lying about it than the actual content of what he's renting. Even then, her concerns are more for Bobby's sake than any moral decency. People are upset at Hank not because he's looking at porn, but because he always tries to take the moral high ground in life and no longer seems to hold that. The Final Shinsult Cotton breaks things off with Dee Dee, who used to work as his chauffeur, so he stays at the Hill residence until he can renew his license, which he thinks he can do as he's memorized the eye chart at the Arlen DMV. But when Hank has the worker switch the chart out, and Cotton learns of this, the veteran becomes upset at his son's betrayal and starts to live with Dale instead. Later on, when Tom Landry Middle School is on a field trip to see the prosthetic leg of General Santa Ana, Dale and Cotton steal it with a plan to negotiate with the Mexican government for a driver's license using the leg as leverage. But this plan doesn't work, and only succeeds in getting him into a psychiatric hospital, where Hank and Peggy are content with leaving him as they're aware that he's become too much of a hassle to keep under control. But Hank feels bad about leaving his father in the sterile environment, and arranges for Dee Dee to return because she wants the Cadillac. One of the major themes expressed throughout King of the Hill is the passing from the old ways into the new, Cotton being an example of the old guard in society. While his service and sacrifice are always viewed with respect, he himself has coasted on this respect his whole life, never doing anything to renew it or maintain his worthiness of the position. This is the general way that the narrative expresses how the changing of societal values ought to pan out. Doing something that's considered inoffensive or normal at the time shouldn't punish you moving into the future, but refusing to update your ideals or change with the trends, assuming the trends are improvements, will eventually make those actions seem less forgivable. Cotton's treatment of Dee Dee was very normal half a century ago, but in the 90s it was no longer acceptable behavior. Cotton's crazy antics likewise would have been the type of thing to be overlooked back when his military service was more recent, an acceptable trait to put up with because of who it was attached to. But that goodwill wears off as the deeds become less of a memory and more of a story. Cotton, like Hank, often fails to adapt to the changing tides of society, though the narrative is much less kind to Cotton purely because he staunchly refuses to, whereas Hank usually comes around. Leanne's Saga 
Luann's mother, Leanne, gets out of prison and stays at the Hill residence despite Hank's insistence that she avoid the place due to the fact that Luann would have to drop out of beauty school to support her. She stays in Hank's garage for the time being, eventually bonding with Bill when the latter is unable to drink due to a new medication for his foot fungus and Leanne's court order to avoid alcohol. As the two date, Bill starts to spend more and more money on her until he can no longer afford his medication and stops taking it. But when his foot fungus grows back, Leanne starts to sneak alcohol in order to tolerate him. This brings back her old personality as she starts to become more and more abusive, both physically and emotionally, towards Bill, eventually getting kicked out of Hank's garage, where the abuse becomes worse. This comes to a head during a barbecue, where she threatens Buckley with a fork, the instrument she used to stab Luann's father slash Peggy's brother, and Luann tries to stop her. But Peggy comes to save the day, telling off the woman and eventually kicking her ass. In the end, Luann and Peggy bond together as mother and daughter, in that the aunt-niece bond is closer than that. Luann's story has always been a story of overcoming adversity due to her upbringing. She was never able to have the healthy, stable childhood that many other characters got, although as seasons go on, we learn just how few people's childhood was normal. And so her adulthood is all about the influences of the people around her. Living with Leanne, she would probably end up following in her mother's footsteps, but living with the Hill family, her future is much more in her own control. Bill's story also overlaps with Luann's here, as the two of them are both characters emotionally damaged by the lack of certain relationships in their lives. Bill loses Lunor, and Luann loses Leanne. When the latter woman comes to Arlen, she starts to promise to fill a hole in both their hearts, only for it to become apparent why that hole was there in the first place. Luann is desperate to have a maternal figure again, that she's willing to take after a woman who has no interest in her well-being. Bill, too, is desperate to have his house feel less empty, and he's willing to put up with the toxicity that takes advantage of his vulnerable emotional state. In the end, that's what the conflicts are about, vulnerability and the people who subsist off of it. Junkie Business Hank is put in charge of hiring a new sales associate for Strickland Propane. He considers the qualified Maria Montalvo, but turns her down as he doesn't know how to interact with a woman, instead hiring the presentable Leon Petard. But Leon shows up late and full of excuses, eventually doing less and less work as he spends most of his time strung out or switching between manic and depressive states. Soon, Hank tries to fire him so he can go to rehab, but the next day, Leon returns with a social worker who informs Hank that he cannot fire an addict under the Americans with Disabilities Act. Leon continues demanding more and more accommodations, inspiring the rest of the employees to feign disabilities so they can do as little work as him, and eventually Hank decides to quit his job. Because this puts Strickland under the 15 employee limit, meaning that they're no longer held to the ADA and Leon can be fired. Hank gets his job back at the end of the episode, and Maria is hired. This episode makes a point about people who misuse government programs to receive special treatment, making things worse for everyone else, especially the people who really do need to use the programs. It doesn't do this well, though, in part because it doesn't represent reality well. It uses an exaggerated version of the ADA that takes liberties on interpretation to make the point about Leon, which inadvertently sells audiences on an idea based on lies. That circumventing the rules in this way is much more common and more simple than the reality of the situation, and so it can turn people against helpful legislation due to this misunderstanding. But the episode itself focuses a bit more on Hank's denial of having made a poor hiring decision due to his inherent sexism than it does on the exploitation of the ADA, which only makes up the third act. Ironically enough, Hank discriminates against a qualified employee based on her gender, which is the thing that gets him into the mess in the first place. It shows that hiring practices based on old stereotypes still exist, and that had he had done the more politically correct thing from the beginning, then he would have had a more competent employee who would not have shut things down, the exact type of situation these laws are meant to prevent in the first place. Life in the Fast Lane, Bobby's Saga when Bobby asks Hank for money, Hank worries that the boy doesn't understand the value of a dollar, and he gets the boy a job at a racetrack to learn a lesson. But Bobby's boss is Jimmy Witchard, a mentally disabled man who makes unreasonable demands of Bobby and forces him to work hard, demeaning jobs. Bobby wants to quit after his first day, but Hank refuses to hear that and gives him platitudes about working 110%, which Bobby takes to heart. He gets promoted the next day, though the new position doesn't have any additional pay and significantly worse work than before. 
Meanwhile, Hank and co. are supporting Boomhauer in his ambitions to drive the pace car at a NASCAR race, serving as his pit crew while he winds up getting fourth. But while they're at the race hoping for enough crashes that Boomhauer gets sent in, Hank hears from Dale that Jimmy Wichard is insane from, from having stared at the sun too long. And when Hank sees Bobby about to cross the active racetrack, he confronts his son, learning that Bobby is merely trying to give 110%. Infuriated, Hank jumps the track himself, crossing the fence, and making good on his promise to kick the man's ass. By the end of the episode, Bobby still doesn't understand the real value of a dollar, asking his father to go back to the way things were where he doesn't have to think about cash. It's a lesson that he wouldn't have learned under Jimmy the way that anyone wouldn't learn the real value of work if that work is not properly compensated. Because it's a fact of life that one hour of hard work for some people is less valuable than an hour of easy work for others. If you have a Jimmy Witchard for a boss, then your time and effort end up getting less than another example used in this episode, Jeff Gordon who Hank dislikes as he believes that the man's had things handed to him. But despite that, one hour of driving from Gordon earns a lot more than Hank gets from an hour of propane sales, which will then earn more than Bobby gets from an hour of climbing stairs in the hot sun. And while to Hank there's an idea that simply keeping your nose down and working hard will eventually result in climbing the ladder, this aspect of the American dream does not exist for people who work with a Witchard or any other disconnected boss. Even Hank himself repeatedly grows disillusioned with Buck Strickland, but is too blinded by his loyalty to the concept of capitalism to realize that he's being exploited by it himself. In a fair world, Hank Hill would be a multimillionaire due to his work ethic. Peggy's Turtle Song When Bobby gets diagnosed with ADD at school due to having too much sugar with his breakfast, Peggy starts to feel concerned that he's not getting enough attention. So Bobby gets put on some medication while Peggy quits substitute teaching to stay at home full time. Hank is happy about this at first, but Peggy can't stand being cooped up all day and eventually starts taking guitar lessons to get out of the house. Her guitar teacher encourages her to write and later perform a song during a Mother's Day show, which Hank tries to stop her from doing as he wants a more traditional Mother's Day celebration. But when he calls his mother and she tells him about how boring and unfulfilling her life was as a stay-at-home mom, he realizes why Peggy was so intent on leaving. Peggy performs on stage that evening and Hank comes by to drop off Betsy, his guitar, encouraging Peggy not to sing a song about a depressed turtle, but one who finds fulfillment with a turtle named Hank. Meanwhile, Bobby stops taking his medication because of the side effects and gives a pill to Luann to focus on her beauty school exam but when the hills see the extreme effect it had on her, decide that maybe Bobby doesn't need the medication after all. Peggy's plot in this episode shows how restrictive her life is without her career, that the button-down life of the housewife is not for her, and that this old-fashioned idea of what a woman ought to do is no longer the type of thing that modern woman can find happiness from. But Hank worries that she's taking it too far, that spending time around alternative women is going to corrupt her, and have her mentality drift too far away from a tradition that's been around his whole life. It's not until he realizes that his own mother wasn't happy or content as a homemaker that Hank's mind is finally changed, that just because an idea is traditional doesn't mean that it's good. He wants to support his wife, he just doesn't have the right idea on what it is she wants or needs. The B-plot of this episode also touches on the overprescription of ADD medications that's been ongoing for years. As of making this video, there are ongoing shortages, which hurts the people who really need the assistance or who have valid reasons mentally. But even in the 90s, this was an issue of overprescription that benefited every party making the decision, but not the kids themselves. For the school, they're just trying to make the population more manageable, and the parents accept the diagnosis as a means to escape culpability for their child's action. It's not raising your child wrong if they have a disability. This ends up hurting the credibility of legitimate diagnoses and cheapening the actual disorder, all while diverting resources away from where they ought to be. Propane Boom Megalomart begins to sell propane, which puts pressure on Strickland, eventually resulting in the small business shutting down as they can't compete. Hank is put out of a job for a while, searching fruitlessly for other work and sales. Meanwhile, Luann is kicked out of beauty school for missing a tuition payment, and she starts to look for a job to raise the money. She starts to study to get a job working for Buckley in Megalomart's propane department, but Hank swallows his pride, giving up his crusade against the company, and takes the job before Luann can get it. 
The two feud over this for a while, with Hank getting repeatedly disrespected at his new job while Luann tries to get some sort of revenge, eventually settling on breaking up with Buckley at a Chuck Mangione concert held at the store. But Hank has plans for the concert as well, to wave a defaming banner and disrupt the performance with kazoos and air horns. But before he can start the distraction, a gas leak caused by an improperly handled propane tank makes an explosion, and the episode ends with several characters unaccounted for. This episode concludes the second season with a cliffhanger, leaving a few characters' whereabouts unknown. But it's obvious that a character like Hank wouldn't be killed off, and the family dynamic with Luann is still worth exploring enough that audiences should know she's safe as well. It goes to show that, when the cast of a show is strong enough, certain traits of its writing can remain intact, purely out of the writers doing whatever is the most interesting. Luann still has stories to tell, so she's going to be safe. But what this episode is also about is something that's been built up through the second season. Hank's dislike of large chain stores like Megalomart has been a staple of his character since the first episode, and several season 2 episodes have also alluded to the damage that these stores can do to the fabric of a small town. They lower prices using economies of scale, then, once their local competition is driven out, the prices are jacked up higher, with no one able to fight back against the monopoly. It's a staple of a capitalist economy that everyone is in a constant competition with one another, and a dollar cannot be earned without someone else losing it. And yet, despite traditional conservative values and capitalism going so closely together, the inevitable endpoint of an economy based on capital is to eventually scrub these small-town values out, replacing them with the cold corporate aesthetic. Season 3 Season 3 marked a change in staffing as Mike Judge stepped down as showrunner to focus on production, replaced by Richard Appel, who worked alongside series veteran Greg Daniels. As Daniels had always been at the heart of the characterization of the cast, this change marked a shift in the way that Season 3 approached episodes. Fewer episodes focused on some modern aspect of culture or politics, confronting the family through a newly introduced side character, and the focus was shifted instead towards plots about the main cast. So new locations, characters, and events occur less out of a desire to make commentary on that aspect of the real world, and more out of a desire to explore the reactions of the cast to these challenges and obstacles. Whether their preconceived notions of how things ought to be can stand up against reality, or if they have to undergo a personal arc. It's not to say that the episodes with more populist bins are altogether gone, only that the cast is becoming developed enough that these aren't the only ways to approach a new plotline. It's not solely that the change in showrunners caused this shift, but that the development of the characters enabled the shift to happen in the first place. But this was really the appeal of the show from the beginning. King of the Hill had a strong cast grounded in realism, and because we could relate to and understand these characters, and we could relate to their problems, the entire show was able to come across as so much more realistic than other shows on the air at the time. And with realism comes even more relatability, the two supporting each other. So the cast starts to feel like real people not only in how they're presented, but in how we think about their actions and reactions. Death of a Propane Salesman The episode picks up following the previous episode's cliffhanger ending. Firefighters are going through the rubble and they find Hank and Luann, as well as Chuck Mangione but Luann's hair didn't survive the explosion. Hank isn't processing the explosion very well, turning down an opportunity to go back to work or even to grill, and Peggy assumes that he's developed a fear of propane. Luann isn't processing the death of Buckley well either, using her lack of hair as a reason to make bold political statements. But when she finds a birthday card Buckley gave her, she finally begins to grieve, getting over it by talking to herself with the manger babies. Hank, meanwhile, learns from a grief counselor that his fear of propane is just a projection of his fear of death. And when trying to discuss this with the alley, Bobby overhears the conversation and fears for his father's well-being, running away from home. Hank tracks down his son and repeats a Buddhist story for with his own twist, finally internalizing the message and accepting what happened. Khan tells a story about a man hanging from a branch, faced with the inevitability of death, deciding to enjoy a strawberry instead of dwelling on his own doom. It's considered a joke by the funeral goers, who fail to comprehend why the story is relevant, as they themselves are the type to consider the tigers. Hank has always tried to live the life he's expected to live, rather than doing what he wants to do. He views momentary pleasures as a waste of time and money, and this is ultimately why he ends up shutting down at the thought of his own death. If Hank simply works himself to his grave, then what was any of it for? 
The previous episode asked how small-town values can coexist with capitalist systems if those systems profit by dismantling the low-profit simple lives that characters like Hank idolize. And here, Hank has to consider the opposite end of this question. If he merely focuses on doing things the right way for his whole life, then it's not really his life. He merely exists as the result of generations of peer pressure, with a larger focus on fitting into a mold than being Hank Hill. Those small moments in life, whether it's a strawberry growing out of a cliff or grilling a steak on a Sunday, are the real reason to keep on living. The episode ends with Hank sharing a moment with Bobby, who misunderstands the lesson on death his father was trying to teach him, but far from trying to force the lesson, he simply enjoys a little moment. And they call it Bobby Love. Bobby meets a girl at his school named Marie, who's smitten with his sense of humor. She invites him out a few times, and they even kiss in the alleyway. Bobby brags about his new relationship to his parents, but when they disapprove, Hank, as she's a vegetarian, and Peggy because she's two years older than him, he says they're only jealous, as Hank and Peggy never outwardly express their love. But when Bobby sees Marie dancing with other guys at a party, he starts to get jealous and possessive, with Marie telling him that they're not dating and that she didn't consider their relationship that kind of one. Bobby sulks over the breakup for a while, crying around the house until his parents take him out for a steak dinner. But when he sees Marie there, Bobby decides to order a 72-ounce steak, rare, and eat it in front of the entire restaurant as a sign that he's moved on. Meanwhile, Khan drops off his old couch in the alley and the gang touch it up, getting attached to it until it disappears one day, taken to Bill's house. Due to his lack of experience with romance, Bobby is unable to parse the type of relationship he has with Marie, her free-loving attitude reminiscent of countercultural movements from the late 60s, coming across as confusing to him, as what's considered friendship to her is considered romance to him. He misconstrues her affection for a deeper love, and he ends up heartbroken because of it. But it's not as though Bobby is completely to blame for this misunderstanding, as Marie's personality is viewed as far too, we'll say, extroverted to be normal. It's really just the optics of Marie's relationship to Bobby, the outward things, that are misrepresentative. The deeper aspects of their togetherness are not shared. While Marie might be okay with kissing Bobby, she's not close enough to compromise on her ideals for the guy, at least not in the same way that Hank and Peggy have adapted to each other's habits together. Bobby thinks that he's close enough with Marie to adopt her vegetarian ways, but Marie isn't willing to compromise with Bobby or adapt to his wants out of anything more than obligation. In the end, this was the real pronouncement of closeness that Hank and Peggy had that was lacking in the puppy love relationship of their son. Peggy's Headache When Peggy's favorite newspaper columnist retires, she considers sending in a sample script to apply for the job, but all the pressure to hit the deadline starts to give her a headache, and she goes to John Redcorn for a massage. This massage works, but Hank is terrified of his wife visiting the man, as Nancy is cheating on Dale with the guy, a relationship that started when he started treating her headaches. Hank tries to explain his reservations to Peggy, and only then does she realize the infidelity. Soon, she starts to freak out around the couple, unsure how to maintain the lie going on under their noses, and Peggy uses her job writing for the column to announce that she's going to tell the truth. But before she gets the chance to say it, Joseph comes over, and his interactions with Dale cause her to realize that, while Dale's not the boy's father, he's still his dad, and she decides against breaking the illusion. A popular fan theory for King of the Hill is the idea that Dale Gribble is aware of his wife's infidelity and doesn't bother to say or do anything about it, either because he wants what's best for his son, or he just wants his wife to be happy, or he enjoys the fact that he can taunt John Redcorn by raising his son in front of him. But this theory goes strongly against a core part of Dale's character, that despite being a conspiracy theorist primed to believe anything, he's totally unaware of the actual secret going on in his own house. Without this dramatic irony, there's much less appeal to his character, and it sells short much of the comedy behind who he is. Peggy in this episode also struggles with maintaining sanity upon learning about the infidelity going on under her nose, the idea that there's a great big lie no one's bothering to say anything about. And we can tell a lot about the mentality of other characters on Rainy Street by the way that they treat this issue. Many of them simply try to avoid bringing it up to prevent an awkward conversation. They prefer to let sleeping dogs lie, as it's unlikely that mentioning the affair will actually do anything to prevent it, possibly even making the situation worse as tempers could rise, and it's none of their business. 
In the end, it's nobody's business because they don't bother to make it their business. And this outcome, no matter your opinions on it, is what everyone believes is best for them, so why complain? Pregnant Pause Ladybird is in heat, and Hank tries to set her up with a stud as he's concerned that there may not be time for her to have puppies of her own. But when he finds out that she has a narrow uterus, mirroring Hank's narrow urethra, he grows concerned that she may never know motherhood. So he begins to research new ways to improve fertility, which reminds Peggy of her own attempts at having a child, and she grows resentful of the extra care Ladybird is getting that she never received. Meanwhile, Dale takes a four-hour bounty hunting course so that he can hunt humans, but when his first target has a house in the woods surrounded by guard dogs that he can't get past, Dale borrows Ladybird to use her hormones to distract the hounds while he goes inside. Hank and Peggy race to rescue their dog, but Peggy confronts Hank over the special treatment that his hound is getting over her. Then Hank admits the reason he never took the extra steps before. There's no romance in that. And he recalls how adopting Ladybird is what re-sparked the romance in their relationship in the first place. Hank and Peggy in this episode end up making the decision to have another child together, something that Hank wanted but didn't bring up, so he uses Ladybird's potential puppy as a surrogate for this desire, and something that Peggy herself doesn't bring up either, as she assumed Hank was more interested in his dog than in her. The entire episode is based on the two not communicating properly with each other, their passive goals and actions doing more to drive them apart than together. But with a little bit of prodding, they're finally able to admit a few of the things that went without saying as a re-pronouncement of their love, that Ladybird was a symbol of their relationship, just like Bobby. It's an interesting dynamic in that usually a couple having a child together to fix their marriage is viewed as a sign of toxicity, that they're dooming a child to be raised by a loveless marriage, and thus dooming them to become emotionally stunted. But it's not as though Hank and Peggy don't love each other, they're just poor at expressing this. And so, it wasn't that the child slash dog came first and the love came after, but that the love came first and they were able to conceive Bobby because they found it again. Next of Shin Following up on the previous episode, Hank and Peggy are trying for a baby, but due to Hank's low sperm count, they're unable to conceive again. While Hank is trying various methods to increase his count, Cotton makes an unannounced visit alongside Dee Dee, who is visibly pregnant. But while out shopping for baby supplies, Cotton begins to feel the pressure of being a parent, and runs off with Bobby where he tells the boy about his parents trying to conceive, before running off to Vegas. Bobby fears that he's being replaced, as if he wasn't good enough, or that he'd be viewed worse with more competition. Though when he's put in charge of the house while Hank leaves to track down his father, Bobby feels validated as useful again. After a search, Hank finds his father gambling and tells him that he's given up on having a child, which Cotton insults him for as he believes Hank would make a good father again. He eventually decides to come back, but not before the two get the chance to bond in Vegas together. Hank and Cotton have their differences put on display during this episode, which each of their stories paralleling in their opposites. Hank and Peggy would make good parents, Cotton would not, did not. Hank and Peggy are trying to have a child, Cotton and Dee Dee had one by accident. And while Hank is eager for the chance to be around children, Cotton balks at the thought of being a father again. But these opposites are things recognized by the characters. When Hank announces he's giving up on having another child, Cotton tells him off, knowing that Hank isn't like him and that he shouldn't try to feel the same way. Another way that this is shown is how in other characters react to potential changes to the dynamic. Bobby fears that he might be replaced by a hypothetical new Hill family member, and so he begins to work harder to take an interest in Hank's life and prove himself useful around the house. But Hank never worries that Cotton is trying to replace him, as he knows from the outset that he doesn't have to worry about competition. In part, this is because he's long since given up on trying to win his father's approval, knowing how little that's worth. But because he's already had the time to prove himself to his father, only to get nothing in return. Hank doesn't fear losing a love that he doesn't have, but Bobby, knowing that his parents love and respect him, has some anxiety at potentially losing that. Peggy's Pageant Fever Peggy gets the idea in her head to enter the Mrs. Heimlich County Beauty Pageant, with the grand prize being a new truck. But as she's meeting the other participants, she realizes how hopelessly outclassed she is, not just in terms of looks, but in terms of accolades and accomplishments. So she gets funding from Buck Strickland, who thought he was sponsoring Luann, to get a complete makeover. 
but when Luann messes up her highlights and gets replaced, and her attempts to bribe Nancy Gribble, one of the judges, do not succeed, Peggy starts to fear for her chances. She gets a complete makeover to the point of being unrecognizable, even going so far as to tape up her feet and ass. But when the contest is about to start, Hank, being realistic about the situation, arrives to sweep her off her feet in a new truck, which is really just his old one with a new paint job. Peggy has never valued her self-worth by her physical beauty, largely out of an acceptance that she won't be able to compete, masked as a trust in her other abilities. She's supremely confident in everything that she does, even if that confidence is misplaced, and usually that level of confidence is all that really is needed to make a passing effort at things. It's nerve-wracking to teach a classroom full of children, but Peggy considers herself the best at it, and that confidence is what gives her the necessary air of authority. But when she starts to go up against a woman outside of her caliber, it's a reality check for her abilities that makes her confidence in herself as a woman falter. But the purpose of confidence is less about your own abilities and more about the perception of those abilities to others and yourself. It's completely possible to fake your way through a situation for a short period of time, but it's much harder to fake a long-term commitment, such as a marriage. In the end, it's Hank's judgment of Peggy that matters more than any panel of pageant judges, as he's the one who's on the receiving end of Peggy for the majority of the time. As long as the people who are closest to you find you to be a worthy person, that's all that really matters. Nine Pretty Darn Angry Men Hank invites his friends to a lawnmower focus group the day after Thanksgiving, a holiday that Cotton ruins by showing up unannounced and trash-talking everything from the food to Hank's mother. The next day, the group goes to the mall. Peggy plans on doing all of her shopping as early as possible, but due to staying up the whole night clipping coupons, she falls asleep while having her shoe repaired. Bobby and Luann go ice skating, so Luann can get back into the dating pool, her reservations disappearing when she sees the ghost of Buckley. Tilly and Dee Dee lament how little Hank stands up to his father until they walk in on the focus group. There, Hank is trying to defend his old model of mower against the new one, which, despite having many more features, isn't actually an improvement on the tried and true version. He has to convince the other focus group members one by one that the features they adore are actually negatives, until getting to Cotton, who only dislikes the mower because Hank likes it. He ends up telling off his father in front of Tilly, and Cotton storms out, with the family returning home later, minus the still-sleeping Peggy. It's not subtext in this episode that Hank views his lawnmower the same way he views his birth mother, reliable and not worth getting rid of for something newer just because you can. To Hank, the idea of getting rid of something that works is abhorrent and a symptom of a person who can't recognize the good things in their life and therefore, who doesn't deserve them, as Hank thinks that anything you earn will be something that you also appreciate. Discarding Tilly like she's an object is a bit like saying that he didn't earn the right to be with her, and that Cotton's the one who should have been dumped instead of the other way around. There would be a more unfortunate connotation to this episode's message derived from Hank treating his mother like a lawnmower and Tilly like the new model, the idea that he's treating women like objects at all instead of people, but it's avoided by the fact that Hank Hill really does love his mower. It's not so much that he's treating people like objects, but that he's treating objects like people. This is put into contrast with Cotton, who does the same connotation but flipped, in the sense that he views everybody as an object, even the people close to him. Hank only exists to embarrass him, Dale and Bobby are only valuable when they agree with him, and relationships with other people are all about whatever it is he personally stands to gain. Good Hill Hunting It's hunting season, and everybody on the block is taking their kids out to kill a deer, viewing it as a rite of passage. But Hank hesitates on buying the hunting permits as he's afraid of spending two days in the woods alone with Bobby, not knowing what they could talk about out there. Peggy convinces him to go out and get the permits, though, as she doesn't want Bobby to fail at his rite of passage and stay as a boy forever. But due to his hesitation, Hank ends up not being able to get a permit for the boy, and he has to shut down Bobby's dreams. But seeing how much Bobby wanted to hunt, he finds a resort, La Grunta, where all of the amenities are taken care of for you. Yet while the two are out hunting together, Bobby begins to realize that it's not the same, and he refrains from shooting a deer. Later on the ride home, Bobby is optimistic that he'll be able to spend another year learning how to be a man from his father, so Hank decides that he can drive his truck for a while. And then Bobby runs over a deer, giving the episode a happy ending. 
The idea of killing for sport as a rite of passage is, despite what this episode brings up, not as much of a historical rite as it pretends that it is. Much in the same way that lawns and trucks and the like are recent inventions, hunting is a cultural invention of recent decades that merely borrows the set dressing of being an ancient and storied passage among early humans to make itself seem like anything other than an excuse for middle-class office workers to get out of the house. But traditions and rites like this are never actually about how long-standing they are or, or how many generations have upheld the belief. They're social tools, things meant to make a person feel a sense of belonging into a group. And that's the way that Bobby sees it. The way that hunting is viewed by the narrative is a different thing, though. I've reviewed Moral Oral and The Simpsons episodes based on this concept of hunting that viewed it as a misappropriated form of toughening up a boy into a man. But King of the Hill is a show that doesn't portray hunting as a wicked thing to do, or some sort of masculinity substitute. Rather, it's a bonding activity between a father and his child. The narrative still paints it as an excuse for the real development, which is something that's earned when Hank gets over his awkwardness around the boy, and the two are finally able to get along at La Grunta. Killing the deer at the end of the episode is just a way of tying everything together. Pretty, pretty dresses. It's Christmas time, or the anniversary of the day that Lenore left Bill. He's sulking much more than usual, ruining multiple dinners with the Hill family by bringing up old lost loves and bringing an iguana until he's eventually kicked out. But after he tries to jump off the roof of his house, the rest of the alley has to make time to watch over him, which winds up being solely Hank's responsibility. Eventually, Hank snaps from the constant exhaustion of watching his friend, and he tells the guy off, screaming that Lenore is gone and she's never coming back. Hank fears he was too harsh, but Bill seems to accept the answer, until Hank discovers Bill dressed in Lenore's old clothes, pretending to be her. He tries living his life as his ex-wife for a while, eventually shows up to Hank's Christmas party in the dress. The partygoers start to admonish Bill before Hank comes out in one of Peggy's dresses to lure Bill away from the public. Then, pretending to be Lenore, he tells off Bill for good, and Bill responds by saying that he deserved better. Once he's snapped out of it, Bill realizes that he hit rock bottom, meaning it's all uphill from there. Bill was never able to get any sense of closure from his relationship with Lenore, with the woman walking out on him without so much as a goodbye. Over the years, he's become obsessed with the woman, or rather, he's become obsessed with the idea of Lenore. Because from everything we've heard about her up to this point, including an appearance by the woman herself in a later season, she's not at all the type of person characterized by Bill's impression of her at the third act of the episode. The fact that Hank was able to convince Bill's damaged mind that he himself was Lenore as well is only further proof of the fact that he more or less does not remember who Lenore was at all. This episode ends up getting put more into context into the toxicity that Bill puts up with, not only from the woman in his life, such as Leanne back in season 2, or Lunauer through their marriage, but from his friends as well. Bill is such a pushover that he's willing to put up with constant verbal abuse from his friends, and that's what he accepts from the people who like him, or at least tolerate him. His mental state is so thoroughly tied to the people that he becomes dependent on that he cannot consider himself as a person worthy of his own company, trying to slam his head in a drawer or inhale the fumes from an electric oven. But by getting rid of the Lenore-shaped hole in his heart, he's finally able to let his mind take over his psyche. A firefighting we will go. The episode starts with Hank, Dale, Bill, and Boomhauer being interrogated for something major. It then flashes back to days earlier, where the guys are told about a firefighter strike that necessitates more volunteers. They take the position, but it's clear that nobody knows what they're doing as they argue and fight with one another. The oldest firefighter in Arlen, Chet Elderson, passes away, and they argue even further after botching his funeral. Finally, they're called to their first real emergency, which was taken care of without them, and when they return, they find that the firehouse burnt to the ground. Each man offers a different account of events, with Boomhauer's tanning bed, Dale's cigarette, and Bill's toaster oven all being prime suspects. But when it's Hank's turn to tell his story, he realizes that it was Chet Elderson's favorite sign being left plugged in that did it, and after realizing that his friends still respected him despite their arguments, he blames the dead man, and they're all let go. From everything we've seen up to this point, it's a wonder why the men of Rainy Street even bothered to spend time together at all if they're constantly at each other's throats. Boomhauer seems to have the most life outside of his friend circle with an active social life without them. Bill, we saw last episode, mostly spends time around whoever tolerates him. Hank mostly seems to hang out with the guys because of inertia. He knew them in high school and doesn't like to shake things up. 
and Dale considers his friends as stupid for not knowing the same conspiracies he does. It's a wonder why any of the men hang out together in the first place, and how they'd all end up owning houses on the same street as adults. But their group dynamic is more of a writer's tool than anything else. Having four clashing temperaments for your main characters allows a variety of reactions to different scenarios. The writers can pick and choose who they wish to include in a plot based on who has something to contribute to said plot. It's the reason why Boomhauer gets the least development, because he doesn't talk enough for any more than a single punchline to occur, and thus doesn't get brought along as often. And of course, Dale, being the most outspoken of the group, ends up having the most plot involvement of anybody of the side cast. To spank with love. Peggy is substitute teaching Spanish for a week, but when she struggles to get a misbehaving student, Dooley, under control, and gets a needs improvement on her evaluation, she begins to feel stressed, peaking when Dooley pants her during class, which she reacts to by spanking the kid. Despite the child's parents being understanding of the situation, she gets fired anyway, and she spends a while sulking until Cotton hears of the reason that she was fired. He gets some of his buddies from the Arlen VFW to rally together, including Hank's old principal, who disciplined thousands of students in his day, and they give her the old paddle and her job back. For the next few days, she's known as Paddle and Peggy by the students, ruling through fear and keeping students in order with threats. But she starts to learn that students, including her own son, are afraid of her, culminating in Peggy panicking when her paddle is thrown out and discovered in the Gribble family's garbage. She accuses Joseph and threatens to beat him, but when Dale confesses and she realizes what she's becoming, Peggy decides to drop the Paddle and Peggy persona, instead keeping students in line by making her lessons more entertaining. In the original script for this episode, the school board praised Peggy for spanking Dooley, promoting her teaching ideals as something others ought to look up to, as she began to discipline students more and more frequently. But this was rewritten, following the table read, to make the district less supportive and for Peggy to lose her job instead. The version of the story we got was one much closer to the typical themes of King of the Hill. It's the veterans and the older folks who support Peggy while the kids think it's abhorrent and the adults are caught in the middle. Hank and co. are outwardly supportive, but largely as a means of justifying their own punishment, instead of coming across as though they were complaining. But both episodes kept one thing consistent. Peggy herself is the one who becomes disgusted at the person she's become, obsessed with violence as a part of her self-image, rather than any actual disciplinary benefit that corporal punishment could have. If a child is too young to understand reason, then they won't understand why they're being struck. If they're old enough to understand reason, then you should try reason first. Peggy has a view of herself as a good substitute teacher, and she believes that spanking is a final resort, after every other option is tried, so for her to have built an identity around a last resort is to build an identity around failure. Three Coaches and a Bobby Bobby's football team, the Cougars, is repeatedly losing games to other teams, and the parents try to give some advice to the coach, who quits. Reminiscing on their high school football days, the Alley decide to get their old football coach, Sowers, out of retirement to whip the Cougars into shape. He takes the job and begins running drills on the kids, many of whom leave to join The Wind, Arlen's youth soccer team. This includes Joseph, their best player, and Bobby. Eventually, Hank comes across a practice where Sowers is trying to run over the kids with his car, and he realizes the old man is insane, so he tells the guy off and takes over. But as the Cougars have lost so many players, they're still losing games, until Bobby, now disillusioned with soccer, convinces all his old friends to return to their old sport. Meanwhile, Peggy tries to fit in with the soccer moms, but can't stand their company, so she quits and returns to rooting for the football team. No matter how good a coach is, he's worthless without a good team to back him up. No matter how good a team is, they still need a good coach to guide them in the right direction. And there are so many other factors that also go into deciding the quality of a team that to give the credit to one source is a misattribution. But Hank and his friends equate the quality of their high school sports careers to Coach Sowers, largely because he was the loudest person to try to take credit. Naturally, because one person does not make a team, one person cannot also fix a team, a lesson that Hanks learns harshly in this episode when he realizes that Sowers has lost his mind, assuming that he had it in the first place. Hank wants to go back to the way things were without understanding why things were that way, and an aspect of this desire is to avoid the way things are becoming. He hates soccer as it's too new wave and represents the opposite of his high school days, where coaches were more physically abusive to their players when they weren't verbally abusing them, as the soccer coach is focusing more on supporting his athletes and keeping a good vibe. 
but in the end, Hank recognizes that reclaiming the good old days doesn't mean emulating parts of them without context, but instead trying to recapture the feeling through other means. Ultimately, Bobby is happier on a losing team because Hank found a way to capture that feeling. Deconstructing Henry Khan is trying to brag to an unimpressed Hank, so to prove that his new job is better, he takes the guy to his office under the guise of trying to buy propane and shows off a new top-secret government contract. But when Hank tells Bill, and Bill tells a general, Khan gets fired, and he takes it out on Hank and his neighbors. He refuses to accept reality as he constantly acts better than everybody at his new job, which gets him fired again, and soon Hank is guilted by Peggy into trying to help out at the Sufanusen phone residence. Hank begins to do all the things that Khan used to do while the guy is absent, nowhere to be seen, which causes Peggy to start growing resentful that her husband is being spoiled by another woman. Eventually, Hank finds Khan's car and sees the guy living in a restaurant's bathroom, where he opens up about the high expectations on his shoulders. In the end, Khan arrives back home with a new job, waking up the whole neighborhood to brag about it. It's revealed in this episode that Khan and Min have been living paycheck to paycheck, that despite having so many nicer things than all their neighbors, they don't actually have any more wealth than the others. For Khan, his pursuit of work and wealth is about prestige. To follow the American dream as an immigrant is to win at capitalism, to try and get as much money as possible, to not only look better than everyone else, but to be better. The idea that a person's worth is equal to their net worth. So to have a lot of nice things means that he's winning compared to all of his neighbors, who are losers because they value things other than money. At the end of the episode, Khan tries to get his family to move to Houston with him, but Min refuses to go with him as she's become attached to the neighbors. This is something that, despite his complaints, Khan still accepts as he too has realized that his neighborhood has some intrinsic value. The Sufa Nusen phones were driven out of every other community they lived in prior to Arlen due to Khan's personality. But the fact that he's willing to put up with Hank Co. means that he's starting to come around on the idea of neighbors being a priceless commodity, even if he won't yet admit that. The Wedding of Bobby Hill Bobby is put in charge of watching Boomhauer's house while he's away meeting a woman he met online. Luann meets a new guy, Rad the Badeix, who is a self-proclaimed genius. He dates Luann for a while until he learns that Bobby is house-sitting and then throws a party in the vacant home. When Luann realizes she's being taken advantage of, she breaks up with Rad and calls Hank over to kick out the party-goers, admonishing Bobby for his irresponsibility. Bobby and Luann each blame the other for their situation, and they begin a prank war, which culminates in Bobby swapping out Luann's birth control. When Hank and Peggy find out about this, they decide to teach Bobby a lesson by telling him he's caused his cousin to become pregnant, and they throw a fake shotgun wedding between the two, with Luann in on the prank. At least, mostly, as they tell Luann that Bill was a real ordained minister, and that the wedding actually happened. Both kids are distraught for a while until Bill finally lets the secret out, and Bobby and Luann go back to being unmarried, telling the other about all the pranks still out there. Bobby still recognizes that he's a child and also still has a ways to go, insofar as growing up. This is in part why he's so eager to consistently take after characters like Rad. He views the other guy as being mature, and therefore latches onto him as a role model. But this acknowledgement is also why he's so nervous about the fake wedding to Luann. He's still a kid, a kid who wants to be an adult, but he knows that he's still far from that point, and so the responsibilities of being an adult terrify him as much as the privileges thrill him. But Hank and Peggy know all too well how much freedom is sacrificed for the sake of getting things done. When you're an adult, you can do whatever you want to, but part of that maturity is knowing better. Unfortunately, you're bound to make several mistakes in life when those two aspects aren't growing in tandem, like Luann dating Rad. She's old enough to have that freedom, but it hasn't quite caught up to her that she needs to self-regulate. There's a bit of a missed opportunity here to show Hank and Peggy faulting on the other side of caution, to have bound themselves with so much responsibility that they no longer know how to enjoy that freedom, but the episode was already pretty packed, and so it never got said. Slight of Hank Hank and Peggy are arguing over the paint in Bobby's room, specifically that it has clouds and Hank believes the boy is too old for them. 
Later, they're taken to a magic show as a part of Nancy Gribble's birthday party, and Hank is unimpressed with the magician's act, although Peggy loves it, especially when she's called onto the stage to participate in one of the tricks. Hank becomes obsessed with a trick involving a pinata that Peggy was a part of, trying and failing to reconstruct the set to learn how it could have been done. Later on, he goes back to the magic show to try and use Luann as a plant so she can reveal it to him, and takes Bobby along to ruin magic for him in the process. But between Hank and Peggy's discussion on the trick, Bobby starts to take a greater interest in magic and does a Sunday school performance, likening Jesus to a magician that does not go over well. On the way back from church, the two are arguing over who influenced Bobby to behave that way, and he starts to worry that he caused his parents to hate each other. His attempts at getting them back together only ramp up the argument, which turns into a kicking each other in the shins match, somehow ending the argument. The end of this episode teaches the lesson that some things just aren't meant to be understood logically. Occasionally, you have to accept the results at face value and have a bit of faith in how they got there, enjoying the experience instead of trying to understand it. Hank and Peggy argue over their differing senses of creativity, and they both learn this lesson in a roundabout way. It's not that Hank understands Peggy, or vice versa, it's that they appreciate each other in spite of this, likening their relationship to the magic trick from earlier. But Bobby ends up not understanding his parents, trying to apply logic from Joseph to get them back together and having the plan backfire. Because he's not a part of the relationship, he doesn't have the out of appreciating it. So from an outsider's perspective, it appears that they may have ended up divorcing over the disagreement, as he's not privy to the hundreds of little reasons why that doesn't make sense. And this is also why he doesn't understand why they got back together. He wasn't there to see it happen, and even if he was, it wouldn't make sense to him due to lacking information. Also, the trick is explained at the end of the episode as a trapdoor behind the pinata. When rewinding the episode, you can even see Peggy leaving backstage, dressed as an assistant. John Vitti presents Return to La Grunta. Tired of always having to lend her money, Hank gets Luann a job as the drink girl at La Grunta's golf course. Once she has money of her own to spend, she decides to pay Hank back by giving him a gift certificate to go swimming with Duke the Dolphin. Hank enjoys the swim for a while, until Duke turns on him, dragging him underwater where Hank is sexually assaulted by the creature. The hotel pays him off with a series of gifts, and he and Luann agree never to speak about it. But later, Luann gets groped while working on the golf course, and mimicking Hank's behavior, she decides to start dressing in baggy clothes and keeping what happened to herself. Realizing the bad influence he's had on her, Hank decides to come clean about the incident, telling Peggy and the alley about it. He takes all the gifts the hotel gave to him back, refusing to accept being silenced. And while he's there, sees Luann getting harassed again, and grabs the guy doing the harassment, throwing him in the pool with Duke, who then assaults him. A lot of Hank's conservative ideology is about trying to keep things the way they are by not rocking the boat, so to speak. There's an idea that things are good, so any potential change is more likely to make things worse than better. But this is only true when the current state of society is good. For a woman like Luann, getting sexually harassed while working or living was a common part of life in the mid-20th century and before. But this, of course, was not true for people like Hank. If you were a straight, white, middle-class man, then a lot of problems that others faced simply did not apply to you. So the Hank Hills of the world often refuse to acknowledge or empathize with why others would complain. After all, they themselves were doing fine. But here, Hank gets to experience firsthand what it's like when someone is assaulted by a person, or dolphin, with enough of a position of influence that the incident would be covered up. La Grunta doesn't want to lose its dolphin exhibit, so they're willing to hide the incident involving Hank, and seeing him become complicit with this for his own sake is what encourages Luann to mimic the behavior. She might risk losing her job if she complains to the wrong person, and if there's a stigma at all around victimhood, then she can lose a lot more as well. It takes Hank deciding not to be ashamed to finally encourage a ripple effect that finally results in the sexual deviant dolphin getting taken away. Escape from Party Island Hank's mother Tilly and a group of her friends are on their way to Port Aransas to view a museum of miniatures. But Hank is concerned about his mother driving and volunteers to take the woman himself. They arrive in the city despite the woman complaining about Hank the whole time, and he's bored as they all look in awe at the various miniatures. But later that evening, groups of college kids start to arrive and Hank realizes that they're there during spring break, with the all-night partying turning the island into chaos. 
He tries to keep the woman insulated from the party goers and eventually demands that they all leave, having to fight his way through the college students to get them all corralled into one place. But while searching for his mother, he learns from Lyle Neff, who makes most of the miniatures, how often older women use the glass crafts as an escape from their lives, a lesson that applies to Tilly as well. He buys her a model of the LA airport as an apology, and the group leaves the island before it's completely overrun by partying. Back in Arlen, Bill is convinced that Hank has left Peggy and tries to woo her, only for Peggy to tell him off and eventually push him off the bleachers at a Little League game. Hank goes unappreciated in this episode for everything that he does to protect the old woman from the partygoers during spring break, and in the same vein, he underappreciates the value that the miniatures gave to Tilly back when she was trying to put up with Cotton's antics. Cotton and a bunch of drunk college students being equated in this episode. This is why, after racing across the island to try to find his mother while she is searching for her unicorn, he doesn't end up telling her off for putting herself in danger. To Tilly, the greater danger exists from having to confront the decades of abuse that Cotton put her through than to have to put up with the inherent danger posed by copious consumption of alcohol on the island. Hank doesn't manage to get all of the women to cooperate with leaving the island until he starts to act firmly with them, which doesn't win him any popularity with the group, but that's not the point. This is also reflected in the Peggy and Bill plotline, as Peggy is firm in her rejection of Bill from the beginning, a rejection that he refuses to accept. Bill projects his own insecurities onto Peggy and Hank's relationship, and believes that it's doomed to the same end as his own, partially why he doesn't accept it when Peggy says no. But there's a bit more respect given from Tilly's friends when Hank rejects their pleas to spend more time on the island, even if they don't show it quite so outwardly. Love hurts, and so does art. Bobby falls in love with a New York-style deli and begins sneaking out to eat there regularly. But when he develops gout from all the meats, his chances of being able to go to a middle school dance go out the window. And he prefers it this way as he's concerned over the fact that his relationship with Connie might become complicated if the two kiss at the end of the dance. So he starts floating up on more and more meat to prevent having to dance with her, something which Connie views as proof that Bobby doesn't like her. When he realizes that he does like Connie more than he likes meat, he hops to the dance and fights through the pain, the advice his father had hoped to give to him. Meanwhile, Hank is fighting the Dallas Museum of Modern Art over its inclusion of an exhibit that uses Hank's clogged colon from the episode Hank's Unmentionable Problem, eventually learning from Buck Strickland that it's a crime in the state of Texas to disparage beef, a law he enforces to get the picture taken down. Bobby is nervous about his relationship with Connie developing, citing previous heartbreaks as proof that adding an additional complexity to the romance can only result in making things worse. He's happy with the state of things between the two of them, and doesn't want to take any risks at changing things for the better or worse. But without some risk, nothing ever changes. This might be fine for Bobby, but Connie is more willing to take a chance to improve things, seen here when she lies about having a date in order to make Bobby jealous enough to try to win her back. Bobby himself is at least semi-aware of this fact as well. He knows that he needs to eventually take a chance, but fears the end result. So he begins to eat incessantly, so that he might be able to avoid confronting the situation head-on. As long as he has gout, he has an excuse to put off a decision even longer. But getting gout in Bobby's case is a decision in and of itself, which is why Connie is upset with his choice. Back to Hank, he fears his privacy being violated by the use of his colon in an art exhibit, made worse by the fact that it's in a modern art museum, which he doesn't understand in the first place. While HIPAA wouldn't take effect in Texas until two years after this episode aired, he still views it as a violation of his rights, but it's not until he learns that disparaging beef also disparages propane that he really begins to take offense. So much so, in fact, that he's willing to take the uncharacteristic approach of litigation to defend himself. Hank's Cowboy Movie Hank and Bobby make a road trip to Wichita Falls, Texas so they can watch the Dallas Cowboys training camp. And while there, Bobby enjoys all the sights and sounds of the other city, lamenting at how boring his hometown is once they return. Realizing that there's no future in Arlen, Hank gets the alley together to film a movie that they plan on sending in to the Dallas Cowboys in order to convince them to move their training camp to the town. 
Hank tries directing the movie, with Peggy writing the script and Nancy as the spokeswoman, but a series of disagreements and arguments over the film results in everyone leaving but Hank, who films a terrible movie in their absence. When Bobby and Peggy see him talking to his Tom Landry plate, apologizing for his failure, Peggy decides to make his dream come true, gathering home movies from the street and having them edited together in a highlight reel of the community's best moments. This film ends up not getting them the movie that they wanted, but Bobby and Hank still end up bonding over the fact that Bobby won't be moving out anytime soon. Hank loves his hometown, loves the cowboys, and loves his son, and he wants everything to stay together for as long as possible. Once he starts to realize the reality that Bobby won't stay around forever, he begins to search for a way to keep things the way they are, to capture this moment in his life and have it stick around forever. If he can show off how great his town is and let other people see Arlen the way he sees it, then perhaps he can convince not just the cowboys, but the whole world that things ought to stop changing. A major theme of King of the Hill is about Hank's anxieties over the changing world that he lives in. He has a great deal of satisfaction with his life with the few things that bother him all coming from outside influences, someone or something different challenging the status quo. But to Hank, the only reason a person would dare to change the world is if they're dissatisfied with it, which is a fair assumption to make, and his counter-strategy is to show how good things are. This ends up being done through the film at the end. All the shared memories that Rainy Street has show him just how great his life is. And although it's not enough to convince Bobby to stay or the cowboys to come over, it's still enough that Hank himself can be satisfied with his life thus far. And if things were good, and are still good, then you can count on the fact that they will continue to be good. Dogdale Afternoon Dale borrows Hank's mower and takes it for a joyride, mistreating it and leaving it near a gas station. Later on, he buys a new mower and begins to brag about how much better it is than everyone else's. So to humble him, Hank, Bill, and Boomhauer steal Dale's lawnmower and hide it in Hank's garage, sending him taunting letters about it to mess with him as he leans further and further into conspiratorial thinking about its whereabouts. But when Bobby finds the mower and doesn't understand why his father would play this sort of prank on a friend, Hank returns the mower with the intention of revealing the ruse. But Bill sees Dale at the top of the university's tower holding his spray wand and believes that the man has snapped. The tower is surrounded by police who believe that he's a sniper, and Hank has to go up there to talk them down. As they're descending the stairs, a vigilante takes a shot at Dale, which Hank dies in front of, saving the man's life after it's revealed that he had a bulletproof vest. Dale has always been portrayed as a harmless individual, but mostly through the eyes of his friends and neighbors who know him well. From an outsider's perspective, it would be easy to make the connection between his skeptical views on everything and potentially harmful methods of thinking. Even in the 90s, most conspiracy theorists were just anti-Semites with extra steps. We see this in the vigilantes who try to shoot at Dale despite the police already having the tower surrounded. They believe they're more correct than everybody else, and as a result, nearly get Hank killed. Much of the appeal to this type of, they don't want you to know, thinking isn't about being smart, but about feeling smart, the way that Dale gets his new mower, mostly so he can show off. Dale himself has also developed significantly since his earlier iterations. At first he was just a small government libertarian stereotype with more free time than common sense. While he exposited the occasional theory during episodes, he rarely acted on these and was much more down to earth. But as the seasons went on, he became flanderized to the point of being little more than a single aspect of the initial pitch. His voice even became higher, goofier, as the seasons went on to reflect how disconnected he's become to the real world. His initial unawareness of Nancy's affair went from believable to comical, as did the rest of his characterization. Revenge of the Ludafisk the church's pastor announces his retirement, announcing his replacement as a Minnesota woman named Karen Stroop. Despite the congregation's initial anxieties about a female minister, Hank and the others quickly warm up to her at a potluck held the Saturday before her first sermon. But Bobby secretly eats all the lutefisk, a dish Karen brought, and throws out the evidence before he gets caught, making it look as though somebody threw out the dish as a sort of protest against her joining the church. The next day, Bobby is feeling guilty slash gassy over eating all the fish, and goes to the bathroom where Cotton Hill has just stormed off to after announcing his displeasure towards a female pastor. He lights some matches to ward off the smell, which Bobby ends up using to try to dispose of the evidence, which then catches the bathroom on fire, eventually burning down the whole church. 
Everybody assumes Cotton did it, and he's even arrested by the arson investigator. But after meeting up with Dee Dee, who tells him about taking responsibilities for once accidents while discussing her unborn child, Bobby decides to confess to the arson to his family. But instead of going to the police about it, Cotton volunteers to confess in his stead, as he's old and Bobby has his whole life ahead of him. Bobby was, at first, embarrassed about eating all the lutefisk, hiding the evidence more so out of shame than anything else. But when the rest of the churchgoers begin to suspect a hate crime was at play, he can't confess due to the association the fish now had. As the time went on, more and more people began to get behind the idea that Karen Stroop was being attacked for her gender, making everything Bobby did behind the scenes gain a worse and worse appearance, instead of the more innocent reasoning behind his actions. He's not a sexist setting out to hurt women, just a kid who likes fish a bit too much, but by the midpoint of the episode, that's not what anybody is prepared to see. This is the major reason why Cotton is declared guilty. His motivations match up with the motivations everyone assumes the arsonist had, even though his story doesn't actually match with both crimes, as he wasn't even in Arlen when the Lutefisk was thrown out. But once the mob starts demanding justice, they don't really care where or how that justice is dispensed, willing to lock up Cotton more for his character than his actual actions. And while there's a lesson to be taught here about a bad personality getting you in more trouble than you're actually culpable for, the real moral comes from Bobby not confessing earlier. If he'd admitted it from the start, it would have easily been played off as Karen being a great cook instead of a hate crime. Death and Texas Peggy receives a letter from a death row convict describing how she was the most influential person in his life, and when she visits the man, he explains that he wants to be taught how to read. Peggy, won over by his words, decides to come over once a week to help the man out, eventually playing boggle with him and bringing his boggle set from his house. Hank is mortified that Peggy is visiting a death row inmate, saying that he can't be trusted and that he's not worth her time, to which Peggy doubles down on teaching the man to prove her husband wrong. But he continuously loses the timers and asks Peggy to bring him more and more, and soon it's revealed that the sand she's been bringing in is actually coke. He threatens Peggy to bring more, stating that he'll snitch on her as a drug mule if she doesn't. But when Hank and Peggy decide to come clean about it, it turns into his word against hers, and since he sold all the evidence against her, he's simply taken back to jail with Peggy getting away with it. Peggy tries to prove herself by teaching a death row inmate to read, mostly because she was told not to do it. That's just her personality. When Peggy is told no, she assumes she's being told as such as an insult to her abilities, rather than because it's a bad idea. Her oversized ego is what motivates her to do almost everything, and this is something that, while shamed by the narrative, is never viewed negatively by Hank himself. He has the opportunity to gloat and say, I told you so to her, but refuses to do so as he himself knows his wife well enough to understand that saying such a thing would only damage her ego, one of the best parts about her. Because while Peggy may not be as smart as she thinks she is, she's still as nice as she believes herself to be. Her entire motivation in this episode was to teach a death row inmate how to read after the rest of society had given up on him. Not necessarily something that a person ought to be shamed for. So many of her other actions are also motivated by spreading her intelligence to others. It's the reasons she substitute teaches in the first place. Peggy is a good person, she's just bad at it, and a person's perception of her largely depends on if they're judging her actions or her intentions. Wings of the Dope Luann tries to re-enroll in beauty school where there's a test coming up that she's unprepared for. Meanwhile, Hank and the alley convince Khan to let them fix his trampoline, which he got from Buckley's estate. While they're fixing it up, Luann sees Buckley's angel jumping on it and joins him, with the religious experience giving her the motivation to keep studying and stop crying. Hank is excited for her to have this boon despite not believing in the angel himself, but the rest of the neighborhood begins to worship slash fear the trampoline, asking it for miracles and the like. Even Luann, who starts to depend on Buckley's angel to give her guidance, but stops receiving it. She stays up all night studying with Peggy, only to end up crashing her car when she argues with Buckley's angel on the drive to the exam, where a group of community college students see her, asking her if she's alright. Luann ends up dropping out of beauty school and getting her tuition refunded, going instead to community college. Back on Rainy Street, Hank sprays his friends with the hose to get them out of their religious fervor. 
This episode adds to the continuity of King of the Hill by changing the path Luann is taking through life, sending her to a community college instead of beauty school. Later in the show's run, she'll return to beauty school after dropping out of college, giving a sort of roundabout sort of nothingness to her arc that results in her character going nowhere, but this is by design. Characters in TV shows are standardized as King of the Hill are rarely developed beyond a basic premise in order to make the episodes viewable in any order. And while Mike Judd would butt heads with Fox over the level of serialization in the show, we ultimately did get something with the desire to keep things consistent. So Luann never gets to graduate beauty school and move out, because that would either mean writing her out of most plots, or contriving a way to keep her around in some other capacity, which does end up happening. But it's not to say that her shift to community college is a pointless endeavor either. King of the Hill is a show that tries to make statements and put its characters into relatable situations in order to present an issue or argument. So to have Luann enter community college creates opportunities to involve her in different types of plots that don't revolve around beauty school as a setting, something that two male showrunners would likely struggle to relate to, whereas having a college-educated character is much easier to write for due to the shared experience. Take me out of the ball game. The Chamber of Commerce is hosting an Arlen co-ed softball team, and Hank is put in charge of coaching for Strickland Propane. Thatterton announces that he has a former Texas Ranger on his team, as he's married to one of his employees, so Hank tries to convince Peggy to join as pitcher, knowing she's talented at it. She's hesitant to play, as Hank has never fully supported her softball career, but when she overhears Coach Kleehammer saying that woman can't play, she decides to prove him wrong. Strickland starts winning games due to Peggy shutting out the other teams, but Hank refuses to acknowledge that she's their star player, giving himself all the credit for his coaching. After an argument between the two, Peggy starts to lose her ability to pitch, and Hank later realizes that his presence makes her unable to focus. So he takes himself out of the game, allowing Peggy to strike out the former Major League player to win the league. In the B-plot, Bobby tries to compete against the Arrow Girls' cookie sales by begging his own, causing a feud between himself and Connie as a proxy for their relationship. But when the other girls start destroying his cookie stand, Connie stands up for him, and the two announce that they're dating in earnest. Hank has ambitions of being a great coach, even likening his position to Tom Landry at the start of the episode. As such, he tries to take credit for every little thing that his team does well, despite how limited his actual involvement was, which is a lesson that he ought to have learned from earlier in the season, from the episode Three Coaches and a Bobby. But his refusal to learn and adapt from past lessons is ultimately what puts his career and the softball team in jeopardy. He tries to drill fundamentals into Peggy's mind, despite her already being a competent pitcher without his aid. He fails to make the connection between his help and the reality of the team's situation until the very end of the episode. Bobby takes after his father in this way, though with a slight difference. While Hank is oblivious to the idea that things might not fit his worldview, Bobby is aware that he and Connie's relationship has evolved from the way that it once was, but he refuses to accept or adapt to this change. His story is one of active resistance, while Hank resists the change of acknowledging that his wife can play more passively. But Bobby gets the excuse of nervousness, that his evolving relationship could lead to a conflict, such as the argument over their differing cookies. Whereas Hank simply doesn't accept the fact that he might be wrong in the first place, Bobby is secretly hoping that his fears about himself and Connie are wrong. As Old As The Hills Hank and Peggy invite the whole neighborhood over to their 20th wedding anniversary, where Hank has a slideshow of all their best moments. But Peggy is lamenting over the fact that she's become old, and that all the dreams she had when she was first marrying Hank are gone, made worse by Dee Dee getting all the attention because of her pregnancy, while she and Hank have struggled to conceive. After a disappointing dinner together, Peggy decides that she wants to have more excitement, and gets the idea to go skydiving. Meanwhile, Bobby is prepared to enjoy his last weekend being spoiled by Cotton, but due to Dee Dee being too pregnant to raise him, he ends up doing chores the whole time until the baby starts to arrive. Then he has to drive her to the hospital. Up on the plane, Hank jumps and enjoys the excursion, but Peggy is too nervous to make the leap, until she learns that Dee Dee's had the baby. So she jumps from the plane, only for both of her parachutes to fail, crashing into the ground as the episode ends. Peggy is afraid that she's growing too old to do anything exciting with her life, that as she gets older and older, the number of opportunities starts to decrease, and she'll eventually be saddled into a daily routine with less excitement until she eventually dies a boring life. 
This is made worse by the fact that having a second child was something she thought of as a means of having a second chance at leading an interesting life. And seeing Dee Dee and Cotton becoming parents makes her feel even worse if they get to do something that she can't. But while she sulks about this at the start of the episode, she does eventually come around, not wanting to be outdone by Cotton, who's much older than she is, or Hank, who's much more down to earth than she is. Pun not intended. Hank himself is a bit more of an interesting inversion on Peggy's anxieties here. While Peggy fears living a boring life, Hank wants that more than anything. His idea of success is to have the button-down lifestyle of selling propane and drinking in the alley. Hank Hill has found the metrics of success that he was setting out to achieve, and yet, it's Peggy's desire for more that wakes him up to the idea of trying out new things. When the two are lamenting at how boring their 20th anniversary was, Hank starts to realize that perhaps he set his sights too low, and should have been more ambitious. After all, doesn't the American Dream posit that if you have everything you ever wanted, it just means that you didn't want enough? Season 4 As long as Mike Judge and Greg Daniels were heavily involved in the production of King of the Hill, the show maintained a strong character focus while having the occasional plot development, something that was unusual for standardized television, but not unheard of, as any show would try to involve gimmicks after so many seasons to shake things up. But the changes to the status quo that King of the Hill had were rarely done out of a need to make the show more interesting for the sake of refreshment, but were instead often things planned in advance as a logical follow-up to so many stories being told. Season 4 was the last season run by one of the original duo, and as such, the last season to really capture the original feel of the show, or at least, that's what one would have expected. Season 4 shows a strong shift towards plots that involve locations that put the stress on the psyches of the main cast. There's more travel involved, and the situation that the cast gets himself into stop being things that the average viewer at home has any experience with. But this isn't to say that these are bizarre or alien situations, they're just uncommon. While the average person might not experience the same things as the Hill family, they still reasonably could experience such things. And of course, this is sold even further by the reactions that the cast has to these experiences. Not so much that they react the way we would, but in the way that we would expect them to. King of the Hill went from a show about everyday people and everyday situations, to a show about stereotypes of these peoples and locations. But that's as much a result of the show getting old, as it is from the characters getting more fleshed out. They don't act like us, because we're boring. Peggy Hill, The Decline and Fall Hank finds Peggy lying in a field of mud, alive but delirious. She's taken to the hospital where she's put into a full body cast to immobilize her while she recovers from a broken back. In the same hospital, Dee Dee has given birth to a child that Cotton names Good Hank, but she's too overcome with postpartum depression to so much as carry the child, and Cotton wants nothing to do with what he considers to be woman's work. So it's up to Bobby to take care of the baby, while Hank cares for Peggy, which he's hoping to do without her remembering the moments before leaping from the plane, as Hank thinks he was the one who encouraged her to jump. But Peggy eventually remembers that it wasn't Hank, but the news of the baby's delivery that did make her jump. The baby, who is now sitting next to her in the living room, being cared for in the same way that she is. Bobby eventually snaps from having to take care of Good Hank, Cotton, and Dee Dee all at once, and leaves the baby behind while Hank tries to shame his father into taking care of G.H., leaving Peggy alone with the crying child, while she manages to calm it down by rocking him with her big toe. Peggy jumped from the plane because she wanted a thrill, something that she had subconsciously accepted she could not get from raising another child after hearing that Dee Dee had given birth. That was the exact moment that her dreams of having a child were given up on, so she jumps to claim some sort of thrill for herself. She then forgets about this logic upon hitting the ground and it takes several days to regain the memories of how she came to that conclusion, but when she does, it hits her that now not only will she likely not be able to have another child, nor was it a wise idea to jump from the plane, but the one place where she could have possibly found some other relief in raising good Hank is gone because of her cast. This episode essentially takes away Peggy's agency to the Hill family dynamic and then shows the end result. Without Peggy to keep things running, no one else has the ability to take care of themselves. Sure, Bobby and Hank were able to keep things under control for a while, but they gave in to pressure after about a week, while Cotton quit hours afterwards and Dee Dee didn't even make it out of the hospital. 
By removing a character from the plot for a while, we're able to see the role they served in better detail by looking at what's missing, and this episode shows off that Peggy can do more for the Hill family with her big toe than anyone else. Cotton's Plot Peggy gets her full body cast removed and enrolls in a physical therapy course, though the course is moving a bit too slowly for her preference. But when she's left alone with Cotton, who starts insulting her for not being able to walk, she finds herself able to work harder out of spite. So she drops out of physical therapy to work with Cotton, who runs a BMT-style regiment of making her crawl and insulting her. And this strategy works. He tells her his old war stories while she's working out, with Peggy even agreeing to compile them for an application to the Texas State Cemetery. But she and Hank begin to notice inconsistencies in the stories, and Peggy soon comes to the conclusion that he is a fraud. This makes it difficult to walk again, and she re-enrolls in her old therapy course, but Hank is able to reinvigorate her when he tells her the truth. Cotton lost his shins in the war, and relearned how to walk. And this is enough for Peggy to resubmit his application, getting him the spot. In the end, Cotton invites Peggy to crawl up the hill, saying that if she can, she can dance on his grave, which the two then do. Hank Hill notoriously doesn't know how to express his emotions, and this is something that he learned from his father, who is equally incapable of doing so. But it's not like they're not there. Cotton does feel a bit of sympathy for Peggy's condition, as it reminds him of his own struggles with regaining the use of his legs, and so he tries to form a close relationship with her the only way he knows how to, a drill sergeant's relationship to one of his recruits. As awkward and semi-abusive as this relationship is, it's still the greatest expression of love that Cotton is capable of, and so it becomes heartwarming in a cosmic sort of way. But this is a relationship built on mutual gain as well as the respect that Peggy has for the man's military service. When she learns that his stories don't add up, that respect is gone, and when a man you don't respect tries to order you to do something, it's not going to have the intended motivating effect, partially why Peggy struggles in her initial physical therapy class. She does ultimately get back her motivation to relearn to walk when that respect comes back. It's not that she loves Cotton or even likes him, but that she acknowledges his accomplishments and his expertise in the field of overcoming her particular hardship. And respect is something earned, not given, just as Cotton's plot is something that he earns too. Bills are made to be broken. The guys are standing around the alley when they hear from a local sports show that Bill's old touchdown record is about to be broken by a local high schooler named Ricky Suggs. They're concerned about Bill's mental health, as his high school record is all that he has, but Bill seems to be taking it in stride, even as the record is tied. But when Ricky's ACL is torn during a play and he's assumed out of the season, the other team simply allows him a courtesy touchdown to give him the record. The guys are disgusted by this, trying to get Suggs' record to be listed with an asterisk next to it for the poor display of sportsmanship, but the rest of Arlen doesn't view it this way as they view his record-setting touchdown as a heartwarming story. But while reminiscing on the good old days, Hank realizes that Bill never graduated high school and can play football as a redshirt, giving him one last opportunity to regain his record. Despite several injuries and not being in peak condition, Bill manages to overcome the other team's defense and score, tying the record honestly. As Bill states in this episode, he appreciates Ricky Suggs taking his own record as the buzz around the event gives him more attention, allowing him a brief moment to relive his glory days. The record had, for a long time, merely existed as a symbol of his decline. He no longer fits into his old uniform, he's out of shape, and his best days are far behind him. But getting the spotlight for a few weeks gives him the chance for that symbol to actually mean something instead of just representing it. This is why, when the record is broken illegitimately, it cheapens the whole experience. If a record can be handed to somebody out of obligation, then the record itself doesn't mean much, ignoring the fact that Ricky would have beaten the record honestly in the first place had it not been for the injury. And so the only way for Bill to reclaim the record is to reclaim what the record means, to earn it, and show that it shouldn't have been given away. Most of the town has accepted the former definition, so they view Bill with disgust as his attempts to steal a record from somebody who has given it in a display of sportsmanship. But when he regains it through his own efforts, it's not Bill who's being given the respect, but his accomplishment itself. Even though Bill only manages to tie Ricky, he earned every single touchdown and therefore has the higher accolade, made better by the fact that he taught Arlen to appreciate the effort as well. Little Horrors of Shop 
Hank is forced to take a vacation by Buck Strickland, and he doesn't know what to do with his time. While driving Bobby home from school, he learns that the shop class at Tom Landry Middle School is being used as a study hall, so he volunteers to teach the class himself, despite the budget not being able to pay him anything. He quickly wins the hearts of the students by teaching them practical lessons on how to repair and create things, even having the students go around the school to repair things there when they don't have the wood to run the class properly. But this makes Peggy jealous, as she was confident that she would win Substitute Teacher of the Year for the third year in a row. But when Hank is fired for telling his students to bring their own tools from home, they simply show up at his house outside of regular hours to continue learning. Peggy rebrands as Mrs. Hank Hill to try to get some of his votes, and in the end, despite being ineligible for the award, the whole school still applauds when Hank walks out on stage to give Peggy her speech. Hank and Peggy both have completely different motivations going into their substitute teaching careers. Hank is doing it out of a passion for the subject and a desire to make an impact. Peggy does so for her own ego. And while I've spoken before in this video about Peggy's motivations, this episode puts the same desire into a more negative context. She begins to grow bitter over being one-upped by her husband, made worse by the fact that he's effortlessly getting a bit of recognition that she believes she deserves. Substitute teaching is how Peggy defines herself, and so to be told that she's only the second best at it damages her self-image more than anything else. And this is what starts to define a trend in Peggy's characterization going forward. It's a common subject to talk about when discussing King of the Hill that Peggy is not a very good person due to her ego and lack of abilities to match that ego up. But I'd argue that this part of her character is something that really only becomes pronounced during the later seasons while getting retroactively applied to her earlier appearances. In the first three seasons, Peggy is still a good person, just getting in over her head because she overestimates herself. But in the later seasons, basically anything post-skydiving, she becomes a much more fragile person. If this episode had taken place a few years later, Peggy likely would have actively tried to sabotage Hank's career. Isle 8A Khan and Min are going to Hawaii for a week so Khan can give a speech, but without a babysitter, they have to leave Connie in the hands of the Hill family. Bobby is excited to camp out in the living room with Connie, and she even gets along with Hank and Peggy by impressing them with her manners. But after the second day, she starts to spend a long time in the bathroom and upon leaving, tells Hank that she just got her first period. Hank is mortified, not knowing what to do and too embarrassed to ask anybody else about it, though he's finally able to help out Connie by taking her to Megalomart's Isle 8A. Afterwards, Bobby is confused as he's not sure where her mood swings are coming from. But when Min and Con return home, Min's able to explain things to her daughter, and Connie's able to negotiate with Bobby based on the two not hating each other. Meanwhile, Dale gets a new trash can that's indestructible, but it gets taken by the garbage truck when it's too thin to be held by the claw. There's a stigma around visits from Aunt Flo, or the time of the month, or whatever other allegory one uses to prevent outright saying period. Especially among older men, this sort of topic is something that's treated with a large amount of awkwardness, even more than usual from Hank, and so it becomes something embarrassing to bring up. This then leads to an extra layer of stigmatization around any additional aspects, such as Connie's PMS or if someone has low iron, and so these issues often go undiagnosed and misunderstood. This is seen in Bobby, who starts to believe that Connie hates him because he never gets a frank understanding of what's going on. Even Connie herself doesn't quite understand her own hormonal changes, feeling as though she's doing something wrong because she exists. But despite neither of the two really understanding what's going on or why all the adults in their lives are treating it so gingerly, they still agree to a mutual tolerance of one another. By being understanding, they can navigate an issue that they don't quite understand. Even the adults end up having a poor grasp of events, mostly Hank and Con, who undergo a similar form of understanding as the two leave the issue to their wives to handle. In the end, it's not about understanding everything about an issue, undoing centuries of skittishness, but about being nice enough to avoid acting like an expert and just accepting other people. A Beer Can Named Desire Hank wins a contest from an Alamo beer can that gives him a trip to meet Don Meredith, as well as the option to either make a 10-yard pass through a narrow hole for $1 million, or have Don perform the pass instead for 100000 Hank makes a replica of the giant beer can he'll have to throw the ball into, and practices, getting confident enough to decide to go for the million. But when they arrive, he second-guesses himself and has Don Meredith make the throw for him, and the guy misses. 
Hank demands an apology and learns from Don that the guy really was trying, to which Hank realizes that he should be more accepting of his decision, even if it turned out to be the wrong one. Meanwhile, Bill is dropped off at the Dotrieve Manor in Louisiana, where he meets his three cousins, all of whom are desperate to continue the bloodline. But he learns from Peggy that one of them is his biological cousin, and fears getting too close to any of them, before eventually being kicked out for trying to fool around. Hank is, if nothing else, a very modest person. He's not the type of guy who needs to make it big, he doesn't obsess over wealth, and the only thing he wants money for is to provide for his family. When discussing the throw with Peggy, his first instinct with what to do with the money is to put Bobby through college. Hank doesn't take risks if he can help it, and always tries to live a reserved and modest life. So many episodes are conflict over something trying to throw him off his groove. Hank is, if nothing else, a very prideful person. He's not the type of guy who can stand to have his credentials questioned, and will always try to drop his accomplishments in propane or football if the opportunity arises. When discussing that throw with Peggy, he insists on going for the $1 million despite not even being able to brainstorm something to spend all the money on. Hank doesn't sit idly by if he hears an insult, whether that's an insult to him, to Texas, or to propane. So when those two ideals are put into conflict, Hank has to choose whether his reputation as a star football player or his family and ideals are more valuable. How confident is he in his ability to provide for them if he's willing to gamble on their happiness in the first place? And then for the safe option to wind up failing anyway is just another hit to his ego, at least until he learns how similar he and Don Meredith are as well. It's an assuring thing that he ended up putting his trust in a man just like himself, even if that trust didn't pay off. Happy Hanksgiving. Hank is on his way to the airport to visit Peggy's mother in Montana, a propane-cooked turkey in tow to prove a point about the fuel. But their flight is delayed by poor weather, forcing the family to sit hungry in the airport as Hank refuses to play into Con's gambit of pretending to own a walk restaurant to get free food. Eventually, their flight is postponed to the next day, and in trying to skip the line for an airport shuttle to the hotel, they get a ride from Bill, who crashes the car, making the family walk there in time to see vacancy run out. After spending the night in the airport, they finally get on the next flight, only for it to be delayed as the dogs there sniff out Hank's turkey, and the meat is detonated, delaying the flight long enough that it gets outright cancelled. Meanwhile, Dale is searching for a place to smoke in the airport, only to get locked outside, while Boomhauer sleeps with flight attendants, and Khan leaves his flight to rescue Dale. In the end, nobody gets to go on their trip, and the food court closes, so they celebrate with leftover pizza and packaged nuts. Holiday travel is stressful, enough so that the Hill family and their friends are able to completely change priorities throughout the event. While Peggy is mostly concerned with her Brown Betty recipe's consistency in the early acts of the episode, by the second, she's just concerned with getting there, and by the end, she's only happy the family didn't collapse in on each other. Even Hank is mostly concerned with showing off how well he can cook a turkey, only to end up losing his chance to brag, at least until the end, when he's finally able to use the tanky stored at the episode's beginning to reheat the pizza. He misses out on the opportunity to brag about propane to Peggy's mother, but he's still surrounded by people who agree with him in the end, and that plays into why the episode's ending is a happy one. Thanksgiving started out as a story about unity between American Indians and pilgrims, but has meant a lot of things to a lot of different people over the years, even more or less going forgotten about for a few centuries. But regardless of what the holiday used to mean or why it was brought back into the public spotlight, what it is today is an excuse to spend time with family, no matter whether that family is blood-related or not. Not in my backhoe. Hank gets upset with Dale and Bill for misusing a backhoe they rented to replace Bill's septic tank. While at the hardware store to cool off, he meets a man named Hal with the same interests, fashion, and truck as himself, and the two begin to see each other around town. Hank begins to spend more and more time around Hal in lieu of his other friends, who view it as treachery, as they begin to follow the two men around. Dale and Bill then come to the conclusion that Hank is friends with Hal because the other guy knows how to use the backhoe, and they decide to take the machine for a joyride to practice. But then they fall into a pit and trap themselves. Later on, Hank learns that Hal's schedule doesn't line up with his, and the two live too far away to meet up under any other circumstances. So they part ways around the time that Hank learns that the backhoe was never returned, and he searches for Dale and Bill, eventually finding them in the pet cemetery where he guides them through digging themselves out. 
I've asked before what Hank could possibly see in his friend group, and, and this episode gives a rather cynical answer. They live nearby. Hank is a man who values consistency in his life above all else, and despite the fact that he's made a genuine friend, a guy just like him, he still opts to spend time around people who he's always known. It's not just the people in his life that he wants consistency in, though. Hank also wants the dynamics between these people to stay constant. And when he realizes that his friends don't like Hal, he tries to get back that old sense of the way things are. And so this is to say that just because two people are similar, it doesn't really mean that they're suitable for one another. A great example of this is the marriage of Hank and Peggy. The two are very different people, but Hank likes it that way. Peggy gets him into things he would not have done otherwise, and his friends are the same way. Without Dale or Bill or even Boompower, Hank's life would be uninteresting. And while he might believe himself suited to that sort of life, he still does crave the dynamic of his friend group. He likes to consider himself the expert in things, and he does get that with the alley. To Kill a Ladybird After being upset with Ladybird for her lack of energy, Bobby finds a raccoon that he names Bandit, and begins to feed it every night, allowing it to live in the crawl space where it gets into the house and tears up Hank's garage. Hank sends Dale in to catch the raccoon, but it scratches him repeatedly and runs off, getting into a fight with Ladybird, who chases after him. Hank searches for Ladybird, Bobby searches for Bandit, and the rest of the neighborhood searches for Dale, who's run into the woods believing that he has rabies. But when Hank learns that Animal Control intends to shoot his dog should she appear rabid, he sets out on his own to find her before they can. While in the woods, he begins to reminisce on the good times he's had with his pet before Dale ambushes them and ties the two up, only for Ladybird to come back and chase him off. In the end, Bobby and Hank are freed when Bobby shoots a charging bandit, where they learn that no one had rabies after all. The difference in treatment of Ladybird is one of the ways in which we can see the clear difference between Bobby and Hank. Bobby wants an energetic dog, one who will run around and play games with him, somebody more like Bandit as a companion. Hank prefers the quiet, laid-back Ladybird, not purely because she's the dog he's had for so many years, but because she represents his life the way he lives it now. We've seen the dog as a puppy, energetic and playful, always running around, and trying various new things out of curiosity, the same way Hank and Peggy were in their early years of their marriage. We've also seen Hank as an older adult. As he enters his middle ages, he's no longer as energetic or active, and so Ladybird has grown alongside him in the same way. This is one of the reasons why Hank is saddened by the potential loss of his dog. It's not only a decades-long companion he might lose, but a representation of some of the best years of his life. If Ladybird dies, so too does his young adulthood. At the end of the episode, he and Bobby are walking Ladybird back to the truck, and he allows Bobby to pick out their next pet if, when, Ladybird passes away. The man finally accepting that it's time for him to step aside and let the next stage of his life begin, alongside Bobby and the family he has now. And of course, Ladybird does live, not very active, but still as a symbol of everything that ever once was. Hillenium. Hank is buying a Christmas tree for Christmas 1999, but the rest of the city seems to be stocking up for Y2K, which they believe will be apocalyptic, as computers will fail to roll over and data will be lost. Hank and Dale aren't worried about the bug, but seeing how panicked Peggy is over the potential damage, Hank decides to buy her a new computer, though the store can't make the sale as their systems are all down for compliance checking. Worse is when he tries to sell propane to a crowd of hoarders, only to learn that the deliveries have been stalled as well. So he takes the last of the propane for himself, hiding it in his garage. Hank begins to worry about the panicking crowds, and is joined by Dale when the latter's supply hoard is ruined by his gerbils. And the two drive around preparing for an apocalypse. Hank buys Peggy a grandfather clock instead of the computer, and he gets his family equally technologically impaired gifts as well. But after an argument that results in him varnishing the clock to cool down, he ends up collapsing from the lack of ventilation in his garage, and hallucinates a Tom Landry whack-a-mole, lecturing him on when it's okay not to worry. In the end, he burns the hoard of supplies he was stockpiling, and the bonfire brings out the whole neighborhood. The Y2K crisis was one caused by panic over the thought that computers would fail to roll over properly at the end of the millennium, presenting the year 1900 instead of the correct date. The fear was that the misaligned dates would cause entire networks to crash, but the reality of the situation was that, at worst, a few parking meters gave out improper tickets, and some cash registers failed for a few days. The collapse did not happen, and most of the damage was caused not by computers, but by people. 
survivalist-related businesses saw an uptick in sales between surplus stores, gun dealers, and outdoor recreation equipment, and any supply chain issues were caused more because of people attempting to hoard than from actual shortages. This episode takes that sense of panic and applies it to Arlen, Texas, with Hank, who is normally very calm and collected, buying into that panic after seeing everyone else go through with it. It's not so much that he actually feared the computers, as it was his fear of other people's fear that instilled the sense of panic. Because often, the greater damage to society can be caused by overreactions to information, rather than the information itself. Well, that and the varnish fumes. The real lesson of this story is to ventilate your garage. Old Glory When Bill sees the old flag at the military base being decommissioned by burning, he volunteers to hoist it over his home instead. Meanwhile, Bobby gets inspired by the sight of the flag to do a rewrite of a failing essay he wrote, but when he can't come up with a way to start it, he asks Peggy to write it for him, which she does upon learning that one of her rival substitute teachers, Mrs. Donovan, is the one who failed him in the first place. But when Peggy's essay gets an A, Bobby takes all the credit, and begins to receive requests from his classmates to help on their papers as well. But unable to write them himself, he simply plagiarizes musings from Peggy's newspaper column, which was recently cancelled. When his teacher notices the similarities between Peggy's column, which she bought ad space to rerun, and her students' essays, she demands that Peggy and Bobby give a formal apology during a pep rally. But Peggy comes up with the idea to make a new essay so patriotic that the students cheer for the apology instead, and they plan on stealing Bill's flag to do so. They end up accidentally ruining the flag in the process, and it's destroyed, though the sight of Bill crying over the desecrated flag is enough to inspire Bobby to write a proper essay in the end. Bobby is able to exploit Peggy's ego to get her to write the essay for him, something that she went along with to repair the damage to her ego from her column being pulled. But when she believes that she's finally vindicated herself, making her satisfied with the effort, she then discovers Bobby taking full credit, meaning that she hasn't actually received anything external for the effort. Because to Peggy, it's not enough to prove to herself that she's a good author, she needs other people to believe it as well. This is why she spends her own money trying to get her musings back in the paper, and why the conflict of the episode rises when she learns that she might have to apologize publicly. And so she and Bobby go to the one place they can think of to get them the support of the public that they want. Nationalism. By using the flag as a prop, they can redirect the student body's love of their country towards themselves, a similar tactic to the one used in the episode Little Horrors of Shop, where Peggy tries to ride the coattails of Hank's popularity. This plot builds off the theme in that episode's plot by involving Bobby in the event. He gets the same ego that Peggy has, developing when he finally receives a taste of the respect that came with people believing that he was smart. Rodeo Days The rodeo comes into town, and Hank thinks that signing Bobby up for a cattle roping would be a good way to get the boy interested in a sport. He shows some proficiency with the lasso, but while there finds his true calling, being a rodeo clown. But the rodeo clowns are constantly looked down upon by the cowboys, as well as the rest of society, including later on his friend Joseph, and Bobby has to keep his new career path a secret from his father, which works for a while as Hank is proud of his son for getting concussed and developing a saunter. But while at the rodeo later, Bill recognizes his underwear and Peggy's shoes on the clown, and Hank learns Bobby's real reason for revisiting the rodeo again and again. He forbids Bobby from performing any longer, until Joseph is thrown from his bull calf and the other clowns are unable to calm the bull down. So, with Hank's blessing, Bobby steps into the arena and manages to distract the bull, saving his friend and earning everyone's respect. In a real rodeo, the clowns are given the same, if not more, respect than the actual cowboys, as the cowboys try to avoid being chased by bulls, and the clowns actively seek that situation out. But in this episode, the relationship is portrayed as much less amicable than the reality in order to portray drama between Bobby failing to get respect from his family, and failing to get respect from his peers. He only begrudgingly gets the respect from other clowns when he's able to prove himself to them, and it takes the same actions to get the respect from others as well. Nobody respects Bobby until he proves useful, and then the episode can end happily. And this is one of the most frequently used plot beats in King of the Hill. Hank tries to get Bobby into or out of a new hobby. He instead attaches to something adjacent to that hobby. Hank is disappointed until either learning that the hobby is actually okay, or he gets proven right in the end. And these plot beats themselves are rarely about the characters themselves. More often than not, they exist as a means of exploring some kind of dynamic about society. 
Bobby's not given respect by a group until he proves himself functional to them, relatable to anybody whose career path gets a more fulfillment than recognition. Or Hank is too caught up in his own fashioned ways to appreciate when something is changing for the better. Hanky Panky Buck Strickland's wife divorces him and takes half of his assets, so he transfers ownership of Sugarfoot's barbecue to Hank, but Strickland Propane gets repossessed by his wife, Liz. She doesn't intend on changing anything, though, and promotes Hank Hill to manager, though after faking a propane emergency, it's revealed that she's only promoting Hank to get closer to him, so she might seduce him as revenge for the years of cheating that Buck put her through. Buck, meanwhile, is living with his mistress, Debbie, and she begins to lust after Hank as well, due to the fact that he's now her boss. Hank tries to prevent Peggy from learning about either of these incidents, which is made easier by the fact that Peggy technically owns half of Sugarfoot's and is busy overhauling the whole restaurant. Hank arranges for Liz and Buck to reunite at Sugarfoot's, and when they see what's become of the restaurant under Peggy, they all recall the years that they spent together and reunite. Though afterwards, Peggy hears a gunshot and checks the dumpster, where she finds Debbie's body. Hank's greatest fear in this episode comes from the potential reveal that he's been fooling around with other women other than Peggy. While these allegations aren't true, the threat of the rumor itself is what he's more afraid of, yet this is an invalid fear. During the episode, he gets accused by Buck of sleeping with the guy's wife and mistress, yet all it takes is Hank's word that he didn't do it to get the guy to believe him. Hank's character is so sturdy within his community that the rumors of him sleeping around would be easily dismissed by anyone who knows him well enough. And yet, he tries to hide it anyway. As a result, he ends up making Peggy worry unnecessarily, getting an accusation in the next episode that comes along with the territory of how much he's been hiding. Had Hank been more honest with his wife and more forthcoming about the incident, he could have saved himself the embarrassment, but the very fact that he was hiding something did more to raise suspicion around him than was ever necessary. High Anxiety Hank tries to recall his whereabouts the night of Debbie's murder. He accidentally smoked with Debbie's stoner roommate and slept in some bushes. After trying to walk through everything, he begins to suspect that he was the murderer, blacked out from accidentally getting high. Sheriff Mumford of Heimlich County starts to piece together corroborating evidence, including Hank's manager Patch in some bushes, his lighter in Debbie's apartment, and a recorded confession of his relationship with the girl. But Hank then realizes that he dropped the lighter in Debbie's apartment and that her roommate can back up his story, but to admit to this means that he would have to admit to smoking pot. So he lies when Gail goes to the police, and this makes Gail a suspect, getting him arrested. But during a case closed dinner, when Hank realizes that Mumford wants to give Gail the death penalty, Hank finally admits to their mutual alibi, turning the attention to Buck Strickland, who was planting evidence, only for a Texas Ranger to step in and reveal that he pieced together the real culprit behind Debbie's murder. Debbie herself. She was lying in wait to kill Buck, and accidentally shot herself while carrying too many things at once. In the last episode, Hank feared that others would begin to judge him harshly if he were to have certain events about himself revealed, but in this episode, those fears are instead twisted around, so Hank himself is the one judging Hank Hill the harshest. His lack of understanding about the effects of marijuana result in a misjudgment of his own character, similarly to the way that his lack of understanding of sexual relationships caused drama for him in the previous episode. A firm rejection following a better read of the relationship would have done him more favors, but instead he nearly accepts Ms. Liz's advancements due to not knowing any better. Hank himself is much more concerned with his reputation than his status as a felon due to his own strong opinions of his own character. When he's confronted by the sheriff about being a suspect, he's almost relieved to hear that it's part of the murder case. Even then, his fears are less about people accusing him of murder than they were about people finding out he'd partied with Gale. But it's this staunch belief in his own willpower that ends up making him do the right thing. In the last episode, Hank got into trouble because he was unwilling to tell the truth. And this one, he gets out of trouble by admitting to the things that he's culpable for, because that's what a good person, like Hank Hill believes himself to be, would do. Naked Ambition After a day trip to the river, Bobby accidentally walks in on Luann while she's showering, and he's shocked by the sight of a woman who's practically his sister, though Joseph seems to be into the idea. So into the idea that he wants to peep on Luann in the shower, but when he and Bobby are caught by Connie, she believes they were peeping on her, and Bobby's too ashamed to admit the truth. 
So she begins to date Chain with Sonasong, the guy her parents are trying to set her up with, in order to portray her anger with Bobby. But Bobby admits the truth to her, agreeing to take his shirt off for her because that's what they believe couples do, until Khan and Min walk in on them and react by grounding her. But Hank still supports their relationship and gives him advice on how he can still visit her in spite of Khan. Meanwhile, Boomhauer drifts downstream and winds up in Houston, where he's checked into a mental hospital because of his rambling. He calls Dale, who sneaks in, and calls Bill, who decides he likes it there and isn't sure if he wants to leave. But when their escape plans are thwarted, they finally agree to call Hank, who reveals that all three could have left whenever they wanted to. Connie's fear in this episode is twofold. Firstly, she's afraid of her relationship being revealed to her parents at the correct assumption that they'll react negatively. But the second is tied to the first, in that she's not sure if her relationship with Bobby is serious enough to risk making her parents angry over it. When she deduces that he's peeking on her instead of being more direct or peeking on his cousin instead, she realizes that she might have misjudged either him or his level of commitment, and so she decides to break things off. But twice during the episode, this sort of pressure placed onto their relationship ends up strengthening it. Connie pretends as though she's interested in moving on from Bobby in order to test his loyalty to her, if he'll pursue her even after the argument that he started. And this works, allowing the two to get closer and still maintaining some healthy distance. So much so that it's conflated with sexual desire to the horror of Khan and relief of Hank. Their relationship has more stress put on it later from Khan's reaction, making the fence higher and installing motion-activated lights to make it more difficult for the two to see each other. And once again, their relationship survives this challenge and comes out stronger because of it. Moving on up. Pops, one of the neighbors on Rainy Street, dies while mowing his lawn, and the alley considers renting out his house to use as their new hangout. But they're beaten to it by Luann, who's renting the place out instead as she's tired of all the rules Hank has for his home. She gets three new roommates to split rent and utilities with, all of whom are annoying to Hank in some capacity. But he's willing to put up with them as long as Luann no longer lives with him, and he gets his den back, although the other guys view it as an invitation to start hanging out there when one of Luann's roommates parks her car where they usually stand. Eventually, Luann is exhausted from the fact that she's the only one who pays rent or utilities, and her roommates call her a fascist for trying to enforce rules, leading her to the realization that she's becoming like Hank was before she left. But Luann's too prideful to admit that she can't handle living on her own, and tries to come up with another way to survive, simply closing out all of the accounts and blacking out the house while she camps on the lawn. Similarly to last season's The Wedding of Bobby Hill, this is an episode about the conflicting desires for independence and the extra responsibility coming with that freedom. And in that episode's review, I mentioned that the opposite side of the presented argument, in which a person burdens themselves with too many rules and fails to exercise freedom, is never properly expanded upon. And then this episode covers that point. Luann begins to take on extra responsibilities around the house in order to cover for her lazy roommates, who take advantage of the hospitality for their own benefit. The lesson taken away at the end of the episode is for Luann to be responsible for her own actions and nobody else's. And while this means doing away with things like power and water for a while, she does manage to get some amount of freedom back by doing so. She cuts out the dead weight from the household and forces them to manage for themselves. Had everybody chipped in a fair amount, they'd all be living a higher total standard of living instead of shaving in the pool or stealing power from Hank. But in the absence of other people's personal responsibility, sometimes all you can do is watch out for yourself. Bill of Sales While lamenting the loss of Sugarfoots and the management responsibilities that came with it, Peggy starts to look for another way to flex her management muscles and comes across MetaLife, a pyramid scheme that sells health foods. She tries to rope Hank and Luann into selling for her, but their sales figures are too poor to get her any recognition, until Bill volunteers to sell the bars on the army base and she learns that he's a natural salesman. So Peggy begins to exploit him by having the guy sell more and more until they're invited to a conference in San Antonio. But while they're there, Peggy's praise causes Bill to freak out and quit. With Peggy unable to sell the product on her own, she begins to fear not managing to make it any further until the rest of her family points out that Bill is motivated by insults. So Peggy goes back to Bill and begins to treat him poorly, motivating him to sell more and more of the product until she notices that his foot is bleeding. She then realizes that it's not worth it to make the national conference if that means hurting a friend, and decides to quit the business. 
Bill's unrequited crush on Peggy has been a long recurring part of the show since the first season, something usually played as a joke until this point where it becomes a point of drama. Because it's never viewed as something healthy for either of them, as Peggy effectively has a stalker, and Bill is coping with the loss of Lenore in an unhealthy way. That said, it's at least a decent sign for his psyche that he does like somebody like Peggy. Lenore was a toxic individual, and he's tried replacing her with other toxic people before, such as Leanne. But Peggy, while egoistic, is still at least a decent person, at least mostly. When she realizes that Bill is a pushover who can be exploited for personal gain, she begins to mistreat him much in the same way that every other woman in his life has. There's just something about Bill that brings out the worst in other people when he's nearby. His complete lack of ability to stand up for himself it makes others gain unchecked power over him. And with unchecked power comes a true revelation about the way they would act if they could live without social consequence. Peggy is, at the very least, able to realize that she's becoming a worse person by association and cuts things off with him. Though it usually takes somebody else making this realization to save Bill from his own lack of a spine. While Peggy is slowly becoming a worse person as the show goes on, by this point she at least has the self-awareness to try to fight back. Won't you pee my neighbor? The Sufanusin phone family are celebrating Pi Mai, the Laotian New Year. They invite their neighbors, as well as a few individuals that they want to suck up to, including a group of Buddhist monks who are searching for the reincarnation of Lama Senglug. They set out a test of selecting an object that used to belong to him for Connie and Chain Wasana Song to take. But while trying to distract Chain to give Connie an advantage, Bobby ends up accidentally selecting the correct item. The monks then believe that Bobby may be the reincarnation of this monk, and they teach the boy about some Buddhist teachings, which he takes too easily as he begins to settle disputes. But Hank is appalled by the new form of spirituality and tries to shut it down, only for Bobby to come to him for advice when he learns that, if he really is saying lug, he has to take a vow of celibacy. But Connie wants him to take the test seriously as a sign of respect for her religion, and he starts to fear that he may get the answer right. In the end, Bobby is asked to pick an item and chooses a mirror as he can see Connie's reflection in it. Despite the fact that the mirror was saying lugs, the monk still decides to fail him as though he chose Connie. Bobby never showed outward signs of spirituality before, and it took the monks telling him that he might be a reincarnated Lama for him to start to change his behavior. Afterwards, he begins to speak as though he were a reincarnation, right up until the point where he learns that this behavior might end up separating him from Connie. But it's also worth pointing out that this is not an inconsistency in his character, but a consistency in his relationship. The only reason Bobby began to embrace Buddhist ideals was because he wanted to show an amount of respect for Connie's religion to keep her happy. It was not until these two desires conflicted that he felt any hesitation. The faux spirituality also presents itself in other characters. The Sufanusin phone family has very little interest in practicing Buddhism throughout the episode, only inviting the monks to their PMI as they were trying to suck up to the neighbors. Khan and Min only bought into the search for Sanglug because they thought it would make them look good, and they never bothered with attending local Buddhist cultural events as there was nobody there to impress. Hank, too, is only ever really seen going to church when it's relevant to the plot. He's not even able to answer Bobby's questions about what a Methodist is without asking for help. And of course, this is the first time we see him praying at his bedside in the show, not because of devotion, but because of anxiety. Hank's Bad Hair Day Hank's barber, Jack, is beginning to become senile and loses his ability to cut hair properly. But despite getting a subpar haircut, Hank insists on returning to give the man a second chance, only for Jack to bleach his hair. He's mortified and unable to leave the house without a hat, but Bill volunteers to give him a haircut. Despite Hank's initial uncertainty at letting his friend cut his hair, he agrees. The haircut is a success, and Hank loves it so much that he insists on paying Bill, though Bill doesn't know how much to charge, so he has the army find out how much it costs and bill Hank for the amount. As it turns out, the army's barber division is massively inefficient and charges $900 for a haircut, which Hank refuses to pay out of principle. So he writes to his congressman about the overcharge, and soon, the barber program is cut from the budget, with Bill losing his job. But Hank receives a check from the army for saving them from overspending, and he uses it to repurchase Bill's old chair from the army surplus auction, donating it to the base so all the other dissatisfied soldiers can re-establish the program in secret. Hank puts a lot of value to the consistency in his life, so much so that he's willing to risk his haircut on a senile barber purely because that's the way his hair has always been cut. 
but when this source of comfort in his life is threatened by the man losing it, it's his fear of Bill's ineptitude that combined with his fear of change that puts a barrier between the two. Though from Bill's perspective, all he sees is a large fear of him. He doesn't quite understand all of Hank's reservations about getting his hair cut by somebody else. And yet it's this trust that ends up being betrayed by a third party to Hank and Bill. Bill is a great barber, very knowledgeable about his craft and experienced at practicing it. It's one of the few things about his life that he still has to feel good about. But upon losing his ability to cut hair, he loses the only thing left to him except for his friend group, which he also loses from what he views as a betrayal. Not only a betrayal of his friend circle, but one by his own country, which had not only been exploiting his services for decades, but were also prepared to cut him entirely at the first opportunity. Thankfully, by the episode's conclusion, Hank is able to use his money from the suit to get Bill's old job back, repairing both severed connections in one action. Meet the Propaniacs Hank has Bobby working at Strickland over the summer despite the boy wanting to go to a comedy camp instead. But when a summer sale goes south due to a short supply of inventory, Bobby's able to save the event by doing a comedy routine about propane that's so successful even Hank laughs. So Buck gets the idea to put together a group which they name the Propaniacs, doing comedy shows around Arlen to motivate the other Strickland employees. They eventually get the attention of Charlie Fortner, the president of the Texas Association of Propane Dealers, to do their skit at a regional convention. But when Bobby has the idea to bring Charlie up on stage for their routine, Joe Jack gets nervous and arrives drunk during the show, resulting in some bad improv that makes Fortner believe that the entire skit was a means of revealing that he wore adult diapers. He forbids them from performing at any official propane establishment ever again, but Hank, upon seeing how upset Bobby is about their performance being shut down, simply stages another one at a local mall. This performance bombs, however, the audience being totally uninterested, all except for Hank. So Bobby simply performs to his father instead, not caring if anybody else is laughing. Hank and Bobby have found common ground a few times throughout the show's run up to this point, but this is usually after some kind of revelation from either character occurring at the very end of the episode, like Hank accepting Bobby as a rodeo clown only after Bobby proves himself useful. But this episode differs from this emerging formula by instead having the moment where the two bond occurring at the beginning of the episode, during the first act. Bobby combining his comedy routine with Hank's love and knowledge of propane results in something that they can finally do together, and this is something that only gets built upon as the episode progresses. But it's been shown that this is still a somewhat one-sided understanding between the two. Hank is willing to let the Propaniacs disband over Charlie Fortner telling him to stop performing, with Hank believing that the skits were all about promoting propane. Bobby is also about to give up when he bombs in front of an audience that doesn't find propane-based humor funny. But when he realizes that it makes his dad happy, he also realizes that's all that really matters. It's not about what other people think about your relationship, it's about what the people in the relationship itself feel. Nancy's Boys Hank saves a man trapped in a freezer and gets a free dinner for four, and Dale invites himself and Nancy to go with Hank and Peggy. But during that night, Dale's able to rekindle the dead marriage he and Nancy have, and the two sleep together, though Nancy feels terrible about this as she views it as cheating on John Redcorn. This leads to an argument that results in Nancy going back to Dale again, but then a jealous John Redcorn enters their house at night, and Dale smashes a lamp over his head. Fearing that he's hurt the man who massages his wife, he tries to apologize to both of them, realizing that his wife has had headaches for 14 years and he's been neglecting her. So Dale, in secret, goes to John Redcorn's trailer and teaches him about the Freedom of Information Act. The two begin to bond over their mutual dislike of the federal government as Dale starts to strain himself helping with the request forms. But when Nancy gets ignored by both men, she goes to John Redcorn's to apologize and sees both the men together. And John Redcorn finally apologizes to Dale for the years of healing his wife, saying that he can't continue to see her in good faith and that Dale should be the one to treat her headaches from then on. The infidelity in Nancy's relationships is played with in this episode, bringing up an interesting point about who it is that she's really cheating on. She's been married to Dale for about 20 years as of the end of season 3, and she's been seeing John Redcorn for 14 of those years. Considering that her relationship with Dale has been emotionally dead for at least that long, she's arguably closer to John Redcorn than she is to Dale. While legally and morally, it's Dale that she's cheating on, to her, she's John Redcorn's woman. The emotional connection being the thing that most would focus on in her shoes. 
All three characters in this relationship have wronged one another in some way, though there are some larger than others. Dale admits he's never been emotionally receptive to Nancy through their marriage. Nancy is, of course, cheating on Dale, and John Redcorn is sleeping with the married woman with no regard for the position it puts her or her husband in. And yet this two-timing actually ends up getting in the way of what could have been decent relationships. Dale and John Redcorn are shown to have a lot in common, being genuinely happy with the other man's distrust of the federal government and bonding over their work to get their vision of justice. Dale and Nancy even find their relationship rekindled after ignoring one another for so long, assuming there was nothing left to their marriage and then not bothering to try to improve it. And of course, it took John Redcorn finally meeting Dale to realize that he ought to consider that the person who may be best for Nancy might not be him. Flush with Power Arlen is in a drought, and Stage 3 water restrictions enforced by the Board of Zoning and Resources prevent Hank from watering his lawn, making it worse than cons. So he decides to install new low-flow toilets that the Board has pushed, in order to reduce his water usage, though he's appalled to discover that they require multiple flushes to function, often using more water than the old designs. Hank then tries to push a repeal of the ordinance that banned the old toilets, taking a position on the board to get the resolution passed, though it's shot down repeatedly and Chairman Hashaway tries to bribe Hank to drop the issue. When Hank refuses the bribe, he blackmails him instead, with photos of Bobby using Khan's hose to water the Hill family lawn, which is part of an agreement with the Sufa Nusenfone family that Bobby worked out after blackmailing Khan once he caught the guy bribing the water company's employee to allow him to ignore the restrictions. When Bobby notices that the new low-flow toilets are made by a company that Hashaway owns, he tells Hank, who uses Peggy's help to filibuster the board until the members all have to use the bathroom, forcing them to realize the new low-flow toilets are subpar and vote in favor of Hank's appeal. There is a lot of blackmail going on behind the scenes in this episode, but above it all stands Hank, who never allows himself to be corrupted by any of the many influences. Khan bribes the water company to ignore his water usage, and Bobby uses his information to blackmail him into allowing him to take baths at his house. This agreement then changes to letting Bobby use the hose to water Hank's lawn, an example of two wrong things being done for a person's benefit, much in the same way that Dale gets approval for his new fence, or Hank is offered to have the old, illegal toilets installed. But Hank refuses this, and even refuses to stoop to using Hashaway's involvement in the production of the toilets to get the guy removed, using a filibuster to prove his point about the toilets' inefficiency so the council members will vote based on the issue rather than anything else. It's Hank's love of democracy and his hatred of subverting it that drives him during this episode. He loves his lawn, but is willing to let it die before he compromises his ideals. He loves democracy and is unwilling to subvert it for his own benefit, or even the long-term benefit of the board by getting Hashaway removed from his position for corruption, preferring that his resolution pass purely on its own merits. Because at the end of the day, it's about capital R right and capital W wrong. If you have to circumvent order to prove a point, then it likely wasn't the right point to make. Transnational Amusements presents Peggy's Magic Sex Feet. Peggy runs out of the bowling alley embarrassed when they try to announce her shoe size over the microphone, and later, when trying to buy bowling shoes of her own at a big and tall woman's shoe store, she hears about a man who can make her feet feel beautiful. That man is Grant Trimble, who asks her if she's okay with creating an educational video involving her feet to raise the spirits of other women with oversized feet. But while describing the process to Hank, the rest of the alley overhears her, and they find the website her video was posted on, a foot fetish site. Hank visits the man to tell him off when he learns of this and then informs Peggy of the real nature of the site. But when she complains, he informs her that her videos can be inspiring to everyone, which Peggy buys into when he compliments her more. Though later on, some creative differences between the two result in Grant dropping the facade and offering to pay her for her quote, big ugly feet. Realizing that his flattery was fake, she begins to cry in her room when Bobby comes in and cheers her up by comparing his weight to her shoes that he's not ashamed of his fatness, so she shouldn't be ashamed of hers either. This is the episode where Peggy gets tricked into starring in a pornographic movie. Ordinarily, this is the sort of plot reserved for a ditzy character in her college years, although even that trope largely ignores the real-world parallel of the story, usually involving less tricking and more forcing, but here it's given to a middle-aged woman. And while it would be easy to attribute this to Peggy being unintelligent, her motives come more so from being self-conscious than anything else. It just takes a bit of flattery to convince her to do something in such a lewd vein. She's convinced that she can help others feel good about themselves, the same way that Grant Trimble did to her. 
just like other episodes such as Death and Texas, this episode has Peggy coming from a place of good intentions, though instead of selling drugs and hurting others, she's selling smut and hurting herself. By the third act of the episode, she's in a worse mental state than she was at the beginning due to the fact that some sort of happiness was dangled in front of her face, only to be suddenly taken away. This mirrors the beginning of the season where Peggy had thought she'd be able to reinvigorate her life with a child, only to instead fall from a plane and give up on the dream. In that episode, it was Cotton's similar life experience that got her back on her feet, literally, and here the episode comes from Bobby. He gives Peggy the same speech that Hank did, but this time around it's framed not as another person loving her, but a person loving himself. Bobby knows that there's more to him than his weight, and Peggy remembers there's more to her than her feet. Peggy's Fanfare Peggy sends song lyrics to Randy Travis and gets a canned response from his lawyer, though she misconstrues this as proof that she's a good songwriter. The United Arlen Methodist Church goes to the Fanfare Country Music Festival, a suggestion by Peggy, which makes her believe she ought to be in charge of the whole trip. But once they're there, she hears Randy Travis's newest song, which shares a remarkable similarity to hers. She attacks him, accusing him of stealing her work, though he tries to calm her down by saying that similar songs are made all the time. Hank believes him, but Peggy does not, and this escalates to a feud between the couple when Randy also steals her childhood stories as well. Peggy starts to realize that Hank doesn't believe her, and calls her crazy. Meanwhile, Bobby is having trouble with Connie, though Brooks and Dunn manage to talk him through it and he gives the duo one of Peggy's desserts as a thank you, although he drops it near some horse dung along the way, resulting in Brooks getting terribly sick. While trying to TP Randy Travis's trailer, Peggy and the alley accidentally knock it into a lake with him inside. Hank has to jump in and save the man, though he believes that Peggy pushed it in maliciously. She tries to bring her other Apple Brown Betty to him as an apology, though is stopped by security who point out that it's similar to a dessert that had poisoned another during the fair. Though Hank vouches for her, eating the dessert to prove that it's clean, and the charges are dropped, though Hank still wants to punch Randy Travis when he claims that he was the one who saved Hank's life. Peggy's ego is a form of flanderization, a process through which characters in a long-running show steadily become characterized by stereotypes about their personality rather than the more nuanced depictions they used to be. In my opinion, this is an aspect of her character that really started to become more pronounced as of the start of season 4, and yet due to this episode being at the end of season 4 and thus produced before audience reception to the season could be seen and reacted to, this means that an episode of this nature has to come around as an internal reaction to the character. The writers and showrunners themselves viewed this change in Peggy's personality as they were developing the character and could design episodes like this around their own observations. It's this sort of familiarity with one's own cast that makes for a good television writer. Being able to notice trends and developments before the audience can is what makes the characters feel real. This is an episode about Peggy Hill as a concept rather than a person, and having this understanding of your own characters is both a cause and effect of why the cast is so relatable to audiences. You can understand them as well as you can understand a real person. And people love stories about people who feel real, celebrity guest stars notwithstanding. Season 5 Despite its position as one of the most down-to-earth sitcoms out there, King of the Hill still managed to stand out among the rest by rebuking traditions. Most shows had a resetting continuity, but King of the Hill still progressed its characters from season to season. Permanent changes were made, not as a writing scrab, but as an attempt to further realism and to expand what stories could be told. And with these changes come the consequences. Bobby is much more rebellious as of this season, many of the plots moving into the next few episodes consist of him directly feuding with people, usually Hank, rather than the more typical, subtle differences in their lifestyles. Rather than Bobby remaining aloof to his father's wishes, he starts to actively fight against that lifestyle, though this isn't to say that plots don't play out similarly anyway. Bobby has merely hit his age of teenage rebellion. And so is this show. Fox wanted something more standardized, something that made watching reruns easier for a casually invested audience that would hold up against other shows, mostly The Simpsons, but the showrunner still butted heads with this demand. The end result is that most episodes are still standalone, but the whole season manages to be elevated by a binge watch and a careful balancing act between the two ideals. The Perils of Polling Hank and Luann are having a conversation about the upcoming election where Hank learns that Luann has no intention of voting. 
so he convinces her to register at the state fair, only to learn that she is thrown in with the Communist Party, purely because she finds the candidate well-dressed. But when Bobby saves the life of a drowning pig and gets an invite to a presidential fundraiser, Hank considers this an opportunity to introduce his niece to his preferred candidate, a ploy which works, as she starts to reconsider her position because she finds Bush attractive. But at the end of the rally, Hank gets the opportunity to shake the man's hand, only to find out that George Bush Jr. has a weak, flaccid handshake. This shakes his determination to vote for the guy, and he resolves to spend Election Day Christmas shopping with Dale instead of voting. But after Luann fakes a propane emergency to call him, she tells him that it's not the character of the candidate, but the character of the voters that counts and Hank rushes back to Heimlich County to vote alongside his family. As principled a character as Hank Hill is, these principles can often be completely arbitrary if not outright asinine, just as often as they can come across as a strong sense of civic responsibility. Hank feels strongly about every American doing their patriotic duty to vote in each election, and while he's a bit disturbed about Luann's choice to register as communist, he feels more upset that she's only voting that way due to a superficial reason. But Hank does not solely feel as though it's his duty to vote for a good candidate, but a good man. And at one of these arbitrary manliness definitions is a handshake. He makes platitudes about how third world dictators will think America is weak if the president doesn't have a strong grip, but these are ultimately just cover-ups for the fact that he's just as shallow as Luann is when it comes to this decision. This episode is King of the Hill at its absolute best. The satire of American idealism is put on full display as Hank is put into the hypocritical position of having to defend his choices when they conflict with the way he pushes those onto others. As much as he wants to tell Luann to vote Republican because that's what he does, Hank also recognizes that influencing her decision in this way is undemocratic and thus un-American. But to try to convince her otherwise through less direct means ends up revealing his own shallow logic as well, forcing Hank to not only confront the idea that he's unprincipled, but un-American. The buck stops here. Hank is tired of Bobby wasting his summer break and makes him get a job, signing up for caddy work at the local golf course with the help of Buck Strickland. But Bobby ends up slacking off all day before hurting a patron, and when Hank demands that he apologize to Buck for damaging the guy's reputation, Buck actually likes Bobby's personality and hires him as his personal caddy. Hank is upset that Bobby is learning poor work ethic from his boss, as Buck never rewarded any of his own hard work, and this culminates in Buck taking Bobby to an illegal craps game, where Bobby is made uncomfortable as he has to wait outside in an alley. Hank eventually catches up to Bobby just as Buck is kicked out, with the boy being threatened for the rest of Buck's bet, and Bobby flees just in time to be rescued by a golf club wielding Hank, who bails the two out of trouble. In the B-plot, Peggy and Min compete to see who can get to the 8 pint threshold of blood donations to win a mug, despite both women being too weak from the constant withdrawals to properly gloat. Hank has always had a surrogate father sort of relationship to Buck Strickland, using the man's praise as a substitution for his own lack of parental affection from Cotton. This has always been a one-sided relationship though, as Buck does not return this affection often enough for Hank to get any satisfaction from the relationship. Not that he ever acknowledges the poor treatment as his baseline for how he ought to be treated is Cotton's aloofness. So he fails to understand how Bobby was able to get the attention that he never got from the man, as he fails to understand what it really was that Buck Strickland ever wanted out of him. Hank thought that, so long as he kept working hard, his work would eventually receive a proper reward. He was merely several years away from seeing the culmination of this work. But Bobby starts to get preferential treatment from Buck for being an enabler, though. Simply accepting whatever Buck does and going along with it is able to get him more affection in a few days than Hank got in his whole life. Something that Hank does not understand is he had viewed the guy as a role model, and what kind of role model would encourage bad behavior. I don't want to wait. Bobby spends his 13th birthday with his grandmother and Gary, who begins to treat him like a man as he's come of age in his religion. Bobby returns home, eager to begin getting treated like an adult, only to learn that Joseph has recently hit a growth spurt, now being six inches taller and sporting mustache hairs. Joseph gets treated like an adult despite being 12, while Bobby is still treated like his little friend, but at his 13th birthday party, Bobby insists on treating Joseph as though he's younger, trying to teach him how to woo woman by showing off with Connie. Only for Connie to be upset at the way that she's being used. 
While he's moping, Joseph decides to apologize to Connie and Bobby catches the two kissing when he comes in for his own apology. He rages at the two and punches Joseph, with Min treating the bloody nose only for Joseph to try to kiss her too, though she only laughs at the attempt, leading Joseph to rage and try to steal the Bugabago, taking Connie with him and eventually Bobby too. But when he crashes into a lamp post, the three then cover for each other by blaming teenagers for the incident, putting the argument behind them. Meanwhile, Hank gets the idea to pre-make coffins for himself and Peggy to help his wife cope with not being invited to Bobby's party. Bobby is hoping to be treated like an adult after having been treated that way by Gary, something the guy only really did as Bobby was moping about others viewing him as a child. But Joseph has the opposite problem, where he gets treated like an adult despite wanting to be treated as though he were younger. The new changes his body and mind are undergoing are proving to be unpleasant. Not to mention the fact that Bobby seems to be much more adult than Joseph is, despite looking much younger. He has a girlfriend, he has confidence, and all the other things one would associate with being grown up, even if Bobby can't truly recognize how much more mature he's becoming. But in his pursuit to be more mature, Bobby ends up having even less control over his childishness, and allows himself to rage against Connie and Joseph's relationship, throwing a tantrum equivalent of a child, all because he was trying too hard to get something he already had. Joseph and Bobby are both hoping to pick and choose what parts of adulthood they get to take part in, only to end up having the bad outweigh the good in their blind search for more adulting in their lives. Ironically, Hank and Peggy seem to be very calm about entering the next part of their days, happily planning out their coffins that they would like to be buried in, with no sort of existential dread. Spin the Choice John Redcorn, hoping to spend more time with Joseph, volunteers to speak about the plight of the American Indian at Tom Landry Middle School. But instead of reaching Joseph, he only manages to reach Bobby's ear instead, and Bobby is soon moved to create an authentic protest feast during Thanksgiving. An issue as Hank had selected him to carve one of the Thanksgiving turkeys. Later, John Redcorn opens up emotionally about not being able to spend time with his biological son, who is acting distant and the move makes Hank too uncomfortable to remain involved with the issue. Until Bobby reveals his thanks-taking protest feast, which includes a faux human head, as his research led him to believe that the Anasazi tribe practices cannibalism. When John Redcorn leaves the feast after Joseph calls him weird, Dale tries to comfort him, only to mistakenly believe he's been kidnapped to be eaten. So Hank takes his son and Joseph to John Redcorn's trailer to defuse the situation, where Joseph's explanation of what Nancy told him is enough that John Redcorn calms down and accepts a lawsuit settlement from the federal government for 12 acres near the highway. John Redcorn and an Anasazi American Indian, a member of a tribe which died out over 500 years ago, likely a move by the showrunners to avoid having a complex character come across as potentially unpalatable to audiences and used as an example of bad representation for a real modern tribe. But these potential misinterpretations are shown in universe as well as the general reasons behind why these mistakes are made. For a majority of the cast, it's a case of political apathy. The problem doesn't affect them and happened centuries ago, so why bother caring? And for others like Bobby, it's misappropriated knowledge implemented haphazardly. Cannibalism was rarely done as anything more than ritualistic, and more often than not was just an extrapolation of a public execution, no different from what the state of Texas does today. Even the usage of the term Anasazi is likely incorrect, as that was a Navajo word for enemy that is the only remaining language describing the tribe. It's improbable that a group of people would knowingly label themselves as enemies. But this episode is not so much about John Redcorn's past as it is about his future, or his lack of one. While he has an idea of what it is that he wants, both in regards to the relationship he has with his son and the reparations he demands, he has to settle for a much lesser reality, as the truth is much more complicated than a stolen wife or stolen property. Peggy Makes the Big Leagues Peggy gets invited to substitute teach at Arlen High School, the big leagues of substitute teaching. But one of her students, David Kalaiki Ali, is the star fullback for Arlen and isn't used to having to put forth effort in classes as he's the team's only chance at making state. Peggy tries to get the guy to properly pay attention in class, but he blows off her lessons, so she reacts by failing him for incompletion of assignments. 
Hank and the guys from the Booster Club are furious as David can't play if he's failing, so they come up with a scheme to have their star player drop the class and do a hastily cobbled together work-study program at Strickland Propane, something meant to give him an easy A and become eligible again. But Hank feels bad about giving the guy a passing grade, especially after his essay insulted Propane, and he decides to go in front of the board to announce that he should not have passed the guy and will be revoking the grade. But when they go to his mother to inform her that her child is being robbed of an education, she reveals that he's learning disabled and can't retain any information, a farce to make the Hills feel as though they were the ones in the wrong. But after David learns that he's being passed as a mentally disabled child, he realizes how bad his lack of academic accreditation looks, and Peggy works together with Hank to teach him the basics of propane for real. Peggy is a principled person, just the same as Hank. The two have an extreme passion for their area of expertise, Peggy with teaching and Hank with propane, and we've seen in earlier episodes that Peggy is actually a very talented teacher who simply fails to pass on her enthusiasm to her class, while Hank doesn't quite get that others don't share his love of propane. To them, these things are so ingrained into their personalities that the idea someone else wouldn't see the same joy is completely foreign. Hank does not sympathize with Peggy when she fails David, not so much for his bad grades, but the fact that he didn't care, until he tries to teach the boy himself. Both of them were eager to fail him for lack of enthusiasm, as they were also content with passing him when they believed him to be learning disabled. But it's not as though David really is a lazy individual. He actually does care about his future prospects, even if he veils it behind the idea that he needs a backup plan. It merely takes the idea that others view him on the same level as the learning disabled to realize that his reputation as some stupid jock is what persists when jock is all he hears. Football means as much to him as education means to Peggy, or propane to Hank, and the idea that an imbecile can perform at his level is a personal offense. When Cotton Comes Marching Home While getting supplies for Peggy's Veterans Day parade float, Hank and Peggy see Cotton and Dee Dee out shopping. Cotton has been living at the VFW in Arlen for days without having told them. But when Peggy gets rebuked asking for Cotton's medals, Hank goes over to tell him off, only to learn the real reason Cotton is living there. He's run out of money. He tries to get a new job, but is only able to work at a steakhouse through Hank's connections, being demoted to men's room attendant and told he cannot march in the Veterans Day Parade as he has to work on that day. But when Cotton sees his repossessed car in the parade, he storms out of his post to steal it, going on a rampage against everyone who mistreated him up to that point. But when his rampage ends, he realizes that he's no closer to being able to take care of Good Hank or Dee Dee, so he borrows a single bullet from Dale and shuts himself in his room, only for Hank to rush over and catch him, teaching his son how to fire a gun. Afterwards, Cotton agrees to allow Hank to pay him back for all the money he spent raising him. Cotton is one of the most proud characters in the entire show, his pride often being the thing that butts heads with others more than any other source of problems. In fact, more often than not, any difficulty he encounters comes less from the actual source of the issue and more from his inability to acknowledge the problem until it's too late, at which point he doubles down and refuses to admit that there's anything he can do to fix it, as it's not his fault for being in that situation in the first place. But pride doesn't take care of your responsibilities and it's not enough to put food on the table. Cotton has to learn to put away his pride in order to get things done, as it's a feeling that's only holding him back. But then why should it be? While the narrative rarely makes his lack of tact into a positive thing, it still occasionally shows that the world isn't precisely fair to him, either. Cotton is mistreated by his boss in this episode, told not to march in a parade honoring him, and looked down upon more than literally by everyone else around him. If anybody deserves a break of good luck, it's Cotton. The fact that he can even remain prideful in this state of living is, is practically something worth being proud of in itself. So while the narrative doesn't portray him as a great person, it's not as though it jumps into the opposite extreme, either. What makes Bobby run? Hoping to get some more pictures of himself in the Tom Landry Middle School yearbook, Bobby signs up to be the football team's new mascot, getting Hank to make him a pair of horns for the costume. Hank is proud of his son for becoming a part of the school's tradition, until Bobby learns that there's an annual McManor Berry whoopin' done by the opposite school's band. When it comes time for this beating, he runs away instead of accepting the attack, leading to him becoming the most hated person in the school. But before he can turn in his costume, Bobby gets the idea to steal the Belton Armadillo, another school's mascot. 
he recruits the help of Dale to break in, but while there, they learn that the other middle school plans on stealing the mascot costume from Arlen. They rush back to protect the garbage can containing the costume, and it appears as though Bobby has run away again when the other students break in to take it. But during the next game, it's revealed that Bobby simply stowed away inside the outfit instead, bursting out at halftime and stealing the other school's mascot. The episode ends with him being beaten up for this, starting a new school tradition. As Bobby mentions in this episode, he is willing to do anything to be the center of attention, down to donning a mascot costume, but evidently limiting himself to things that don't involve public beatings. Despite getting exactly what he wants, Bobby realizes that there are some things he doesn't feel like subjecting himself to in the pursuit, so he runs away from the fight to save his skin. But this ends up denying him the initial positive attention he'd been getting as the mascot, leaving him worse off after everything is done. Bobby cares more about the attention he gets from associating with the football team's traditions than he does about the traditions themselves. It isn't until he nearly has the costume stolen that he finally realizes that the two are exactly as connected as they initially appeared to be. He's finally willing to let not the band, but the football team wail on him as he's learned that the positive social effect of traditions are more valuable than whatever temporary attention you might receive from making a fool out of yourself. And this lesson is immortalized in the yearbook at the end of the episode. Was the nut before Christmas. Bill is moping over spending yet another Christmas alone until Hank takes him to the post office to cheer the guy up, where he gets the idea to buy presents for needy kids. Following this trend of giving, Bill decides to open up a Santa's village to help out children, and he provides a free service that attracts a lot of positive attention, including some attention from a single mother named Marilyn, who asks him out when she sees how good he is with her kids. But once Christmas is over, Bill keeps the decorations up and continues trying to host, eventually scaring off Marilyn and everybody else. But while out washing his Santa outfit, he gets hit up for money by a slacker named Wally, and Wally begins crashing at Bill's house, taking advantage of the hospitality and eventually selling beer to Bobby, Joseph, and Connie. When Hank finds out that the neighborhood kids are drunk and learns that Wally stole his belt sander, he demands that Bill throw the guy out, who leaves when he learns that he's expected to straighten up. But Bill comes crawling back to Hank for answers when he learns that Wally has been arrested, and torn between being taken advantage of and abandoning his, quote, son, Bill finds a happy medium by enrolling the guy in the army. This episode draws a comparison between the parenting style of Hank and Bill through their children, Hank's biological son Bobby and Bill's adoptive mentality towards Wally. Although the comparison is not entirely apt, as it was only Wally's ability to detect that Bill was easy to take advantage of that drew him to the guy in the first place. But while Hank is overly bound to the rules, such as refusing to allow Bobby to watch a TV-14 show, Bill does not make any rules or standards, correctly guessing that Wally would walk out if he had any amount of resistance. In fact, Bill had to have known from the beginning that it was not an even relationship with the guy, otherwise he would have put up more rules and restrictions at first. And by the end of the episode, it becomes clear that he's failed at parenting. Bill compares himself to Hank, who is doing a fine job of raising Bobby, and can't seem to match his friend's level of competence. But to realize this is one thing while admitting it is another. Bill cannot admit to his failure, especially after spending so many Christmases in despair over his lack of connections. Admitting to failure would mean that, once he gets close to happiness, he messes it up, such as how he failed to keep Marilyn engaged. Meaning that he'll be alone forever through his own fault. It's enrolling Wally in the military that finally gets him the best possible ending. Having a son figure who will get the same upbringing as him means that he's succeeding on his own terms without compromising his dignity. Chasing Bobby The Hill and Gribble families go out to see a chick flick and Hank begins crying in the theater. Peggy assumes that he was crying because of the father-son dynamic of the movie and Dale teases him for it, but the root of the issue comes from his truck. The carburetor keeps catching fire and there are other cascading problems. Hank believes that the truck might be dying soon. After a reluctant trip to the mechanic, he's told that the vehicle only has a few hundred miles left on it and that it would cost more to fix it than it would to replace it. He tries to replace the system himself, but even after an all-nighter, it still shows a lot of issues which wind up overheating the engine and losing Strickland propane in account. Peggy, still convinced that Hank is emotional over his lack of a relationship with Bobby, tries to get her son to work on the truck with Hank. There, Bobby sees a newspaper ad about a truck shop that he thinks would be able to fix it. 
but rather than truck repairs, they're actually a dealership, and Hank lashes out at Bobby for wasting his time when the truck finally stalls on some train tracks. It's destroyed when he can't start it up in time, and Hank goes back to the dealership to call a cab. But when Bobby decides to walk home alone in the rain, Hank test drives a similar truck to his own, and is impressed enough on the ride that he eventually decides to buy it. But not after a conversation with Bobby where they reminisce on the good times the old truck gave them. Hank goes through the stages of grief in this episode. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. These stages, despite most commonly being presented in this order, aren't necessarily revealed in the same order, nor independently. Hank goes through a mix of denial and depression when he first starts to suspect that his truck is going to give out on him. He begins to bargain after his attempts to have it repaired are rebuked, and he's willing to shell out for a brand new carburetor, among other fixes, to keep the truck alive for just a bit longer. And when it seems like Bobby has wasted the last few miles the truck has left, he lashes out in uncharacteristic anger at his son. It's not until finding a new truck that he can be happy with, he's able to move on to acceptance, not just because of the truck itself, but because of people that he can share the grief with. As much as Hank refuses to admit it, he is a sentimental man. Everyone with at least a little bit of principle is. If you value something, then you'll fear losing it. And Hank values the truck, not purely in a monetary sense as he's willing to repair it despite being totaled, but in a nostalgic sense, reminiscing on the early days following the purchase. If you put 20 years of your life into something, of course you'll be attached to it. Yankee Hanky While searching for his birth certificate, Hank starts to fear that he might be adopted due to not finding it from either of his parents. But when he checks online with Dale, Hank learns that his parents are in fact his own, as well as the fact that his birthplace was New York City, New York. He is disturbed by this revelation and confronts his father to learn what happened, where he hears about his mother desperately wanting to visit the city. Saddened about his New York heritage, Hank starts to feel as though he's not Texan enough to continue living the way he has been, not man enough to drive his truck, or remember trivia about the state. But when he calls his mother later, she tells him the real truth, that he was born in the women's restroom at Yankee Stadium during a failed attempt by Cotton to assassinate Fidel Castro. Hank confronts Cotton again, inspiring the guy to finish his plan to assassinate the Cuban leader by getting his guys back together to sail across the Gulf of Mexico. And they plan on using Hank as a fall guy by feigning an apology about not telling him the truth. But when Hank is left in San Antonio with his prints on the gun, he starts to search for some way out, where he learns that the original defenders of the Republic of Texas were all originally from different parts of the US. Emboldened by this, he rushes to Corpus Christi, dressed as Davy Crockett, to stop his father's plan, and ends the episode feeling like a true Texan once more. Hank takes pride in his origins, so long as those origins line up with what he currently values. It's this sense of nationalism that causes people to value their country above all others, regardless of what that entails. Hank considers himself a true Texan for being born there, and that somehow being born elsewhere diminishes all of his past accomplishments. Nationalism doesn't always make sense in this way, like a proud Texan loving his place of birth despite the place you were born in being something you don't get any say in, whereas an immigrant to Texas actively chose to be there, arguably showing more dedication than somebody living in the state because of inertia. So of course this is the lesson he learns during the episode. Many of the folk heroes of Texas history were people not originally born in the state, who in fact arrived back when the territory was still a part of Mexico. So a Texan identity is more so something influenced by the things you do, rather than one thing you didn't long ago. Something that could have been seen in Bobby, who was born and raised in Texas, but still shows less authenticity than Hank does. In Hank's own words, that boy ain't right. Hank and the Great Glass Elevator the Alley celebrates Bill's birthday in Austin, where the guys prank Hank Hill into mooning out the glass elevator at their hotel, only for him to inadvertently moon former Governor Ann Richards. But when security shows up to their room, Bill admits to the mooning to take the fall for Hank, and shortly afterwards is seen having dinner with Richards. As it turns out, she was impressed by Bill taking the fall for his friend and was smitten, with the two going to formal events for a time afterwards. But the attention Bill is receiving is discovered by Lenore, his ex-wife, and she shows up at an event to try to ruin the relationship, convincing Bill to cheat on Ann Richards. When she catches him talking to Lenore on the phone during a Rangers game, Ann Richards breaks up with him, something Bill announces to Lenore later at his birthday party, which upon hearing causes her to lose interest, leaving Bill with neither woman. 
Meanwhile, Bobby and Peggy have charcoal grilled burgers at Luann's end of semester party, and they love the taste, sneaking out to grill more behind Hank's back. But when he finds charcoal in his house, Hank is upset and forces Peggy to choose between him and the other fuel, and Peggy chooses her husband. Bill has never gotten over the departure of Lenore, a repeated aspect of his character, and up to this point, the reason for his breakup was never exactly clear. At times, it was Bill's poor hygiene, bad physique, and lack of drive in his profession that drove Lenore away, but other times portrayed Lenore as a terrible person, cheating on Bill constantly and taking advantage of the guy. It really depended on how Bill was characterized in that episode. But as of now, it's Lenore who is portrayed as the problem, being petty enough not just to ruin Bill's mental health with the breakup, but to go back and finish the job when it looks like he started to recover. As the show has progressed, the writers have a more solid idea of who each character is, their personality being set in stone more as they learn what plots work and which don't. Many episodes in the past were mean to Bill, but in the more recent seasons, his faults are a lot more complex. Bill's still not a great guy, but it's implied that this is in part a result of a spiral of depression that started around the time he was with his first wife. Likewise, we see the relationship between Peggy and Hank become more solidified. While they might not be perfect for each other, they're still as good as anyone can hope to do. Perfection is an unrealistic ideal, just as Ann Richards was perfect for Bill, but he still had many personal issues to resolve before he would deserve to end up with her. Now, who's the dummy? After wowing a retired ventriloquist, Jerry Popper, Bobby inherits Chip, his old carved figure. Bobby begins to work on a puppeteering act, much to the disturbance of Hank, but as Bobby starts to research more and more for the role, he starts to teach himself the basics of sports. Soon, Chip and Bobby are accepted alongside Hank and the guys as they go out for games, but it's soon learned that Hank prefers the company of Chip to Bobby. Bobby asks Jerry Popper for advice about the puppet being more popular than he is, and learns from the expert that that's just how the business goes. So Bobby resigns to letting the show go on, even if he's only at the edge of the spotlight. But when Dale, who is terrified of puppets and has been plotting Chip's destruction since the start of the second act, steals and destroys Chip, Hank gets the idea to simply craft a new, better puppet. Dubbed Chip 2.0, Hank starts to spend more time with the figure than with Bobby. But after Peggy points out that he's neglecting his son, Hank decides to go back to work, shaping the new dummy to look like Bobby instead. Bobby and Hank have always struggled to find some sort of common ground between their interests. Bobby doesn't care about the things Hank values, and vice versa. But here, Bobby ends up taking an interest in sports, not because he enjoys watching them, but because he's trying to get in character for a role. After seeing how much his father likes the new knowledge, he continues to research out of an interest in getting to spend more time with his dad. This works out, though Bobby isn't actually the center of attention. He didn't merely want to spend time with Hank, he wanted to get closer to him, and the puppet in between the family members is an obstacle to that. But Hank, too, feels the same way, even if he's a bit slower to realize. He enjoys the new companion in Chip, but ultimately values the time he's spending with Bobby. In fact, he views the barrier of the puppet as an acceptable middleman for the two, happy that he gets to talk sports with anyone. It's not until realizing that Bobby's take on the situation is different from his own that he finally realizes the issue with this newfound bond. It's not that Hank really didn't like the puppet more than his own son, but what the puppet represented, and that's something that you don't need a carved figure to achieve. Oh yeah. A new hire at Strickland, Tammy Duvall, messes some things up that force Hank to miss a lunch date with Peggy, so Peggy goes with Tammy instead. While out, they start to bond over Peggy's teaching experience and Tammy's lack of a good role model, resulting in Peggy inviting Tammy to stay with them while she works on getting her GED. Hank is unsure about letting Peggy's new friend stay with them, but Tammy's able to pay rent and buys a few gifts for Hank, winning him over. Eventually, Hank tries to get her a steady boyfriend and starts to take her along on his propane route, with Tammy dating many of the men he introduces her to. But things take a turn when Alabaster Jones, Tammy's old manager, arrives in Arlen, wanting his girl back, revealing at the same time that he was her old pimp. Hank is mortified by the fact that he let a prostitute into his home and accepted gifts from her, demanding she leave at once. But when Tammy reveals that she genuinely wants to get out of her old ways and keep learning with Peggy, Hank relents, especially because Alabaster returns to try to pick a fight. 
So Hank dons the hat Tammy gave to him and plays up his role as the Mac Daddy of Arlen County, scaring Alabaster off before renouncing the role. The idea of taking a prostitute into his house and watching after her is something one would never expect a more traditionally minded man like Hank Hill to ever do. But because her character is introduced to Hank with that aspect last of all, he's much more willing to take her personality up front instead of her career. In this way, by the time he finds out that she's a sex worker, he's not so much upset, but weirded out by the revelation. The only anger he feels towards her being a result of the fact that she lied about it to him instead of being truthful. Though being truthful would have gotten her kicked out of the house in the first place, so deception was her only option, even if it was something that she only settled on by a mistake of judgement, rather than out of malice. And of course, if there's anybody who would be easy to fool in this way, it would be Hank Hill. He's so honest a guy that the idea of Peggy befriending a sex worker never even crosses his mind, and the writing of King of the Hill is strongest when it uses the differences between its cast and audience in this way. Much of the episode's humor comes from the dramatic irony between Hank's actions and the later revelation, donning a pimp's hat and Cadillac with no understanding of the image the usually straight-laced Hank Hill is projecting. The Exterminator After passing out from inhaling too much poison, Dale Gribble is told by a doctor that he has to stop being around toxic chemicals or he may die. So he's forced to quit the extermination game, giving him ample free time to sit around the house, helping Joseph with his science project of raising roaches. But all the sitting around is hurting his love life, and so Hank pulls a few strings to get him a job at an adhesives company. But all the stresses of his 9 to 5 are wearing him out, and he begins to lose his temper at his friends and family, until he overhears two women in HR speaking about their inability to fire a man who's been at the company a long time. Dale steps in and fires the man for them, cutting him off so efficiently that they decide to make him a full-time assistant manager of human resources. The firing guy. He gets his spark back with the new promotion, but when his friends and family learn of what his actual promotion entails, they're too put off by the job to go back to the way things were. When Joseph shows up to pick up his science project from Dale's office, they learn that the roaches have escaped, and, still unable to use poison, Dale simply smashes all of the insects by hand. This makes him rediscover the love he had of his old job, and he quits to return to the life of an exterminator. Despite, or maybe because of, his eccentricities, it might be strange to imagine that Dale Gribble is actually one of the most well-adjusted members of the cast of King of the Hill. Like Hank, he has a job that he's extraordinarily passionate about, and hobbies outside of work that he can enjoy too. As such, he has a high level of what you might call bliss to balance in life so many things. When you can enjoy what you do for a living and then come home to something else you also look forward to, you'll avoid things like burnout or a sense of lacking fulfillment. So Dale losing his exterminator job also means that he loses his sense of purpose, and without this the balance to the rest of his life is thrown off as well. He spends too much time on his hobbies to the detriment of his home life, and while Hank is somewhat accurate in guessing that he just needs some steady work to bring meaning back to his career, Hank underestimated just how fulfilling the exterminator work was to his friend. It wasn't about the career itself, but the sense of satisfaction that came with it. Luann Virgin 2.0 After breaking up with her newest boyfriend, Luann is lamenting her failures in dating, mentioning that she slept with men before marriage. This disturbs Hank, who waited, and he takes Luann to church where he and Peggy learn of a born-again virgin program that the church hosts where they can sponsor Luann. During a sponsorship meeting, Hank meets a repressed man named Rhett, and Peggy reveals that she slept with another man before marrying Hank. They proceed with the ceremony, and Luann becomes obsessed with her newfound virginity. But Hank and Peggy are worried about whether she can continue to repress her urges, and Hank sets her up with Rhett. The two quickly feel a sense of lust, and only two days after meeting, decide to get married. While Peggy is trying to explain why this is a bad idea, Luann reveals to Hank that Peggy didn't wait the way that he did, causing them to argue and separate for a while. But the next night when Peggy laments her mistake to Luann after she and Hank catch the engaged couple in Rhett's van, Luann is finally gotten through to, and she cancels the wedding so Peggy can become born again as well. The sight of her in the soaked white clothing encouraging Hank to forgive her so they can reconsummate their marriage. Hank is repressed enough to the point of feeling extreme discomfort by any and all means of fornication, only begrudgingly going through with some of the ceremony alongside Luann out of his concern for her. But Hank himself does not view this as a problem. In fact, to him, it's everyone else's frankness with the discussion that he sees as abnormal. 
Hank himself being one of the few sane ones for his level of repression. This is why, when he meets Rhett, he doesn't consider the guy to be as off-putting as perhaps he should have. The man clearly had a few hang-ups about his relationships in the past, but Hank being Hank, these were viewed as pretty healthy reactions. It wasn't until Luann got engaged to the guy so quickly that Hank finally realized what was really going on. The two were rushing into a commitment purely out of a sense of lust, something Hank was completely unable to relate to. And like most things he doesn't understand, Hank is against everything about it. He assumes Peggy has his back on the subject, which she does, but after learning about her fling before their marriage, he's too blinded by his disgust to bother realizing this, even after Peggy tells everyone how much of a mistake it would have been not to marry Hank. Hank's Choice Bobby begins sneezing constantly, and after Peggy takes him to the doctors for an allergy test, the family learns that he's allergic to pet dander, specifically Ladybird. So Hank has to make the tough decision to build a doghouse for the dog, somewhere to put her away so she stops triggering Bobby's allergies. But Ladybird refuses to go into the house, and Bobby is still sneezing, so Hank gets the idea to let Bobby stay in the doghouse while Ladybird stays with them. Bobby is thrilled about this new idea, finally having a place of his own, but the neighbors start to make fun of the Hill family, while Bobby slowly starts to behave more dog-like to the disgust of Connie. And as Bobby has begun to fake symptoms to keep his new place, he's long since gotten over the allergies, the Hills are eventually forced to give away Ladybird to Bill and get their house totally steam cleaned out. Eventually, Bobby sees how much it's tearing up Hank to not have a dog or a son, and so he feigns finding some combination of pills that works so the family can be together again. Ladybird and Bobby are shown to be equivalent in Hank's mind, the two both being 13 years old and becoming additions to the Hill family at around the same time. Earlier seasons have shown that the two are directly connected as well. Ladybird being around the house was what reinvigorated the Hills' relationship and drive to conceive. So in this episode, we have Hank forced to choose between one or the other, and he picks Ladybird. While it at first sounds like Hank is picking his dog over his son, there are still other contributing factors as to how this decision was made. Bobby himself influences the choice. Ladybird is 13 in dog years and much more dependent on Hank for support, whereas Bobby is 13 in human years and eager for a little bit of independence from his family. So when the doghouse arrangement is made, Bobby and Hank are both quick to come to the same conclusion, a happy ending for both people. It's not until the reality of this situation is made apparent that the social consequences of treating your son like a dog and vice versa are clear. The odd behavior, something Hank reviles above all else, is getting them negative attention. And so Hank, with the decision weighing on him a second time, eventually chooses to go to extreme lengths for Bobby. It's just up to the boy whether or not to accept this outcome. It's not easy being green. Bobby is writing environmental court tickets on the behest of his teacher, Mr. McKay. Hank is annoyed by his son's new environmentalist obsession and goes to one of these mock courts as it's a part of his son's grade. But there, he learns that Arlen intends to drain the quarry for a new landfill, something which he is firmly against. As it turns out, Hank, Bill, and Dale stole Boomhauer's car and went for a joyride decades ago, crashing it into the quarry and then lying about what happened. So Hank tells the other guys and they volunteer to help Mr. McKay's protest in order to prevent their joyride from being discovered. But when the city ignores their petition, they opt to simply lift the car out of the quarry to hide it. The environmentalists from before arrive at the quarry in time to see their attempts and mistake it for a protective barrier, joining in on the perceived blockade. Hank plays along for a time, but, but when Bobby overhears the real reason his father was there, he calls Boomhauer himself to reveal the truth. In the end, the police arrive and Hank pleads for Bobby to be let off the hook, getting arrested himself, while Boomhauer gives Bobby a ride home, telling the boy to let bygones be bygones. Hank Hill does not consider himself an environmentalist, to the point that this has become a part of his identity. He sells propane and loves to grill, so any attempts to preserve the environment are viewed to him as a personal attack. It doesn't help that McKay and his yoga group are willing to make it a personal attack whenever they denigrate the Hill family for their wastefulness. If you want to convince somebody of something, anything, it helps if you don't act as though you are looking down on them. Of course, it doesn't help that Hank is just as willing to resort to insults first when defending himself, but that's not the main point of this episode. Hank only buys into environmentalism in order to preserve his self-interests. He and the other guys try to prevent Boomhauer from learning not only that they wrecked his car, but that they lied about it. 
and in lying about it, they also hurt Bobby, who for once had believed that he'd managed to convince his dad of anything. So on top of Bobby learning that he and Hank weren't really bonding, Hank also reveals to Boomhauer another lie, hurting his reputability in multiple different ways as each lie reveals another. The Trouble with Gribbles Nancy celebrates her 40th birthday at the spa with her husband, nervous over her age and the way it might prevent her from continuing her career as the weather girl, a fear that comes true when Luann is brought in to replace her on short notice, taking the job full time. Nancy insists that she get plastic surgery to look younger, but as it's too expensive, Dale decides to sue Manitoba cigarettes in small claims court for making his wife less attractive with his secondhand smoke. He assumes their lawyers won't show up, but they do, countersuing for $1.3 million, and they bug his house with a singing fish to gather evidence. But when Dale finds the bug, he starts to verbally abuse Nancy in front of it in order to better sell the case, keeping her in the dark as he doesn't think that her acting is good enough to go along. But Nancy eventually leaves him because of his ploy, and after getting scared by Bill, Dale tries to win her back, to no success. On the day of the trial, the Manitoba lawyers offer Dale an out-of-court settlement of $75,000, which he rejects, instead testifying that his wife is indeed beautiful and having the case thrown out. In the end, she gets her job back when Dale threatens an age discrimination suit. We often judge others for their actions while judging ourselves based on intentions. This is something at the center of this episode. That Dale assumes his verbal abuse towards his wife is acceptable as he's doing it for her own good, to buy her the surgery that she wants. These actions go against what he believes is the right thing to do, less out of their acting and more because he doesn't think that she needs the surgery in the first place, but Dale has always been willing to take a morally dubious course of action for his own benefit. But as Nancy is kept in the dark about this plan and Dale's true feelings about it, she only gets to see the middle step. She's unaware that he wants her to have the surgery, that he doesn't think she needs it, and that he's lying about the effect of secondhand smoke on his wife's face. So this is where the conflict ultimately comes into play. Dale ends up rejecting a large sum of money from the out-of-court settlement offered by Manitoba, as for him, the money was always secondary. It doesn't take a stretch for his characterization to turn it down, as he doesn't think that she needs the surgery in the first place. The purpose was to make his wife happy, but if he can do that with a grand gesture, then why not take the easier route of apology? Hank's Backstory Dale enters the Durndal County mower races and the rest of the alley enters against him. But as they're training, Hank throws out his back. He's hesitant to get it checked on until the pain is too debilitating and Peggy convinces him to go to the doctor. While there, he learns that he has diminished gluteal syndrome, no ass. He's told to wear a prosthetic to protect his spinal cord, but Hank is embarrassed about this. And although the embarrassment wears off of it once he's able to start sitting again, it comes back when the alley discovers his unit and begins to taunt him for it. But when Peggy fakes a propane emergency to get him to go to a support group for other men with the condition, he starts to realize there's nothing wrong with wearing one, and he starts to wear his unit again. But once he realizes that Bobby is self-conscious about developing DGS himself, he decides to re-enter the race so his son won't grow up ashamed. Though the support group is hesitant about how public Hank is going with this. On the day of the race, his unit pops and he's about to give up until the guys return to cheer him on, donating one of theirs to Hank so he can finish proud. Hank is ordinarily very reserved about anything abnormal coming forth about him. There have been multiple plots about this in the past, as early as the first season. But here, this reservation is shown to have multiple detrimental effects. First, his stubbornness about visiting the doctor in the first place causes his back issues to worsen as he continues to sit on his spine for years, making the issue worse than if it had been diagnosed earlier. Then his shame in wearing his unit causes him to have to give up riding on his mower or even maintaining the lawn, a point of pride for him being done away with because of his pride in another field. And finally, Hank is able to overcome this shame, only to realize that it's having an effect on his son, that if he were to keep living in embarrassment, then Bobby will be raised to go through the same lack of fulfillment that he almost suffered through. So wanting Bobby to turn out alright, he starts to fight against the stigma so his son doesn't have to. It's Hank's uniqueness in being so reserved that put him in the position that he knows just how much this sense of shame can hold someone back, making him stand out among the other men of the support group prior to them learning the lesson from him. 
Seeing how hard Hank fought through reinvigorates their passion, that they felt embarrassed too, enough to join the group in the first place, and that they ought to stand up for their own rights, or rather, sit down. Kidney Boy and Hamster Girl, A Love Story Bobby and Connie take a shortcut to school through the high school parking lot, only to get chased down by the high schoolers where Bobby has to abandon his bike. When trying to retrieve it, he gets confused for a freshman and sent inside, but after seeing the culture there, he starts to sneak out to go to high school more and more, faking that he's a senior with a kidney condition that makes him look young, giving him the nickname Kidney Boy. But while he's enjoying the life of Kidney Boy, he forgets to buy prom tickets for himself and Connie, eventually faking that she's a fellow hospital attendee with a short tail to justify why he's talking with her. Meanwhile, Dale decides to buy a porta potty and spruce it up, charging people to use it. This porta potty gets used for a stunt by Arlen High, which earns them a concert by No Doubt, orchestrated by Bobby himself. While he's planning this stunt, Connie breaks up with him to go to the middle school prom with Joseph as he actually has tickets, and she's trying to make Bobby jealous. But when the high schoolers are out later, they wrangle Bobby into throwing water balloons at the middle schoolers, with Bobby taking a balloon for Connie after revealing that the whole thing was a lie. In the end, the high schoolers apologize to Bobby and give him two tickets to their prom as he wasn't able to go with Connie and no doubt is expecting to see Kidney Boy at the concert. While slow dancing with Connie at the high school prom, Bobby says that he's done with the Kidney Boy persona, spreading into a rumor that Kidney Boy has died. This is him finally dropping the whole act in order to get acceptance. Because it was never Bobby that the high schoolers really liked, it was Kidney Boy. Part of their acceptance was because of the fact that he was sick and they were taking pity on him, and the other half was that they thought he was one of them. So a relationship built on two lies is a flimsy one, and they never truly liked Bobby for who he was. But Connie always has, and she's not willing to go along with these lies in order to maintain anything as they are, to her, unnecessary. If people only like the version of you you're pretending to be, then they don't really like you, and you won't get any of the positive things that we really need from social relationships. Whenever you're praised, it's false. When you're complimented, it's false. And if you really feel like you're connecting with another person, that's false too. Bobby has had a genuine love with another person in Connie, and to put on such a fake persona that she's dragged along into it too can make the stuff that's real seem less so. Season 6 Jonathan A. Bell and Glenn Berger were the showrunners for most of Season 6, taking over the position from Richard Appel. Though this tenure was short due to behind-the-scenes reasons, they departed, with Greg Daniels returning to run the remainder of the season. Many of the episodes of this season had heavy rewrites, whether this was a symptom or cause of the earlier drama being a question, and were frequently aired with plots different from the short summaries presented on Fox prior to airing. If season 6 can be described in a single term, however, it's flanderization. That is, the steady simplification of a character from their initial premise to an exaggeration of what they used to be, often circulating around a single aspect of their character. Starting in season 6, many of the worst aspects of the show's cast are put into the spotlight, a lot of negativity surrounding who they are as people that gets them into worse and worse positions. And these positions are often extremes, things that would rarely, if ever, happen in the real world. It shows a detachment from the realism of the earlier seasons that made the show so unique in the first place. Moving forward, the show was much more in line with so many other animated sitcoms of the time. But while this may sound like I'm being negative myself, this is not the case as far as ratings and audience perception were. Because so many of the most iconic moments of the show happened during the season. The next three episodes include That's My Purse, I Don't Know You, Pocket Sand, and so much of Peggy's Broken Spanish. Several of the most memorable bits from the show are in its future, the things that people still remember about King of the Hill. It's golden age, to borrow another term from The Simpsons history. Bobby Goes Nuts Bobby tries to revive Connie's sleepover when the party seems like it's dying, only for Chain Wasana Song to arrive and harass him, ending with the guy and his friends forcing Bobby to eat dirt. When Bobby tells Hank about the assault, Hank encourages the boy to fight his own battles by taking a self-defense course at the YMCA. But the only course available is woman's self-defense, where he learns to go for the testicles. The strategy proves effective for a time, with Bobby fighting off Chain and many other bullies, earning the fear of most of the school. 
But when the boy is suspended, and Hank finally learns how Bobby has been fighting his battles, Hank decides that Bobby needs to learn how to fight above the belt, boxing with him personally. But Bobby gets angry with his dad's lessons, and he kicks Hank in the testes, incapacitating his father. Khan tells Bobby that, while Hank is out of commission, he can't be pushed around by anybody, so Bobby stops doing his chores or respecting his dad. Finally, Peggy has to step in to confiscate Bobby's video games, as his usual method of attacking no longer works against her, and Hank tells Bobby that it's no fun when a person fights dirty, whether that's kicking the testes or having a woman fight his battles for him. Growing up, Hank was the schoolyard bully type that gave Bobby so much trouble, and as such he doesn't understand or empathize with his son being the underdog in any sort of scuffle. So when Bobby resorts to fighting dirty, Hank doesn't agree with the methods, as those were the kind of things that the lower rungs of his schoolyard would have to do. It's not until the situations are reversed that he finally gets the new perspective. Bobby refuses to give up his Game Boy when Hank grounds him, the boy knowing that his father's in no condition to enforce the law around the house. Now being a second-class citizen in his own home, Hank finally starts to become the victim to Bobby's aggression, and when Peggy fights for him, he gets a sense of understanding of why the boy ain't right, not that it excused his behavior. Although to say that the dynamics were completely inverted doesn't actually tell the whole story, because while Hank was part of the popular groups in his high school days, he got that way by picking on those weaker than him and being the star of the football team. Bobby, however, was never really respected in this way, just feared. People didn't pick on him not out of deference to the social hierarchy, but out of self-preservation. There's a difference between safety through the social contract, and safety because of fear of retaliation. Soldier of Misfortune while telling a story to the Arlen Gun Club, Dale accidentally has a negligent discharge, which causes the other members to mistrust him, just in time for one mad dog to announce that he's running against Dale and winning over the other members. Seeing how distraught Dale is over his loss of the position, Peggy gets the idea to hire Dale as a private mercenary, to do a simple task so he can feel like a big man again. But Dale fails at this task and misconstrues the failure as mad dog trying to assassinate him. Hank, Boomhauer, and Bill go to the gun club to stop Dale from doing something stupid, but they're captured by the new president's booby traps. When they call him for help, Dan stops his plan to flee to Costa Rica and runs in to save the guys. He's captured himself, though as he called in some flower delivery beforehand, he often tells a story about using a fake flower delivery service as backup, Mad Dog fears for his life, and the rest of the gun club refuses to go along with him and going down fighting. So Mad Dog flees and Dale gets reinstated as president, sicking the flower delivery on the other guy before taking back his position. Dale has always been a paranoid kind of guy with delusions of grandeur much greater than what he's actually capable of. Ordinarily, this is a recipe for a dangerous individual, though Dale is only held back by his lack of actualization. He has a family, the gun club, and a career to keep him content with his life. Mad Dog, on the other hand, is just as paranoid as Dale, without any of the other sources of fulfillment to keep him from acting on his paranoia. He's the worst possible version of Dale, because he actually believes all of his old stories. But in this episode, we see that Dale is actually a pretty on-top-of-it kind of guy, so long as he knows it's all a game. Because there's nothing wrong with a bit of pretend every now and then. Dale might be a doomsday prepper with paranoid delusions, but deep down he knows it's mostly just for show, more of a hobby than anything else. Mad Dog, on the other hand, genuinely believes the whole thing, but this is just as much a source of weakness as it is a danger. Dale is able to bluff his way out of the situation because he's similar enough to Mad Dog to know the other guy will fall for it, while still grounded in reality enough to not fall for it himself. He's just paranoid enough to formulate the plan, but not paranoid enough to try and do it himself. Lupe's Revenge Peggy is substitute teaching for a Spanish class on the day it's meant to go across the border for a field trip. She insists on going with all of the students, and, despite a few miscommunications that result in the group winding up at a butcher's, the kids still seem to enjoy the trip. But after they arrive back in Arlen, Peggy discovers that she has one extra student, an actual Spanish girl that Peggy corralled on. She tries to hide the girl from Hank, who's busy with a police officer stalking him when he inadvertently flirts his way out of a ticket but Hank eventually learns about the kidnapping anyway, and implores her to return the girl. 
Peggy sneaks her pack across the border and gets arrested, though her poor grasp of Spanish prevents her from understanding the issue until much later when she's calling Hank. At the trial, her lawyer wants to use Peggy's terrible Spanish as a defense, that she didn't understand what she was doing, but after Hank has to accept a frisking from the officer from before, he's able to arrive and convince the lawyer to allow Peggy to defend herself, to the same result, but without having to embarrass her publicly. The gap between Peggy's perception of herself and her actual abilities is one that's been widening since the beginning of the show. While in early seasons, her Spanish was passable with a few pronunciation difficulties indicative of her mixed American accents, in later seasons, her grasp of the language is so poor that she's barely able to string together a sentence. Here, she's so bad at Spanish that she doesn't realize she's committed a kidnapping, even after multiple people are out for blood. But this sort of slanderization does not exist in a vacuum. The trait of hers being exaggerated over the years isn't her poor Spanish, but her detachment from reality. Peggy was confident in the early seasons, even if that confidence was misplaced most of the time. Yet despite all of this, her heart was always in the right place. She believed she was doing good in the world and that her talents allowed her to be a better person. But here, between giving Bobby a script for what kind of praise to levy her way and how quickly she thought she'd been recognized for returning a kidnapped child, it's clear that Peggy no longer has interest in doing good, but being recognized for those deeds. It's a de-evolution of her character that's causing many of her previous actions to be reframed into a negative light, as though she has always been this way. The Father, the Son, and J.C. Buck Strickland gets his license revoked for a DWI and has to volunteer for Habitat for Humanity, building houses to get it back, something Hank thinks is neat enough that Buck volunteers Hank to do the community service for him. Meanwhile, Peggy and Bobby are wondering what to get Hank for Christmas when, seeing the strained relationship between Hank and Cotton, they decide to get him to spend some time together as a gift for both. Peggy convinces Hank to invite Cotton to the home construction, but during the groundbreaking ceremony, Hank gets promoted to full-time manager by Buck Strickland, and in his excitement, Hank announces that he loves his boss. Everybody is taken aback by this, Hank most of all, and they're soon back to the strained relationship from before. But Peggy implores Hank to admit his true feelings to his father during a Christmas dinner with the family that they're building the house for, and he does, saying that he hates his father. So Cotton barricades himself inside the house and refuses to leave until Bobby finds Jimmy Carter working on a nearby home, and the former president volunteers to mend the relationship. He eventually fails at making more than a small amount of ground, though as he's leaving, Cotton and Hank are finally able to bond over the humor in the situation, after Bobby reveals he thought that the man was Jesus Christ. Despite his constant behavior, Cotton Hill really does care about his son, only putting up a rough exterior as he too is incapable of expressing this feeling, something that Hank takes after him in. Here, the hatred that Hank claims to feel for the man gets to him, though this is less because of the fact that his son hates him, and more because of the acknowledgement of failure attached to that statement. It's a basic feeling for two family members to feel some kind of love towards one another, so for Hank, who's terrible at expressing any emotion, positive or not, to openly admit that he hates his father means that Cotton is so ill-respected that his usually stoic son is able to express himself purely to tell the guy off. And this is made more pronounced by the fact that just earlier he admitted his love for Buck Strickland, a man who by all accounts is a terrible role model, something Hank has even recognized last season in the episode The Buck Stops Here. So by these metrics, Cotton is a much poorer role model and by extension person than Buck, on opposite emotional extremes as far as Hank is concerned. It's one thing to fail at raising a child, it's another to watch a terrible person to succeed where you failed. There's still an aspect of insincerity that Cotton really only lashed out at Hank after he found out that he no longer had the respect of his son, but those feelings had to be predicated on something in the first place. Father of the Bribe Khan catches Bobby sneaking into Connie's room again and, worried that he's a distraction to her and his own Ivy League aspirations, offers Bobby $300 to break up with his daughter. Meanwhile at school, Bobby and Connie are constantly told by staff to stop publicly showing affection, and upset by the fact that they can't be together at school or at home, they hatch an idea. Bobby pretends to accept the bribe from Khan, and the two publicly break up, dating in secret by renting a motel room with the cash. Connie then decides to fail a test on purpose in order to make her father feel bad about forcing the breakup, and gets dropped to the on-level courses where she can spend time with Bobby. 
but when the note she passes to him gets misconstrued for suicidal feelings, Khan demands that she get back together with Bobby. For the next few days, Khan forces the two to spend more time together, giving them unwavering support. But Bobby and Connie start to realize that they don't really enjoy this time together, and plan to break up for real. But when they meet at the motel room with their own methods of breaking the news, they realize that they're a good match after all. In the B-plot, Dale hosts a pirate radio station with a radius of about half a block, only to sell it to Octavio when it cuts into his dead bug business. Bobby and Connie's relationship has always been one forbidden by Khan, and this is the source of the excitement that they feel. It's not so much that they're in love, but that they enjoy the rebellion against the expectations society has for them. Connie feels pressured by her father to conform and be perfect, and by dating Bobby, she's sticking it to him in some small way. Bobby also feels like Khan expects nothing out of him, and that by dating Connie, he's proving the guy wrong. So when Khan suddenly becomes supportive of the relationship, that rebelliousness is no longer there, and the relationship has to be based off of something else. Because both of them have different reasons for being together, this new foundation is something that's hard to find. Bobby's presence conflicts with Connie's desire to study and make her way up in the world, something that she's not just doing because of pressure from her father, but because that's the way she actually wants to live her life. If she was content with simply making Khan angry, she'd be failing classes on purpose and rebelling more openly. Dating Bobby is a middle ground for her feelings about her father's demand that don't actively get in the way of her own ambition. I'm with Cupid. It's the Valentine's Day flower sale at Tom Landry Middle School, where girls buy flowers for guys they're interested in. Bobby and Joseph both get a few flowers each, with Bobby successfully maintaining his relationship with Connie after their breakup. But later that evening, when Hank and Peggy are out on a Valentine's date, Bill checks up on Bobby and scares him into thinking that he's never going to find love again. He starts to mope around, becoming increasingly desperate as he begs Connie to get back together with him in time for Joseph's party. But when she's put off by these advances, Bobby schemes to enter dressed as Cupid for a grand gesture, getting him thrown out. Now, worse than before, Hank implores Boomhauer to teach Bobby how to get back on his feet, as his friend is always seen around woman, and Boomhauer takes Bobby to a designer shoe sale. But there, Bobby learns that Boomhauer's secret is that he simply asks every single woman he sees, getting rejected a vast majority of the time. Upset by the revelation, he eventually finds a girl there and talks naturally with her, getting over his hang-up on Connie by realizing it wasn't a big deal. Bobby and Connie stop dating in the previous episode to no greater mental damage than is necessary. They simply figure out that there's no spark there and that they're better off as friends, both continuing on with their lives in a healthy way. It's not until Bill starts to poison Bobby's perception of love that he begins to panic. Bill's attempts at deflecting his many personal issues by claiming they're all just a natural result of his loneliness makes that crippling depression seem so much more common than it is, and this terrifies Bobby into believing that he's doomed to end up like Bill. Of course, his attempts to prevent this problem only makes it worse, as he starts to reek of desperation, destroying whatever goodwill he still had in his relationship with Connie. But when trying to recover, he gets advice from Boomhauer, whose romantic outlook is the opposite of Bill's. While Bill gets overly attached to a single love in his life, Boomhauer has no attachments to any relationship whatsoever. And Bobby's able to immediately recognize this as a bad thing. Because to feel nothing from a rejection or an acceptance of love doesn't make you any better than Bill, even if your outlook on life is much more stoic afterwards. He's able to compare these two emotional extremes, realizing neither man is truly happy, and moves on by realizing that he never had anything to fear in the first place. Torch Song Hillogy Bobby is lamenting over his lack of trophies compared to his father, who was once the pride of Arlen in nearly having the team win state. Peggy then writes an essay about Bobby to submit to the Olympic Committee in the hopes that he can become the next torchbearer for Arlen County, but Hank ends up winning when the panel is more impressed by an essay about Hank written by his friends. Hank is hesitant to upset the honor, which Bobby believes is a bid to make him feel better, until Hank reveals the truth. He believes that the only reason his ankle snapped in the final play was because he had gloated after each touchdown before, and he was being punished for his hubris. But Bobby cheers him up, saying that he shouldn't feel bad about his old failures, and Hank takes this lesson to heart on the day of the torch running. Then he trips and snuffs out the flame. 
Hank tries to fake it with his lighter, but his guilty conscience gets the better of him and he can't accept passing on a weak flame. That is, until Bobby remembers that Dale lit his cigarette on the Olympic torch before Hank dropped it, and carries the flame back to the torch, saving the integrity of the games. For his efforts, Hank rewards Bobby with the used torch. Hank feels as though all of his awards are worthless due to the personality he used to have as a teenager. His gloating and lack of tact in winning made him less deserving of the accolades he'd received back then, culminating in a broken ankle as some sort of divine punishment for the way he had acted. He also thinks that the fake award given to Bobby by Peggy is worthless, despite Bobby behaving in a way that Hank thinks his past self is less than. Bobby gets the award for having a good personality, unlike his father, but Hank doesn't think he deserves it. In order to be worthy of attention, it's not enough that you have to be better than other people at what you're being recognized for, but a better role model too, good in skill and personality. And yet Hank winds up failing at this once again when his morality is tested. Instead of trying to be a good person and own up to his faults after dropping the torch, he tries to fake like it stayed intact. Not only failing by gloating with the flame, but failing by pretending that the fire never went out. It's Bobby managing to think quickly and preserve the spirit of the games that causes Hank to finally recognize the boy's talents, insofar as his personality. Bobby isn't taking after Hank, and for once, Hank thinks better of him because of that. Joust like a woman Hank gets a lead on a new potential client, the local Renaissance Fair, and he negotiates a large sale. But when he takes his family there the next day to show them around, Peggy starts pointing out historical inaccuracies and offends the king. So King Philip requests of Hank that Peggy work at the fair in exchange for the propane account, and he puts her to work in a demeaning job. But while there, Peggy can't help but continue to fail to stay in character, and gets taunted even further. Between this and the poor working conditions of the other female employees, she organizes a woman's rebellion. Though once the others back out, she gets singled out and put into stocks. So Hank demands that King Philip apologize, and is then challenged to a joust for his wife's honor, with the propane sale being on the line. As Hank has never jousted or ridden a horse before, he ends up unhorsed, losing everything. But a mystery rider approaches and, using the cleaning instruments from before, unhorses the king, revealing herself as Peggy afterwards, and riding into the sunset as the other female employees are emboldened enough to serve a discrimination suit against Philip. King Philip is a misogynist who uses the veil of historical accuracy to justify his behavior. He considers women to be second-class citizens, but believes that it's also just a part of the aesthetic of the era people are coming to see, and that this justifies his behavior. But that excuse wears off the second his actions reach outside the realm of roleplay, and begins to treat not just the characters in his world as second-class, but the actresses portraying them. And this pretend misogyny doesn't stay within the realm of pretend either. As it seeps out into the real world, it maintains that veil of, that's just the way things were, to continue to exist, while demoralizing the Renfair employees to the point that they don't even think it's possible to unite and strike. Peggy as a character has always eschewed gender norms, however intentionally, and this is why her relationship with Hank works. Because he's a very traditional southern gentleman, including some of the stereotypes that follow that label, such as the concept of things like woman's work. But in spite of this archetype defining his personality, he still accepts Peggy the way she is, allowing her to speak her mind and behave in a very 21st century manner, going against the sensibilities on which he was raised. This is why he's willing to forego a propane sale in the defense of his wife. The bluegrass is always greener. Hank plays his guitar in the alley to drown out the noise of Connie practicing at Con's behest, and when she hears the music, joins in, finding a love of bluegrass music. So the other alley guys get together their instruments and form the Dale Gribble Bluegrass Experience, with plans to play at the Branson Old Timey Fiddle Contest. But as it's the same weekend as Van Cleburne's Violin Academy, Connie has to lie to her father about where she's going to travel with Hank instead. Bobby comes along with them to meet one of his comedy idols, Yakov Smirnov, but Hank is annoyed by his son's presence as he insists that the band practice as often as they can. But the pressure from Hank is too much for Connie, and she runs off with Bobby, who's upset that, despite selling a joke to Smirnov, Hank still doesn't give him any attention. 
Khan discovers his daughter has run off with Hank and rushes to Missouri to demand her back. But he encounters Hank as the guy is looking for Connie as well, and they both come to the conclusion that they've been too harsh in pushing their dreams to the girl. Ultimately joining her in a street performance, as a Dale Gribble bluegrass experience drags Charlie Daniels in to substitute for their missing fiddler, before Dale's arrested for having assaulted Smirnoff earlier. Hank and Khan are much more similar than they think, the episode's message ultimately being about the way that they're similar. Hank is at first annoyed with the constant fiddle playing that Khan makes his daughter do, and the less than receptive attitude that the guy has towards his daughter's dream. And yet, he completely fails to acknowledge Bobby's wants or talents himself and in a dramatic mirror, it's Khan who first acknowledges that Bobby's joke is good, while Hank is the first to notice Connie's skill at bluegrass. Connie and Bobby are opposites here, not in the way they act, but the way that their talents are treated. While Bobby manages to find success in the realm of comedy, his talents are completely ignored for not lining up with what the adults in his life want out of him. Connie's talents are much more closely aligned with what Khan and later Hank want her to do, and so she ultimately ends up not being in charge of her own destiny, as any time she's enabled, it's for someone else's sake. It's only Bobby who recognizes her talents and then accepts whatever she wants to do with them. Her dream of playing music for the sake of the music rather than for any amount of recognition or wealth, aligning with his love of comedy for reasons that also have nothing to do with wealth. The Substitute Spanish Prisoner After failing to be able to show her work while substitute teaching, Peggy starts to fear that she's not as smart as she thinks she is. So she takes an online IQ test, which tells her that she's a genius, and receives an invitation to a seminar for other geniuses of Texas held by a Dr. Vesosa. But Dale warns Hank about this, telling him it's a scam as the same people who make the tests are selling the certifications, and later, phony PhDs, which Peggy buys. When Hank convinces her that the tests are rigged so anyone can get a high score, she realizes that she's been duped, and gets the other scam victims together for a heist to get their money back. She makes a phony gambling parlor out of the Econo Suites and pretends to let Vesosa in on the trick, but he recognizes the scam and walks away with even more of the victim's money. Though when Hank finds out about Peggy's scheme and subsequent failure, he demands the money back, which the phony doctor hides in his room safe. Though after Hank leaves, he finds out the safe was stolen, as Peggy's plan from the beginning was to just have Boomhauer break into the room and steal it. Dr. Robert Vesosa is really just a more applied version of Peggy Hill. Both pretend that they're much smarter than they are, while their confidence can get them into trouble as they approach situations with less wariness than they should have. And while Robert may have more experience than Peggy does in various cons, recognizing the Spanish prisoner gambit before Peggy can finish it, his overconfidence can still lead to the same disaster for him. The scheme of simply stealing from his room is so simple, he was distracted by the opportunity to con even more money off the marks from the first scam. And while the fake doctor was duped by his greed, Peggy was duped by her vanity. She was so excited to be called a genius that she never considered the reliability of having an organization label her as one if they also intended to sell her something related to that fact. Most cons depend on knowing the personality flaws of the person being manipulated. Even Hank is able to be manipulated by Peggy in this episode into using his hard-headedness to scare Vesosa into hiding his winnings. So for Peggy to learn this fact about scams and to quickly arrange to exploit it shows that she's able to use her personal experience to learn and grow, and perhaps she's not as dumb as she was made to believe after all. Unfortunate Son The Arlen VFW is behind on its propane bill due to losing multiple members to old age. In spite of their efforts to raise the money by selling off old war trophies, they still can't afford the rent, and have to stay at the hills for a time. But Hank gets the idea to meet with a group of Vietnam veterans to recruit new members for the VFW, and get them back to paying rent, finding a group of veterans at a trauma support group. The World War II vets aren't happy about having to share space with Vietnam vets, but with no other ideas they begrudgingly accept. Though during an introductory barbecue, the World War II vets start to trigger war flashbacks on purpose, and Cotton Hill is chased into the woods after he attacks one of the men. Hank follows him there, and they try to navigate to the highway for help, but Cotton's leadership ultimately gets them surrounded. When Hank tries to apologize for failing, Cotton admits his fault, that Hank did everything right, and that sometimes that still isn't enough. Hearing these words and how they relate to their struggles, the Vietnam vets say that that's all they ever wanted to hear, and the two groups merge, after some of the World War II vets hear about the benefits to therapy. 
In the B plot, Dale buys a falcon but doesn't train it, and it attacks Bill over and over. King of the Hill shows generational differences all the time, one of the major themes. Whether it's Hank, the archetypical baby boomer, versus Bobby, the archetypical millennial, or Hank versus Cotton, who is meant to represent the archetypes of masculinity in America during the 40s and 50s. As the US progressed through the years, so too did the outlook on our wars and the people who fought in them. World War II is the good war, where everyone had a great time overseas, and we were the good guys. Nothing bad ever happened. Vietnam was a war where the US was in over its head, expecting to win by shooting all of the bad guys, rather than understanding why we were fighting at all. And this ambiguity gets retroactively applied, to the benefit of everybody even if they don't want to recognize it. The World War II veterans are shown as rude and angry, and the episode implies that if they took better care of their mental health the way the Vietnam vets were attempting to, then they would be more well adjusted. And if the Vietnam vets were able to accept that the World War II vets had suffered just as much as they had, and were simply too afraid of expressing as such, there would be a bit more understanding between the two groups. Are you there, God? It's me, Margaret Hill. Peggy is struggling to find substitute teaching work and decides that it's her calling to work as a full-time teacher instead. But Hank offers her a position working under him at Strickland as a junior grill associate, in case teaching doesn't pan out. She searches for a while, but ultimately can't land a job until she discovers that a Catholic school is hiring. But, as they're only looking for nuns, she pretends to be one in order to get the position. For a while, her new career works out, though Hank is disappointed in her for not following through on the Strickland position. Made worse when he discovers that she's been faking a position within the church in order to work there. After a while, the guilt gets to her as she has nightmares about damnation, and so she later confesses. After returning to Strickland, as per her deal with Hank, he decides to let her go, understanding now that teaching is Peggy's passion, just the way propane is his. I've mentioned before that Hank and Peggy both have their passions, and this episode reiterates the topic through more from Peggy's side than Hank's. She loves teaching enough that she would perform an act of blasphemy, albeit from a religion different than her own, in order to keep at it, something Hank would never do, at least from the perspective of a teacher. We saw earlier this season that he was willing to don tights and play along with the Renaissance Fair in order to make a propane sale, and while that's nowhere near as potentially harmful as Peggy's act, it's still similar enough to draw the comparison. Yet, in spite of this, Peggy still knows that it's wrong. Not so wrong that she didn't want to fake being a nun in the first place, but wrong as it could potentially confuse the students she's faking her credentials in front of. Because ultimately, teaching is not something that a person does for themselves, but something that's done for the sake of others. Peggy is often portrayed as a selfish person, but not a bad one, in spite of the seeming contradiction in that statement. She enjoys having her ego stroked as she sets out to do the job that she wants to do, but if that ego ends up hurting somebody else, she at least has the decency to shelf it for their sake. Tanking it to the streets. Fort Blanda is having their annual war games, but Bill is asked to stay out of them as he's too fat and incompetent to do anything but cut hair. But while at the infirmary due to carpal tunnel, he notices large swaths of his medical chart are classified, so he has Dale break into the base to investigate. As it turns out, he was part of a trial for an experimental drug designed to make American soldiers into blubbery, hairy, hibernating beings, and this explains all of Bill's maladies. He laments that the army turned him into a fat loser, and steals a tank while drunk, driving it to Rainy Street where the other guys wake up and vow to take it back before their friend gets arrested. As they're returning it, Bill wakes up and pulls over to vomit, where the others cheer him up by saying that, since he was part of an experiment, none of the things wrong with him are his own fault. So Bill decides to take the tank back himself, talking his way out of a ticket and winding up back on base. But once there, Dale mentions that the drug was really a placebo. And before this can sink in, they learn that they're on a live firing range and artillery is being shot at them. So Bill sacrifices himself, dropping off the others and drawing the fire away. The tank is blown up and the guys lament his loss, only for Bill to have wound up fine, cheering up when he hears all the good things that they said about him. In the end, he returns to his old job with a slightly better outlook on life. In the B-plot, Peggy tries to memorize the weights of various ice cream ingredients so she can win a free cup of ice cream by correctly guessing its weight. Bill's perception of himself is hugely negative, a self-perpetuating cycle as he allows himself to get worse and worse, his self-confidence lowering in turn, which then makes his life even more terrible. But in this episode, the cycle is broken by a single bit of information. 
The fact that he was experimented on at first sinks him further into despair, as if nothing he could do could drag him out of the slump. Then, it takes on a different meaning as he starts to believe that nothing he did got him into it in the first place. If it's not his fault that he's fat and hairy, then maybe all the other things aren't his fault as well, and there's no reason for his confidence to be shot. A telling signs of the origins of his problems, as he immediately starts to turn things around due to the belief that it's now possible to do so. But when he learns that he was on the placebo, it instantly undoes everything that had changed about the outlook. And yet, he was still affected by the fact that his outlook changed at all. If the belief that things can get better is all it takes to make things get better, then perhaps it's not an impossible task to start on the journey of self-improvement in the first place. Of Mice and the Little Green Men Bobby is rehearsing for a performance of Of Mice and Men at the local library and tries to get Hank to read through his lines with him. But Hank is busy practicing lacrosse with Joseph, as Dale is incompetent enough at the sport. And he reaches a compromise where Dale rehearses with Bobby while Hank trains Joseph. But Hank misses Bobby's play while Dale misses Joseph's tryouts, as they were both at the other event, leading to an awkward moment where they both go out to the same spot for celebration. While there, Dale and Hank admit that they're not great dads, and Dale posits why. He isn't Joseph's real father, although he believes that this is because of an alien impregnating Nancy while he was investigating lights in Marfa. Both men approach their sons to try to make peace with them when Joseph gets it into his head that he's half alien. So he and Bobby skip their obligations to go back to Marfa so Joseph can be abducted. But when Dale tells Hank where they've gone off to, the two men rush to save their sons, and wind up catching them in the desert, Dale reaffirming that he's Joseph's dad after a pep talk from Hank, and the episode ending with Joseph theorizing that the aliens must have stolen genetic material from Dale. Dale finally discovers that Joseph is not his biological son, at least that's the information that he's operating on during this episode, and his reaction to this revelation is what drives his actions throughout the events. He starts to try appeasing the kid and talks to him as though they're not on the same level, alienating, no pun intended, Joseph from the rest of the family, as he's made to feel different in spite of the last 13 years. It's actually a relief that Dale never learned the truth about John Redcoin and Nancy, as it would have been the worst case scenario for Joseph. Being denied a father figure as John Redcorn is not shown to be especially caring of a father, only wanting to be close to Joseph once he starts to feel inadequate. And it's a relief that Joseph is able to come back around by the episode's end, to a point where he accepts Dale once more. His reactionary attitude prevents him from thinking rationally, that and the fact that he's a teenager, and Joseph starts to behave erratically, running off to the desert near Marfa to get abducted by aliens. Both Dale and Joseph have the same reaction, and that reaction is bad. Their mentalities are similar for better and for worse, with this episode's plot showing off both extremes. A Man Without a Country Club Khan brags about getting into the Nine Rivers Country Club despite not being a member in order to make the rest of Rainy Street jealous after they install a putting green in Hank's lawn. This installation eventually evolves to a crude recreation of one of the holes on that course. Though when Khan invites Ted with Sonasong over to try to suck up enough for a Nine Rivers invitation, Ted instead sees Hank swing and invites him. Khan sneaks along as Hank's plus one, and attempts to suck up further during their game, where Ted informs Khan that he will only get into the club if Hank is invited first. Hank and Khan both get an invitation after impressing the chairman, but Hank starts to notice preferential treatment on the night of a party, celebrating the arrival of a PGA spokesman. And later, he learns the truth. Hank was invited to the country club as a diversity hire, due to being white. He ultimately rejects the offer and the fake words of friendship when Ted fails to remember what Hank does for a living, and returns to the Rainy Street Country Club, inviting Khan to play with them after seeing how despondent he was for losing his membership when Hank quit. Khan is looking for a place where he belongs, although what he means by he isn't exactly clear to himself. He assumes that an all-Asian country club is ideal for a guy like him as that's the sort of prestige that he associates with the image he has of himself although people like Ted don't see it that way. Because Khan is ultimately a character caught between two worlds. On one side is his heritage, something valuable to him in the same way it would be to anyone. On the other, his current residence, the well-being of his family, and existing lifestyle. 
Even if what he has isn't what he wants, ignoring reality won't get him any closer to his dreams. And sometimes, it's best to be realistic about what you have in order to be realistic about what you will have. Hank, too, is a character caught between these two worlds, though it takes him a while to finally piece together what's wrong with one side. His heritage as a Texan and pride in where he's from clashes with the class and race of the Nine Rivers Country Club. And as much as it's a place where he'd like to be, it's not a place that he'll ever belong, even in spite of his race. Because when he gets admitted on the basis of the color of his skin, it's an exception to everything else about him. Nobody at the club really knows Hank as anything other than the white guy, and that's not an ideal way to fit into a new place. He would rather be judged on the content of his character, much in the same way that Rainy Street judges Khan on his. Beer and Loathing Hank in the alley can't get a hold of any Alamo beer and can't seem to figure out why. He asks Peggy to call their customer support line to ask, and while conversing in Spanish, she ends up offered a job as a bilingual call center employee. While inside the company, she learns a few secrets but can't reveal them due to a non-disclosure agreement that she wants to keep intact. Hank eventually pressures her into talking, though, and she reveals that the supply has been diverted to Mexico in order to increase sales there. So Hank and the guys road trip to Mexico to stock up until the supply is back on American shelves. However, once they buy a large supply and get sick from it, Peggy then learns the real truth. The supply was diverted to Mexico because it was contaminated, and they didn't want to sell the beer in the U.S. When Hank comes home sick with the same symptoms as the Mexican callers, Peggy makes the connection that Hank broke his promise not to tell what she knew, though Hank also deduces that Peggy knew about the contaminated beer and didn't stop him from drinking any. In the end, hurt that her company would withhold so much after she overhears a conversation between Hank and the CEO, Peggy swaps out some of the beers in an executive meeting with a contaminated batch, and the whole board gets sick, which finally forces an apology and a recall. Hank and Peggy's stubbornness is a central aspect of their characterization, the resistance that they feel to change being a key part of why they find friction against the rapidly changing world around them. And yet, for all the value they place on consistency and the expected, they tend to react with hostility when confronted by these same tendencies in others. Hank does not want to accept that Peggy is sticking to an NDA, despite agreements of that kind being the sort of thing that Hank usually observes, even when no one else does. It's just that the NDA got in the way of his favorite beer, making it a change. And Peggy is too stubborn to break the agreement she signed, as keeping a secret a secret is what makes it exclusive. If anyone could find out, then it's not very special when someone knows it. And of course, the loss in sales associated with the recall of that size that Alamo would have to have done is too great an obstacle to continued return on investment for Alamo to forego, even if it causes them to lose a bit of faith in their less valued foreign markets. They would rather not investigate the causes and change production style to prevent a future incident, which draws ire from Hank and Peggy, who feel betrayed by a personality trait that they themselves may have exhibited in a similar situation, although it's unlikely either person would go to the extreme of allowing others to be poisoned. Fun with Jane and Jane Buck Strickland has Hank stay after work to execute the emus on his emu farm so he can make an insurance claim. He cancels his date with Peggy, who had just cancelled her date with Luann after telling the girl to try and make new friends at a sorority rush week. Luann attempts to go to a few of the sororities, but none accept her, until a girl from the Omega house sees her drinking alone and offers to accept her. Once Luann gets to the house, she finds that everybody there is named Jane, and they only allow the pledges to eat rice, and they force members to sell jams and jellies while working on a ranch as pseudo-slave labor. She manages to escape when Hank sees her on the side of the highway while he was out hunting down the emus that he and the other guys didn't have the heart to kill. But Peggy, who has been feeling down about not having any friends outside her immediate family, takes Luann back to the cult and joins up herself when the girls there tell her platitudes about why she's unhappy. When Buck tells Hank to retrieve the emus' corpses, Hank panics as he doesn't have them, so he buys $400 worth of beef with the idea to pass it off as emu. Yet, when he learns of the cult and Peggy and Luann's admission, he instead stops by the campus and uses the smell of cooking beef to lure the starving pledges out of their hypnosis. Cults often prey on the lonely and or desperate, targeting those who have nowhere else to turn and luring them in with a few niceties that manipulate them into doing whatever they can to keep the positive attention coming. 
In general, they go after people who are in a moment of weakness, as they do to Peggy in this episode. They also attempt to target Luann, but fail to get through to her, as her lack of dissatisfaction in life makes her an almost impossible target for brainwashing. Luann, despite everything, is a very content person. The place she is in, in life, is exactly where she wants to be, so there's very little in the way of platitude that can satisfy her. Even people who are insulting her often fail to make their point. It's an optimistic outlook centered around ignorance of the world and its potential for cruelty, and yet from the same point of her personality is where her vulnerability is derived. Because Luann is too kind to even comprehend why another person might want to harm her, meaning that it doesn't take brainwashing to get her to go along with the trip to the ranch. Peggy, on the other hand, is eager to find any sort of social connection to the point that she can have that desperation used against her, though nothing can break away conditioning like being reminded of what you're missing and the things you used to have. My Own Private Rodeo Dale is renewing his wedding vows to Nancy, and the two are feuding over Dale's father being on the guest list. Dale is upset, as during his wedding he walked in on his father kissing Nancy, and they haven't seen each other since. But Nancy, still covering up her affair with John Redcorn, wants Dale to get used to giving her people second chances, and she has Hank invite the guy. Hank goes out with the rest of the alley to find Buck Gribble, who they know is a rodeo star, and eventually track him down at the rodeo. The gay rodeo. Hank learns from Bug that the kiss 20 years earlier was a misunderstanding, a cover-up for trying to kiss a waiter, and Hank invites Bug over so he might have a reunion with his son. Over the next few days, the two men grow closer together until Bug finally decides to tell Dale the truth behind his double life and secret partner. Though Dale misinterprets this as a cover story for his father being a federal agent. He's unreinvited to the re-wedding, and Dale sets out to find proof of his father's career, resulting in a public spat between Bug and his lover. But when the two make up and kiss in front of Dale, he finally believes the real story and re-invites his father to the re-wedding, announcing that he has no problem with his dad being gay because he thinks John Redcorn is too. This is an episode rife with gay stereotypes and humor at the expense of some of the mannerisms of its gay cast, though these are minor and put into the context of airing on Fox in the year 2002. With that in mind, this episode is actually extremely progressive in its depiction of homosexuality, more so than many modern shows can manage while actively trying to be good representation. Bug is a flamboyant man, but this is just as much attributed to him being a rodeo cowboy than it is to his sexuality. It's just a bit of camp for the audience. A few of the characters still have a problem with the concept of homosexuality, Bill and Boomhauer cracking a few jokes at the gay rodeo's expense, but ultimately they're still at the wedding in support of their friend, extenuating circumstances be damned. Dale's issue is only with the fact that his father lied to him, something his mind extrapolated to mean that he had to be hiding something more, as it didn't cross Dale's mind that someone would have to go to such extreme lengths to cover up a sexuality in that way. In a state and a time that wasn't especially known for its tolerance of the abnormal, it's impressive to see a show like King of the Hill managing to resist aging poorly. Shug Knight After installing a propane heater in the hot tub for Nancy, Hank returns home too exhausted to sleep with Peggy. Then he has a dream where he was grilling in the nude alongside his neighbor's wife. He's mortified about this dream, only telling parts of it to his family, and seeks out some meaning to the events with John Redcorn, although the guy throws him out when he learns Hank's dream was about Nancy. Later, Dale tells Nancy and Peggy while they're hot tubbing, and Peggy begins to suspect that Hank is having erotic dreams about other women due to not finding her interesting anymore. She laments the loss of intimacy to Nancy, who suggests that they try to find something that can spice up their love life, and she gets the idea to recreate Hank's dream. Though because he's self-conscious about grilling in a new, they decide to go to a nude beach to live out the dream. And while there, the smell of burgers attracts two young women who begin to ask questions that Hank answers eagerly. Peggy is distraught that Hank is paying more attention to the younger woman than to her, until he comes back and starts to eagerly describe propane and its usage. At this, she deduces that Hank's dream was not about Nancy Cribble, but about grills themselves, and that Hank is aroused by the thought of propane. Repeatedly stated throughout this episode is Hank's idea that he dislikes change of any kind, the type of person to prefer the same old thing. And yet, he ends up putting his marriage into a complicated situation by trying to resist his own mind's desire for something fresh. 
When he has an erotic dream about who he thinks is Nancy, it's actually just his brain trying to put a fresh spin on the propane business that he's been a part of for 20 years. And of course, once he actually starts to think about an alternative way to heat things such as hot tubs or houseboats, he immediately finds himself with much more energy, comparing his spiel about grilling from the start of the episode to his explanation at the end. But it's not an easy route to get from one point to the other. Hank is so reserved about this sort of thing that he refuses to think about it any more than the bare minimum. Not help that his initial attempt to find out the meaning of the dream resulted in John Redcorn kicking him out. So when Hank tries to hide what's on his mind, he doesn't make any sort of progress, staying in his rut until Peggy is finally able to get him outside his comfort zone. And although not for the reasons they were expecting, Hank is finally able to wake up to new possibilities, a happier world than what he saw with the same old thing. Dangle Love Bill sees a woman jogging through the alley and falls in love with her, but his attempts to woo her fail as she's not interested. Boomhauer tries to offer him advice, which Bill ignores to go with Dale's plan of digging several potholes in the alley so he can trip her and treat the wounded ankle. But when he falls into his own holes, Boomhauer steps in and carries Marlene inside, where the two sleep together. Bill is enraged that his friend would steal the woman he saw first, culminating in an argument when Bill goes through her underwear after Boomhauer invites the alley over to her house. But Marlene soon loses interest in Boomhauer and kicks him out, which tears the guy up, leading to Bill to start taunting him. Boomhauer eventually decides to propose, but when he shows her his grandmother's ring, finds out that she has moved on. He's broken up about this, with Hank and Dale failing to get him back into the dating pool until Bill finally steps in and takes him to a lookout. There, Bill gives him a motivating speech, where he compares the two men, and Boomhauer is encouraged to get himself back into some strange woman's bed, though first, he apologizes to one of his old flings. Dale makes an observation about the alley's dynamic, four quadrants of married single and cool loser, although his gauging of each person's coolness is a bit off. It does allow for each person's character dynamics to reach more variety in what plots can be done. If there's a plot about a married person in a stable relationship, it goes to Hank. If there's a plot about a married man in a strange relationship, it goes to Dale. If there's a plot about a single guy botching a relationship, it goes to Bill. And a plot about a single guy with all his stuff together goes to Boomhauer. But stories about people who don't overreact to aspects of their love life are not especially interesting, and so it takes Boomhauer being broken up with, turning him into a Bill, to make a story about him that can hold audience attention. And as he gets to become more like Bill during this dynamic, it's Bill who has to get him out of the rut. Because as much as Bill is a loser, he's self-aware about it all, and he still tries to change. That's a more telling aspect of his personality than a man who has it all and doesn't want to change anything, as it takes a lot more willpower to put yourself out there in that sense. We see Boomhauer shut down completely after a failed relationship, something Bill has done multiple times, always to rebound. So he's the best person to get his friend back into the dating pool, as he's had the most relatable personal experience. Bill knows who he is and has both accepted that and vowed to try to be better. Returning Japanese, Part 1 Cotton starts having war flashbacks during a Memorial Day celebration at John Redcorn's sauna. He laments that there's a woman whose husband he killed and stole the wallet from, that he's been carrying her photo around for 50 years and wants to apologize. Peggy spins this into a potential travel article for the local newspaper, and the family is given a trip to Japan for her to investigate. But as the day of their trip gets closer, Cotton becomes increasingly anxious to the point of trying to get out of the meeting, made worse when local paparazzi want to film the reunion for a feel-good story. As it turns out, Cotton is not meeting the woman whose husband he killed, but a woman he was in love with back during his deployment, the nurse who took care of him once his feet were reattached. Hank is put off at first that this is a 60-year-old booty call, until he starts to realize that his father has dyed his hair and bought flowers. He really does love this woman. So they find her address and prepare to visit, only for the door to be answered by a half-Japanese man, who looks exactly like Hank. Meanwhile, Luann is taking care of Ladybird, and mistakenly believes she's killed the dog, while Dale and Bill start to fear that the Hill household could be broken into, so they don Hank and Peggy's clothing while pretending to live there. Cotton starts to open up during this episode, the humbling experience of feeling bad about his actions during World War II catching up to him, as his take on the events shifts from bragging about the kill count to lamenting the needless bloodshed. 
bloodshed that was done against a more humanized target as he starts to remember Michiko, the woman he loved during his time recovering. Now instead of miscellaneous villains, he starts to consider the Japanese as real people, people just like Michiko. In this moment of remembering his humanity, Cotton starts to open up in other ways as well. His relationship with Hank starts to get better, as Hank begins to feel like his father is once again a decent man. And Cotton, too, starts to view Hank's achievements as being greater instead of denigrating his son for not having a killing spree of his own. Returning Japanese Part 2 Hank Hill meets his half-brother, Junichiro, though the other man seems hesitant to acknowledge his American family. Cotton regales the tale of how he and Michiko met, and then were separated without a goodbye, and the two families have a dinner together where these feelings get to be expressed. When Cotton hears that his other son doesn't respect him, though, he gets angry and storms off, leaving a wake of destruction in his path. Hank tracks down Junichiro and implores him to help out, as Cotton's actions are dishonoring the family name and they track Cotton down to a train station where Cotton announces his intentions to spit in the Emperor's face. The brothers race to stop their father, with Hank teaching Junichiro to be a bit more assertive, like an American, before they ultimately arrive in time to talk him down, using their newfound brotherly bond to convince Cotton to put the past behind him. Luann, still thinking Lady Bird is dead, buys an identical dog only for the two to run around and Luann to forget which is which. Later, while out walking them, she finds two people inside the Hill household, and thinking that they're intruders, calls the police. Dale and Bill are arrested, pleading with Boomhauer to take in Hank's paper while they're in jail. Bobby finds love in an unnamed girl who plays a dancing arcade game with him, but never gets to say goodbye until Cotton finds out about her, at which point he drops everything so Bobby won't make the same mistake he did. It's worth mentioning that in Japanese culture, bastard children are regularly viewed with extreme disdain, not only by family, but society as well, something that had to have made Junichiro's life extremely difficult. With this idea in mind, the episode sets a more awkward starting point for his perception of his father, the man who put him in such a negative place to start with. So the metaphor through the episode of Cotton's apology being a stand-in for the relationship between the two nations works better with a more cultural context. It then tells a more personal tale, not just of redemption, but in earning that redemption. It wasn't any of Cotton's actions that caused Junichiro to finally decide to leave the past behind, but Hank's, a man who never wronged him in the first place. As he starts to find a common ground between the two men and they exchange lessons on each other's cultures, the two brothers realize that letting the feuds of earlier generations divide them in the modern day doesn't actually help anybody. And this is one of the most recurring themes in King of the Hill, simply extrapolated to an international scale. Cotton and Hank, or Hank and Bobby, rarely get along because of the differences in the way their generations view the world, but it's always by finding something the other party does better, or that both parties do equally well, that this sort of resentment dissipates. The one thing that can heal generational trauma is finding the humanity in the other party, and realizing that we're not so different that we need to fight. Season 7 Peggy kidnaps a child, Dale throws pocket sand, Bobby becomes Bill, and Bill becomes Boomhauer. Luann joins a cult, and Hank becomes an exhibitionist. This is what defines Season 6, and when compared to the first few seasons, it's shocking to see just how dramatically King of the Hill has changed from what it once was. The crazy situations that the show once rejected were now staples of its plot, and the characters start to become more exaggerated versions of themselves to accommodate this new direction. But Mike Judge was unhappy with this change, and when John Altshuler and Dave Krinsky took over, they steered it back towards the small personal story that made the show so original in the first place. But this damage has already been done, assuming one might call it damage. The show has gone to so many crazy places that to drag it down suddenly back to the ground would be jarring. So it was a change that had to be done carefully and believably. But what is King of the Hill known for if not its believability? The tool used to guide the plot structures back to reality is through the characters themselves, who have always stayed relatively normal even if there are still a few stretch marks left from the excursion. Season 7 is a return to the more simplified plot structures of the early seasons, while keeping the more advanced characterization established by later episodes. As such, it manages to tread new ground without becoming tired or played out, as so many other shows often do when they reach this number of seasons. The 
Get your freak off. Peggy, Nancy, and Min are ranking the guys on their block in order of sexiness when Peggy learns that the others view Hank as being second to last next to Bill. Meanwhile, Hank has found a boy band that he thinks is wholesome after hearing a few of their songs and comparing it to doo-wop. He had just confiscated all of Bobby's records after disapproving of their content. But when he takes Bobby to a concert of theirs alongside his new friend Jordan, he sees Bobby dancing suggestively, taking after the band's members themselves, and he drags Bobby away from the concert. But later he's invited to meet with Jordan's parents about the incident, and they reveal that they don't put restrictions on their children. So Hank tries to show them how to be better role models by taking them out to a Mennonite historical society, where they encounter even cooler parents who announce that they're having a mixed gender slumber party. Hank forbids Bobby to go, but Peggy lets him sneak out anyway, and once there, Bobby finds out the parents are out, and they're playing seven minutes in heaven. He and Jordan are pushed into the closet together and pressured into fooling around, but Hank breaks up the party and tries to get them to play more wholesome games, which go over well. Later, when picking up the kids, Min and Nancy overhear how Hank saved the day, and change their rating of him to just below John Redcorn. There's a point raised in this episode about kids growing up too fast due to a lack of restrictions made by their parents. Considering how frequently the show points out the many character flaws of Hank that are a result of the overly restrictive mode of thinking, it makes sense for the writers to want to tackle the opposite end of the spectrum as far as parenting goes. It portrays Hank breaking up Bobby's fun as the wrong thing to do early in the episode. Even if it was a bit weird the way he was behaving, Hank should have just straightened him out, not derailed the train altogether. But Jordan's parents, and later Serena's, are shown as an opposite extreme, and them putting the kids into uncomfortable situations is the worst case scenario for the slumber party. But these situations are things that kids go into willingly, at least that's what they tell themselves. In reality, it's a combination of lashing out against the strictness of their own parents and the peer pressure of the other children at the party. Connie, Bobby, and Jordan verbally express how uncomfortable they are with the situation, and it could have escalated into something much more traumatizing for the kids had it not been stopped by Hank. His party games by the end of the episode are corny, but the relief felt by the others in response to knowing they have an out for not growing up so fast is enough to make him the life of the party. The Fat and the Furious Bill is in a rush at one of Hank's barbecues, and thinking a plate of hot dogs for everyone was for him, scarfs them all down in about a minute. Everybody is disgusted slash intrigued, and Hank eventually points out to Bill that eating that quickly is a talent. Later, when disgusting a woman on a date, Bill is scouted by Cindy, a competitive eating enthusiast, and she invites him to a party with all the other big eaters. There, he learns that the best competitive eaters are all skinny Asian guys, and encouraged by patriotism, vows to take home a championship for America. But during the qualifiers, Dale starts denigrating the guy, and showing off how eating is not a talent, eating enough hot dogs that Dale himself qualifies for the competition. But later in the alley, when Bill argues with Dale over his spotlight being stolen, Dale reveals that he once ate bugs for attention in school, only to realize that the other kids were laughing at him and he's vowed never to eat for a spectacle since then. At the finals, Bill gets ahead of the Laotian representative, only to look into the audience and realize that, just as Dale said, the audience doesn't respect him. So he resigns and walks off the stage with his dignity intact. In the B-plot, Peggy tries increasingly desperate things to prevent Bobby from finding out competitive eating exists. Bill has never had any positive thing that separates him from other people. Most of his character traits are negative, with the closest thing he has to a good trait being his abilities to cope with his failure. But for once, Bill is able to find something people admire him for and latches onto the experience. The world of competitive eating is a world that Bill thrives in, and in spite of the dangers to one's body that might result, he's able to accept the physical risks in exchange for the emotional satisfaction. But that's something denied to him as Dale comes close to stealing the spotlight. Once he's back outside of everyone's attention, he's able to be put into a headspace where he can look at it with more skepticism, just in time for Dale to inform him that being the center of attention isn't always a positive thing. Through all of the talk of nationalism and doing it for your country, nobody ever stops to ask Bill if he's doing it for himself. And once he realizes that it's better to be ignored than laughed at, he's able to start respecting himself just a little bit more.
Bad girls, bad girls, what you gonna do? Bobby asks Connie to be his partner for the upcoming science fair, but after meeting her cousin, Teed Pow, he develops a crush which combines with feelings that he might be leading Connie on. Teed Pow, as Connie explains, is her delinquent cousin from LA, who was sent to Ireland for poor grades, though a conversation she has on her phone reveals the real reason. She's laying low after stealing drugs from a gang. She's hoping to pay back the gang she stole from so that she can return home, and plots to trick someone into helping her with the supply, when Bobby volunteers to be her science fair partner. Teed Pow starts to seduce Bobby into gathering supplies for her meth lab, convincing him to steal propane from Strickland and encouraging him to tag the alley. Eventually, Bobby becomes anxious that he's not cool enough for her and transports the lab to his school, setting up the equipment in front of an officer. When Connie realizes what's going on, she destroys the meth lab with a potato cannon to save Bobby from jail time, and Teed Pow gets sent to rural Wisconsin with a different uncle. Last season, we saw that Connie and Bobby's relationship was predicated on the fact that there was a sense of rebellion to their togetherness, and when the relationship was finally approved of by Con, they broke up. As Bobby does not find a normal, boring girl to be interesting, he moves from Connie to Teed Pow, someone much more openly rebellious. This is in stark contrast to the straight-laced relationship of Hank and Peggy, two people that Bobby has always clashed with emotionally and has always tried to reject in terms of lifestyle. And so just like with so many episodes before, Bobby tries to do the opposite of what Hank would do in the situation, only for this to backfire while things spiral out of control. It's the normal, boring girl Connie who's able to bail him out of the situation, when ordinarily it would have been the straight-laced Hank to do so. Thematically, it's a similar plot, but as the characters involved have grown, we get to see their roles expanded to better fit the direction of the show. Now, Connie is such an ingrained member of the cast, she's able to adopt archetypes that were once reserved for Hank and all he stood for. Goodbye, Normal Jeans Hank is appalled that Bobby is taking home economics, cleaning stains out of outfits, and cooking. But when Bobby starts to fret over an assignment, he gets a motivating speech from Peggy, and then the two destroy Hank's favorite pair of jeans. He starts to pay more attention in class and manages to rebuild Hank's pants, and Hank loves the new clothes and the food Bobby starts to make, enough that he begins to believe that he's one-upping Peggy's meals, and spoiling Hank in a way that Peggy has never been able to do so. So Peggy goes to her hairdresser, Ernst, and vents about Bobby upstaging her in this way, to which he replies that Bobby cannot take her place in the bedroom. So she gets her hair done up, only for the fumes from the product to make Hank feel sick, and Peggy leaves when she sees him separating their beds. As Bobby is still awake, Peggy uses his bed, and Bobby sleeps in the master bedroom with Hank, staying up all night as the two talk. So she tries to sabotage Bobby's new lifestyle, at first by revealing that he has a homemaking magazine under his bed, and then by stealing the Thanksgiving turkey he made. But when she takes the bird to her hairdressers and finds out that even he has a loving family, Peggy breaks down and Hank has to take matters into his own hands. Eventually, Peggy gets home and finds that Hank has cooked all of the meals Peggy usually makes, informing her that he didn't marry her for the homemaking skills but because of, you know, the love. Hank is portrayed as a very traditional type of conservative man socially, and yet whenever he's confronted with some sort of change, there's always a chance for him to learn to accept and even embrace it. Bobby starts to behave like a housewife during this episode, something Hank is against out of principle, until he starts to see the usefulness of the skill set. Hank begins to consider the work Bobby is doing is barely different from his own around the house. And of course, the reason he would think this way in the first place is that he's already accepted one non-traditional family member. Peggy is not the traditional housewife that's lauded as an ideal for so many old-timers. Her cooking is subpar, she forgets to clean, and she always speaks her mind. She's very driven when it comes to her career as well. Hank did not marry her because she was traditional, even if that's why he does everything else in life. He married her for her personality. Peggy's opinions are among the few that he regularly respects and even seeks out on occasion. So when Peggy laments that Bobby is challenging her role as the woman of the house, it's a fear born out of not knowing the value she really contributes. Dances with Dogs Hank catches Bobby dancing with Ladybird in secret and admonishes the boy for the weird behavior. But later on in the garage, Ladybird hears a song on the radio that she enjoys and insists on dancing with Hank which he finds out that he enjoys as well. 
The other guys in the alley make fun of him for it, except for Bill, who immediately rushes out to get a dog of his own to be a dance partner. As Hank is busy dancing with Lady Bird, Bobby arranges to dance with Connie's dog, Doggy. The two enter the same off-leash freestyle competition, and begin to practice with secrecy, feuding and fearing that the other one might steal their moves. Peggy is upset about being in the middle of their spat, and so Hank takes her out dancing only to grill her for information about Bobby's routine, causing her to throw in with her son, instead of staying neutral. Bill, meanwhile, has adopted a Rottweiler that he's struggling to control, the animal attacking him as soon as he takes off the muzzle, where he's barely able to get it back on before being cornered in the shower. The three couples arrive at the competition and show off their moves, with Hank being confident in his fundamentals to woo the judges. But they go for Bobby's flashier performance, which gets second, and Hank doesn't place at all. In the end, he tries to put up the costume, though Ladybird still insists on dancing, and soon the rest of the family joins in. Structurally, this is about as typical a King of the Hill episode as you can get for the first two-thirds. Hank finds Bobby doing something he disapproves of, then comes around to the idea, then gets too far into it. And usually the end result would have some character learn a valuable lesson about limits or tradition, and they'd all go back to the way things were. But if that doesn't happen, then the episode ends largely the same. Hank gets extremely into doggy dancing and competes against Bobby. Their rivalry is the highlight of the episode and is constantly put into contrast with the rest of the alley's responses. Dale and Boomhauer find it laughable, only to spend the rest of the episode standing around doing nothing. Khan finds it stupid, but he finds Bobby stupid too and enjoys the matchup. And Peggy thinks it's pointless and beneath her, until Hank accidentally calls her by his dog's name and she's motivated to start rooting against him. Especially coming off of the last two seasons, having a plot about the most mundane imaginable sporting event and having each character get extremely into it is a sure sign of the show's change of pace. The Sun Also Roses Hank tries to train Bobby for football tryouts, but as he's too portly for any position, Bobby becomes the towel manager instead. But this job isn't what it's cracked up to be, and despite Hank's approval, Bobby ends up leaving the team, noticing Mrs. Supanusen phones Rose Garden in the alley, and asking about the plant. He then gets into rose growing, getting the supplies he needs as well as some Eastern philosophy from a local gardening shop, Stems and Seeds. He misses the game and Hank yells at him for this, getting even more upset that Bobby doesn't seem to care about competition to grow roses instead. But Peggy gives Hank the idea to enter Bobby in a rose-growing competition, something they can do together, and Hank learns just how competitive the world of rose-growing can be. He gets them a sponsorship from Stims and Seeds and begins to take over the duties of Bobby, ignoring his advice on philosophy to follow the American Rose Association's guidebook to the letter. On the day of the competition, Bobby gets boxed out of contributing, only for him to accidentally knock over the vase, bruising the petals. This hurts their score and the Stims and Seeds team loses, but despite the loss, Hank decides to let Bobby grow his flowers in the front yard in the future. Hank Hill loves the tradition of competition, using it as a means of judging the quality of a person relative to their peers. It's the idea of trying your best to fit in so much that you can stand out that drives so many of his life decisions. Hank wants Bobby to take after him and be the best at something, the spirit of competition driving the respect others give to him. Because for Hank, happiness is something to be won, your neighbors and peers being conquered in order to force them to acknowledge your worth, and then to derive your self-worth from the praise that others give you. But Bobby already has self-respect, he's happy, and this happiness is derived internally. So to compete with others to try to prove you're worthy of their respect, and thus your own, is pointless to him, as the end result does not make Bobby any better off, while the potential downside of trying your best at something, only to be told you're not good enough, can only hurt his ego. Especially something with defined win conditions and rule sets like a competition. Bobby's rose would have had points counted off for its uniqueness, that the things that make it special also make it worse, going against Hank's idea of conformity and competition that Bobby didn't partake in from the beginning. The Texas Skillsaw Massacre Hank falls through a hole in the floor of his kitchen when he finds out that Dale dug one beneath his house. To punish him, he does not allow Dale to use his new skill saw that he purchased for the repairs. But while the repairs are ongoing, per a city inspection, Hank cannot stay inside the domicile. So Nancy guilts Dale into volunteering his house for the Hill family until it's safe to stay in again. 
but Dale drives Hank mad with his habit, and later, while cutting a board, Dale's finger is cut off by the saw. Dale decides to press charges, and when Hank has an outburst in the courtroom, he's ordered to take anger management courses to get a restraining order removed. While at his classes, he meets another angry man, Big Jim, who bonds with Hank over how much they hate the course. Big Jim and Hank work together to repair the tunnel while Dale taunts them, only for Big Jim to lash out at Dale so hard, he has a stroke, dying on the spot. At the funeral, Hank realizes that he may actually have anger issues, and he starts to take the class seriously enough to graduate. Post-graduation, he's back at the alley where he learns the guys have dug underneath the street. But when a garbage truck threatens to collapse the tunnel and he can't convince his friends to leave it, Hank gets angry and threatens them out, saving their lives. Hank's anger is a small part of his character relative to many other traits of his, but it's exaggerated here in order for the trait to be tested for the plot. People start to treat him differently, even his own wife, as they begin to think that he's got issues with controlling his temper, which, despite being true, is usually something that happens in response to a frustrating issue. But anger isn't necessarily a pointless emotion. Big Jim raises the point that people who don't get mad wind up being the world's doormats, and Hank is not the type of person to let other people boss him around without purpose. Ultimately, Hank ends up learning that anger without reason is negative, while righteous anger is fine, even useful. If being angry can stop someone from hurting themselves and others, then it's okay to lash out in order to get an immediate reaction. But using anger as a default is when the emotion becomes an issue. So the end of the episode has Hank first try to use logic to appeal to his friends, with the threats only coming about when it's clear they have no intention of listening to reason. And that is the message of this episode. Full Metal Dust Jacket Tired of the lack of intellectual stimulation in the world of teaching, Peggy goes to a local bookstore and learns about a book club hosted regularly. When she tries to get into it, she learns that the store owner who told her about it was only in because she gave the patron a discount on novels in exchange. So Peggy buys the bookstore. But business is slow to non-existent, and when Dale comes in hoping to find a book big enough to hide a gun inside, another patron thinks the guns are for sale. And soon, in order to keep paying the lease, Peggy agrees to let Dale sell firearms in her store so long as she gets a cut of each transaction. In order to keep the business legal, the guns are technically not sold but are given as gifts with the purchase of a book. But this only means that she's giving away books to Dale's patrons. She eventually gets her invite to the book club, with Hank being dragged along as it's a couple's book club, only for the other members to be less interested in reading and more interested in casual conversation. They uninvite Peggy from future meetings and she laments the loss of her potential new friends, ultimately selling her book and gun store after kicking Dale out. Yet in the end, the gun enthusiasts who were receiving the books come back, as they actually developed an interest in reading, and soon, Peggy hosts a book club with a different type of clientele at the Hill Residence. Peggy views reading as an intellectual pursuit, reserved for the literati and upper crust of polite society. But every demographic or individual in this episode ends up having a different take on this perception, showing just how universal reading and stories can be that even genre bounds get mixed. Bobby finds enjoyment in a high fantasy novel despite the disapproval of Hank, something expected by this point in the show. But going along with this is the way every other group starts to read. While Dale's Gun Club is at first shown to use the books for little more than target practice, they do eventually read through them, and despite not having normal takes on the themes and character dynamics, their genuine love of literature is enough that perhaps a normal take isn't what one should be reading for in the first place. Peggy tries to join a book club, and that club ends up being more of a social circle than actual literature enthusiasts. The Gun Club ends up being more appreciative of the themes in a womanly title, and even Hank finds himself enthralled in the book Peggy makes him read. With each group contributing something new to the conversation, it leaves the original book club out of the discussion, inverting the expected outcome of this episode as Peggy too winds up with a different take on what kind of company she wanted to keep at the start. Pygmalion Peggy forces Luann to quit a job when she overhears the business's owner yelling at her and tries to have the girl find a new career, taking an entrepreneurship class at the Learning Annex. Luann is unsure about this, wishing that she could make the decision for herself, but during the class, she meets a man named Trip Larson, the owner of a pork products empire, who immediately falls for her. Trip invites Luann back to his mansion and the two begin dating. 
Peggy and Hank disapprove at first, and although Hank is won over by football bloopers, Peggy is not swayed, and she gets into an argument with Luann, who stays with Trip after that point. But Trip starts to become more and more controlling, telling Luann what to wear and dyeing her hair, eventually causing her to wind up like the woman on an advertisement that Trip had near his crib as a baby. At a Halloween party he throws later, Trip is dressed as a pig and reveals his true plan, having Luann marry a man dressed in Bavarian garb so he can recreate the ad perfectly, with Trip as the pig. Luann flees from the man and is chased into the slaughterhouse, where he wrestles with her onto the killing floor, deciding that if they can't be a family, then the two can become pork products together instead. But after an electric shock, Trip snaps out of his insanity, just in time to be slaughtered and turned into a sausage. This episode was held back for two seasons, originally meant to be aired as a part of season 5, but being pushed back to air closer to the Halloween holiday. It was then pulled from airing due to the graphic content depicted, which is fitting as it was originally meant to be a Halloween episode. The whole episode is framed as a horror story, starting innocuous enough as the theme of Luann wanting independence is set up, only for Trip to reveal his true plan and that independence to be stripped away as she loses her free will. It culminates in a chase into a slaughterhouse, with the same techniques used as many slasher film finales, and concludes with a big shocking moment. Luann ultimately doesn't really get the independence she wanted by the end of the episode, a tongue-in-cheek exchange between her and Peggy, having the girl repeat everything her aunt says as she's declaring that she can think for herself. Through the script, she's constantly trying to differentiate the idea that she's stupid and the idea that she's ignorant. Ignorance being when you make mistakes due to not knowing any better, and stupidity being when you make mistakes despite knowing better. Luann has had many failed relationships in the past, so one more bad boyfriend may have made her come across as stupid, though given the unhinged and unpredictable nature of Trip Larson, maybe she gets a pass as ignorant for this one. Megalodale Hank finds out about a rat infestation at the Megalomart while making a propane run there. He's hesitant to put his name on the line by recommending Dale for the extermination, but does it anyway. Dale immediately gets to setting traps and hunting the rat, but comes up with no leads, until he notices chewed up security wires and deduces that it's not a rat he's hunting. Using the cover story of now searching for a baboon, he asks a few of the store employees what they've seen, only to get made fun of by some teenagers. Afterwards, Dale decides he's hunting for Chuck Mangione, and calls Hank to inform him of this. Thinking Dale has lost his mind, Hank, Bill, and Boomhauer dress in dead bug uniforms to flush out the real rat and take Dale home. But when he finds out the reason they're there, Dale starts to feel like his friends no longer trust him. But something really is in the store, blocking them in and setting up traps to counter Dale's, eventually revealing themselves as the two teens from before. They corner Dale in an aisle only for the real Chuck Mangione to save him. The musician reveals that he's contracted to perform at every single Megalomart opening, over 400 a year, and has been hiding out inside the store to weasel out of the obligation. With some advice from Chuck, Dale's able to outwit the teens from before, and they're arrested, with the pest problem finally being taken care of, or so everybody believes. For once, Dale deduces a conspiracy theory that turns out to be completely correct, but as usual, no one believes him. As he now has proof of his beliefs, this lack of faith in his words stands out much more than before, proof that his friends have never really respected him as their skepticism turns out to be real disrespect. And when Hank leads the others in trying to do Dale's job for him, he realizes that Hank values his own reputation far more than Dale's self-image. And yet by the end of this episode, Dale ends up not being able to prove himself right, finding Chuck Mangione hiding in the store and refusing to rat him out due to his personal code of honor. Chuck is sticking it to the man, and Dale respects that too much to interrupt. But this works out for him, as even though his friends still think he's crazy for hallucinating Chuck Mangione, Dale knows that he was right, and so his self-image manages to be preserved as he can believe himself, even when no one else does. Boxing Luann Tired of being ogled and disrespected by the men in her class, Luann practices at Tai Bo to work off the stress and feel empowered. But while Buck Strickland and his brother, a woman's boxing promoter, are at the gym checking out the girls, he pretends like he was planning on having Luann fight to cover for why he's there. She boxes against her first opponent and wins, to the surprise of Hank, who had forbidden the fight. Though it's soon revealed that Buck Strickland has simply been finding patsies to throw fights against Luann, and the only reason she was led into the ring in the first place was because he wanted her to bounce around for the men in the audience. 
When Luann and Peggy believe that she's ready to fight Frida Foreman, George Foreman's daughter, they manage to arrange a time and place, only for Hank to learn that the fights were thrown and that Luann is not a real boxer. In spite of his attempts to get George Foreman to call off the fight, which fall through when Hank insults his grills, Luann decides to go through with it anyway, instead of simply taking a dive to impress the fans and get a paycheck. And after taking several real punches, she soon earns the respect of the men who came to see her box. Luann believes that her new boxing career will earn her the respect of the men who have come to see her, while she's unaware of the real reason they're there. But despite this not being the case, she had still managed to find a level of self-respect for the duration that she had legitimately believed in herself. While Luann was under the impression that she was a real boxer, she was equally assuming that she was being respected by the people around her, and that was enough to repair her self-esteem. But upon learning that she was not a real boxer, that self-image is shattered. But she really only loses her self-respect when she learns it was all a show, so the best way to earn it back is to prove that it never was, or at least, that it never needed to be. If she can go a few rounds against a real professional, then it proves that she'd had it in her all along, and that none of her opponents ever needed to throw. Of course, at first, this would not have been the case. Early in her boxing career, Luann never could have won any legitimate fights. It was only with the newfound confidence that she ever became able to think she could. And that vision became a reality, not through winning, but simply by standing her ground. Vision Quest John Redcorn is afraid for Joseph's future, being raised by another man and falling in with a bad crowd instead of with Bobby. He wants his son to undergo a vision quest, something brought on by starvation and exhaustion, and for him to interpret it to straighten the boy out. So Hank takes Bobby, Dale, and Joseph camping to have this quest, believing that it would be suspicious if John Redcorn goes too. But the only person to pass out and see anything is Dale, who interprets a dream about an Indian-American baby as a sign that he himself is Indian. Dale starts to play up his imagined heritage, embarrassing Joseph, who wants to befriend some cooler kids by spray-painting pandas at the zoo. But when he has a vision about a herd of buffalo trampling him near a panda, Dale interprets it to mean that he should kill and skin a panda before the other cool kids get there. But Bobby tells on his friend and John Redcorn rushes out to stop him, catching up just as the others arrive, where Joseph is forced to decide whether to kill the panda or go his own way. And he ends up choosing the latter option so he can be a leader himself. Many of the characters in King of the Hill are flawed people, and flawed in such a way as to not recognize their own shortcomings or to believe that they're positive traits. Dale wants his son to be one of the cool kids, a way of living vicariously through the boy to experience a life he never got to have. Joseph is at an impressionable age and willing to go along with whatever his dad thinks is right, but John Redcorn knows better than Dale and does not want his son to have the same life that he did. John Redcorn being a former cool kid who grew out of that drifter lifestyle. And yet John Redcorn's motivations for influencing his son to be better aren't out of a selfless desire but out of a want to see his son become more like him. One side wants Joseph to do the right thing for the wrong reasons and another wants him to do the wrong thing for the right reasons. Ultimately, the only person who can decide the future for Joseph is Joseph himself. To simply let others guide him and pressure him into behaving more like them is to be a follower for the rest of his life. Even going along blindly with one of his parental figures means he'll be stuck in the same way of thinking. With one exception. Bobby narks on his friend out of a desire to protect him, a decidedly uncool thing. And yet, this is the right action done for the right reason. So Joseph still has at least one purely good influence in his life. Queasy Rider Hank and Peggy are having arguments about Hank always making decisions without consulting his wife after he tries to take her to Houston to watch a football team's training camp. So at Dale's recommendation, they see a couple's therapist. They tell the therapist about their retirement dream, to buy two motorcycles and travel the country. But as they're halfway to being able to purchase the bikes, the therapist suggests that they simply get the one and drive it together. This works to repair their marriage for a while as they start to spend their time with the motorcycle and one another, until they see a happily married biker couple at a store and get an invitation to Sturgis for a rally. Hank and Peggy leave Bobby with Cotton and head out together, but Peggy does not get to drive any of the way there, and Hank finds it unmanly to sit behind a woman. They feud for the last stretch of the trip, as Peggy ultimately decides to take a bus home so she doesn't have to share a ride with Hank. 
But Hank's glasses break when he's bumped into, and when trying to repair them, he sees other biker couples talking about women knowing their place. He's put off by how misogynistic the culture around cycling can be and returns to Peggy, with the two driving home together, this time Peggy in the driver's seat. Hank Hill is an old-fashioned kind of guy, and one key tenant of so many conservative and old-fashioned ideologies is women having a lesser place in society than men. So while Hank does love his wife, he also follows a moral code that doesn't give her the amount of respect she deserves, and he does this without consciously realizing it. It's not until the couple's therapy that he gets any opinions to the contrary, and even then it takes seeing a more extreme example of this sort of behavior that really makes him understand that the way he's been treating Peggy is subpar. And so, with these two clashing ideals, Hank is forced to choose between the culture he was raised in and the culture he's married into. That is, to be married to a woman who rejects the second-class place that many would want her to be in. And while Hank at first chooses tradition, as it's the thing that's gotten him to where he is, he ultimately chooses to reject a part of his old-fashioned ideals to get him to where he wants to go. It's not as though being conservative is a bad thing, as long as the ideals are compartmentalized and you take the good while leaving the bad. Board Games After seeing Bobby and Joseph messing around in a parking lot after school and learning that their programs they used to attend to have been cut, Peggy, Min, and Nancy decide to run a candidate for the school board. They know they have an advantage as Peggy can use her sway as a substitute, Min can win over the Laotian vote, and Nancy is popular with the news watchers. But they disagree as to which one of them will be the actual candidate, and Min volunteers before anyone else gets the chance. But Peggy tries to control her campaign on her own, only to clash with the others, resulting in Min declaring that people with two-year degrees should not be eligible to teach classes, meaning Peggy would lose her substitute teaching job. So Peggy decides to coordinate with Nancy to betray Min, only for Nancy to announce on television that she's running for school board herself. Disgruntled, Peggy resorts to a last-minute plan to pretend to be the voting bus and shuttles all of the other women's supporters out of the state for the day of the election. In the end, none of them win, and the three decide that they should simply watch the kids on their own. Although they all start out with good intentions, retaining the after-school programs that the children need for enrichment, by the end of the episode, none of the three Rainy Street women running for the board actually care about the real position. Nancy runs on the idea that Min is unfit to run. Min uses rhetoric about togetherness instead of suggesting much in the way of the original policies, and Peggy just wants to see the others fail. The politicking of the candidates gets in the way of the actual issues, and thus, in the way of actual progress. And this is to say nothing of the interpersonal relationships of the cast. Peggy, Nancy, and Min are close friends at the beginning and end of the episode, their relationships decaying only during the election, as they care more about themselves and their platforms than what it was they originally set out to do. It speaks to the art of compromise, something central to any diplomacy, and how it could have prevented any further issues. Even at the start of their campaign, Peggy and Min were willing to give each other friendly advice, as they knew it would help their overall message. An Officer and a Gentle Boy Hank is trying to teach Bobby some discipline, but can't get through to his son. So Cotton suggests taking him to Fort Burke, the military academy that straightened him out as a child, so he can undergo a two-week boot camp. Hank and Peggy are worried about how the boy will turn out, having heard the horror stories from Cotton. And after a few days, they show up for a wellness check. But once there, they find that the academy is rather nice, teaching crafts and giving the cadets proper food. Eventually, Cotton discovers this and shows up at the camp himself to take over, bringing the standards back to what they were during his time. He singles Bobby out, giving him the harshest punishments to no success, eventually putting the boy into the hole, a concrete box used as a punishment. When making a delivery to Dee Dee, Hank learns that Cotton is at Fort Burke and that he's put Bobby into the hole, rushing over there to save his son. Hank arrives just as Cotton is about to let him out, only to see that Bobby is unaffected. In the end, it's revealed that he saw graffiti left by Cotton during his time, stating that he'd spent two days in the hole, while Bobby spent three. As Hank Hill repeatedly says when referring to Bobby, that boy ain't right. And yet during this episode, when put up against the same challenges that Cotton admits were too much for him, Bobby is able to succeed unharmed. There's a large amount of importance made regarding how combat-ready boys are as a gauge of their quality, a holdover from Cold War paranoia that defined earlier generations of American men. And yet, despite Bobby clearly not being a fighter, he's still able to hold up to these completely arbitrary standards. In part, this is due to Bobby's lack of ego. 
So many military exercises are designed to spiritually break down recruits, to cause some sort of ego death so they can be built up into something else. But all of the struggle here is dependent on the amount of ego that the subject has. If they're proud, then they'll feel humiliated until they feel nothing. Yet for Bobby, that feeling of humiliation is absent. To quote a great man, pride is not the opposite of shame, but its source. And Bobby, however unintentionally, has figured this out as he seeks out attention not from his pride, but adaptability. The Miseducation of Bobby Hill Hank takes Bobby to the Grill Stravaganza, hoping to teach his son the basics of salesmanship. He starts Bobby out by wiping tanks and calibrating gauges, but Bobby just wants to sell grills on the floor. When the boy sees Joe Jack using tricks to sell grills while Hank is simply giving customers pamphlets and leading them out the door, Bobby starts to take after Joe Jack's flashier style, and he begins to make a sale himself. Hank is appalled by this behavior as it ignores the fundamentals, but Buck Strickland sees the potential in the boy and adds him to the sales team, with Bobby overtaking Hank in sales. So Hank, hoping to prove his methods to the boy, starts to try to mimic his tactics to so little success that Buck bets Hank in a poker game and loses. But things take a turn when Hank is wiping tanks at Thatherton's when the customers Bobby sold to come back demanding refunds as Bobby never properly informed them about the grills. Hank is brought back to mitigate the disaster and manages to turn each customer into a satisfied one. Just before closing, one of the customers Hank gave a pamphlet to comes back and declares he's transitioning his trailer park to propane, giving Hank the sales edge to win at the last minute. Meanwhile, Dale, Bill, and Boomhauer strap a bunch of weather balloons to a lawn chair in the hopes of flying, only for Bill to lose control and fly away. Bobby and Joe Jack's method of salesmanship is all style with no substance, the kind of thing that works up front, but after a few weeks of practice reveals its issues. Bobby knows nothing about grills and ends up selling the wrong product to the wrong customer repeatedly. And while this is good for short-term gains, it shows more and more weakness as the grill extravaganza goes on. Because while it's easy to rip people off with a lie, these lies only last for so long. It shows the issues with a system where salesmen are incentivized to hit arbitrarily high marks regardless of how these sales are made, much in the same way that success is often measured in ways that only show a surface level interpretation of events. Hank doesn't really care about his sales figures, he cares about the overall satisfaction of his customer base, much in the same way that he's never been motivated by money but security, or how he cares less about showing off his wealth than keeping it. So Buck Strickland's system of monitoring and rewarding sales ends up showing its faults as all of the success is front-loaded with no backup plan of what to do when people find out that they've been ripped off. The Good Buck Buck Strickland comes into work broken up over his wife leaving him and the fact that he's gambled away part of the Strickland Empire. So Hank, remembering that Buck was the one to get him into propane in the first place, decides to help the guy straighten his life out by taking him to church. There he meets Luann, who's been upset that her Bible study class won't accept her as a temporary substitute, and she begins to privately teach the guy about Jesus. Hank and Peggy are skeptical of Buck's intentions, assuming he just wants to sleep with Luann, made worse when he begins to request that they study the Bible in her pool. These Bible studies become larger and larger, with more people joining in, all of whom are just there to look at Luann in her swimsuit. But after Buck makes an impassioned speech comparing himself to the prodigal son, Hank and Peggy come around to the idea that he truly has been saved. And then Buck announces his intentions to marry Luann. But Luann shoots this suggestion down and Buck breaks down again, coming into the office drunk and passing out. When he wakes up, he sees Hank polishing propane tanks and joins in, vowing to make propane his only vice in the future. In the B-plot, Bobby skips his cross-country practice to dine in a hotel's diner, befriending two elderly women in the process. Buck Strickland has always been one of the least moral characters of the show, constantly involved in gambling, drinking, and other miscellaneous dives and vices. And no matter what happens to him through the show, he always manages to return to the way he started out at the beginning of the episode. Here, the episode gets a positive ending, with Buck vowing the same dedication to propane that Hank has, but the audience is fully aware that he's doomed to the same spiral of depression and desperation that he's always had in him. Or is he? Because this episode also makes a point that Buck Strickland was once a much better person. He noticed the work ethic of Hank Hill and hired the man on the spot due to his principles rather than abilities. He also taught Hank Hill everything he knows, and with Hank's personality, it's clear that this includes a large part of the guy's current philosophy. 
so instead of a miserable wreck, his downward spiral becomes a facet of a tragic character. Buck Strickland was not always this way, but he's doomed to continue down on the path no matter what temporary goodness he exhibits. This is why Hank and Peggy are so confused about his proposal to Luann. While they know that his expression of religion is likely genuine, they're also fully aware that it's temporary, and he'll soon be back to the gambling booze hound he used to be. I never promised you an organic garden. Looking for a job at the school, Peggy finds out about a cut organic gardening class that students have been able to opt into as a gym alternative. She talks her way into teaching the class on the condition that the food be used to feed the football team. The first harvest is a success, and the coaches, plus Hank, are so impressed by the food that their praise encourages the organic gardening class to keep at it. But the next harvest is full of bugs and other pests, so Peggy tries to look up meaningful ways to prevent the pests from gathering, but nothing works. When she goes to the old organic teacher, he advises her to simply use pesticides and not tell anybody. This works, and the garden is brought back to its bountiful self, with Hank so proud of the hard work of all the students that he starts to refer to them as a team, and makes jerseys. But later on, the truth is discovered when Peggy is caught with a pesticide, and the team becomes demotivated with the class being cut once more. But Bobby refuses to allow his hard work to go to waste, and begins one final harvest before the area gets used by the football team for storage, motivating everyone else to come back to work too. The purpose of the organic garden as a means of providing food is something that's viewed as the only thing any of the effort is good for, though this is far from the truth, even to characters who are motivated otherwise. Hank is appalled when he learns that Peggy has been cheating with pesticides, and yet the only reason he was involved with the gardening program in the first place was because he saw the team effort it took to maintain the garden, as well as the leadership Bobby was showing, and compared it to the efforts of a football team. It was never about following arbitrary rules, but teaching a sense of work ethic and discipline to the participants. And if you think about it, football is more or less the same thing. Nobody really cares who's the best at moving the ball from one place to another. The skill set from the sport of football is barely applicable to the real world, and yet the efforts to improve at the sport, work with the team, and the friendships you form in the locker room are all things that will continue to be useful for your whole life. So even if the spirit of the organic garden was violated with the use of chemicals, the concepts that had the real value remained intact, and that matters more than how big your tomatoes are. Be true to your fool. Hoping to get a chance with the girl who treats lice at the school, Bill infests the alley with head lice. They all attempt to remove the lice, with Hank, Dale, and Boomhauer ultimately shaving their heads to stop the itching. But when they do so, Hank discovers that he has a tattoo of Bill's name on the back of his skull. Bill, meanwhile, has been excommunicated by the alley, so he resorts to drinking alone when he gets arrested for public intoxication. Hank gets the tattoo removed, and then asks Boomhauer where he got the tattoo to learn the story. That he and the guys had gone out drinking to celebrate Bill's deployment, where a drunken Hank taunted some bikers and got saved from an assault by Bill, Hank getting a Bill tattoo to commend the action. He feels bad about not bailing the guy out of jail, and goes down to the station to apologize to his friend, but Bill has found acceptance among the other inmates and refuses to leave. So Hank gets himself arrested so he can speak with his friend, though when Bill stops talking to him after learning the full story of the tattoo, Hank asks another inmate to give him a new Bill tattoo in the same spot, and the two finally make their peace. While Bill is a loser in the present day, this episode's flashbacks show that he was not always this way. Once upon a time, he was the type of person that even Hank respected, as well as being the kind of person to deserve that respect. So Hank's tattoo that he discovers is a memory of the time where his friend wasn't so much of a failure and many of his present failings are, in part, the result of the people closest to him abandoning the guy. Bill went downhill after he lost Lenore, and it's implied several times through the show that if Hank weren't around, Bill would be much worse off. So to turn his back on his friend means that Hank will, in a small way, contribute to Bill becoming even worse off than before. Without the guys from the alley around, Bill considers confessing to a string of break-ins and misdemeanors so he can hang out with criminals who look up to him. He would have gone from a loser to a menace to society, were it not for Hank expressing some small desire that he remain the way he is. For Hank to give up on Bill means an even lower chance that he ever turns his life around, as if declaring that such a thing is no longer possible. Racist Dog 
When the Hill family's water heater starts leaking, Peggy invites Mac, a repairman from the church, over to fix it, not trusting Hank to do the job, as he was the one who installed the malfunctioning one. But when Lady Bird comes into the closet to see what's going on, she attacks Mac, and the repairman accuses the dog of being racist. Hank tries to insist that Lady Bird is not prejudiced, but when taking her to a canine training school, the instructor says that Lady Bird picked up on Hank's subconscious signals, and that she wasn't the racist one, but Hank was. The rest of the church hears about Hank's prejudiced ways and starts to shun him, made worse when Lady Bird attacks a rehabilitation doll he was using in front of the congregation. Eventually, another repairman is called over to look at the water heater, and Lady Bird attacks him too, despite the guy being white. At this, Hank concludes that Lady Bird does not hate black people, but repairmen. She was picking up on Hank's dislike of other men working on his hardware. Hank puts a lot of care into the relationship he has with Lady Bird, so finding out that he's raised her to be potentially prejudiced reflects badly on him. But it's not as though this was something consciously done by the guy, as Hank himself has never shown any particular inclination to dislike anybody for a demographic reason, unless they're from Oklahoma. And yet the rest of the church is willing to go along with this idea of Hank being racist in spite of his own words otherwise, as a lot of prejudice is done subconsciously. Whether it's as simple as seeing an Asian man and assuming he's either Chinese or Japanese, or even overcompensating in the other direction, by trying to play up his niceness around an African American man as though he has something to prove. At the end of the episode, it's shown that Hank is not racist, but that he hates repairmen, his nervousness around them making Lady Bird react negatively. And so this ends up also explaining why he got a poor score on the racist test, and the reason that Lady Bird attacked the doll that he and Bobby were interacting with. The situations made him uncomfortable, as he tried too hard to overcompensate for his behavior, forcing himself to behave in an unnatural way. Hank considers himself an American, and deeply believes in all of the ideals the country espouses, down to individual freedoms and not judging people. But when the topic of racial prejudice is brought up again and again, he suddenly starts to see race again, as it's at the forefront of the conversation. Night and Deity When Bill causes a pigeon infestation in the alley, Dale tries to solve the issue, but fails. So he calls in a pigeon expert, Sheila Refkin. Sheila has a keen interest in extermination, and is able to talk shop with Dale, who's excited to have someone as interested in extermination as he is. But this attention garners the jealousy of Nancy, who starts to fret that her husband is spending time around another woman, while she and Dale have next to nothing in common. Eventually, Sheila invites Dale to an overnight extermination at the Econo Suites, something that Nancy compares to her migraine workshops with John Redcorn, and she stays up all night fretting over it with Peggy. Peggy, meanwhile, has been jealous of Hank for being selected as the designated driver for Luann's 21st birthday party, but Hank gets roped into chugging some alcohol and, unable to drive the girls home, Luann gets a ride with a man who was hitting on her while Hank watches them make out from the back seat. Boomhauer and Bill find a pigeon under the influence of one of Sheila's pigeon repellent, and they babysit it for the night so it can come down off its high. In the end, Dale finds out that Sheila had intended to seduce him on the overnight trip, and he rejects her as he reprofesses his love for Nancy. After years of Nancy cheating on Dale, the situation is nearly reversed during this episode, Dale finding a woman who loves him the same way that she once loved John Redcorn. And while there would be some sort of karmic justice to Nancy losing her husband to another woman, karma doesn't necessarily mean the best for everybody. Especially in a familial relationship, infidelity of this kind can lead to problems for friends, and especially for Joseph, although this is an angle not explored during the episode. Instead, the spotlight is put onto the relationship between Nancy and Dale, specifically that it's one not built on a mutual interest, but much deeper personal connections. In the earlier seasons, it would have been easy to imagine Nancy not caring if Dale had run off with another woman. It would have given her more time with John Redcorn, after all. But by now, she's trying to remain faithful to her husband, and despite a few underhanded tactics being deployed, like trying to set up Sheila with her former masseuse. It raises the question of whether or not Nancy really deserves a second chance with Dale, as well as the idea that potentially, two wrongs not making a right, even if Dale is unaware of one of these wrongs. So Dale ends up passing a test of character that he was unaware of, and as a reward, gets to keep the good parts of his life intact. Made in Arlen Khan's mother, Laoma, moves in with the Sufanusen phone family, and immediately starts to get on men's nerves as she corrects the other woman's housework. 
But after Laoma goes to the Hill family and starts to work cheaply just to get out of the house, Min gets the idea to have her clean the houses of the rest of Rainy Street to get some time alone. But as she's taking care of Bill, the two start to flirt over their mutual loneliness, and soon start to date. Khan is mortified by this and struggles to adapt to the change in his life as he finds Bill repulsive. So he sabotages the relationship by telling Bill that he ought to break up with Laoma, as she's dating an astronaut and doesn't have the heart to break up with him herself. Afterwards, Bill becomes even more miserable than usual, and Laoma declares that she's moving to a retirement community to be away from him. But before she can leave, Hank gives Bill a motivating speech to declare his feelings one last time, and as he does so, everybody discovers Khan's lie. In the end, the couple makes up, with Khan begrudgingly coming around in the relationship. Due to a combination of loneliness and a feeling like she may be abusing the hospitality of a younger relative, Laoma finds solace in cleaning and cooking for someone else, her personality being one where she's only happy by making others happy. And Bill is by far the one person on Rainy Street who needs this relationship the most, barely able to take care of himself at the best. He starts to see an improvement in his life and mental health from the relationship, turning things around to everyone's benefit. But Khan still doesn't accept this development as he hates the idea of his family underachieving in anything. The idea that his mother is in a relationship with Bill puts that guy on his level, forcing the two to spend time together as a family. But one of the main reasons Bill was viewed as so pathetic was due to his inability to take care of himself, physically or otherwise. With Laoma around, he improves as a person, but that previous image of the man still remains in Khan's mind, as it does to the audience as well. Despite the ending of this episode, Laoma does not become a recurring character, and Bill remains just as miserable as he's been since the beginning of the show. The Witches of East Arlen After losing a part in a play, Bobby starts to sulk over his lack of a thing that makes him unique. So Hank takes Bobby to a flea market to find a new hobby, where he comes across a deck of tarot cards. While searching for more material on them, he meets Ward, who invites him to hang out with the Coven of Artemis at his mother's house. Hank is thrilled about Bobby having a new friend group, and doesn't pry too much into his son's life, until he notices Bobby skipping a football game to dance around in the woods in a robe. He tries to shut down Bobby's new interest, telling his son that the guys are nerds, but this only makes Bobby double down and try to get more involved with the group, and the cult ultimately asks Bobby to drink dog's blood at a ceremony during the next full moon. While looking for a way out of this, John Redcorn discovers what's about to happen, and he warns Hank of the ceremony, with the two heading out to put a stop to it. But they don't arrive until afterwards, where Bobby has realized that the guys were nerds after he refused to drink the blood and got destroyed by the wizards, really just the guys making weird noises at him. In the end, Hank decides that it's alright if Bobby hasn't found his thing yet, as he still has plenty of youth. This episode starts out with the bog standard, Bobby gets into a weird hobby plot that so many King of the Hill episodes have been using since the beginning. The difference instead comes from the episode's end. Rather than Hank's advice being the thing to get Bobby out of a disastrous situation, Bobby himself is the one to realize that his new friends are posers, and that he's better off without them. Hank telling him to stay away from the group is, like any advice given to a teenager, the thing that pushes him further into the circle. And why wouldn't it? From Bobby's ignorant perspective, Hank is the hypocrite here. At first, he's pushing Bobby to hang out with new people and find a new hobby that facilitates this. He's even happy with Bobby coming home late and skipping social events to spend time with them. So after Bobby does exactly what his father wants, he's then told that he shouldn't have done that and that his new friends aren't good enough. Hank is right in this situation, but as Bobby doesn't yet know just how detached from reality the Coven of Artemis is, it merely comes across as Hank trying to force Bobby to be more like him. A lesson Hank should have learned is pointless to enforce by now, just as much as Bobby should have understood that his father's advice is worth following. Season 8 If Season 7 was a return to the form of the early, character-centric episodes of King of the Hill, then Season 8 is an attempt to rebuild off of what the show had regressed back to. The more down-to-earth realism being re-established, the writers now had the chance to start thinking outside the box with what their characters did, with the perspective of what it may look like should they go off the rails again, and with this knowledge, how to avoid it. Season 8 took the stories in directions further from the mundane that Season 7 did, though with care not to make anything too absurd occur for fear of the show forgetting its roots, what made it so beloved in the first place. And while there is far less in terms of memorable set pieces going forward, 
This only allows the characters themselves to shine through more thoroughly. Because having crazy situations and settings is only a shallow means of attracting interest. Good character writing is how you keep that interest. In this way, King of the Hill has begun to retread the style of some of the earlier seasons following the first, and attempts to do so in such a way as to avoid being repetitive. After so many seasons, most shows would start to either decline in quality, or wear out their welcome, and using this technique, King of the Hill tries to avoid both of these pitfalls. But it's one thing to attempt to stay fresh, and another to succeed. Patch Boomhauer Boomhauer finds out his younger brother Patch is getting married and returning to Arlen for the wedding. Later on, Boomhauer learns who the bride-to-be is, Catherine, an old love of his. He's torn about his younger brother's wedding, but accepts when Patch offers him the position of best man. But when Boomhauer catches Patch trying to hit on Luann and tells him off, the ensuing fight causes Patch to offer Hank the best man position instead, as well as Hank being put in charge of planning the bachelor party. But later on, Boomhauer is trying to warn Catherine about his brother's behavior, and Hank tells him off, assuming he's trying to break up the wedding. Boomhauer attends the bachelor party in an attempt to make things right again, only for a group of exotic dancers at Patch Hire to arrive at Hank's house for the party. The bachelorette party walks in on this moment, and Patch acts as though they were Boomhauer's idea when his fiancée looks disgusted. After this incident, Hank asks Boomhauer for the truth, and Boomhauer tells him it wasn't him. But before Hank can reveal the truth, Catherine herself admits that the gesture of Boomhauer hiring the woman reminded her that she still had feelings for her own love. At this, Patch reveals that they were his idea all along, and Catherine's disgusted enough to call off the wedding. In the end, Boomhauer and Catherine say their goodbyes, and Boomhauer asks Hank if he'll be his best man if he ever gets married. There are a lot of misunderstandings in this episode, not just in the sense that it's difficult to understand what the Boomhauers are saying, but that other people willingly assume the worst about each other leading up to the wedding. And yet, while so many other shows would have ridden the misunderstandings to a logical breaking point and then beyond, Hank Hill stands out by simply asking Boomhauer if his assumptions are right, and then believing his friend of 30 years when he says they're not. Because to Hank, the real issue with all the perceived actions was the fact that he was lied to by a friend. It's telling that this episode can play with audience perceptions in this way. One would have expected the wacky misunderstandings to continue as more and more people turned against Boomhauer. But Hank is quick to believe his friend's good nature and to put an end to the bad blood that could have formed. And then, Catherine saying it was actually romantic for Boomhauer to try to break up the wedding causes a second shock, only for the hypocrisy of Patch to reveal itself as he not only admits he lied to make his brother look bad, but that he was willing to cheat on a woman he was engaged to as well. Reborn to be wild. Upset with Bobby's latest music obsession, Hank takes his son to a Christian youth group to straighten him out. A youth group that ends up being a bunch of skateboarders who praise Jesus using punk rocker aesthetics led by Pastor K. Bobby starts to get more involved with his religion, though Hank has some problems with the clothing style and skateboarding that his son is adopting. Yet when he tries to stop Bobby from dressing the way he is, the rest of the alley considers it a censure of his religion, telling Hank off for trying to stop Bobby from worshipping in his own way. Around the same time Bobby gets grounded for getting an ear piercing, Bobby also gets invited to a Christian rock concert to perform on stage, and Hank forbids him from going. After Bobby sneaks out anyway, Hank moves out to stop his son from attending, and there meets Pastor K's father, a roadie for one of the bands, who tells his son that he shouldn't try to tell Hank how he ought to be worshipping. Hank takes Bobby home and shows him all of the old fads that he used to buy into, lamenting that he had feared religion would go the same way once Bobby decided skateboarding was no longer cool. Meanwhile, the rest of the alley finds out about last meals for death row inmates and plans to make a last meal of their own, but when it comes time to actually eat all of the food, they're too paranoid to consume any. Hank struggles to verbalize what it is that he has a problem with during this episode. While getting Bobby further into religion is something that he was pushing for at the start, it wasn't so much that he wanted Bobby to be faithful, but that he wanted his son to be faithful in the same way as him. The purpose wasn't to push Bobby towards a religion, but to push Bobby towards the moral lessons taught by that religion. It was the end result that he wanted, for Bobby to be as upstanding a citizen as he is, with the same code of honor. And so this is closer to the reason that Hank dislikes the way in which his son is adopting Christianity. 
He wanted Bobby to be a more traditional son, and thought of his faith as being a middle ground to get to that point. But instead, the middle ground was all that was adopted, the end result being different than what he'd intended. And this is ultimately what Hank has an issue with. If the purpose of his religion has to do with something other than what Hank views as its core tenant, then it's a faith made on a shaky foundation, and thus, one that can be passed over as with any fad. New Cowboy on the Block A new neighbor moves into Rainy Street, Willie Lane, a retired Dallas Cowboy with the Super Bowl ring to prove it. The guys are ecstatic about having a football player living nearby and head over to watch games with him, as well as driving the guy to work. But after a Cowboy's victory, he throws a party which lasts all night, keeping the neighborhood up with the noise and disconnecting Khan's phone line when he calls to complain about the noise level. Hank is hesitant to tell the guy to calm down for a while until Khan's lawn is vandalized, and Willie starts a fire when Hank tries to make him answer for it. But the police are too infatuated by the Super Bowl ring to enforce the law, always taking Willie's side when they get called over, and even believing the story that Hank pushed an old car onto his own lawn. But when Khan insults Willie and the retired football player tries to start a fight, Hank ends up taking a punch to the face. But as Willie's Super Bowl ring has left an imprint on Hank's face, the block now has irrefutable evidence of the assault charge that they used to convince Willie to pack up and leave, or face legal retaliation. Hank starts off this episode infatuated with an idol of his, the fictional football star Willie Lane. Although Willie's only career accomplishment is blocking a field goal attempt and being on a Super Bowl team, two things that are enough in Hank's eye to override anything else that the guy does. Because to Hank, the position of being in the public's perception is enough that the person ought to behave in a similarly majestic way in all else they do. He considers people to be all good or all bad, no compartmentalization that a terrible person can do one great accomplishment, or even considering whether playing a sport well counts as a heroic deed worthy of that praise. But as the episode goes on, Hank sees himself changing sides and going up against the people who recently held the same opinions as he did. At first, he believes that a football star can do no wrong, while Khan doesn't care about the sport and thus does not have the same hang-up. A noisy neighbor is a noisy neighbor. But after Hank comes around on the idea that Willie Lane isn't all that great, he has to go up against his old friends, who held the same opinion that he did only a few hours before. And ultimately, the episode is concluded by finally gathering the evidence to convince the police of the same mistake, and conflating morality with greatness. The Incredible Hank Peggy is put on the planning committee for Arlentinos Day, a day celebrating Arlen's Latin American heritage that includes a bull run. But Hank is too stressed from work to focus on her talking about the event, and later, when Hank learns that Bobby is failing gym class, they go to the doctors, and the doctor suggests that Hank has irritable male syndrome. He prescribes some testosterone to treat the issue, something Hank refuses, although Peggy fills the prescription anyway and secretly puts it in his food. Over the next few days, Hank becomes more and more energetic, gaining muscles, acne, and picking fights with the other guys. He becomes so active, in fact, that he volunteers to raise money through sponsorships for the insurance at Arlentino's Day so that they can have a bull run without a protective fence. But Hank later learns that Bobby failed gym class due to not wanting to shower, and that Peggy has been drugging his food, that his energy, and subsequent lack of it, is the result of the pills. So hoping to set a better example for Bobby, Hank decides to run in the event without the help of testosterone, encouraging Bobby to overcome the showering he's nervous about. Through the show, we've seen Hank Hill repeatedly regret the person that he was in his youth, that he was too hormonal and behaved in a way that adult Hank feels ashamed of. In this episode, the testosterone doses cause him to return to that level of overconfidence and energy, volunteering to run with the bulls without spending much time thinking about whether it's a good idea or not. Despite the immaturity of saying things without considering them, he still manages to salvage the behavior by following through with it anyway. Because to Hank, being a man means sticking to a strict code of honor, whether it's a good idea or not. And this is the lesson he's attempting to impart onto Bobby, who is on the opposite end of the testosterone spectrum as Hank. While Hank is glad to be out of puberty and more mature than that, Bobby is equally far from the raging hormones of that age in a boy's life. But this, to Hank, is viewed as an issue. And part of the reason this isn't a hypocritical concept is the fact that it takes going through that awkward phase of puberty to understand why it's more important to behave as an adult. 
Hank feels ashamed of his actions during his second puberty, but still wants Bobby to undergo a similar event so that his son, too, can learn from experience. Flirting with the Master when Peggy learns that the actor who plays Latin television sensation Monsignor Martinez, Eduardo Felipe, is visiting Arlen, she pretends to teach a class with sick children so that he might pay a visit to her school. While there, he asks Peggy if she would be interested in flying to Mexico to tutor his children so they can enroll in an American private school, and after convincing Hank, she agrees. But while she's being hosted, Eduardo gifts her with homemade wine, passion fruit, and he speaks familiarly with Peggy, leading her to believe that he's flirting. She attempts to flirt back, thinking that his wife is dead, and the two start to grow closer over the trip until he asks her to place some roses on his bed. Though when Peggy confronts the man, saying that she's happily married to Hank, he reveals that the flowers were not for her, but his wife, and that Peggy is too old for him to find attractive. Heartbroken, she returns home, only to find that Hank has given her a surprise. His and her sinks. In the B-plot, Luann tries to replace Peggy while she's away, only to take her duties too seriously. Peggy and Hank have their relationship tested in this episode, starting with Hank's awkwardness around romance in comparison to Eduardo's frankness about intimacy. Hank is too embarrassed to be seen kissing his wife in the airport, giving her an awkward handshake instead, whereas Eduardo doesn't seem to have any reservations about being physically close or showering her with gifts. And through this, we see the differences in the relationship Peggy dreams about and the one that she has. She believes that she's being whisked away to Mexico for a romantic Latin excursion, but this is something that she rejects in favor of Hank, who has comparatively been showing very little in terms of affection. But it's not intimacy or romance that Hank offers to her, instead, it's stability. And while this may not have the same dreamlike aspect to it as a Latin movie star's hospitality, it's still the sort of thing that Peggy prefers. She married Hank, after all. Him remembering an offhand comment she made about finding his razor stubble in the sink and then using the time apart to install separate sinks is the sort of thing that Peggy really needs in her life, not someone who showers her in gifts, but in sensibility. An especially welcome refuge after the perceived rejection by Eduardo Felipe. After the Mold Rush Hank enters his house into the Parade of Tomes to show it off to others. But while putting up the cabinet to hide some of Bobby's toys, he strikes an unguarded water pipe, causing a leak in his son's room. His insurance company comes over to inspect the damage and has his house tested for mold while repairing the drywall. But this test comes back positive and Rob Holgren, a mold worker, comes over to search for more and more finding infestations throughout the house. He tells the Hill family to avoid Bobby's room, then later the master bedroom, and eventually the whole house, as he and his crew tear apart more and more of the building, as they keep up turning mold. But when Hank arrives at his insurance company to complain about the slow treatment and their work ruining his leg of the Parade of Homes tour, he notices the insurance agent, mold inspector, and mold exterminator all dining at the same table, bragging about the insurance-backed scam that they have going on. So Hank trains himself on how to inspect for mold, and invites himself into Rob's home, testing the air around Bill's fungus-infected feet, and threatening that he'll take the results to another insurance company to get his house evacuated as well. In the end, the Hill family gets their home back, and Hank forces the scam artist to sit through his Parade of Homes tour. Hank is the type of person to do everything by the book. That is, he follows the rules no matter how arbitrarily they seem to be, simply because he values the type of society where everyone follows the same guidelines and the world works in a predictable way. But there are others who use these exact same rules to their benefit, typically by being the ones at the top who get to write them. And as idealistic as it is to believe that all of the guidelines and laws created in society are made in such a way as to achieve the maximum possible benefit, the reality is that people in power like to stay in power, and then use that power to make sure nothing changes about this. A whole section of Hank's insurance company is involved in a mold detection scam, likely able to lobby or influence legislation in such a way as to keep themselves employed. We can see the way they're able to scare Peggy with the information about the mold levels in the house in order to keep her involved in the scam, and that they even have Hank going along with it at first. So it's not a stretch to see how this scaremongering can be used on legislative bodies within the insurance companies, who are less familiar with mold levels, in order to keep the restrictions intact and the scam going on and on.
living on reds, vitamin C, and propane. One of Hank's grandmother's friends dies, leaving her an inheritance of antique furniture, so Hank rents a truck so he can deliver it to her in Arizona. He and Bobby are excited to pretend like they're truckers, keeping a schedule and stopping at truck stops. Though, as the other truckers point out, they're not really truckers just because they rented a vehicle. Made worse when it's revealed that Dale, Bill, and Boomhauer stowed away in the hole and shot their way out once they ran out of water. Now behind schedule, Hank ends up falling asleep at a stop, so Bobby and the others decide to ride through the night to get back on pace, only to make a few wrong turns and wind up stranded at the top of a mountain, with no fuel and no battery. But Hank comes up with a plan to use the furniture straps for traction and gravity to power the battery, with a small amount of kerosene used to get them to the nearest truck stop. With Boomhauer navigating and Bill holding back the furniture, they manage to reverse down the mountain and make it to a diner. There, the real truckers who overheard the ordeal over the radio celebrate the deed and offer to make a convoy to escort the mirrorless truck to Arizona and back. Meanwhile, Peggy and Luann try to write a Christmas song about Hank and Bobby, though their audience of Nancy Gribble is less than enthusiastic as she's wondering where her husband is. Hank compares the American trucker to the myth of the American cowboy, a part of the mythos of the country regarding the last few free Americans before society, at least American society, caught up to the opposite coast. With promises of the open road and sparse safety between Texas and Arizona, Hank is eager to live out the masculine dream of the American hero archetype. And yet, he learns that he can't just pretend to be a trucker after renting a vehicle, much in the same way that a belt buckle doesn't make one a cowboy. After being told off by the real truckers, he has his dreams smashed, and he's not only told that he can't be a trucker, but that he's not a real man either. And yet it's not driving a truck across a country or doing a cattle run that made the modern or classical cowboy into the idealistic archetype that got worshipped by so many modern Americans. It was what these archetypes stood for, their code of honor. Hank decrees that he's going to deliver his cargo no matter what, refusing to call for help when he's stranded and making a difficult journey with nothing but what he's trapped with. This is what causes his honor to be retained and what proved that he had it in him all along. Rich Hank, Poor Hank Hank tries to take Bobby out shopping, but learns that his son doesn't know the value of a dollar, nor the concept of keeping one's finances to themselves. But later on, when trying to listen in on his parents discussing money, Bobby overhears that Hank has made $1,000 in one day, although he doesn't know that this was simply Hank's bonus, and extrapolates that his father is a miserly millionaire. After telling the other kids on the block about Hank's fortune, they spread a rumor that he's loaded. But no one believes this quite as much as Bobby himself, who gets frustrated with Hank's lessons on finance and steals the emergency credit card to go shopping. When Hank discovers these suspicious charges and learns what Bobby's been splurging on, he sits down with his son and actually goes through the whole budget, Bobby realizing that the hills were not rich after all. When a jet ski that Bobby purchased gets delivered to the house, Hank decides to sell it and make Bobby pay off the difference. Though a spoiled child that looks interested in it disgusts Hank enough that he's able to justify keeping it around for a year or so before they get around to selling it. So many domestic comedies have frequent episodes about the family's money troubles, The Simpsons being one of the prime comparisons made with any animated TV show being one of the UR examples of this. But King of the Hill rarely shows the family as struggling for money. If Hank needs to buy a new truck, he can. If he needs to go on a trip, it's within their budget to do so. But this is not so much because he's well off, but because he sets a very conservative budget. This is not only meant to reflect his character, but something meant to reflect the changing eras of American culture as well. While baby boomers were often associated with the accumulation of wealth and aspirations of being better off than one's neighbors, this part of the American dream slowly eroded as people became less competitive with one another and started to view money as less of a contest and more of a par to surpass. So many cultural lessons were made about finding happiness from sources other than blind wealth that the typical Americans started to view themselves less as a temporarily embarrassed millionaire and as more of a job title or description. Hank could make more money if he were willing to work a job he viewed as less honorable, pushing propane to people who don't need it, or upselling grills at his workplace, but he values his integrity too much to sell it for so small an amount. As Bobby does not yet share this ideal, it makes sense for him to be the one to misinterpret the family's finances as coming from a place of consistency rather than commodity. This is not a King of the Hill. 
Strickland Propane gets a permit for a new storage facility on the condition that they beautify the county in equal parts. So Hank is told by his boss to find a work of art to display near the highway. He searches a few local art dealers but is put off by their style, until Peggy volunteers to create a probot out of propane tanks. But the zoning board is not impressed by her work and declares it not art, upsetting Peggy. But when an art dealer from Dallas is invited over to make the sale, he sees the probot and is impressed, telling Peggy that he wants to buy more probots and sell them in an art show. But once the Hill family arrives at that show, they discover that she's in a two-part exhibit of outsider art, being sold as an illiterate country bumpkin alongside Jimmy Witchard. Peggy laments that she can't be a real artist and prepares to destroy the probot, until a group of people shopping at Strickland who liked the statue start to put in commissions. In the B-plot, Dale buys a suit of armor and begins to pick fights, until Bill creates a suit of his own and defends Rainy Street. The concept of art is something misunderstood by both sides of this episode, be it from the artistic insiders who deem Peggy's probot as not art due to Peggy not being an artist, or from people like Hank who view the works at the start of the episode as not art for not being appealing. On one end of the extreme is a Philistine audience who considers art something meant to tie a room together, or in this case a highway exit. If the statue is not visually appealing, it's considered controversial or not art. But this is the same exact type of mentality that says real film is about superheroes blowing each other up, or that real literature is when the book has no conflict and a happy ending. There's an idea that any visual work is supposed to look nice and make you feel nice, commonly parroted by people who don't understand art. But on the other end of the spectrum, there's the insider world of the artist community who make the same error. They view Peggy's Probot as not art because it wasn't made by an artist, only to then turn around and praise her works for that exact same reason later on. Even the initial impression of the zoning board is completely neutral, the members all saying it's interesting and then waiting for someone else to express an opinion before they voice their own. It's a definition of what real art is based on whether others believe it is so, rather than allowing any personal feelings to weigh on their judgment. And this is ultimately what defines Peggy's success by the end of the episode. The patrons of Strickland like her work on a personal level, with no regard for what others think about it, Peggy finding success purely because she showed her works to the right audience. That's what she said. A new employee at Strickland, Rich, is introduced to replace a retiree, and quickly finds himself able to make others laugh by telling off-color jokes. Except for Hank, the rest of the office finds it funny. Especially Buck himself, as he begins to encourage the behavior by taking the new guy along on outings with clients. But as time goes on, he starts to target people with his jokes, and they stop being quite as funny, although the victims still laugh along so as not to appear like they're being sticklers. Hank tries to solve the issue by reporting a hostile work environment, but when Miss Borginis, a lawyer, suggests that Hank file a sexual harassment suit, he's too embarrassed by that idea to go through with it. But when Hank realizes that the antics are getting in the way of helping customers, he finally decides to wash Rich's mouth out with soap, and when Buck catches him doing this, Hank creates an ultimatum. Either the antics go, or he does. Buck pretends like he never found it funny in the first place and chooses Hank, and the office celebrates by finally saying things like meat and rack with impunity. In the B-plot, Dale quits smoking only to try out alternatives until he finally reinvents smoking again. Hank fears that the new, raunchy humor being introduced into the office will make everyone look bad, and yet he rejects a potential solution to this issue as having the same result. He could have made a sexual harassment suit in order to at least threaten the language into being toned down, or at least brought up a formal complaint to make his point clear. And this is a type of thing that Hank doesn't normally balk at either. He loves rules, especially when the rules enforce a sense of decorum, and so a sexual harassment complaint on record would seem like the right response in a legal sense. But Hank's real issue is that the jokes make him look bad, and makes the whole operation seem less respectable, made worse by the fact that so many others are going along with it. So even if the suit would have been the right thing to do, it would have made Hank a pariah among Strickland propane, meaning that that sense of office decorum would have been seen as a forced solution people are made to follow against their will. Acting professionally has to be an option that people voluntarily choose, or else it's just an arbitrary set of behavioral patterns. So Hank ends up fighting office politics with office politics, physically overpowering Rich in order to win the office over to his side, where they can then stop the comments as though it were their own choice. My Hair Lady 
While styling the hair of the girl in front of her during class, Luann realizes that she doesn't want to be in college anymore and that her passion was in hairstyling. But unable to go back to beauty school, she asks Bill to tutor her in hairstyling and manages to pass the beauty exam with his help. Soon after, she's scouted by Hotties with a Z, a trendy hair salon. But as she can't afford rent for a chair on her own, she splits the spot with Bill. But once Bill arrives, he's told that he's throwing off the vibe of the place and they put the duo in the back. Hank gives Luann the advice to find the most successful person at the salon and to copy them, and as the most successful man is a flamboyant homosexual, Bill and Luann begin to imitate his mannerisms. Now believing he's gay, Bill, or Beto, begins to get clients and works his way up alongside Luann. But after a while he can't keep pretending and comes out as straight, getting him fired. Hank is disgusted that Luann didn't at least try to stand up for the guy who got her the job in the first place, and after his lecture, Luann comes around, defending Bill in front of the other stylists. And they respond by firing her, too. In spite of this, Luann is happy that she can stop pretending to be someone she's not, and at Hank's recommendation, gets a stylist job at Jerry's across the street. This episode marks Luann's return to the world of styling and departure from community college, as the latter setting wasn't very utilized in her plots. But as she moves into a new position in-universe, there's time enough for one last plot involving her lack of direction in life. It's not so much that she knows she wants to be a barber, but that she has to decide what kind of barber she wants to be. Luann's lack of an identity is the main reason why she struggles at first to find success at her new job. Since she lacks identity, Luann ends up adopting the personality of a different stylist, one who perhaps is not an ideal role model. Bill, too, adopts an identity inconsistent with who he is as a person, becoming a gay stereotype in order to fit in. Without this identity, he was just an overweight loser, so it makes sense that he'd be eager to want to be someone else, someone who could more easily fit into the new setting. But ultimately, Bill is pretending to be a person that he's not, an ironic twist in the fact that he's a straight man pretending to be gay with the language of the episode drawing a comparison to closeted gay men living in a conservative area. Though by the end of the episode, it's Luann who finally decides on her future. Not so much what she wants to do, but how she wants to do it. And she realizes that it's not worth it to be a stylist if you have to abandon the people who helped you to get there. So too, does Bill learn that it's not worth it to live a lie for acceptance, as it's not really you the people around you are accepting. Fish and Wildlife Thinking that Bobby's timid nature is too much, Hank takes him on a camping trip in order to teach him some self-reliance. The plan is to catch their own food and only use what they can gather, but Bobby is struggling to get anything and begins going hungry. This is made worse when a group of hippies enters the park and begins to set up for a gathering, something that the park ranger can't do anything about as the gathering is protected by the First Amendment. A starving Bobby enters their commune and is offered to share in their gumbo, which he eats until it runs out. Afterwards, the hippies start demanding he pay them back, and they follow Bobby to his campsite, where they steal Hank's fishing poles, and later, his truck. Dale and Boomhauer leave the park, and Bill joins the hippies, leaving just Bobby and Hank to figure out how to manage in the park. It's then that Bobby gets the idea to think like a hippie, and determines that the group wouldn't leave if the park stopped offering services. After announcing that the clean water, outhouse pumping, and snack bar are being shut down, the hippies leave at the thought of having to catch their own food, and Bobby and Hank finish the episode by fishing together. This episode is based off of a real event, a group known as the Rainbow Family visiting a park in Texas, sparking concerns over the impact of roughly 20,000 members visiting a small town with a population of about 700, especially given that on previous years, this gathering had caused some environmental and property damage to the surrounding area, damage the park service feared would be too costly for the small park to handle, and that was settled in a court case where the gathering was deemed as a protected gathering. By pulling from real events, this episode grounds its message in reality, though attributing a generalized label onto a singular group ends up painting the hippies here in a worse light than the more nuanced depictions we've seen back in the first season. Hank and his friends were, at one point, characterized as the type to enjoy the commodified version of the outdoors, to buy a cooler, and considered beer and truck beds as part of living under the stars, and the hippies were depicted as being much more genuinely in touch with the environment. But in this episode, the relationships are given significantly less nuance, as Hank is made out as an extreme stereotype of an outdoorsman, and the hippies are portrayed as much more helpless, losing the existing subtlety that makes for quality satire. Cheer Factor 
Upset with the cheer team's lack of interest in football, Peggy volunteers to assist with the cheerleaders despite not having been one in her youth. She's quickly able to win over Principal Moss once she starts to cheer for the football team instead of doing unrelated dances, and gets put in charge where she struggles to win over audiences as she only knows a few football cheers. But after noticing that audiences respond well to violence, Peggy begins to create routines that involve beating the other team's mascot. This causes the football team to rally, until the former cheerleading coach assists Peggy in coming up with a routine to beat up McManorberry's mascot, the Fighting Irish. McManorberry refuses to continue playing, viewing the routine as a hate crime, and Peggy's removed as cheerleading coach in exchange for Arlen keeping its win. In the end, Peggy is disallowed from attending the playoffs, and the cheerleaders go back to focusing on competitions instead of football. But once the team starts to lose again, Connie breaks away from the team to lead the audience in the cheer that Peggy taught her. To Peggy, cheerleading is something meant to support the football team, the kind of organization that exists to piggyback off of another one. And in the same way, Peggy also tries to piggyback off the cheerleading squad as a way of getting her own popularity, the kind of attention she never got in her school days. The cheerleaders, including Connie, view their participation the same way. It's not something done out of principle, but something done out of a desire to fit in with an in-crowd. And yet this ends up being the point of hypocrisy that Peggy makes. Because in spite of her real motivations, she still tries to say that the cheerleading squad is supposed to primarily care about the football team's victory. And while it's far from being a bad thing that a school would show some sort of unity in this way, it becomes a problem when everyone is involved for selfish reasons. So by the end of the episode, when Peggy is removed as cheer coach in exchange for the football team retaining its win, what happened is something meant to be done for the overall benefit of the team. And were she truly motivated by what she claimed to be motivated by, she would have accepted whatever it took to benefit the team. Though it's by the end of the episode that Connie finally accepts being taken off the cheerleading squad in exchange for rallying the audience, where a real moral is finally explained, as Connie is the first person to actually want to show some school spirit for the sake of school spirit, instead of the associated popularity. Dale be not proud. Race car driver John Force collapses at a race and needs a kidney transplant, which the guys on the alley pressure Dale into doing when they learn that he's a match. But Dale doesn't want to go through with it for free, negotiating a series of deals with the driver in exchange for his organ. While Dale is in the hospital, he gives Hank power of attorney, as well as instructions to be Dale for the next three days. Hank goes through with this, helping out with many of the more questionable ongoing deals that Dale has going on. But it's later learned that John Force didn't need the kidney after all, and that the doctors want to give it to a sick 10-year-old instead, which Hank agrees to. Dale's upset about this at first, but later on steals his own kidney and holds it hostage, negotiating with the sick kid to give up his kidney in exchange for a few random things around the room. In the end, Hank returns Dale's power of attorney, and Dale thanks him for not letting him do something stupid with his organ. In the B-plot, Bobby takes over the morning announcements and tries to be funny during them, but he can't get any laughs until Peggy agrees to be his sidekick, ringing a cowbell after each punchline and giving up the substitute teaching job to help her son. Dale ultimately trusts Hank more than he trusts himself, something not only seen at the start of the episode when Dale agrees to turn over power of authority, but also at the end when he thanks his friend for responsibly handling the kidney situation when he would have tried to sell it on the black market. From this, we can see that on a subconscious level, Dale is aware that many of his ideas and schemes are bad, and that when it comes to something life-saving, he trusts Hank with that power instead of himself. The transfer of power of attorney being a means of ensuring that he didn't try to back out of the kidney donation that he was hesitant on. The B-plot here has Bobby struggling to get laughs on the announcements, as he no longer has the ability to project comedic timing without a live audience there, relying on a loud cowbell to tell the listeners it's okay to laugh. While this functions the same as a laugh track on a sitcom, the real reason it succeeds is because Bobby himself can hear the noise. It's implied when he starts getting flustered after hearing his mother land a substitute teaching job that it was never about the new genre, but his own nerves getting into his head about his job. Peggy recognizes that it's her emotional support that's helping Bobby more than the actual cowbell. After Hank, The Flood there's a flood going on in Arlen after several consecutive days of heavy rains. Hank is certified to assist with the evacuation and to get everyone to Tom Landry Middle School for shelter. But as he's dropping off the last of the pets, he ends up stranded and goes to the dam for higher ground. 
In there, he sees that the dam manager has abandoned his post, and has walked through the red phone scenario about opening the floodgates in case of dam damage. The dam starts to show cracking, so Hank floods a few streets in Lower Arlen to save the town. Meanwhile, Bill is at the shelter and gets put in charge once people see his army uniform, and he begins to guide people and maintain contact with emergency services. But once Hank arrives and announces his decision about the dam, the people, including Bill, turn on him. And Hank is soon arrested to keep the people content. When he tries to break out, Khan betrays him and Bill tries to figure out what to do when Hank deduces that the flood stopped days ago. He convinces Bill to let go of power and step down instead of arbitrarily extending the emergency to feel useful. Meanwhile, Peggy comes down with shelter shock and regresses to a childlike state, while Bobby and Joseph sneak into the yearbook room and submit fake club photos. People in this episode begin to panic given the emergency situation and look towards any sign of authority that they can, diverting their attention to Bill once he's put in charge, no matter what kind of leader he actually is. From here, most of the episode's conflict comes from Bill trying too hard to please a crowd, willing to go along with whatever he says, and as a result, ends up being held to whatever the crowd wants. When they get mad at Hank for flooding the neighborhood, Bill throws his friend under the bus, instead of allowing Hank to defend his actions or explain his logic. He's also willing to put people in further danger as they begin to run low on supplies, despite the flood being over. Hank in this episode also goes through a variant on what is known as the trolley problem, where one has to make a decision to make a small sacrifice in exchange for a bigger crisis being averted. The question is raised as to whether an immoral action, either flooding a street or diverting a trolley to run over a man, is viewed as a lesser evil than no action, resulting in greater flood damage or a large number of casualties. The crowd, in their panic, views inaction as a better alternative, even defending the man who had abandoned his post, to continue to attack Hank, who remained calm and level-headed. And this level-headedness is also what allows him to figure out Bill's real motivations for his methods of ruling the shelter, rather than trying to figure out a personal vendetta. Dale Tech Cotton is staying with the Hill family for a while, and Peggy convinces Hank to enroll him in a senior's daycare center to keep him out of their way. But when he's throwing a tantrum there, the local police are impressed with his strength, and give him a job as a civilian on patrol, an honorary position with no actual authority, though Cotton doesn't see it that way. Meanwhile, Dale tries to run Dale Tech, charging people for his services monitoring the alley but he views Cotton patrolling the streets as a threat to his business. So when Hank gives Cotton some busy work of finding out who drank his juice, Dale conspires to turn the neighborhood against Cotton by implicating everybody, then having him spy on a meeting where they air their grievances. After hearing everyone badmouth him, Cotton realizes that the power went to his head and is relieved of his responsibilities, returning to the senior care center depressed. But Dale, feeling bad about demotivating Cotton, tries to replace the spark in the guy when Cotton realizes that Hank's pillow smells like Con, and that the real busy work task earlier of finding out who drank his juice had a real culprit. In the end, Dale and Cotton learn that Con and Min have been fooling around in the Hill's house, and they threaten him to install a privacy hedge in front of his bathroom in exchange for their silence. There have been episodes before about Cotton's lack of purpose in the real world following his military career, but this episode shows this relationship through the perspective of an outsider, learning that same lesson, in this case, Dale. He sabotages Cotton's career as a civilian patrol in order to support his own interests, not realizing how much the position meant to Cotton, as it was all he had left as far as usefulness. Dale is genuinely surprised when he sees how depressed Cotton was after losing his hat and whip, expecting the guy to land on his feet and find a new fixation. But that new fixation doesn't come, as it's had decades to manifest to no success. This, combined with Cotton losing all of his friends to old age, means that Dale ended up taking away the only thing Cotton had going for him. But the episode manages to salvage everything without some grand apology, and with each character involved getting what they want out of the deal. It wouldn't be enough to simply give Cotton his hat back, he would have to earn it. And Dale doesn't have to sacrifice Dale Tech except for on his own terms, getting one job in before shutting it down for good. How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love the Alamo Bobby's history class begins their section on Texas history and gets new textbooks alongside these lessons. Hank helps him to study for his first Texas history test, but Bobby ends up failing it when none of the material he was taught is on the test itself, and after going through the new books, Hank finds out that barely any of it has to do with the history he was taught. 
When Hank meets another frustrated man, Bruce Tuttle, at a school board meeting, they team up to recreate the Battle of the Alamo, in order to ensure that a more accurate version of events gets taught. Bobby is involved in the reenactment, as extra credit to make up for his failing grade, and Hank works on the set alongside the alley. But on the day of the reenactment, Hank learns that Tuttle's version of events paints the characters of the story in a less-than-heroic light, and Hank prepares to sabotage the play. But when Dale compares their destruction of the Alamo to General Santa Ana, Hank decides not to stifle the man's right to tell his story, and simply states the facts before the play instead. In the end, Bobby fails Texas history anyway, as he wrote the real version of events in his textbook. In the B-plot, Nancy receives a flat Stanley in the mail, and Peggy takes it around Arlen, destroying Stanley in an attempt to teach harsh life lessons. Truthfully, Hank's knowledge of the historical events surrounding the founding of Texas is no more or less valid than Bruce Tuttle's. The truth is that we don't know the exact events and characters of all the people involved, and many of the gaps are filled in with whatever information we know for sure. The historical events include the fact that the Alamo was attacked by the Spanish forces and the men were all killed, this event later inspiring other Texans to continue the fight and eventually win. So this narrative gets supported by the people involved being more heroic figures, that they fought to the death for their ideals. Tuttle's play challenges the existing idea of the character of the men at the Alamo, but takes it far too far in the opposite direction and portraying the people there as cowardly and drunk. Ultimately, this is no less valid, even if it doesn't make for a good story, and Hank ends up taking this lesson away. Not to stifle the ideas of the people you disagree with, but to tell both sides of the events and allowing the audience to decide which version is the most interesting. Something the non-committal messaging of Bobby's textbooks failed to do by not even bringing up the controversy. Girl, you'll be a giant soon. Hank Hill tries to enter the grilling competition at the Texas State Fair, only to learn that they do not accept propane there. Luann is tired of being treated like a child, and wants to do something more grown up, so she listens to Hank vent about his propane issue, and convinces him to start up a propane protest next to the grillers to give the gas an equal chance. But her attempts to recruit more members for the protest only gather a few aimless college students, who host a die-in, and wind up making propane look even worse. Hank, upset by Luann's naivety, tells her off, so Luann commandeers Big Tex and begins shouting her slogans from the giant, hoping to make Hank proud. He's unable to get her to come down until he realizes that he's been treating her like a child, finally defusing the situation by offering to talk it out like adults. Meanwhile, the alley is bored without Hank and they offer Bobby the position of new Hank, telling them what to do, while Peggy and her friends try to view a murder house only to be told to leave as their buy offer isn't serious. Luann is tired of being treated like a kid and wants to find something that she views as more mature to keep her occupied while also earning the respect of others. But not knowing what this really entails, she just goes to the first person willing to sit down and talk with her, who happens to be a Hank too concerned with his grievances to care how the conversation with Luann is. With both people more concerned with themselves than the other's involvement, the situation spirals into a misunderstanding as Hank tries to protest and Luann tries to get Hank's respect, neither one communicating with the other and merely guessing what it is that they want. And this lack of empathy is what drives many of the other actions through the episode. The protesters following Luann's lead are only doing so in an attempt to woo her. They have no idea what they're actually protesting against, as they're only involved for the clout. No different from Luann, although Luann is trying to earn this clout for her sake by impressing Hank, so it's more well-intentioned than trying to sleep with someone. In the end, most of the characters spend more time trying to prove things than they do thinking about why they're trying to prove that thing in the first place, or who they're proving it to. Stressed for success. Hank is tired of Bobby watching so much television, so he makes his son enroll in an after-school program. When he hears from Connie that the middle school quiz bowl team is struggling, he joins up as their pop culture guy. With Bobby's help, the team is able to get into a winning streak, but despite Bobby's confident performance, the other members of the team all study constantly, as their college aspirations depend on the team's success. While at the Megalomart's electronics section, Bobby has a panic attack as he tries to remember too much trivia at once and collapses. So Peggy and Hank try to come up with a way to calm him down to no success. It's not until Bobby considers quitting the team that his stress level finally starts to go down again. But despite Hank's disapproval of Bobby joining the Quiz Bowl team in the first place, he still shuts down the idea to quit, as he believes Bobby should go through with the commitment. 
In the end, Bobby accepts that it's okay to feel a bit of stress and returns to studying once more. Bobby's pop culture consumption ends up getting him recognized in this episode, though not for the right reasons or by the right people. Rather than the Quiz Bowl team recognizing his contributions, they instead place more and more pressure on him to continuously perform the best instead of his best. As it's a talent recognized for its benefit to others, rather than recognized for what it is, he does not get the satisfaction from his hard work that it seems he ought to be getting. This is one of the things that can lead to stress, one's work not being recognized unless it's gone. Pop culture knowledge is viewed throughout this episode by Hank as something less worthy of recognition than most other interests or hobbies, but to Bobby, it is serious business. It shows that stress doesn't come from what you're doing, but from the conditions under which you're doing it. Once Hank starts to compare Bobby's quiz bowl pursuits in a more serious light, he's finally able to start empathizing with his son and is able to give him reasonable advice. As long as Bobby is only concerned with impressing himself, then it doesn't matter what others think of him, but despite that, he should still be trying. Hank's Back, or The Unbearable Lightness of Being Hank Hank throws out his back at work, and his doctor recommends either going on workman's comp to rest up or taking pain relievers. But Hank refuses both of these and stubbornly tries to return to work, only to collapse and fill out the application anyway. In spite of the skepticism of the government agencies trying to make sure he's genuinely incapacitated, he gets approved for comp and spends the next few days recovering. But Hank can't bear to spend so long out of work, and so he finally agrees to do some yoga to stretch once again. His instructor, Yogi Victor, is obnoxious, but the new stretches work and Hank is soon able to walk again, just in time for the lawyer investigating his case to get photo evidence. Accused of fraud, Hank has to defend himself, but with no evidence to support his claims, he simply invites Yogi into the courtroom, claiming that one would have to be genuinely suffering to put up with the man for more than a few minutes. In the B-plot, Peggy tries to revitalize her old grocery store by bagging there, only for her service not to be enough to compete with Megalomart, who puts them out of business. Hank attempts to personify American ideals by working through his pain, ironically only to make his work look worse as he ends up causing issues for Strickland. He refuses to use any of the systems in place to mitigate his pain, instead allowing himself to suffer unnecessarily because of his own sense of pride. Hank is ultimately forced to attend yoga classes long term in order to maintain his health, something that he could have avoided if he'd simply accepted taking a few days off of his job. Instead, his pride is forced to put up with Yogi Victor for even longer. So this episode ends up showing off some of the negative sides of the traits that normally make Hank look good. His insistence on valuing work ethic above common sense, making things drag out longer than they ought to. Peggy's subplot does a similar thing, her customer service and bagging being far less interesting than the lower prices of the Mega Lomart. In the end, neither Hank nor Peggy are able to get what they want in the way that they want it, their idealism smashing against the reality of the situation as they learn harsh lessons through their failures. Some problems cannot be solved by hard work and a can-do attitude, and trying to pretend like they can fix everything will only make the people inevitably failing due to reasons outside their control feel as though it's their fault. The Redneck on Rainy Street After Connie gets rejected from a collegiate summer program for being just another smart Asian, Khan grows frustrated, eventually catching the attention of Elvin Mackleston, who teaches Khan about being his own boss and not taking the worst parts of the world. After this, Khan decides to stop going to work and to drink beer all day like the rest of the alley, convincing men to go along with him. They enjoy this new carefree lifestyle for a few weeks, but Connie hates it, staying with the Hill family as Con and Min head out to do a variety of white trash things without her. Eventually, Hank and Peggy learn that the bank is planning to foreclose on their home as they missed a payment, and after leaving Con for trying to break into a record store, Min learns about this and decides to get her act together. But Con is still rejecting the button-down lifestyle and plans on going sticking with his new friends, getting hit on the head with a piece of lumber while others bet on it. Hank rushes out to save him, but Khan refuses to listen until Hank brings up Connie. Realizing that Connie is no longer just another smart Asian girl, but a smart Asian girl from a troubled family, Khan goes back to Rainy Street and back to work, with Connie using the experience to get into the summer program. 
Khan laments that his family escaped a brutal dictatorship to come to the land of opportunity, doing everything they were supposed to do to find success and happiness, only to realize that that success has already been distributed, and the family is just another among the millions wanting the same thing. Realizing that this version of the American dream has long since been done away with, Khan decides to follow a different dream, one where your aspirations can't be crushed because you have none. But it's only Khan who's given up on this lifestyle. Connie still wants to work hard at it and earn her way up in the world. It's this constant motivation that forces Khan to remember why he was working hard in the first place. Not just for himself, but for his family as well. A family that he nearly lost in the pursuit of his own happiness. Khan is also frustrated with the idea that less deserving kids are getting into colleges ahead of Connie due to quotas at the schools that they're trying to reach. Upset that they don't care purely about grades, but where the grades are coming from which is a misunderstanding about what the quotas were meant to do regardless of their success. They're meant to reward the hardest working students, not the hardest working parents. Some kids born into conditions that make their achievements less impressive, others into conditions that make even moderate achievements stand out, as Connie manages to take advantage of in this episode. Talking Shop It's elective sign-up time, and Bobby and Joseph have decided to take something that will allow them to meet girls. But Hank insists that Bobby take Auto Shop instead, as the peer counseling course that he wants to take is too sensitive, and Hank thinks the repair skills will come in more handy. But Bobby signs up for the peer counseling course anyway, only to learn that he's not allowed to date clients or other counselors. Despite this, he still manages to get a date with one of the girls, Jenny, keeping it hidden from the teacher. Later, he encourages another girl, Stacy, to break up with her boyfriend, and she begins to fall for Bobby instead. Stacy starts to stalk Bobby, a feeling he does not reciprocate, and he tries to flee the girl, finding no help from the teacher or his peers. Meanwhile, Hank has assumed that Bobby is enrolled in Auto Shop, and looks for a beaten up car that he and his son can repair together. But after he finds the right one, Hank learns about Bobby's predicament, and when Stacy arrives at the Hill household throwing eggs at the window, Hank takes her and Bobby into the garage and has them fix up the car together, with the two talking through their problems over the hood. It's assumed throughout the episode that Hank Hill has problems working through his emotions as he shuts down Bobby's attempts to take a more sensitive subject, pushing him towards working with his hands. And so when Bobby tries to take a subject to meet girls, he's shown as being more in touch with his sensitive side, something girls ought to like. But the reality is that some of the girls he spoke with were really only attracted to the sense of power, the dynamic between them shaping the relationship that they had. And so Bobby was not truly in touch with any sensitive side of himself, merely putting on an act that was enough to fool some vulnerable girls right up until the point that they realized his true intentions, shown when Jenny breaks up with him for what she saw him do to Stacy. Hank would have had Bobby do something viewed as more macho than peer counseling, the assumption being that Hank wants Bobby to refuse his emotions and to bottle them up, as Hank has done so many times in the past. But in the end of the episode, Bobby and Stacy have a normal conversation. No power dynamics or ulterior motives in the way. So from this and Hank's recollection of the many other emotional issues that have been resolved over a broken down car, we can see that Hank does not reject his emotions at all. He simply uses auto repair as a way of working through his problems, talking things out with a wrench in hand. Season 9 King of the Hill's ninth season coincided with the release of the American version of The Office, a show that series co-creator Greg Daniels was involved with, and a show that took some of his attention away from Hank and Co., but the result of one of the two remaining brains on behind the show having his attention diverted was not as devastating a change as one might have expected. In spite of the almost entirely new directing crew, the show began to go back to some of its roots while upending a few of the others. For one, the commitment to a soft continuity returned as things like Luann's relationship and marriage to Lucky began. Season 9 also saw a pushback to some of the executive enforced retcons of earlier seasons, with characters recapturing lost development, though not all of this was to stay. Some retcons were for the best, allowing this new characterization to take the place of stories that had exhausted their welcome. Through the tumultuous relationship King of the Hill has recently had with its continuity, ultimately came out to a net benefit, in the interest of storytelling, even if there's not as much consistency as one might hope for. A rover runs through it. Peggy is invited to the Platter family ranch by her mother, Maggie Platter, who she never got along with. 
It's assumed by Hank that the invitation is a means to bury the conflict between the two, but upon arriving they soon learn that Maggie still can't stand Peggy, and only brought them over to see the farm one last time before it's lost. Henry Winkler and other Hollywood types have bought the land surrounding them and are forbidding the use of the cattle trail for spring grazing. Hank tries to talk out the issue with Winkler, but only gets confusing analogies, as well as the ire of the Platter brothers, who assume that Hank is another city type who's come to steal their culture. Peggy then takes matters into her own hand, exploiting a centuries-old bylaw that allows Main Street to be used as a cattle trail in the event that a side trail is blocked, and she publicly shames Winkler into allowing their cattle drives on his property. But this still isn't enough for Maggie Platter to accept her daughter, and Peggy prepares to leave. But Hank convinces her the trip wasn't wasted when he points out that Bobby has taken a liking to horse riding. Peggy's perception of her childhood and the reality of her childhood are brought into contrast during this episode, her memories of her mother's negative attitude clouding the other memories associated, and making the entire experience worse. This is a mentality shared by Hank during the episode, stating that he should be having the time of his life, but can't focus due to the ongoing land dispute. But Bobby is enjoying his time thoroughly, as he's disconnected from any of the ongoing conflict. Blissfully unaware of the mental anguish the others are experiencing, Bobby Hill manages to have a fun time at the ranch, and gets some valuable life experience from the trip. Experience not clouded by one adjacent negative trait. This episode also gives us a large retcon to Peggy's backstory, something presented in a tongue-in-cheek manner where she at first claims that the woman in the house is not the woman she grew up knowing, a nod to the more perceptive viewers who noticed. But this is a retcon that works to the show's benefit, and as such is not brought up in a negative context so much as the previous iterations are for distracting from what's the better story. Retcons are typically fine, as long as it's an interesting character dynamic replacing an uninteresting one, like Peggy's constant demands for praise and attention now being the result of an unaffectionate mother. Ms. Wakefield While setting up for Christmas, an elderly woman named Miss Wakefield pulls up to the Hill residence, stating that she used to live in the home for many years. She goes on a tour, and praises how well-maintained it is before ultimately revealing the real reason she's there. She wants to die in that house. Hank throws her out, not wanting death in his home, but Miss Wakefield makes a scene as she's being thrown out, which attracts the attention of the neighbors, who all show their displeasure towards Hank's rudeness. Through the next few days, Miss Wakefield continuously tries to sneak her way into the home, up to making a fake obituary to trick Hank into dropping his guard. Ultimately, she's able to sneak in just before a Christmas party, once again making a scene while she's being thrown out. And between her stubbornness and the disapproval of the partygoers, Hank relents, permitting her to die in his home. But when Miss Wakefield finally realizes how awkward she's making the party, she changes her mind, asking to drop by to drop dead later. Meanwhile, Dale tries to plan a bed and breakfast with a hook, trying and failing to convince Miss Wakefield to haunt his business when she dies. Miss Wakefield is a character defined by a strong nostalgic attachment to her past, somebody not unlike the much more traditional and conservative Hank. They even start out similarly at the beginning of the episode, as Hank enjoys seeing someone with a strong attachment to the home he's built and the sense of history it has for both of them. The difference then comes in the form of her stubbornness to leave the house behind, both physically and mentally. She wants to die there, and she's made up her mind about doing so. This creates an interesting dynamic wherein Hank is the one trying to deny someone a connection to the past as he implores her to move on for his sake. And of course, these attempts are all rebuked as he's thinking about what he wants. While Hank was in the right to not want a dying woman in his house, perhaps his demands would have been more well received had he tried to take on some of the wrong methods of thinking. To get into the head of a person he's feuding with to try and understand why she wants what she does. It's not until caving to her demands that she finally realizes that she's letting the past damage the present, and thus, the pasts of the people surrounding her. Death buys a timeshare Cotton Hill inherits Topsy's money after dying, and he decides to spend it the way Topsy would have, blowing it on drinks and women. He recruits Bill to go along with him to Mexico, where they sit through a seminar on timeshares. Despite his best efforts to prevent either man from buying a timeshare, Hank ultimately fails to stop Cotton from making the purchase, and his father is brought into the El Presidente Club, where he's hand-selected to go on a yacht to be sold more. 
Hank is able to use Bill as a distraction to sneak into the club, where he tracks down O'Kelly, the man running the scheme, and convinces him to cut Cotton out of the contract by revealing his father's poor financial situation. But when he tries to reveal the contract being cancelled to his father, he learns how much the El Presidente Club means to him. Cotton had just outlived the last of his veteran buddies, and so he tries to go back to O'Kelly, ultimately buying a timeshare himself to get Cotton on board the yacht. Meanwhile, Peggy, Dale, and Bobby look for a pool they can use to cool off by sneaking into different people's yards. Hank intrinsically understands that buying a timeshare in a country where you cannot legally own land is a bad idea, if not an outright scam by the people selling it, and the episode never does anything to offer a contrasting take on the situation. Financially speaking, it is a bad idea to buy a timeshare. This is the logic that Hank uses when trying to prevent Bill and later Cotton from purchasing one. The fact that it's not wise investment in any capacity. But it was not about the vacation, or the money, or anything else when it came to Cotton's actual motivations. As he mentions at the start of the episode, all of his military friends are dead. The people he's to find his life along with are all gone, and his motivations for socialization have gone with them. He has no real attachments, so he pays for them instead. Cotton gets won over by the idea of companionship, even if it's companionship predicated on the idea that he provides the group he's spending time with with money. It's not as though Cotton has never paid woman to spend time with him before, so this is no different, and understanding why he would be so prone to falling for a scam for companionship is what allows Hank to try to attempt to rectify the situation. Yard She Blows Jealous that Hank's grass always gets the attention of passers-by while she has nothing to show for it, Peggy decides to take up gardening. She fails at any of her attempts at growing until stopping by an estate sale and finding what she truly wants, a garden gnome. Hank is mortified at the gnome being on his lawn, trying what he can to cover it up or obscure it in spite of the attention Peggy is now receiving. Later, when Bobby accidentally breaks it, Hank takes advantage of the situation to destroy the gnome and hide the evidence, conspiring with Bobby to never speak of it again and blame vandals. But after seeing how distraught Peggy is over the missing gnome, and the fact that she correctly deduced that Bobby broke it, he sets out to buy a new one, made difficult by the fact that the gnome was a Winklebottom, a collector's item. But when he successfully buys a new gnome and tries to get Bobby the credit, Peggy rewards Hank for his efforts and they proudly display the new gnome in their bedroom as the whole experience has made Peggy fearful of this one being vandalized for real. Peggy wants to contribute something to the house's reputation, which Hank views as a challenge to the attention he's receiving, that if Peggy gets more, he has less. And so Hank's desire for control and stability suddenly comes into contact with Peggy's own desires, things that are extremely similar to his own wants, differing in the fact that they're unfulfilled. She attempts to curate the yard on her own by raising flowers and attempting to put her own personal touch into her work, but she settles on the gnome instead. Hank hates Winklebottom, not just because the gnome looks creepy, but because the gnome represents a loss of the stability and sameness of his own lawn, and the care he's put into it. Hank loves things to be consistent, a nice trait to have when consistency works to your own benefit, but not so much when you're in Peggy's position of lacking satisfaction or something to work towards. And of course, Hank views Peggy's sudden yard care obsession the way he views his own, something that she will remain unflinchingly loyal to with no chance of compromise. Ultimately, this episode is able to have a happy ending due to the fact that Peggy does compromise, but only unwittingly, and of her own volition. Dale to the Chief Hank is excited to get his new driver's license, only to be horrified when it's revealed that a clerical error has resulted in him being listed as female. He goes to the post office to get his license updated, but is given a bunch of bureaucracy, and redirected to the DPS, who redirect him to a doctor, who tells him that it's legally difficult to prove one's gender. Meanwhile, Dale is reading the Warren report to Joseph, when he accidentally pieces together that the Kennedy assassination was not a conspiracy. Following up on this, he soon finds a newfound trust in his government's ability to tell the truth, and start to become a zealous patriot. This infuriates Hank, who's frustrated with the paperwork and waiting, as well as everyone close to him teasing him for the misgendering, and he snaps at Dale, who reacts by trying to prove that Hank is a domestic threat. But when he runs his plans by Nancy, she talks Dale into remembering his friendship with Hank, and soon, Dale arrives at the DPS to threaten the employees with their own bureaucracy until they give Hank an updated license. If there's one thing that Hank has consistently been keen on engaging with to an illogical extreme, it's paperwork and bureaucracy. He's the type of person who loves an orderly life and the systems that support that kind of ideal. 
He reads through every user manual he owns, he follows proper procedures at all times, and he despises above all else the people who make things more difficult for everyone else by not following these rules, no matter how arbitrary they are. But this is only the mentality that Hank has when the systems he's following have an end result to his own benefit. As long as Hank can keep driving to work and grilling steaks, he's willing to put up with any system that can continue to support that lifestyle. It's only when the system fails him that he grows frustrated with the exact confrontations that earlier would have delighted him. And in a twist of irony, this happens in an episode where Dale becomes a zealot in his love of country. Dale becomes Hank as he grows more and more enthusiastic about everything America does, right or wrong, though he would never admit to the latter. Meanwhile, Hank loses his respect for the system and those who support it as it finally works against his interest, and although neither character gets to quite the same tier of extremism in their beliefs, the flip in personality is still very much intentional. The Patriot Act Bill volunteers for an army program allowing him to foster a pet for a deployed service member and gets Buster, a well-behaved dog that Hank admires. So Hank himself signs up to volunteer as well, signing a pledge to watch after a Duke when his serviceman leaves. But Duke arrives sooner than usual, not only showing up just before the hills leave for a vacation, but being, to Hank's horror, a cat. As he signed a pledge to do everything in his power for the animal's well-being, he ends up having to follow instructions including a visit to a preferred veterinarian named Dr. Leslie, who overcharges Hank for several redundant services. Hank eventually has to cancel the family vacation as the vet bills rack up more and more due to Dr. Leslie refusing to sign a waiver saying that everything had been done for the animal, until he gets a second opinion from his own veterinarian, who laughs about the overpriced machinery and its propensity to bankrupt doctors who don't overcharge. Armed with this knowledge and some reading material, Hank raises the issue of the vet not doing enough for his patients due to not owning the most up-to-date and expensive models, forcing Dr. Leslie to sign off in exchange for his silence. In the end, Hank and his family don't get a fancy vacation, though they're at least glad to have Duke out of their lives. Hank must contend with the benefit of keeping his word in this episode. He wants to vacation with his family, and he hates cats. But when a cat stops him from taking his vacation, the only thing keeping him obligated to the animal is whether he intends to keep true to his personal values. The intent behind such values is ideally to offer some benefit to your life, whether it's an intrinsic satisfaction at having done the right thing, or an external value of society's net benefit. But caught between a scam artist veterinarian, an animal that hates him, his jealousy of Bill, and his personal values having a direct negative effect on his family's enjoyment of life, the strain on his personal code of honor starts to crack. But he's able to come out on top in the end, not because he broke his promise, but because he forced somebody else to keep theirs, exploiting Dr. Leslie back by forcing him to prove his own conviction, something the doctor's unable to do in the face of a man who never quit on his responsibilities. Enrique Silable Differences After noticing a crack in the foundation, Hank begins planning to install a new driveway, and gets the rest of the alley in on the action. But when Enrique from Strickland Propane starts to show up early and tries to spend all his free time around Hank, he starts to grow uncomfortable with the affection he's getting from his employee. At first, Hank believes that this is the result of Enrique trying to get a promotion, but the truth comes out later. Enrique is having marital troubles, and he has no one else he can talk to. Hank tries to force Enrique to reconcile with his wife at Peggy's insistence, but this only makes things worse as he's thrown out and forced to live with the Hills in the interim. So Hank takes him to a singles apartment complex and gives him an ultimatum, which, after a bit of neglect, finally gets Enrique to settle his marital dispute and go back to being less familiar. In the B-plot, Bobby and Joseph try to unlock the parental controls on the Fox network to watch the Daytona 500, only to lose interest after seeing it's just a race. As much as Hank Hill avoids confronting interpersonal issues throughout the show, there are some issues one cannot simply avoid forever. As the supervisor of the normally reserved Enrique, Hank is the only person he really knows who he's able to open up to, the rest of his close acquaintances being family and thus not ideal people to speak with about domestic issues, when they're likely to have a more blatant bias. So Enrique and Hank both have their lack of emotional attachments in common, and we get to see the effect this has on a person when they finally need one of those connections. They turn to someone with no interest in helping. This episode ultimately has an ending that's neither good nor bad, it's just an ending. Enrique makes up with his wife and goes back to the way things are, but there's an idea that should something go wrong in the future, he really will have nobody but himself to depend on. 
and while it's nice to be self-sufficient, it should never be the only plan you have for struggling. Had Enrique not been able to resolve things himself, he could have wound up totally miserable with Hank in part to blame for the issue, not because Hank did the wrong thing, but because he went so far out of his way not to do the right thing. Mutual of Omabwa when Bobby dents the garage door, Hank takes it upon himself to teach him how to file an insurance deductible. But while walking his son through the proper channels, Hank discovers that he forgot to send his last check, and their account is delinquent. He begins to panic, telling Bobby to double-check circuitry and the accountability of their smoke detectors, etc., getting the idea into Bobby's head that the world is a dangerous place. Meanwhile, Dale starts selling honey, only to realize that he can sell bee stings instead, but when his bees fail to sting away an injury, he kicks over the hive and gets chased by a swarm. Boomhauer and Bill learn that you can fry anything, and begin deep frying whatever they can find, accidentally starting a grease fire in the alley. When Bobby starts to panic over the ensuing doom, Hank realizes that he may have given his son a more dangerous view of the world than was necessary, and he sets out to put out the literal fires to show his son that there are some things within your control. Meanwhile, Peggy and Luann are stranded at a rest stop due to not being able to drive without insurance, and they get arrested for knocking over a vending machine. Hank Hill teaches Bobby responsibility in this episode, not doing anything that could get the family into financial trouble during the period in which they are uninsured. And while this is viewed as a sort of responsibility, it's put into an extreme context in which the characters cannot do anything until the check clears. But being fiscally responsible is not the only way in which one can show their responsibility. For one, you can be responsible in risk management. By refusing to take any risk whatsoever, you're not living much of a life at all. The people who sit indoors being paranoid aren't really living, they're just waiting. So Hank sets out to put out some fires and get Dale medical attention, things that put his own safety at risk, but things that are worth doing as, again, waiting out a problem can sometimes cause it to get much, much worse before it dies out completely, and a bit of risk is needed to keep life worth living. The entire reason Hank tries to maintain his good standing with his insurance company is because he wants to keep the family's finances in order with the point of these finances to be making life more comfortable, something which is not found by living in constant fear. Care taken care of business. Arlen has a shot at making it to state, though when the Booster Club points out the sorry state of the field, Hank has to defend Smitty, the current groundskeeper, to allow him to keep his job another year in order to retain his pension. But Smitty is growing senile and can't do the work, causing a game to be forfeited due to the poor field maintenance. Hank then takes on the responsibility of caring for the field himself, even getting the guys from the alley to do a few tricks to the grass to give opposing teams a disadvantage. But all these clever tricks are credited to Smitty, who starts to develop an ego before eventually chasing the alley off his field. Without Hank to maintain the grass, the field is unplayable and Arlen will have to forfeit once again, until Hank gets the idea to convince Lucky to lead a few other rednecks across the play area in his new truck, after the guys struggle to find purpose in life due to no one wanting to race him. In the end, the field is destroyed and the game has to take place at a neutral site, though Lucky's stunt has endeared him to both Hank and Luann. After 28 years of consistent quality service and one year of not-so-great work, Smitty is considered for being let go so his pension can be redistributed for funding to the football team on a particularly great year. In this instance, it's a booster club deciding that a man's future livelihood is less valuable than the football team making state, and Hank is the one to disagree. Because as much as he wants something for the water tower, he also values longevity through intrinsic aspects of a person's contributions, namely the years of loyal service to the team. But this ideal then clashes with the reality of Smitty's competence. He's no longer able to perform his job in his old age, as his senility clashes with the basic needs of the people for whom he works. And later, when Hank tries to do a good deed for the man, his senility clashes again with the reality of the situation as his uncanny field tending gets to his head. It's worth mentioning that this sort of confrontational attitude is a common symptom of multiple age-related maladies, including whatever unnamed ailment Smitty suffers from. So Hank then has to ask himself whether the most obnoxious person he knows that week deserves the basic decency of a standard of living, as well as parsing how much his past actions can override his present attitude. Arlen City Bomber Luann accrues a significant amount of credit card debt from taking cash advances, and has no way of paying it off with her expenses. Peggy tells her to get a second job, and Luann finds work for Lane Prattley by responding to a job listing looking for girls. 
Peggy's horrified at the implication and rushes over to stop her, only to learn that she's joined a roller derby team, and so Peggy joins as well. But despite getting Hank's tentative approval, things go south when they realize the $500 per game they're supposed to be earning is cut down to $90 after expenses. So Peggy takes a cash advance to afford to buy the team from Prattley, and let it be player-owned. But the other women on the team don't get along without any sort of centralized leadership, and it seems as though neither Platter will be able to pay them back their loans. But when Prattley and the other owners try to threaten Hank, Peggy learns of this and deduces that the team owners are afraid, so she convinces the others to pretend to get along, just enough that Prattley buys the team back, and they all profit from the venture. In the B-plot, Lucky tries to get a corn chip directly off the line for Bobby by threatening a lawsuit after falling off the security fence. In spite of her attempts at lessons on fiscal responsibility, Peggy winds up falling into the same mentality as Luann in an attempt to achieve her personal financial goals. But for all the comparisons the episode makes between their decisions, the differences are still enough to be worth highlighting. For one, Luann's purchases were things bought on impulse at the behest of her new boyfriend Lucky, and her items with only a frivolous value in the moment. But Peggy takes out an advance in the interest of making an investment, not so much to invest in her financial future, but to invest in her emotional state and the happiness of the other team members. But this happiness is just as fleeting as the poorly planned purchases of Luann, as Luann doesn't consider anything beyond the immediate feeling of a purchase, while Peggy doesn't consider whether player ownership of a team is a good idea when none of those players understands what it takes to be a good leader. So in this vacuum of power, there is no leader, and the Bombers struggle to get anything done other than fight. So what's more important than the absence of good leadership? Bad leadership or none at all? In this case, the lack of leadership is only an asset for as long as the bad leaders think it's possible. The bluff of pretending the team owners are in a worse position than they're in being the only thing to scare them into compliance. Redcorn gambles with his future. John Redcorn's band, Big Mountain Fudge Cake, is struggling to find any gigs to play and getting kicked out of free ones. When they hear that Hank Hill is put in charge of organizing a Strickland Propane Family Fun Day, John Redcorn begs Hank to allow his band to play there, but Hank doesn't think their sound, or quality, would mesh with the tone of the afternoon and tells John Redcorn to bet on himself as a way to get him to stop bothering Strickland. John Redcorn takes this advice literally and opens a casino, taking a loan from a shady shark so he can afford to build a place for BMF to perform. But this casino gets shut down as it was never legally established, and John Redcorn falls into a slump, convincing Dale to sabotage Hank's arranged performance so BMF can get another shot at a gig. But the other band members refuse to play at a family fun day, and the band breaks up. Torn between losing his casino, having to pay back a large loan, and no longer having a band, John Redcorn tells Hank in person about the breakup, but Dale encourages him to play anyway, and he tweaks his lyrics from being about self-harm to being about personal hygiene instead. Rebranded as a children's performer, John Redcorn finds new purpose in his music. Up to this point, John Redcorn has been shown as a drifter, a guy who won't settle down but will sleep with someone else's wife, a guy who gets a job that grants him free time and flexibility rather than a stable homebody's life. But before he realizes it, he turns to a 40-year-old with nothing to show for it other than some inerable land near the highway and a failing rock band. So in typical fashion for a man of his age, he undergoes a midlife crisis and tries to find some new long-term meaning to his life that simultaneously allows for some kind of future advancement. It shouldn't come as a surprise that he turns to his polar opposite, Hank Hill, to try to change his life to follow his dream. But even after making more and more affordances for that dream, he still fails to achieve success in the way that he wants to find it. His brand breaks up, his casino is shut down, and he becomes a solo act. But after all of this, he finally manages to make it, not in the way he intended, but his break still comes nonetheless. And this shows the difference between the ways in which one can give up on their dreams. One way is to surrender completely, as John Redcorn almost does. The other is to accept that the dream itself may change, but as long as your pursuits aren't in the language of the dream but the concept, this isn't such a bad thing. Smoking and the Bandit While out at a restaurant, Dale struggles to get Joseph to behave himself and gets upset over the fact that he can't smoke indoors in Arlen. Dale turns to Hank for advice on how to get his son to respect him, and Hank tells him to be a man, though Dale struggles to understand exactly what this means. But later, at a waffle restaurant, Dale finally decides to stand up for what he believes in and makes a scene when asked not to smoke. This becomes sensationalized by one of Peggy's rivals at the Arlen Bystander, and she sets out to get to the bottom of the Smoking Bandit story. 
Joseph and Bobby are obsessed with the mystery of the smoking bandit, but when Dale tries to reveal that it's him, Joseph doesn't believe him. And when Joseph and Bobby get suspended from school from trying to be math bandits, Hank decides to rope Dale into tracking down the miscreant themselves. But as Dale is the smoking bandit, he has to fake a confrontation after realizing that his son is finally starting to respect him. Hank catches on, but the boys don't, and Dale, as the bandit, promises to never attempt anything so asinine again. Meanwhile, Peggy's attempts to crack the story end with her in a standoff with the bouncer over whether she's on the list. It's worth mentioning that the core source of Dale's issues in this episode do not merely come from the lack of respect Joseph is giving him, but the lack of respect Dale gives to himself. Knowing that Dale doesn't believe in anything he himself says, Joseph won't respond to it as even Dale acknowledges that he lacks a conviction to back up his words. So his attempts to get his son to look up to him have to stem from something else. From Dale learning self-respect before he can get it in anywhere else. He finds a cause and then commits himself to it. Dale finds self-confidence from his conviction and his fight as he finally has a reason for doing what he's doing. But then, it's not Dale himself that Joseph respects, but this persona he's adopted. A persona so far from his true personality that it doesn't garner any respect whatsoever due to how unbelievable it is. It's not until Dale fights the smoking bandit in the bar bathroom that he gets disrespect, and it may be a stretch to say that this is meant to reflect Dale fighting his inner demons and not just a silly scene of a man pretending to be in a brawl with nobody, but the narrative of the episode certainly sells that his internal struggles are being dealt with, just in a very Dale-like way. Gone with the Windstorm After the weather forecast predicts a sunny day on a windy one, Nancy Gribble starts to lose the respect of weather watchers, who begin to demand a meteorologist who actually knows what they're doing. Unable to accurately use any of the station's new meteorology equipment, Nancy is replaced by Irv Bennett. At first, she tries to sabotage Irv's career by digging up dirt or making him self-conscious, but he's clean and quick to joke about his faults. So at Peggy's behest, they plot to steal a news van and drive into the center of a wildfire to prove how much of an asset she is to the station. But this turns out to be too much as the amateur news crew of Nancy, Dale, and Peggy only manages to film a disaster. In spite of this, or rather because of this, the Channel 83 news team offers Nancy not just her own job back, but a new one as co-anchor. Meanwhile, Bobby is continuously getting jump-scared by Jimmy Bearden, a kid with a penchant for hiding in weird places and jumping out at people. Not knowing how to defend against weirdness, Bobby works with Hank and the boy's father to turn the tables and to jump-scare him instead. Just as the point of King of the Hill is to feature the differences between the old and the new, this episode has the same conflict portrayed through Nancy's conflict with the new station she worked at for many years. She's an old school style of weather girl, simply reading a teleprompter while being eye candy. But modern news watchers don't just want the entertainment, but something informative as well, at least in universe. So she has to contend with the fact that the industry in which she's thrived for so many years has become a changed one, and she can either change herself to fit in, or be left behind. But rather than accept this dichotomy, Nancy instead manages to find a third option, a synthesis of the other two. She wants to prove that she's more capable as a newscaster instead of fuel for the more lowbrow action and sex appeal approach to the news cycle. But she still delivers on that latter synth, despite trying to prove a different ideal. And yet this is exactly what the station needed. They always prioritized audience appeal, whether that was by being informative or charismatic. And Nancy's stunt is what made the station finally remember why she got her job in the first place. Competent or not, she's entertaining. Bobby on track. After raising a bunch of money for a fun run but failing to actually finish it, Hank forces Bobby to run the remaining four kilometers of the event on his own at the middle school's practice field. While struggling, Coach Palmer of the track and field team notices Bobby's inability to run and gives him a spot on the team. The other runners are upset about this at first, though Hank convinces Bobby that it's just friendly hazing. Soon, Bobby gets put in when Shane Masana Song is too busy flirting instead of warming up, and the team later wins a meet. Bobby is excited, and Hank shares in his enthusiasm until actually attending a meet and seeing the methods in which Bobby is used. A stick that shames other players into working harder so they don't get replaced by him. Hank is appalled and tells Bobby the truth, but Bobby is excited about this, saying that he's now a professional motivator and taking the role of stick in stride. But at a later track meet when a player is injured, Coach Palmer is forced to put Bobby in as a legitimate substitute. Bobby loses the lead Arlen had in the relay until every other player trips and falls, with Bobby only barely managing to win as a result. The ending of this episode is just a little bit out of nowhere, likely as a result of not otherwise being able to put an optimistic twist on the dynamic written. 
Hank finds Bobby's deployment as shameful as the act is meant to be, and despite being raised not to question a strategy, he can still tell there's something wrong. Bobby doesn't see anything wrong, and worse, the strategy actually works. Not just for the team, but Bobby himself, who doesn't feel any shame about his role, nor does his team treat him any worse, as doing so would be an admission of fear, likely getting them bobbied. So that if the coach is happy, Bobby is happy, and the team is happy, and therefore Hank is happy, then what is there to complain about? In the end, Hank's only real issue is that it feels wrong, and if Bobby was upset about his position as the stick, then it might have been enough to call the whole thing off. But just because an idea sounds stupid doesn't mean that it is. If it sounds stupid and it works, it's not stupid. The conflict in this episode is just a generally bad vibe, and so it has to end on an optimistic note instead of some sort of reality check that would have cheapened the emotional conflict that came before. It ain't over till the fat neighbor sings. Bill starts to suspect that nobody would notice if he stopped going into work, and Hank recognizes this as another one of Bill's slumps, banning Dale from making fun of him. He tries to send his friend to church to give Bill some meaning to his life once again, but while there, Bill notices the Harmonaholics, a men's choir, and begs them to allow him to join. Once in the group, he starts to entrench himself more and more in their culture, making large sacrifices of his time and wearing expensive custom clothing. But after using up all his sick days and most of his money, the army declares that Bill will be considered a wall if he doesn't show up at an appointed time. But Bill has given too much to the Harmonaholics, and they encourage him to tune his old friends out. So Hank chases him down to Dallas, where he's about to perform on a telethon and lifts the ban on Dale, who then gives a long speech about how ridiculous he looks that Hank follows up on by stating that he, the Harmonaholics have asked so much of him while giving nothing in return. So Bill quits the choir and returns to a job that cares about him, if only a little bit. In the B-plot, Bobby and Peggy play a game of Pong on the Atari that lasts all day. A key tenant of the Harmonaholics is sacrifice. The organization demands that its members give more and more of their time and resources to the group in lieu of any personal hobbies or personality. What they give in return is ostensibly a sense of companionship and belonging, but this is a veneer that's enforced through two things, demands and sunk cost. By demanding so much of their singers, there's a constant barrier between the members who have doubts and those who don't. If you feel like you don't belong, it's because you're not trying hard enough. If you feel like you do belong, it's likely only because you put so much energy into the choir that you've got nothing left to do if you were to quit. And this is something doubly reinforced by the choir's management. By forcing its participants to spend so much time practicing, they can ensure that the members don't have enough free time or outside connections to realize that what they're doing is abnormal. But Bill has friends willing to go after him even after being abandoned, a friendship that's lasted long enough that all four recognize what they give and what they take. Even Dale, who spends the episode holding back insults to his friend, contributes in some way by pointing out Bill's flaws whenever they get egregious enough to threaten his standing in society. Season 10 Most of the episodes in Season 10 are holdovers from the production of the shorter-than-usual Season 9, as well as By Stand Me, which is from Season 8, with only five episodes carrying the AABE production code, one of which was aired in Season 11. As such, Season 10 lacks a strong identity that separates it from the rest of the show, as many of these later, shorter seasons do. Hanks on Board when Dale's truck breaks down while he and Boomhauer are allegedly going on separate vacations, Hank finds out the truth. The other guys occasionally go on trips while leaving Hank behind. So the alley then bring their families along on a trip to Corpus Christi to enjoy the beach together, where Hank starts to fear that he's a killjoy, something Peggy corroborates as she says that he can be a bit overbearing with the others. Peggy then encourages Hank to simply go along with whatever the other guys do, instead of bossing them around so much, and soon they're on a treasure hunt. But between enjoying the sun, sharing some beers, and fishing in the open ocean, they actually have a great time, and Hank enjoys being along for the ride. That is, until they all jump into the ocean together, only to realize no one lowered the ladder first, leaving the four stranded in the ocean. But with a bit of quick thinking, using one of Dale's cigarettes and some spilled gasoline, Hank is able to light a signal flare to alert a passing helicopter. Back at the beach, Bobby spends the family's grocery money on a metal detector that he and Peggy use to search for treasure, only to get harassed by a local group of metalheads. In the end, Peggy is able to find their truck keys, which she trades for their haul of the day. 
Hank represents ideals of temperance in this episode, and every other episode, being the type of guy who would rather avoid a potentially fun situation in the interest of consistency. This consistency comes around for better and for worse, both sides presented in this episode. On one hand, trying not to be so controlling in his scheduling and demands allows Hank to finally unwind for the first time in a long while on the boat, but it also lowers his guard enough to allow a situation to go out of control as the four find themselves stranded in the ocean because no one thought things through. But there's a saying that, if you make 100% of your flights, you're leaving for the airport too early. It's impossible to accommodate every possible thing that could go wrong while still enjoying a reasonable amount of freedom in life. If enough things go wrong, there's no amount of planning that can prevent offsetting these issues, and this is something that happens with diminishing returns on either end. Making a few preparations will have a greater effect than making even more, and being overbearing with preparation will often give a negligible benefit compared to preparing for 99% of potential issues. So in the end, Hank learns that the best thing to do in moderation is moderation itself. By Stand Me The Arlen Bystander, the local newspaper, undergoes a change in management that fires the delivery men and replaces them with paper boys. Hank is excited about this and makes Bobby sign up for a route, while Peggy takes advantage of the opportunity to apply for a new job. Peggy gets the job, writing for a household hints column despite not knowing any good tips for housework. She asks men to ask her mother-in-law for hints, instead, in exchange for that day's crossword answers. Bobby doesn't want to actually do his paper route and passes the work on to Dale instead, though Dale's incompetence gets Bobby in trouble when he's sleeping in during the morning instead. But when Min gets into an argument with her mother-in-law and the household hints are gone, Peggy tries to come up with one of her own, and accidentally publishes an article encouraging readers to mix bleach and ammonia. When Hank points out this produces mustard gas, he and the rest have to rush to retrieve all the papers before they get read, getting the help of the fire delivery men to do so. In the end, Peggy admits her deception to the editor, who says that facts are less important in the news than personality. In the end of the episode, Peggy learns that it's her spin on stories that makes her a good writer rather than the actual subject matter she's writing about. As this is the one thing that she was undoubtedly contributing to a newspaper column, the implication is that she had what it took to work for the newspaper from the beginning, and she was simply misplaced within the organization. This plot resolution likewise shows off what King of the Hill does best, writing social satire while making the main focus of each plot the characters. This episode concludes with Peggy getting a job because she makes up new stories as she goes along and potentially gets people in danger, and yet the editor-in-chief states plainly that the facts don't have much of a place in modern reporting as the readers aren't interested in learning anything new, but to be entertained. The episode then also goes out of its way to point out how the profit-motivated factors that control news sources can also hurt people, as the previous employees are fired and replaced by the much cheaper sources of child labor, even pointing out in the way that a conservative mind like Hank Hill praises this kind of change in spite of seeing who's losing their jobs and who's replacing them. Bill's House The Hill family all get sick and can't take care of themselves, and then Bill comes over and begins to take care of things for a while. But after everyone recovers, Bill starts to get desperate for more people to take care of, and it's suggested that he volunteer somewhere, which he does at a halfway house called Opportunity House. But the owner of Opportunity House, Draper, mentions that they don't have enough space for the recovering alcoholics, and he has them stay at Bill's instead. This annoys the alley, who are told not to drink during the temporary stay to prevent temptation, though Hank begrudgingly helps Bill out when it's clear that he's overwhelmed. But one day, many more recoveries arrive at Bill's as he learns that the Opportunity House has shut down due to a lack of funds. When Hank asks for an explanation from Draper, he learns that the guy has a mansion in a gated community and is mostly faking his enthusiasm for helping people. After this, Hank deduces that Draper is committing welfare fraud, and has the members of Bill's house send their checks to Bill instead of Draper so they can afford to rent a house in the gated community next to Draper's, shaming the guy into actually helping out. In the B-plot, Bobby tries to teach Peggy how to ride a bike due to a promise she made while feverish. Hank constantly complained about all the assistance he has to provide at Bill's house to take care of the recovering addict. But despite how much he resents the work, he still does it diligently anyway, even helping others to share their emotions. Draper, on the other hand, constantly talks about how much he loves to assist people, when the truth is that he's only doing so for the social justice brownie points and welfare checks. There's a big difference between the type of person who actually wants to help make the world a better place, and the type of person who actually wants to make sure everyone knows they're helping. 
and the latter group often hurts the credibility of the former. After all, the actions of these two groups often differ dramatically. If the person doing all the work never takes the opportunity to take photos of them helping, then are they really doing anything? Of course they are, but when it comes time to convince others to give, this is a harder point to make, whether to a welfare office or a person looking for a charity to donate to. And sure, there's something to be said about good advertising being a driving force in increasing awareness, and thus donations. Typically, the people who really want to make the world a better place don't care whether or not they personally get credit. Harlot Town. When Hank learns that an old Arlen monument, the Tea Kettle, has been vandalized, he asks Peggy to publish a story about the Rock Formation's history to raise awareness to have it cleaned. He also asks the town city manager, Vance Gilbert, about it, though he's rebuked as it would cost too much and the city's finances aren't in great shape. But when Peggy's research discovers that Arlen used to be named Harleton and was founded by prostitutes, Hank is appalled, though Peggy still insists on running the story as she views it as a part of their town's history. When Vince Gilbert learns of Peggy's discovery, he promotes the idea by suggesting a new attraction to the town in a cultural museum, though he takes this idea to a much further extent than anyone was assuming he would by having Arlen host the Adult Video Awards and changing the museum's name to the Arlen Museum of Prostitution. Peggy is no longer on board with the idea, and the family tries to leave to avoid exposing Bobby to the event, though Hank finds two porn stars broken down on the side of the road and feels obligated to give them a ride. But on that ride, he starts to talk to an actress, Candy, and creates a compromise of embracing not the town's origins, but what it's become, an idea that Candy promotes when giving her acceptance speech. The characters in this episode present three points on a scale of shame to perversion. The furthest to one side is inhabited by Hank, who views Arlen's history as shameful and tries to have it destroyed. The next is Peggy, who thinks that history ought to be embraced, no matter how uncomfortable it makes some people. And finally, the city manager, Vince Gilbert, claims that this history is something that should be clung on to, used to define the town and the present. And all three of these positions are mostly informed by the characters who hold them, and as such, they end up being just short of an ideal compromise. After discussing the town's history with Candy and connecting her story to that of the founding mothers of Arlen, Hank realizes that a shady history is nothing to be ashamed of, ironically the exact claim Vance Gilbert made when discussing Salem, and that real pride comes from what the people in that situation did afterwards. If anything, Arlen being a town known for prostitution that later became more wholesome is a much more indicative trait of its morality than having been created out of a wholesome ideal and maintaining that through inertia the characters end up embracing the present without ignoring their past. Portrait of the Artist as a Young Clown When Bobby won't stop making jokes out of everything, Luann suggests sending him to a clowning class at the community college, an idea Hank promotes as he thinks it'll get some of his son's excess energy out of his system, and more importantly, out of the house. His teacher is Professor Twilly, a classically trained clown who follows the style of Commedia dell'arte, who has a scientific method to prove what is funny and what is not. Bobby struggles at first, but slowly starts to get the hang of proper clowning in this new style. When it comes time for the school's talent show, Bobby gets his professor's permission to perform his new character, Tartuffe the Spry Wonder Dog, and follows the rules of humor he's learned. But when Hank overhears a practice session, he becomes horrified that Bobby's comedy routine will only get him ridiculed by his peers, and he rushes to the middle school to bring Bobby his box of props. Bobby rejects these until seeing the lack of reaction from his classmates, ultimately playing himself off with the whoopee cushion's fart sounds. In the B-plot, the alley plays an impromptu game of kickball with the stray ball they find, then lose. Comedy, like any form of art, has rules that generally need to be followed in order to maintain a reasonable quality. Bad artists tend not to follow these rules due to a lack of understanding, whereas good ones have a better understanding of what to do and what not to do. For example, one wouldn't make a joke about a recent tragedy in front of people affected by it as it could be viewed as tasteless, an example of bad humor. A good comedian would know better and would avoid the subject matter. But while bad artists break rules and good artists follow them, great artists also break the rules as they understand when it's right to deviate from the mundane in the interest of being original. Norm MacDonald could tell a 9-11 joke that would really make you think. And so for as much as Hank recognizes that Bobby's humor is childish, his classmates are children. Kids love that type of thing, and if you're going to be the class clown, you should at least try to appeal to the class. 
While other high art comedians may have preferred Bobby's style of humor, it's plain to see that this was never what Bobby truly wanted to do, impressing his seniors. He wanted the attention of the lowest common denominator, and so his best humor practices were to appeal to that demographic. Orange you sad, I did say banana. Impressed with the swimming pool at Ted Wasanasong's house, Khan gets the idea to install one of his own, recruiting the help of the alley in exchange for granting them access to the pool. But when trying to show it off at a holiday celebration, the rest of the Laotian community accuses Khan of being a banana, yellow on the outside, but white on the inside. So he tries to get more in touch with his Laotian roots, changing his diet, media consumption habits, and converting his swimming pool into a reflecting pool. But this isn't enough for Ted, who cites a resistance soldier visiting as a true Laotian man because of his military service. At this, Khan is roped into being a soldier in a Laotian paramilitary organization, trained to parachute into his homeland, and prepared to die on his native soil, or march in a Laotian pride parade to earn Ted with Sanasong some cultural brownie points. But upon realizing how crazy it sounds, Khan is talked out of the group by his neighbors and family, and he returns to being an American, enjoying a barbecue by his swimming pool. In the B-plot, Bobby becomes CPR certified, so he can swim in the Sufanusen phone family pool. American culture has this insidious way of sneaking into every person that becomes even slightly exposed to it. As America itself is a country with no long-term history, you know, all the American Indian tribes might disagree with that, it instead pieces together its culture from whoever happens by, making a very malleable sort of identity that can take over a person's interests so thoroughly they don't even realize how Americanized they are. It's a common stereotype for a person to say that America has no culture because American culture is so intertwined with their own to the point they can't even recognize that the clothes they wear, music they enjoy, and media they consume are all extremely American. Both Ted and Khan fail to understand just how thoroughly Americanized they are, and they have two very different reactions to this fact. Ted is in denial about just how American his way of life is, joining a country club, living in a mansion, having a personal maid to keep it clean. His connections to his home country are largely performative, things done out of guilt for forgetting where he's from. Khan, on the other hand, is mortified about the fact that he's completely lost touch with his roots and makes an attempt to get them back. But through the episode, he starts to realize th just what he fled from and that it's not a crime to move on from your past, especially when you're only doing so to impress others rather than a genuine love of your country. You gotta believe in moderation. After an undefeated softball season, Hank is invited to give a speech at Tom Landry Middle School, where he learns their baseball team has been disbanded due to a lack of funding. So to raise money, Hank recruits the help of the Ace of Diamonds, a novelty baseball team that performs stunts on the field and donates their winnings to a local charity. But Hank has the impression that the retired players who make up the team would prefer a real match, and he goes into the game with a plan to win, rather than to entertain. After a half-inning of bunting and fundamentals, Ace retaliates by trying. It doesn't make for a good show, but it does result in a sweep that's so boring he decides to keep the giant check for himself afterwards. So Hank and the Zephyrs decide to apologize and throw a game for real, an offer which Ace rebukes as he's upset about losing out on merchandise sales. Undeterred, Hank encourages the other players to simply rock the athlete's RV repeatedly until he relents, and the middle school's baseball team is able to reband. To Hank, nothing is more fun or rewarding than a game well played, with everyone giving it their all. This is the mentality he uses going into his coaching career, and thus, the mentality that he manages to share with the rest of the team, as well as projecting his desires onto the ex-pro players from Ace's Jewels. But it's not a game for fun in that sense, but a game played for entertainment, meant to let the audience have fun more than the players. It's not just a bit of harmless fun for everyone involved, though. The Ace uses these exhibition games to support his livelihood by selling merchandise and taking a cut. So when the Zephyrs ruin the fun for the audience, he has a point in trying to recoup his cost by keeping the money, even though it's still not a nice thing to do. And yet, when this wrong is answered with another wrong, Hank leads the Zephyrs in trying to answer a rude action with a kind one, offering to undo the game from before so they can raise the money properly. This offer is turned down, though, giving the team a moral high ground for harassing the Ace's RV. Responding to a wrong with a wrong is somewhat of a neutral response, even though others may expect better of you. Responding to a kind act and a genuine good-faith apology with another wrong, though, gives others the right to finally look down on you. In the end, Hank and co. earn the right to take the low road and still be the good guys, because, after all, it's for charity.
Business is picking up. The middle school career fair occurs with students shadowing local businesses for a week. Hank assumes Bobby will be shadowing him at Strickland once again, but Bobby is hesitant to do so, and in his hesitation, Joseph gets the spot instead. So Bobby signs up for Earth Cleaners and learns that he'll spend the next week picking up animal feces. As it turns out, picking up animal feces isn't actually a bad job, as his boss, Peter Sterling, is well off and enjoys his work. But Hank is appalled at what his son is doing, more so because Bobby enjoys it and wants to start his own business of cleaning vomit. Hank tries to explain his issues to his son, but Bobby tells him off, saying that he's always been told to find a career that he loves and that can support him while shooting down the first job Bobby finds that does both. But later on, Hank tries to explain this concept to Peter, claiming that Peter is charismatic enough to get away with this sort of career path, whereas Bobby is not. So Mr. Sterling fakes an attack on himself in front of Bobby, paying Jimmy Wichard and a few others to harass him, and Bobby finally decides to find a different career field. In the B-plot, Dale shadows Joseph as he shadows Hank, hoping to ensure that his son can contribute financially once Nancy's earning power declines. So many people in the world hate their jobs, but it's a reasonable assumption that whatever resentment one feels towards their work is actually something divorced from the labor itself. These issues are either with the people you work with, the people you work for, or the reimbursement you get from the labor. In this episode, we see Peter Sterling working with animal feces, a job no normal person would want to have, and yet he's happy because it's a job that can afford him a lot of money without having to work for someone directly, likely a secondary result of people not wanting to associate with a person who does a job they deem unclean. Of course, this dream job concept is something that would vary from person to person. Some people would happily flip burgers, or in this case, clean dog poo, if they could afford a mansion for doing so. Others wouldn't touch the job no matter how much they were compensated, but would happily do other things that some might scoff at. And in this case, Bobby's strong stomach prevents him from finding fault with cleaning vomit as long as he's getting steady payment for doing so. It's the lack of respect that Peter Sterling has to fake that finally convinces Bobby otherwise. Even then, it's easy to imagine a case where Bobby could be enticed by even more money to offset the occasional poo cocktail. The Year of Washing Dangerously Tired of his dead-end job, Khan looks for a turnkey operation after buying an educational videotape. He finds the local car wash, Scrubbies, and mortgages his house to purchase it, immediately changing the business model to one that kicks out freeloaders and jacks up prices. As Buck Strickland was using the car wash as a way to show off his ride and attract women, Hank encourages his boss to talk some sense into Con, only for Buck to instead buy a majority share in the business and tell Hank that he now works there. Hank's work ethic is able to get the car wash back to being profitable, and this gets to Con's head as he brags about how hard work gets you nowhere. But Hank grows tired of the insults and quits, meaning that he doesn't work for Strickland either. Realizing that his golden goose is gone, Buck sells his share in the car wash to get Hank back, forcing Khan to work for the new owner. In the B-plot, Peggy notices that Nancy didn't pick up the phone when she saw her name on caller ID, so she stalks her neighbor to learn why. As much as Khan is obsessed over the American dream, it's clear that his enrapturement is more with the end result of that dream than the process of getting there, a mentality that can easily lead to failure as you start to view the tedium of work as a stepping stone instead of something that has to be maintained. It's a bit like dieting. When you reach your desired weight, you have to continue maintaining your eating habits or you undo all your previous work. Khan, in this way, is searching for a get-rich-quick scheme, and in his pursuit, completely misses out on a fantastic revenue stream that he would have had otherwise. Leveraging your property to buy a business is a risky move, but Scrubbies was doing fine already and Khan merely had to sit back and let the cash roll in, the entire point of a turnkey operation. It was a situation where a risk paid off, but Khan wasn't looking for that amount of payout and ended up relating to his current job, something that's been reviewed as lucrative in the past and only spoiled by Khan failing to live within his means. In the end, this is another episode that shows the consistency of Hank Hill's life as being the real key to happiness, as well as how that consistency can be challenged or threatened by the greed of a third party. Hank fixes everything. The four major propane dealers in Arlen are engaged in a price war that's forcing them to sell tanks at a loss. Tired of the constant one-upsmanship, Buck Strickland hires the Toodles from American Chopper to make an appearance at the Propane Expo in order to get better branding. But when the appearance goes wrong due to having nothing planned, a brawl breaks out, and they're in worse condition than ever. So Hank sits all four men down in order to force them to talk it out, and they get the idea to fix their prices, creating a cartel that enriches them all. 
When the propane commissioner of Texas finds out that Hank was the mastermind behind the price-fixing fiasco, he forces Hank to wear a wire to catch the men in the act. But when the Toodles arrive at Strickland to apologize for being unprepared before, Hank hatches an idea, encouraging them to rev their bikes loudly while he warns the rest of the men they're being taped. When the engine noises finally die down, they do so in a discussion on forming an oversight committee, and Hank, as well as the propane dealers, are spared jail time. Meanwhile, Lucky, Luann, and Bobby wait outside a theater for six days to get tickets to a concert. Of all the ideals that Hank values, capitalist ideals rank above many others, his belief in the American ideal of free trade being one of the things that defines his moral code. But these free market ideals are things that clash with one of his other traits of rebuking government intervention, and yet, one can't exist without the other. A truly free market is one in which prices are lowered by competition, as innovations are made more common due to this competition. It brings an overall increase in quality and efficiency to the lives of the people who live in the system. But fundamentally, this is not the most profitable way to run a business. We see at the start of the episode that, in conditions of harsh competition, businesses can barely eke out a profit while employees are laid off in the pursuit of lowered costs. So to truly run a business in the interest of profitability, the four big propane dealers in Arlen begin to fix their prices, sharing customers, and removing the distinction between their brands as they focus less on service innovation or value, and more on getting rich. It would take intervention from a government official to get the free market back to normal, but then the question is raised as to whether a free market is really free if it needs outside intervention. Clearly, a worst-case scenario can arise on either extreme of these conditions, and the real deciding factor comes down to Hank's desire to avoid jail time. Church Hopping The Hill family arrives late to church and finds that a new family, the Smiths, have taken their pew. Hank tries to ask Reverend Stroop to intervene, but she refuses his offer to instill assigned seating. So Hank and his family begin looking for a new church, eventually setting on a mega church that seems to fit their needs. In spite of a few more arguments with Stroop, they adapt to the new setting, although Hank struggles to find his niche as the church staff are insistent on getting him as involved as possible. So Hank decides to stop going to church entirely, worshipping with Lucky in a more passive way until he's confronted by his family where the megachurch's pastor tells him that he ought to do what's right for him, though this is largely because he's sick of Peggy trying to micromanage his responsibilities. But Hank doesn't want to admit that he was wrong to Stroop until he finds a compromise. He informs the Smith family of the megachurch's amenities and takes his family's pew back when they leave. Several different takes on faith and religion are given through this episode, while others are implied through the actions of different characters. Lucky mentions to Hank that his approach to religion is through trying to lead a good life, taking God with him wherever he goes. And while this seems like an easy out to lead a secular life, it's also open enough to interpretation to allow the individual to define their relationship to a higher power, instead of putting it into the hands of another party. Because it's totally possible to go to church every week, participate in all the extra activities, and support your religion financially, all while being a bad member of the faith through not just your actions, but the motivations behind them. Peggy attempts to get in with her new church by taking over secretary duties wherever she can, not out of a sense of obligation to her faith, but for personal reasons. Bobby is there for the amenities more than an attempt to be right with God, and even Hank rejects his old church because of the lack of consistency in his seating. None of these motivations are inherent to the religious views of the characters, but in tertiary aspects of their desires, things that are more performative. But religion's not about what you believe, but how you believe it. Lucky has the right idea. Doesn't really matter what church you go to, or what seat you're sitting in, as long as you're there and eager to follow the tenets of your religion. Twenty-four Hour Propane People after an argument over the complimentary buffet at Jugstore Cowboys, Buck gets into a fight with the owner and is banned from the strip club. Hank tries to convince him to go back to work, but when he can't keep himself interested, Buck goes to an ice cream store instead. While there, he has so much fun he decides to rebrand Strickland as a place where people can enjoy themselves, making the employees sing songs, spout catchphrases, and stay up all night at slumber parties. The other employees are appalled by the longer hours and the fact that they can never get any actual work done, but Hank sticks to it as their profits are up since the fun started. But after a particularly long night, Hank realizes that the only reason Strickland is making more than usual is because Buck isn't raiding the cash register for money to tip strippers with. Realizing they've been staying up all night for nothing, Hank convinces Buck to make his peace with the strip club owner and everything returns to the way it was. 
In the B-plot, Peggy begins to use her press pass to get into places for free. Once again, Buck Strickland is forced to make a change to his lifestyle, and once again, he fails to do so. But what's different about this plot compared to the last few times we've seen it done is that Hank himself doesn't seem nearly as convinced of his boss's infallibility as he used to before. Hank is convinced that the best strategy here is to ease his boss back into the swing of things, and then to push him back to the outskirts of the business's dealings when it becomes clear he hasn't changed enough to competently manage his business. It's a far cry from his early season impressions of his boss, syncophantically accepting even the most absurd of ideas. While here, Hank shows much more hesitation to go along with Buck, his agreeability comes out of pity more than idolization. This isn't the first time this season that Hank has become fed up with his boss's sudden change in the manner of Hank's work. In The Year of Washing Dangerously, Hank also has enough and denies his labor to Buck, that being enough to snap the guy back into his old habits. And here, Hank has to also get Buck back into his old habits of womanizing, in spite of the excess spending there alone making the business worse off. It's a compromise of Hank's ideals to bring things back to the way they were, in spite of the ambiguous benefits of doing so. The Texas Panhandler Believing that a new pair of jeans will make him cool, Bobby and Joseph set out to get jobs so they can fit in. But their job of standing on a street corner with arrows gets them made fun of by their peers, and when they see another group of cool panhandlers nearby led by Derek, Bobby decides to sit on a street corner and ask for change instead. For a while, this works. Bobby's able to spend more and more money, and the rumors of him hanging out downtown make him more popular. But when Hank discovers how Bobby has been raising the money, he's appalled and he forces his son to stand on the street to give it all back. Derek and his friends offer to take all the money from Bobby so he can get home sooner, but Bobby later realizes that he has a date and no way of paying for it. So he tries to ask his friends for a bit of cash and they rebuke him, finally making him realize that his old friends are actually worthless as he sets out for more legitimate work. Some people give more than they take, others take more than they give. Derek and his friends are firmly in the latter category, while Hank sits in the former, with both sides resenting one another for having a poor understanding of the way the world works. Derek has a very self-serving view of the world, that people have a right to follow the rules of survival of the fittest, and if he's able to get money by any means, he ought to do it even if it's entirely at the expense and manipulation of others. Hank, on the other hand, acknowledges that, in a functional society, there are going to be some people who contribute more than they get to use, as a result of the first party that an equal amount of overworking must exist to compensate for people who don't contribute. But even through this episode, Hank also acknowledges that these two mentalities have a bit of overlap. Hank doesn't like the idea of a freeloader in society and would prefer if everyone were self-sufficient, through force if through no other means. But this isn't always a tenable ideal, as, as legitimately mentally ill folks often end up begging on street corners when a lack of other resources are available. The alley even discusses that the only people who should be begging on the street are those from the more marginalized section of society, something they say with an uncomfortable tone. To completely ignore people in legitimate mean is inhumane, and sometimes, as uncomfortable as it is to consider, some social services ought to exist while being used by people who don't need them. It's better to have people collecting handouts who don't need them than for people who need assistance to not be able to get it. Hank's Bully New neighbors move in across the street, Jim and Lila, who get to know the alley and introduce their son, Caleb. Caleb repeatedly harasses Hank, stealing his hat, messing up his garage, and riding his bike all over Hank's lawn. When the other guys learn of this, they point out that Hank is being bullied, though he takes objection to this use of language. Hank tries to confront Caleb's parents about the behavior, but they dismiss it as precociousness and self-expression, and when he attempts to parent the kid himself by confiscating the bicycle, Caleb cries to Jim and Lila, and they get the police involved. Powerless to stop Caleb from acting up and unable to fight back due to the kid being a 10-year-old, Hank decides to turn to another child to handle the issue, and recruits Bobby to harass the new family in the same manner as Caleb. They refuse to see the comparisons until Bobby threatens them with a soaker gun full of a brown liquid, at which point they relent and finally discipline their son. In the B-plot, Peggy and Dale enter a taxidermy competition after they discover their combined love of creative posing and killing small animals. There's a sense of justice in this episode insofar as Hank's flashback appearances all depict him as a schoolyard bully in the same manner as Caleb. He was able to hide behind his reputation and large stature to prevent anyone from fighting back, and here, the situation is mirrored as Hank is powerless to prevent harassment from a child without being disliked by the neighborhood. 
and yet this is not the perception that the audience gets from the episode at all. It would be interesting to see Hank confront the comparison to his past and his present, while being harassed and then to put himself in the shoes of his past victims, but the truth of the matter is that Caleb is obnoxious, and anyone else would have slapped him a long time ago. Perhaps this is why Hank Hill, of all people, was chosen as Caleb's target. He knew what kind of a weakness a more passive, kind-hearted attitude could be, and took advantage of that fact. So despite Hank being a changed man and the episode depicting this irony, the real message to take is that two wrongs absolutely do not make a right. Taking the high road is the best option, and if that road is blocked, then you have no choice but to convince your preteen son to threaten people with, like, barbecue sauce. Edgemacatin Lucky Lucky reveals that he regrets never getting his GED and asks Peggy to tutor him so he can be good enough to have one. Though Peggy has been growing more and more annoyed with Lucky staying around their house as she believes that he's holding back Luann from reaching her potential. Then, Lucky reveals the real reason he wants his GED. He refuses to marry Luann until he has one. So Peggy gets the idea in her head to intentionally teach Lucky the wrong information so he'll fail, and later on he does. But while they're lamenting this failure, Luann reveals that she's pregnant with Lucky's child, and so he decides to live with her out of wedlock, in spite of nobody really liking this outcome. After seeing how distraught Lucky and Luann are over this, Peggy and Hank go to Lucky's trailer where Peggy finally reveals the truth about sabotaging his GED attempt. And after hearing more about Lucky's code of honor, Hank gets the idea to simply stage a shotgun wedding, the way every other man in his family was married. Luann's initial story arc was about her attempts to overcome her childhood, to become better than the trailer park where she was raised, and to make something out of herself. So to marry Lucky is a sign that she's regressing back to that person she fought so hard not to be. And yet her motivation for her behavior is what really sells why she's doing any of it. Luann didn't want to flee her own lifestyle out of a hatred for it or because she had ambitions of wealth, but because she simply didn't want to continue the cycle of toxicity that her family had embraced for so long, keeping them there in the first place. So to marry Lucky isn't something that she's doing because she's settling or failed to find anyone better, but because Luann has found somebody who fits with her life goals. As simple as he is, Lucky is an honest man. This episode's entire plot centers around his code of honor. And so for Luann to marry him is, yes, a sign that she's returning to the aesthetics of her trailer park life, but she's not returning to the toxic behaviors of her own family, the very thing she fled in the first place. It's not just a failure to understand this, but an insistence on acting as though she knows better that make Peggy's actions during this episode more reprehensible. She knows that Luann is happy with Lucky, but because it's not what Peggy personally wants, she tries to sabotage it. Season 11 As with season 10, season 11 seems to be a mix of episodes from the previous season's production schedule and episodes that won't air until the following season. It lacks a unique identity outside of the general change in direction the show has had since its inception in the first place. But perhaps trying to place a singular, distinct identity on a season of television is a mistake instead of making an attempt at looking at the broader trends that can push or pull it away from one iteration to the next. The cast is, by now, the central focus of what King of the Hill is about, the social commentary coming from them rather than through them. You're more likely to see a plot about a side character than a plot about some societal ill. Even then, these quirks of society are usually things done in the background. And this subtlety is what makes it feel more ingrained into the world, as it adds to the believability when the characters accept it before the audience themselves do. The Peggy Horror Picture Show At a clothing exchange with the other woman of Rainy Street, Peggy starts to lament that she's not ladylike enough. But when she's out shopping to feel better, she meets Carolyn, with whom Peggy shares a lot in common, and the two become fast friends, with Peggy sharing makeup tips and the like. Carolyn enjoys Peggy's company so much that she's invited to a performance where the two will lip-sync on stage together. But when Peggy arrives, she learns the truth about her new friend, Carolyn is the stage name for a man named Jamie, and the performance is a drag show. She's torn up about this revelation as she now feels less feminine than ever, so Hank tracks down Jamie and asks him to have Carolyn cheer up his wife. Carolyn arrives and asks Peggy to bring her clothes from the clothing exchange to the venue, where the other drag queens not only praise her style, but obsess over her old clothes, and Peggy learns that it's actually very ladylike to be the idol of men who are trying to appear more feminine. 
After being confused for a man, Peggy begins to fear that she's not ladylike enough for her own self-confidence to stay intact, and she breaks down over the perceived failure. She wants to fit in with the women of Rainy Street and be feminine in the same way that they are. But as she cannot accomplish this without compromising a large part of who she is, she feels stuck outside of her typical gender norms. And being in this headspace makes her brief connection with the drag queens more devastating as it reinforces the idea that she won't fit in. It's not until recontextualizing the connection that she finally gets what she was supposed to want. Fitting in is not about changing yourself, it's about being yourself. The other drag queens have made a selective choice when it comes to their desired interpretation of femininity. They reject the normalcy of conventionally attractive women and instead model themselves after women who did something grand or who demanded attention. And so it's not that Peggy Hill is being compared to a woman she isn't like, but that she's being compared to who she is like. And then this whole episode winds up playing with gendered behavior as well. As Peggy is a woman, technically anything she does should be considered womanly. A fallacy predicated on the idea that normal gender performance is something that has to be taught and then enforced. If it's normal for men to act like men and women to act like women, then how come people need to be taught how? Sir Punt Lucky gives Bobby a six-foot Burmese python as a gift, which Bobby names Josh, then loses after it swims into the toilet. Dale suggests that Hank call the county as it's now a public issue, though Tommy and Rollo of the county animal control unit claim they don't have the resources to go after it. That is, until they start a plot to exaggerate the severity of the situation in order to scare people into allowing them to focus full-time on the snake issue, getting news stations to report on the fabricated fear as public opinion turns more and more in favor of animal control and less and less in favor of Hank, who's blamed for releasing the snake in the first place. They use the extra funding to hire Dale, believing him to be incompetent enough not to disrupt their scheme, and Dale soon becomes friends with Tommy and Rollo. That is, until Hank encourages him to actually check up on the status of the snake hunt, where he learns the truth behind the entire scam. So Dale sets out to redeem himself and catch Josh for real, with Hank threatening to expose the truth behind their war room if they get in the way. In the end, despite admitting that the bond measure they were hoping for is unlikely to actually be used for anything, the measure passes anyway, as Hank comes up with the lie about Josh's fate to tell to Bobby. Tommy and Rollo were correct in their assessment that the department was too underfunded to actually do anything about a snake entering the sewers, as well as being correct in their initial assertion that it's not too big of a deal to do anything about it. And as a result of the first point, they come to the conclusion to fake a disaster in order to get more funds. This is the fate of any public institution. When everything is going well, people complain that their tax dollars are being wasted. When things aren't going well, people complain that their tax dollars are being wasted. And so fabricating a story and getting the media involved into the fear-mongering is the best way for an underfunded public service to remedy the situation, without people becoming upset in the way out there which their money is used. The fearful populace actually demanding that their tax burden be increased in order to make them feel safe, as they felt when the problem was just as bad, but they were unaware of it. Hank, however, is one of the only people completely aware of the facts of the situation, who has no financial interest in promoting fear, and he gets repeatedly ignored as the average person who'd rather be afraid than do a bit of independent thinking about the reality of the situation. Blood and Sauce Lamenting that he has nobody to pass his legacy to, Bill gets the idea to look up his family history so he can invite all his living relatives to a reunion. The rest of the alley gets together to help him clean his house for the event, while Bobby flakes on assisting Bill with the barbecue, something Hank assigned to him as a punishment for baking. But the only person to show up is his cousin Gilbert, who explains that everyone else was either an imposter, barren, or dead, and they are the last of the doe trees. When the rest of the alley gets a hold of the remaining barbecue from the event, they're obsessed and Hank is able to get a group of investors to make offers to sell the recipe to. But Gilbert refuses to sign off on allowing the barbecue to be sold, saying that it's better for the family's legacy to die out as a poetry book he's funding, and the event gets shut down. In spite of a few more attempts to convince his cousin, Bill ultimately fails to make any headway on passing his legacy on, until Bobby, who helped make the second batch, reveals that he's learned the recipe himself, and Bill learns that he's passed on something after all. The conflict of this episode comes down to legacy and the value and intentions of that legacy. While Bill is much more desperate to pass something on to memorialize his name, Gilbert is more concerned with the quality of what he's leaving. He tries to curate a magazine to enrich the family name, as well as preserve it, and rejects Bill's notion of marketing their legacy, as any attempt to capitalize on it could result in compromise. 
A family name is a priceless thing, and to put a price on it diminishes that fact. On the other hand, the entire reason the priceless label gets attributed to something in the first place is because of the collective benefit a public display of that thing has. A historical artifact that is priceless belongs in a museum so its legacy can be appreciated. And to Bill, if the legacy isn't preserved in some small way, it is pointless to even have one. Even a commodified version of the Doetree family name is better than silence. But as he and Gilbert cannot see things from each other's perspective, the name is doomed to die out rather than be altered, at least until Bobby is able to start adapting it. In this way, the Doetree's legacy can live forever. Luann gets lucky. While cutting hair for prom season, Luann starts to lament that she never got a prom of her own. She tries asking Lucky to take her out, but Lucky is too concerned with manly pursuits, currently focused on trying to take out a stump with a winch. So instead, she encourages a 15-year-old named Kevin to ask her out. When Lucky's friends Elvin and Mud catch wind of this, they try to threaten the boy into skipping the prom, though Peggy is able to fend them off for a while. Ultimately, after worrying that she's going to miss another prom, Peggy and Luann work together to force the boy to take her and keep the couple safe. But the two men sneak into the prom anyway and prepare to maim the boy in spite of Peggy's protection. Meanwhile, Lucky is taking the other guys out to collect that stump, and in spite of Hank's insistence that they ignore any talk of emotions, Lucky starts to realize that he's close to losing his fiance. So he abandons the alley in the woods to get his girl back, allowing Kevin to dance with her as he promised, but getting the last dance in himself. Lucky has always been coming in and out of the main cast, revolving into plots as needed and sitting out on entire episodes in a way that puts him into a middle ground between a secondary and tertiary character. In most episodes, someone like Bill or Dale might have a single line just to remind audiences they exist. As far as i found, this isn't a guild thing requiring a credit in each episode as some shows in the past would do. And as the show went on, Lucky's role would start to become more and more defined as well as allowing him to exist independently of Luann, giving him more of a character role than Luann's fiancé. And so this dynamic is addressed in this episode, just as the new direction starts to get set into place. Lucky tries to be his own man, his aloof behavior not being as coddling as Luann had hoped for, as her depiction of domestic life and his both differ. And while there's no doubt that there's a strong sense of love between the two, how that love is expressed is still inconsistent within their dynamic. The episode ultimately points out that Luann's desire for more emotional closeness is more valid than Lucky's adventures in stump pulling or whatever he's up to that week. And so that's the direction in which their togetherness goes. Hank gets dusted. Cotton prepares to get rid of his old Cadillac, the one he's had since Hank was a child, and he brings it to Arlen so Hank can prepare to pass it to his cousin, Dusty. He's embarrassed about being related to this Dusty Hill, and when his cousin arrives, it's revealed why. Dusty Hill is a member of ZZ Top, the one with the beard. His arrival is made worse by the fact that he's being followed around by a producer named Portis, who is filming Dusty's life as part of a reality TV show pilot. Hank is infuriated by the fact that there are camera crews living in his house and filming his friends and family, who are all obsessed with appearing on TV. But when the TV crew struggles to find anything funny about four guys standing in an alley and drinking beer, Portis notices that Hank getting angry makes for good television. So he sets out to do a series of pranks against Hank, goading Dusty into going along with them, until finally making one big stunt to drive Hank insane, destroying the Cadillac in a demolition derby. When Hank rushes over to stop the destruction, he finds Dusty in a burning vehicle and rushes onto the track to save him, freeing him from a seatbelt by cutting off his beard. In the end, Dusty quits the show as he realizes that he's hurting Hank, and they give the car a dignified funeral. An episode that is mostly focused on his celebrity guest appearances, even if the show ends up being stolen by Will Arnett's VA talent. But unlike so many other guest star episodes, this one focuses on integrating the guest into the cast of the show in a more natural way, instead of simply having every character fawn over them, and this then plays into the dynamic that the episode focuses on, in which Hank's anger is given a more central focus. Here, we have a character who has been implied to be present through Hank's life since his childhood, with the dynamic between the two of Hank being on the receiving end of what's effectively bullying, albeit the lighter kind between siblings. This sort of throws off a lot of the dynamic between Hank and the modern world and how he's defined himself by his growth as a person, in spite of a lack of pushback to his actions. By suddenly throwing in decades of worrying pranks into a character's personality, especially a character with over 10 seasons of development, it attempts to redefine so much about the man and his methods of thinking that ultimately does not live up to the amount of retroactive continuity needed to justify the story. 
It's a better use of a celebrity cameo than most other shows would do, but it's stranded between being too much and not enough. Glenn Peggy Glenn Ross While looking for a spring break internship that will look good on a resume, Connie shadows Peggy while she works for the Arlen Bystander. Though the work is much less impressive than Peggy promised it would be, so she decides to write an attack article on Sizemore Realty in order to look good. But as Sizemore is one of the biggest advertisers for the Bystander, Peggy is fired, then immediately hired by Sizemore as he likes her moxie. But Peggy's moxie doesn't get put to use as she mostly cleans houses to prepare them for the older members to sell instead. When she tries to go on the news and go over Sizemore's head, he gets upset with her defiance and fires her too. Spurred on by Connie, Peggy then starts her own real estate company and sells a house using what she learned, even faking a story about how Connie's her adopted daughter to appeal to a couple. Sizemore sees her doing this and is impressed enough to allow her to work for him full-time. Meanwhile, Hank gets a set of golf clubs from Dale that he learns were used in a high-profile murder, and sets out to try to feel less guilty about playing with them. Peggy has always had a personality that was disproportionate to her abilities, as a regular source of plots involving her would, at some point, have a moment where people realize she didn't know what she was talking about, usually occurring slightly before she herself admits this. But there is a job out there that benefits from impressing somebody in the short term without having to stick to whatever story you made up in a panic state to look good real estate. Sizemore quickly figures out Peggy's shtick of trying to find a good story even if there's not one, as he himself is similar. Both people are great as appearing as though they know what they're talking about. Sizemore's platitudes don't actually mean anything, and he's far more egoistic than he deserves to be, just like Peggy. So as he was able to have a successful career, he sees a similar success story in Peggy, knowing that he just had to push back against her ego to get it to inflate even further. And this is exactly what she does, trying so hard to prove to Sizemore that she has the ability to sell a house that she also convinces the audience of this fact at the same time. The Passion of Dotrieve When Bill's roof caves in directly over his bed, he starts to believe that it was a warning sign sent from God to find a purpose in life, and he searches for this purpose at church. At first, he worries the rest of the alley by getting overly involved in everything and eventually signing up for an overseas mission trip. But when Hank says he shouldn't be overcommitting, he follows this advice and finds purpose more locally, dating Reverend Stroop. Despite this being something allowed by the church, it's still frowned upon by the congregation, and so Bill has to use Hank as a go-between for their relationship. But Hank is tired of being used in this way, and he convinces Bill to go public with their relationship, to the predictable disgust of the rest of the churchgoers, who find fault with their reverend making out with Bill in public. Eventually, the church higher-ups get involved to try to denounce the union, so she quits to spend more time with Bill. But once his relationship is no longer taboo, Bill loses interest in Stroop and tries to act rude to get her to break up, not being able to do it himself. But when Hank denounces this idea, Bill stands up for himself and breaks it off officially, realizing that Hank is always right when it comes to this sort of thing. Previous episodes have shown that Bill is attracted to the danger and taboo of a relationship that others don't approve of, with some retroactive implication that part of the reason he married Lenore was because others were weirded out by their relationship the same way they treat Karen and Bill in the present day. But unlike Lenore, Karen is much more fond of Bill and eager to make large changes in her life for his sake. In fact, it's arguable Bill is the one to ruin her life instead of the other way around as it's been before, though Reverend Stroop is also more than capable of making her own decisions. And so once again, Bill rushes into something, only to try to rush out of it. But leaving a relationship is something that's hard to do quickly and painlessly, typically only one or the other. But despite his lack of romantic experience, Hank still has a lot of practical experience in other things, and to him, there's no distinction between the two. So he gives more general advice to Bill to face things directly, and to exit the relationship as confidently as he entered it, acknowledging that he's the bad guy for doing so. But it's more proper to do it this way than to force Stroop to be the bad guy, or continue on in a loveless affair. Grand Theft Arlen Hank finds out that Bobby is taking a course in video games instead of the presidential fitness test, so he goes to the school personally to get to the bottom of the issue. While signing Bobby up for a proper gym class, he sees the gaming course and meets the student teachers who program the games the class is playing, and this duo takes an interest in Hank's career. 
They show this interest by recreating Strickland propane in a video game, which Buck Strickland demands that Hank play in order to make an inventory of the royalties he's owed. Hank then learns that it's possible to play the game in a crime-free manner, and becomes obsessed, even continuing to play long after Buck realizes it's public domain and they aren't earning a cent off of it. But Peggy grows upset with Hank constantly going back to gaming, to the point of ignoring Bobby after he does his first push-up, and she visits the programmers to ask for help. They give her invincibility and a kill switch, allowing Peggy to defeat Hank and then shut the servers down for good, at which Hank snaps out of it and visits Bobby during his exams, praising his son for doing one more pull-up than the rest of the gamers from before. As someone who has played video games enough that I thought it appropriate to name myself after them, the depiction of them here is outdated at best and outright false at worst. That XP's of Beavis and Butthead would be able to program a GTA clone alone that has consistently contradictory controls hurts the believability of anything else the episode could be trying to say about the subject matter. It's to the point that when Hank asks whether there's a button to turn oneself in, you may believe that the writers consider that an actual dedicated button rather than an asinine statement by Hank. But what the episode then excels at is showing the effects of a compulsion on a person who would buy into that sort of thing. Hank becomes addicted to video games to the point that he stops to focus on his responsibilities, much as I've been doing with this video thanks to Subnautica. And then it gets to the extreme point that he doesn't acknowledge when Bobby does something that he would have otherwise been extremely proud of. In fact, the flippin' personality between Hank and Bobby here is likely intentional, as Bobby starts to believe that hard work pays off and becomes self-motivated while Hank slips further and further into the grips of addiction. Peggy's Gone to Potts Hoping to get more recognition at Sizemore Realty, Peggy tries to sell in Arlen Heights, getting into a party at the Wasana Song's house after they express an interest in selling. But the party turns out to be a sales pitch for Cozy Kitchen, an MLM business that traps its customers into expensive contracts. Peggy signs up, assuming it'll be her ticket to more sales, but she's unable to push any of her products made worse when the Wasana songs reveal that they were never actually planning on selling their house, and Judy Barnes, a Cozy Kitchen representative, starts to stalk her to collect her due. Meanwhile, Dale gets a visit from Rusty Shackelford, the man who he pretends to be whenever he signs a contract, who's upset about the damage to his credibility that Dale has caused. Peggy and Dale find out about each other's hiding and make a ploy to fake their own debts, though Hank puts a stop to this and tells them to be honest. Instead of doing this, Peggy hosts a dinner party that is also a ploy to push more of her products, and while there, Dale breaks in and pretends to take her hostage, the two retreating to a shed that they then rig to explode. Despite the audience seeing through the fake death ploy, they're still impressed enough that the kitchenware stood up to the blast that they start to place orders, with Judy agreeing to let Peggy out of the contract on the condition that she also be allowed to fake her death. There's an obvious comparison to make in this episode to the earlier episode Bill of Sales in which Peggy attempts a bit of creative thinking to weasel her way out of a marketing scam. But here, her attempts to exploit somebody else don't go through because of her own sense of morality. She briefly attempts to rope Luann into the same scam as she did to Bill all those seasons ago, but stopped herself. Peggy has evolved a lot as a character throughout the last several seasons, with the optics behind these changes largely appearing negatively, and yet she still stays true to many of the same initial principles. Despite often doing the wrong thing, her reasons are almost always understandable. Having Lucky fail his GED examination was a terrible thing for someone who supposedly takes pride in their teaching ability to do, but it was something motivated by trying to look after Luann, even if this assumption was ultimately ill-informed. And here, Peggy's growth in not wanting to inflict her situation onto another person serves an additional purpose in not only showing development, but in making plots more over the top as she attempts to fake her own death alongside Dale. Hair Today, Gone Tomorrow While dealing with stress, Nancy notices her hair is beginning to fall out. As her hair is part of her livelihood, she goes to a doctor to see what can be done about her balding, and he diagnoses it as being either hereditary or stress-related. She brings up the hereditary possibility to her mother, who corroborates the fact by claiming she lost her hair shortly after breaking off a long-term affair with one of her ex-lovers. While this is happening, John Redcorn makes repeated attempts to get back together with Nancy, which she at first rejects before justifying reciprocation by using her hair falling out. Meanwhile, Dale prepares for an alien visit during the vernal equinox and meets Khan's nephew, confusing his Laotian for alien, getting dropped off in the desert where he assumes he's being brought to the future, and then brought to the past where he tries to avoid himself all day. Hank and Peggy try encouraging Dale to avoid Nancy so as not to worry her, and because they believe his bizarre behavior will only drive her further away, 
but when he starts to believe that he'll encounter himself and destroy the world, Dale decides to spend his last few minutes on Earth with his wife. In the end, the two stay together as they go shopping for a new wig. Nancy's relationship with John Redcoin is something thought to have been resolved many seasons ago, but just because the affair isn't actively happening doesn't mean the fallout from the affair is gone completely. There's still the matter of figuring out why that affair occurred in the first place, and what marital troubles might cause someone to be driven to cheat, whether it's something that can be worked out together or a more individual flaw. When Nancy begins to lose her hair, she has to contend with the knowledge that she may be driven back to cheat, not because of anything Dale is doing, but because of her attachment to her looks. And yet, a psychosomatic issue like this is something that one would have to figure out to a more thorough extent than simply returning to the actions you performed when you were happier. Nancy wants to return to John Redcorn, in part because she's trying to recapture the beauty she had when she was a younger woman. But as she realizes in the end, moving on is something that can't be done once, but is something you have to actively maintain. Perhaps the only reason she thought her marriage was failing was because she stopped putting as much effort into maintaining it. Bill, Bulk, and the Body Buddies Bill's army physical is coming up and he's self-conscious about working out in front of other people. But the rest of the alley agrees to split the cost of gym equipment to convert Bill's garage into a gym that they can all use without judgment, and soon Bill is able to start exercising frequently. But while looking for a protein supplement, he encounters Dirk, who offers to coach him in exchange for the use of his home gym, as he's been banned from his. Dirk and his buddies take over the Rainy Street Gym as they bring their obsession with muscle mass with them, scaring off everyone else until it's just Bill and the bodybuilders. Over the next few weeks, Bill starts to put on more and more mass while becoming more and more isolated, until he eventually gets trapped beneath the leg press overnight. But rather than helping him, the gym bros keep pushing him further until he's about to miss his physical. So Hank distracts the bodybuilders by convincing them to compare sizes, while the rest of the alley carries Bill to the hospital, where the doctor gives him a six-month extension on his physical to recover from a hernia. As he's the most self-conscious about his body and strength, Bill is a prime candidate to get caught up in the muscle fever that the body buddies have. They take a trait that someone lacks, conflate it with their lacking confidence, and then over-exaggerate the importance of that trait in order to endear themselves and their ideology to the target. In this case, doing so to have access to a gym they can use. The method of influence is the same thing that convinces teenage girls to become anorexic, for example. And so, in overcompensating for his body image issue, Bill drives away all the people who never saw his physique as that big of a deal in the first place, and his similarly-minded friends don't help out much. But as Hank remembers not the person Bill has become, but the person he used to be, he decides that he has to help him out like he used to, even if Bill himself refuses to ask for help at first, and then later being unable to. By the end of the episode, Bill's motivations go from trying to get as big as possible to going back to the way things were after his injury, and Hank is more than eager to assist in this as he was friends with Bill before, so there's nothing wrong with wanting to go back to that stable relationship. Lucky's Wedding Suit Lucky and Luann are planning their wedding, looking at all sorts of extravagant costs that Hank knows they can't afford. He encourages Dale to hire Lucky to ensure that he can afford to pay not just for the wedding, but domestic life afterwards. But while Lucky and Dale are messing around in Dale's dead bug headquarters, Lucky falls and injures his back, planning to sue the small business in order to use the settlement money for his wedding. But when the lawyer he hired, Edward Johnson, realizes Dale is uninsured and broke, he decides to sue Strickland instead as that's where the arrangement to hire Lucky was made in the first place. Hank is furious that Lucky would file a frivolous lawsuit against the company he works for and convinces him to drop the suit, but Johnson claims there are too many things already underway to stop it. So they make a fake tape of Lucky playing golf uninjured and use it to threaten Johnson into dropping the lawsuit. But when he doesn't buy it, Dale and Lucky fake fight once again and Lucky is re-injured, threatening to sue Johnson so he'll waive the legal fees. In the end, Lucky and Luann have a small, sensible wedding in the hill's backyard and use the new settlement money to make a down payment on the house next door. Making a living off of frivolous insurance scams is not a tenable long-term solution to life, as Hank repeatedly tries to tell the Lucky. In spite of earlier episodes insisting upon the fact that Hank has deemed Lucky a good man from a moral perspective, his way of living is still something with which he takes contention. And when Lucky is pushed into a desperate financial situation, his true colors are shown. Lucky feels bad about trying to sue Dale and later Strickland, but goes through with it because he loves Luann and wants to provide for her once more than he cares about his reputation. 
But Hank sees things differently. To Hank, the temporary desires and memories of Luann don't matter nearly as much as ensuring the marriage begins on a good note. Even if it means Lucky will start out with a large amount of legal debt to Johnson, he still decides it's for the best. Better to be broke and honest than rich but sleazy. But Dale and Lucky are still able to get the best of both of these options, starting out Lucky's married life with better finances and a better outlook on their future. And in doing so, this episode has an optimistic rather than bittersweet ending, appropriate for what was initially intended to be the final episode of King of the Hill. Season 12 Lucky's wedding suit was originally planned to be the final episode of King of the Hill, but the show was shortly afterwards granted additional airtime, resulting in the big send-off that included cameo appearances from many minor characters throughout the seasons to continue on afterwards. In spite of the theoretical continuity that King of the Hill was intended to have, there weren't especially many finales for individual characters, giving a bit more time to write a proper conclusion over the next two seasons on the air that the showrunners got instead of hastily being pushed out the door as it felt a few characters had been. But other characters did indeed get proper conclusions to their stories. Luann fought against her poor childhood through her whole life, only to settle down sensibly as she separated the good parts of her early years from the bad while also embracing the new. Hank has finally learned to work alongside one of his kids, but then again, this was a lesson he would learn multiple times per season anyway. So to forget the last 11 seasons to retread ground is something the show is able to do without being jarring. King of the Hill ended, and now King of the Hill can begin. Sweet Smell of Excess Hank notices Bobby is showing an interest in watching football and tries to get him more and more into the sport by taking him to a Big 12 game in person. They have to buy tickets from a scalper to get in and end up with terrible seats, so Bobby sneaks into one of the luxury boxes nearer to the field and the rest of the alley follows him down there. After explaining Mojo and a few other traditions to Bobby, they find out that the box belongs to a former Nebraska quarterback, confirmed when the assistant coach calls in to ask for advice on the last play of the game. Hank tries to give him a terrible play in the hopes that Texas will win, but the quick kick ends up working and Nebraska wins, with Hank and co. being identified as the ones who made the call. Hank doesn't want Bobby to understand what's going on, lest he potentially stop liking football, so he and the alley try to sneak out, eventually being confronted by UT fans and rescued by a convoy of Nebraska fans. In the B-plot, Peggy gets so mad at the outcome of the game that she smashes the TV and has to buy a new one before Hank gets home. Through the show, we've always seen Hank as being extremely eager to find some common ground with Bobby, and this episode shows the sheer extent he's willing to go to to find that common ground. Hank finds the idea of buying tickets from a scalper abhorrent, but does so to keep Bobby's interest. He finds the idea of sneaking into the luxury boxes abhorrent, but does so to keep Bobby's interest. And ordinarily, he would never buy into superstition in favor of what's logical and provable, but when trying to get his son to enjoy football, he goes along with this sort of thing in the interest of what he now views as more valuable than the traditions he's kept. Without realizing it, Hank is given a choice in this episode between his love of his son and his love of his hobbies, and he doesn't hesitate to choose Bobby over anything else. Hank makes the game-winning play for Nebraska, later donning their jersey and claiming football is about sportsmanship and then following a convoy to a different state, all to keep Bobby in the dark about the situation. In any other context, Hank never would have accepted a similar outcome, but it's not about football anymore, but Bobby. Bobby Ray While lamenting that everybody seems to be in a relationship but him, Bobby starts to blame the corn syrup and soft drink for his issues. He starts a protest to get them taken out of the school hallways, something the teachers are afraid of as the revenue from the vending machines was supposed to pay for their trip to Cancun, and something the students enjoy as they view it as a form of activism, including a girl named Olivia who interviews him for the school paper. Realizing that he can attract Olivia's attention with protests, Bobby then complains about tickers running ads in the school hallways and stages a walkout among the student body. But after they all leave, he doesn't know what to do next and the mob decides to run downtown to continue the protest. Things get out of hand when kids start to ransack stores and cause property damage, so Bobby turns to Hank for help. Hank is able to get the crowd's attention as he starts to prepare them for the consequences of their actions, describing police violence and jail time until they all lose motivation. 
In the end, while cleaning up around Strickland, Bobby meets a girl who shares an interest in movies and more passive activism, like letter-writing campaigns. Meanwhile, the alley tries and fails to make a book of quotes. This is an episode about activism, specifically activism devoid of anything else and the consequences of that. The characters who lead the charge against what they claim is injustice are largely doing so out of a misplaced understanding of the issues and are motivated by personal reasons. Bobby only wants a girl to like him, Olivia is an activist for the sake of activism, and the students are largely obsessed with Bobby out of a misplaced blame for the soda machines causing all their problems, then later a desire to get out of school and go along with the crowd. As Hank states, protesting is acceptable as a final course of action, only after everything else has been exhausted. And while it's hard to imagine Hank ever actually attending a proper protest, this is more so due to the fact that he's always had some available options for airing his grievances. And here the situation is no different, hence his objections. But when a protest is done out of a sense of anger, or for more personal reasons rather than a sense of justice, it's much more likely that that protest will get out of hand as things do here. No one has an end goal in mind, so they can't work towards anything but protesting for the sake of a protest. The Powder Puff Boys for his comedy skills, Bobby is selected to perform in the Powder Puff game, where the football team dresses in drag while the girls play the sport. He's against the idea of cross-dressing at first, whereas Hank is enthusiastic about the idea of his son wearing a dress. But when Bobby announces that he wants to quit the team, he finds he can't do it as, for once, all the other boys are interested in hearing what he has to say about their routine. Meanwhile, Peggy has joined the PTA and worked her way into the graces of its leadership, but when they learn of the Powder Puff game, the PTA works to have it banned for being disrespectful to women. Bobby and Hank are furious, expressing this anger and disappointment to Peggy, who realizes she was caught up in trying to impress other people. So Hank tries to solve the issue with democracy, only for the boat to tie and the Powder Puff game to continue to be banned. But Bobby, undeterred, decides to lead the others in attending the game and cheering from the stands anyway, citing that their freedom of expression can't be infringed. The mere concept of Bobby putting on a dress and doing a cheer performance is something that Hank would never be on board with, were it not a tradition. But as it is a tradition, Hank, and so many of the other macho men of Arlen, are entirely on board with it, no hesitation whatsoever from many of the other participants. But this ends up devolving into the exact same argument anyway, where the episode's antagonist does not support the same thing as Hank, and goes against it out of principle if nothing else. The PTA president more concerned with whether or not she looks strong in front of the teachers, rather than actually asking the kids themselves what they want. The idea that it was offensive to girls is pure projection. The girls participating in the game, those in the audience, and all the other students never mention anything about the Powder Puff game negatively. The only participant who has an issue is Bobby, and even he comes around to it once he starts to find the fun. Like most culture war concepts, it's not about what's right or wrong, but it's rather about feeling like you're correct and telling off anyone who doesn't go along with it. Peggy is quick to figure this out after getting caught up and winds up taking a stand for her principles. But among the unprincipled, like the PTA president and Principal Moss, they put their own feelings over the interests of those who are actually being exposed to the thing they take exception to. Four Wave Intersection During a heat wave, Bobby looks for a way to cool down and suggests a water park, convincing Hank to take him and his friends. But despite buying season passes, Bobby can't enjoy the park as he's being harassed by a group of older locals led by a surfer dude named Bobby. The park's manager is powerless to do anything about the gangs there, and Bobby only gets harassed further, prompting him to ask Boomhauer to put them in their place with his surfing skills. But Boomhauer, who's been self-conscious about his old age, only falls over in front of them, embarrassing the whole group. Boomhauer then mopes around his old hangouts, eventually finding a younger kid who gives him a bit of advice not to beat the wave, but the surfer, and he returns to the water park alongside Hank, embarrassing the surfers there and letting the kids play once again. Meanwhile, Bill's car breaks down on the side of the road, and as he's waving for help, gets other people to wave back at him. Finding some sort of meaning out of this, he decides to hang out on the side of the road and brave the heat to keep waving. It's implied during this episode that Boomhauer's midlife crisis is prompted by events entirely within his head, although most midlife crises are, rather than being prompted by some sort of physical failure and the resulting realization afterwards. As such, it's his belief that he's old that makes him act that way, rather than his true age, something that he learns from the young boy he meets at the beach. 
It's not the way that you're supposed to conquer, but the surfer on the wave, a sport about mentality just as much as it is about the physique performing it. And so when Boomhauer learns this lesson, he's also able to overcome the bullies blocking the wave, here meant to represent an emotional barrier as much as a physical one. And just as Boomhauer tries to rediscover his identity, Bill tries to find one in the first place, accidentally realizing that he can make people stay better by waving to them by the highway. This is something that takes a large toll on his physical health as he starts to suffer from sunburns and exhaustion, but he acts selflessly and goes out to the side of the highway anyway, as he values others more than himself. Interestingly, he has the opposite motives of Boomhauer, who can't find happiness until he starts to serve for himself instead of others, to prove something to himself before he seeks out the validation of other people. Death Picks Cotton The Hill family goes to a Japanese performance restaurant and leaves Cotton and Bobby together at home, but Cotton refuses to stay put and goes to the restaurant where he has a war flashback and falls down onto the grill, hospitalizing him with burns and an allergic reaction to shrimp. Hank at first doesn't believe his father is actually going to stay dead and doesn't visit until seeing the reactions of everybody else and deciding to come to see him. But he gets into a fight with Cotton after trying to say a final farewell and his last words end up being, I don't love you. Cotton refuses to stay dead and comes back, only to continue to feud with Hank and ultimately die after a fight with Peggy, where she's able to tell him exactly what she always wanted to, that he's a spiteful man who deserves to live alone and miserable forever. Peggy then lies and tells Hank that Cotton tried to make peace with his son on his deathbed, but couldn't say it aloud. Hank then commemorates a new shed to his father, which Dale blows up, also to commemorate Cotton. In the B-plot, Bobby is staying with Luann and Lucky to give Hank and Peggy some time to cope, and the newlyweds struggle to figure out how to raise a child. Cotton gets his dying wishes in this episode, or at least he imagines that he does. At first, he mentions to Peggy that all his friends are dead, and he's intentionally isolated himself from everyone else to prevent any more heartache from his death. He then starts to taunt Peggy into getting angry enough to tell him off, revealing how she actually feels about him while being too polite to put into words around company. And of course, when Hank tries to have a heart-to-heart -heart with his father, he's rebuked as Cotton doesn't want anybody to properly grieve his death. So he dies alone, not just physically outliving all his old companions, but destroying any other companionship that could have outlasted him. And yet, just because you get what you want doesn't mean that it's what you need. In his mind, Cotton was fighting against the Japanese to the end, dying when he assaults a chef who was actually Hispanic, but to him his vengeance was real. He got to die with no one around to mourn him, even though this is far from a nice way to go out. Had Cotton been a bit nicer, not just to others, but himself, then perhaps his dying wishes would have been to properly make peace, to be mourned and remembered as the best version of himself. But instead, he's as miserable as he deserves, though he was at least able to take out Hank's shed. Raise the Stakes Hank starts to notice a decrease in the quality of the meat he gets from Megalomart, and while there to complain, learns from Appleseed about a local co-op with higher quality meat. As the co-op only allows members slash co-owners to shop there, Hank ends up signing on and being made to do some volunteer work behind the shelves. But as he's working, he starts to use his business sense to make a few changes to the store, rotating stock, moving more efficiently, and changing the number of open registers based on demand, until soon the co-op starts to turn a profit. Hank is excited about not only the profit, but the higher quality he's getting in his meals, until Megalomart makes an offer to buy out the co-op, something the other co-owners agree to, using Hank's profitability logic from before. But Hank can't stand to see the poor conditions of the cattle on the factory farms being used by the new owners, and he plans to break the animals out of captivity, keeping them on his lawn for a while until Khan calls the police on him. So he has Appleseed take the cattle far away, and later, Hank learns that they've named a calf after him. Hank and the rest of the alley talk about how much they hate hippies during this episode, then Hank proceeds to be a much more efficient hippie than anyone else could have imagined, going so far as to become an eco-terrorist who steals from factory farms. As such, it's clear that Hank's dislike of hippie personalities is something purely aesthetic and more of a personal disdain for certain behaviors rather than anything intrinsic to the ideals these people represent. He even gets first-hand experience in seeing how the cost-efficient method of ordering prepackaged meats and working with untrained teenagers instead of professional butchers on site will produce a lower quality product that nevertheless is more cost-effective for the business producing it. But Hank's business acumen is able to take the extra cost associated with that quality, not just quality of meat but of life, and turn it around to be profitable after all. 
and so smelling blood in the water, Megalomart stifles competition by buying it out before people realize what they're missing out on. Hank and his family have to go back to eating the bland meat they've been sold and get used to having no alternatives, because if there's one thing scarier than a hippie, it's a hippie who knows what he's talking about. Tears of an Inflatable Clown Bored with school, Bobby decides to convince the student council to host a carnival, and he gets put in charge of planning it. Hank gives his son some advice on what type of boss to be, and Bobby ends up settling on being a tough one who gets things done. But a diversity expert named Pope comes to the school to try to promote tolerance among the student body, and singles out Bobby and the rest of the planning committee for a pilot. After guilting the students for their race, he's able to take over the carnival conceptually, and turns it into a seminar on historical hatred. But when Bobby starts to present a guilt-ridden speech instead of the actual carnival, Hank and Con start to fear for their children's reputation, and ploy to sneak out to set up the carnival by themselves. Eventually, Bobby comes to his senses and realizes that he has a responsibility to the students, and goes back to running things while other people try to take credit for his success. In the B-plot, Lucky cuts open his hand on a barbed wire frisbee and refuses to go to the hospital, making Dale, Bill, and Boomhauer hunt him down. Pope's motivation in this episode is to start a diversity program across multiple schools so he can get a steady paycheck. For as much as he talks about guilt and cooperation, he's really only looking out for himself. To some people, it's not actually about eliminating inequalities or treating people correctly, but about feeling so sorry for yourself and being as loud as possible while doing so. Being nice to other people is harder than being hard on yourself, and it's a much worse method of enacting actual change. Because if anything actually gets fixed, people like Pope are out of a job. The kids on the planning community for the carnival are depicted as being multicultural and cooperative, but this is not a very good narrative, so Pope has to try to start several exercises and then stretch their conclusions in order to get the kids to feel sorry for themselves enough that they can pass on the burden of change to another person. That's what this sort of guilt-first mentality is about, not fixing anything, but learning to be helpless enough that you ask others to do it instead. Feeling guilty is actually entirely useless unless that feeling is acted upon. The Men Who Knew Too Much The Sufenducen phone family wants to get into the Nine Rivers Country Club, but lack a distinguishable skill to make their application stand out. But when they learn that one of the activities at the club is skeet shooting, Khan encourages Min to get out her old gun and practice to make the team. But with no access to a range, she has to begrudgingly use her connections to Dale to get into his gun club, forcing herself to go through their initiation rituals until eventually she doesn't have to fake liking them anymore, as they've genuinely endeared themselves to her. Soon, Min is ready to join the Nine Rivers team, and she and Khan get into the club as proper members. But when the Arlen Gun Club asks about her plans and she admits she's no longer interested in shooting with them, they set out to get their revenge, storming the country club during the event, but ultimately being too impressed by the luxury to stay upset with her. Feeling upset about what she caused, Min uses all of her guest passes to allow the Arlen Gun Club to stay and cheer her as she wins the event. In the B-plot, Hank finds out someone has been using his trash cans and the family investigates the garbage to learn who it was, until Lucky comes in, claims all the trash, and then admits that he was only doing so to avoid paying taxes. A spotlight episode for Min, who is an interesting character in that she's abrasive and rude to the people around her, but in a way that's not inherently negative. She has this belief in her head that she's better than other people, but then she goes out and actually attempts to prove it afterwards. Effectively, Min is Peggy if Peggy actually was the woman she thought she was. It's also interesting how Min remains uncompromising in her goals through this episode. She at first only associates with the rednecks in order to get away from them by joining a country club. But while most other plots and other works of media would have had Min make a decision between the gun club and country club, Min does not get such an ultimatum. She chooses the country club and simply accepts her old friends in anyway, her goals remaining the same with the exception of a few more desires being added into the mix. And of course, her ego is never challenged or damaged in the process. She doesn't actually care if the country club members judge her for howling into her cell phone. They still need her to continue to win shooting events. Dreamweaver Hoping to get Dale out of the house and more employed than before, Nancy encourages Hank to take him on a vocation vacation so he can learn a marketable skill in a fun way. Hank is at first excited to go with him upon seeing all the interesting blue-collar choices, but Dale ends up picking Basket Weaver as his career of choice. 
Dale quickly distinguishes himself as a completely incompetent basket weaver, with Hank overshadowing him in every way. At first, he believes the boss, Mr. Brubaker, is merely trying to motivate him by withholding praise, but when he overhears Hank joining in on making fun of him, Dale gets mad and tries to flatten him with a forklift. Realizing his friend is upset, Hank sets out to rebuild Dale's confidence by working with Brubaker to fake a beetle infestation that only Dale can fix. In the end, Dale is able to drive out the bugs by destroying his own baskets, a show which impresses the other vocation vacationers enough that they pay money to learn to exterminate. In the B-plot, the rest of the alley tries to recreate a one-in-a-million moment of the wind blowing Bill's hat onto Khan's head. The episode Megalodale has nearly the same plot as this one with the distinction that before, Dale was struggling to convince people of his skill in a very real hunt against Chuck Mangione, and here, Dale is genuinely struggling with basket weaving while failing to convince people otherwise. His competency gets called into question both in and out of universe, even as he resolves the plot towards the end, destroying a fake beetle infestation that even he admits he can't actually detect. Between his failures outside his career, within his career, and his own family admitting that he's not carrying his weight financially, Dale is given every reason to believe in his failure as a human being. But the point of this episode is not some objective ideal, but instead the mentality of Dale himself, as he struggles with accepting these facts. The beetle ploy was merely to build his confidence up to the point where he's able to come up with a new solution for money-making by the end of the episode. All of these issues combine to raise the question of how such a situation comes to be in the first place, or rather, how he was able to support himself and his family originally, given the flashbacks that show that he's always been like this. It's a sign of the steady stupefaction of Dale's character that he's degraded to little more than comic relief, able to have a similar plot play out in a much less flattering way. Doggone Crazy The family returns from a rained-out baseball game to find that their house has been ransacked. After a bit of paranoia, they discover that the culprit was Ladybird. She gets nervous during thunderstorms and tears up the furniture. Hank at first thinks that he needs to spend more time with her, but during a later storm, she bites Hank suddenly. And while he's getting the wound treated, his doctor puts Ladybird on the vicious dogs list. When he's told that another incident will result in Ladybird being put down, Hank begrudgingly calls a dog spiritualist, Oscar de Vries, to help soothe her soul. After a few days of trying to make Hank into a pack leader dog for her, Oscar believes that Ladybird is searching for the rest of her pack, and he takes her to a retirement home to be with her kind. But when a thunderstorm starts and animal control is called for the vicious dog, Hank has to rush to stop Ladybird before she goes crazy again. But instead of finding her assaulting people, he instead finds her calmly resting her head on a woman's lap, shortly afterwards deducing that she's gone deaf. Peggy points out that the message of this episode by the halfway point, that Hank's acceptance of the absurdity of Oscar's strategies for taming Ladybird, is proof of how much love he has for his pet. The more he's willing to embarrass himself for her, the more he values her life, doubly so as Hank is normally a much more reserved person, meaning that everything he's doing is in the context of that fact. The fact that Hank even calls an eccentric personality like this in the first place shows that, for all the pomp Hank tends to pride himself on, he still values certain things more than being proper. At the episode's conclusion, we learn that Ladybird was merely losing her hearing all episode, that the thunder was the only thing she would hear due to it being a loud, sudden noise. This, combined with the stress of being without a sense, is the true reason behind her actions, and yet all of these are symptoms of the same thing. The dog is getting old. Earlier in the season, we saw Hank's reaction to the news of his father being hospitalized, that he spent most of the episode in denial of that fact, and here the issue of Lady Bird's deafness is not connected to the fact that the last few years of her life are coming up at all. Hank is still in denial of the passage of time, or that his idyllic, unchanging lifestyle will eventually be affected by this. Trans Fascism After being made fun of by some New Yorkers, Ted Wasanasong proposes to the city council that Arlen ban trans fats. Hank is against this at first, but the ban goes through anyway, and soon, Sugarfoots is shut down as their whole menu was deep fried. But Buck Strickland remains undeterred, and opens up an illegal food truck, selling the old menu while evading news vans and bribing the police to look the other way. Hank at first is adamant about his continuing mission to subvert unjust laws, until he runs a red light while evading Nancy Gribble and feels bad enough about it to want to quit. But he's too far into the criminal lifestyle to do so, as Rooster, Buck's rival, opens up his own food truck and starts a turf war, forcing Hank to defend his boss's business interests. 
But after this rivalry starts to get more violent, people start to become extremely ill, with Hank realizing that it's the unsanitary conditions of Rooster's food truck that are responsible. In the end, Hank uses this, as well as some of Nancy's footage of the council members eating the banned food, as a justification for repealing the law, which the council agrees to do. When trans fats are taken out of the hands of average people, they instead become objects exclusively controlled by anyone willing to break the law. This is true of anything that a government attempts to ban, the reputation of which follows along with it, whether it's access to firearms, marijuana, or abortions. If there's demand, there will be supply. That's basic free market economics. Regulation is something that can only be done with some inherent tolerance of the act itself. You can't regulate restaurants that serve trans fats if they're illegal in the first place. Leading to increased prices that reflect the risk and unsanitary conditions as anyone willing to break one law is willing to break several. And the actual reasoning behind the ban is entirely fabricated. To some, it's a means of looking good. To others, a means of shifting blame away from themselves for their children's obesity. And to people like Bill, it's a way of avoiding responsibility for your own actions. The very people who pushed the ban in the first place also end up subverting it, viewing themselves as more responsible and better than the rest of the masses who simply can't control themselves. Again, much in the same way as most real-world bans where people justify their own participation while denouncing the actions of others. Three Men and a Bastard, a.k.a. the Untitled Blake McCormick Project Bill goes on a date with a single mother named Charlene, and the two hit it off well enough that she brings her kids to meet him. But as the kids are over, her daughter Kate starts to get close to Joseph, as the two have so much in common, and Dale becomes suspicious of her. So he tests her DNA to confirm his suspicions, and realizes that Kate and Joseph share the same paternal DNA, though he concludes that he's the father. Hank and Peggy are unsure what to do with the information as they don't want to ruin Bill's happiness, though Peggy tries to get Bobby to third wheel Joseph and Kate to prevent incest. But Dale starts to grow upset with the idea of Bill raising his daughter, so he recruits John Redcorn to seduce Charlene slash Candy again in order to ruin the relationship and make Bill single once more. When an exhausted Bill learns that Charlene has been cheating on him, he's relieved instead of angry as he realizes that he doesn't actually like kids and Charlene leaves to move in with John Redcorn. This episode plays with a few of the expectations society tends to have regarding dateability in different people depending on outside factors. As much of a failure as Bill appears to be, he's a man with steady employment, his own house, and a genuinely caring personality that makes him a much better partner than he at first appears to be. On the other hand, Charlene is outwardly friendly and attractive, but as a single mother she's connected to her kids in a way that many men would find unpalatable as they compete for attention and affection. But as more is revealed about her, we learn that she has a history of flings that she hasn't entirely grown out of, so these traits about both people and the couple change the dynamic between them as more information is revealed. But this episode isn't entirely about dateability or compatibility, but rather the effect of these traits on the perception that others have towards the relationship, from the inside and out. Bill is more obsessed with the idea of being in a relationship than he is in the relationship itself, shown with how quickly he tires out once the honeymoon phase of the relationship is over. Likewise, the rest of the neighborhood took issue not with the idea of the relationship, but the relationship itself, an additional layer of awkwardness to their opposition of the union on top of, you know, the, the incest. The Accidental Terrorist when Peggy's car breaks down, she asks Hank to buy a new one, and Hank takes her to his car guy, Ted Hammond. As the two are in disagreement about what kind of car to get, Peggy starts to talk about buying a convertible with the dealer and is able to haggle him down some ways. But when Hank gets a special price for being a loyal customer, Peggy's horrified to learn that he paid sticker price for the vehicle, the same price Hank has been buying all his cars at for the last 25 years. She tries to keep this fact a secret from her husband as she's unsure how he will react, but the secret gets out and Hank starts to feel humiliated and betrayed. But not wanting to let it rest, he sets out to get even by putting flyers on all of Ted's vehicles, recruiting the help of a college kid he met at a print shop to put them up. But as he's driving away from a job well done, the dealership explodes, destroying all of the cars. Everybody assumes Hank is guilty of the attack, as he's unable to track down any of the men who helped him and he had a motivation for doing so. But before he can be arrested, Ted Hammond arrives at the police station and declares that Hank is innocent if he says he is, as he does not want Hank to take the case to a higher court, bringing bad publicity to the dealership. 
Free market capitalism is a system that by design has winners and losers. The winners are those who start out in an advantageous situation, and the losers are the people who don't know better or can't do better through either a lack of startup materials or knowledge. Hank, however, doesn't see it this way. To him, being fair and honorable is a more valuable thing than being rich. As he himself would never try to take advantage of a situation like this, he can't imagine anyone else doing the same thing. It's a sort of optimism that he projects onto others that can be taken advantage of by a person who recognizes it as a character flaw instead of a boon. But for as much of a weakness as Hank's kindness is, it's also something that can be perceived as a strength. Hank projects his personality onto other people so intensely that it makes their real personality stand out that much more. As Hank repeatedly tries to shame others into assuming the best about one another, it calls into question why they aren't living up to that ideal in the first place. Hammond exploits Hank so clearly that anyone else who finds out about it will surely begin to question whether he's being honest with them or not. And once that question is raised, so too is the level of scrutiny. Ladies and Gentrification Enrique asks Hank to give a speech at his daughter Inez's quinceanera, even though Hank knows next to nothing about his employee's family. So he goes over to Enrique's house to research for his speech and recruits the help of Peggy to serve as a mediator. But Peggy has been with a difficult client, a hipster named Asa, all day, failing to sell him a home until he enters Enrique's neighborhood and loves the houses there. As the days go on, more and more of Asa's hipster friends move into the neighborhood, building art galleries, and changing the flavor of the town, until soon the cost of rent there is too high for Enrique to live anymore. Peggy, realizing her role in all of this, feels guilty and sets out to de-gentrify the neighborhood, eventually realizing that she can throw off the vibe by pretending to sell houses to the people of Rainy Street, scaring off the hipsters. In the end, Hank is able to give his speech to celebrate Enrique finally being able to own his home. Basic economic supply and demand dictates that the more you charge for a price, the more you make per sale, but the fewer people will buy it. The less you charge, the less you make per sale, but the more people will buy it. Somewhere in between these two points is a price at which you maximize your profitability. A normal conclusion to make about a free market, but one that creates unfortunate situations when used on necessities like housing and healthcare and food. While maximizing profits for housing, you produce a significant portion of the population who are priced out of ownership by design with the people and families affected being locked out of financial security as a result of not building equity or buying outside their means. As obnoxious as the hipsters moving into Enrique's neighborhood are depicted as, it's difficult to actually consider them to have done anything wrong. As Peggy repeatedly states, them moving into the area increases value and is good for the economy. But just because something is good for the economy doesn't actually mean it's good for everyone, especially when the wealth being generated is disproportionately distributed among those who already have the money, while raising prices enough that, even if some of those at the bottom appear better off, they're still priced out of their future. Behind Closed Doors Dooley runs away, becoming the talk of the town and attracting a speech-slash-book sale by Stephen Davies, a family expert. And despite Dooley returning home, Davies still uses it as an opportunity to scare the audience and shame Peggy when she can't reveal the exact location of her son. So Peggy overcompensates by setting up a whiteboard in the house, giving everyone one-way cell phones, and removing all of the inside doors. Hank and Bobby quickly grow tired of the oversharing and start to avoid Peggy outright, culminating in the family missing a photo appointment when Peggy learns it's happening a day earlier than she planned it to. When Peggy learns the reason her family has been avoiding her, she feels terrible, so Hank and Bobby set out to make things right by threatening Stephen Davies and crying to the photographer respectively. When Peggy sees her family all gathered at the mall, they make a plan to work together to get their family photo after all by convincing Dooley to run away again and taking their spot. Repeatedly throughout King of the Hill, we've seen that Peggy is the type of person to push back harder than she's pushed into. And here we see this manifest as an obsessive force controlling her family, as a result of her parenting abilities being called into question. But while Peggy pushes back against obstacles out of stubbornness, Hank and Bobby are different in that they try to avoid the situation in the first place. Hank, so opposed to the idea that he may be called on to open up emotionally, that he hides from his wife instead of staying close like she wanted to. And this shows the fault of overbearing and strict parenting styles. Those who practice parenting in this way believe themselves to be raising well-behaved and calm children, when the reality is that they're raising kids who are good at listening to footsteps or pretending to be busy and hiding. 
And of course, when everything is under control of a parent, the kid themselves fails to learn how to act independently, relying on others to take care of things for them, or worse, allowing opportunities to pass over completely as they prioritize being low maintenance over asking for assistance in learning new things. So by the episode's end, Peggy comes to the conclusion that she never needed to prove anything to anyone but herself and her family. Some people really are content with a healthy distance between themselves and others, and a little bit of independence can go a long way. Pour some sugar on Khan. Khan's father-in-law, the general, comes to Arlen to visit the family and he constantly insults and berates his son-in-law. Hoping for some reprieve, Khan goes to a Laotian bar where he's encouraged to use a cathartic feeling of karaoke to unwind. He sings the morning after to the applause of the crowd and excitedly returns home to brag about the feeling, much to the annoyance of the general. Over the next few days, Khan is able to relax as, without the pent-up feelings close to boiling over, he's not bothered by as much as he usually is. Soon, word of his performances reaches Nine Rivers, and he's allowed on stage at a fundraiser, only for the general to invite himself up and sing the morning after, before Khan gets the chance to. He's broken up about this and returns to his meek self, unable to be fixed by any of the alley's advice. Eventually, Min asks the general to undo the damage he's done, and he goes to Khan to tell him that he's better than him in every way, but will leave the guy alone so he can pretend otherwise. In the B-plot, Bobby and Peggy make various bets over bragging rights. Khan's sour attitude is shown here to be a defense mechanism against the general feeling of insecurity that he gets from so many sources in his life. He complains about his co-workers and constantly compares himself to them, as well as comparing his life to his neighbors in an attempt to prove that he's doing well. If he can just get some physical evidence that his life is great, then nobody can make him feel bad about that. And yet, despite how concrete he wants his accomplishments to be, Khan ends up finding comfort in karaoke, a hobby where objective skill is almost impossible to measure, and doing so defeats the point. When he gets a positive reaction from the crowd, he feels a sense of unprovable joy, that people liked him for who he was and what he did, instead of the things he had or things he could prove about himself. By going on stage and being confident, he was able to continue to be confident off stage. But while these lives were separate, he could still believe in himself. Once the general went on stage and attempted to destroy him there, Khan realized that it's possible for him to lose what he just gained and goes further into a slump than before, because he had happiness and lost it. Six Characters in Search of a House During a tight housing market, Peggy is able to get a commission to sell despite only having two weeks and the family of ugly people living in the home refusing to leave long enough to host an open house. So Peggy gets the idea to hire actors to promote the house and brings in a troupe to put on a play she writes about the value of a home. The actors are difficult to work with and Hank is unsure about letting Bobby be exposed to their kind but Peggy is able to get them to work together long enough to finally perform her show, and the audience loves it. They love it so much that a client puts in an offer for the Hills House above market price, an offer which Peggy accepts. Hank is appalled about his home being sold while he's still living in it, and he tells Peggy to back out of the deal. But there's a large penalty for doing so, and the only way they can get out without paying is to fail a home inspection. Hank sabotages his own house before the inspector comes over, and he quotes the home as needing thousands of man-hours worth of repairs, getting the hills out of the deal. But instead of Hank being embarrassed, he's instead praised as the inspector notes that only a skilled craftsman could have faked the damage to that extent. Hank takes pride in the condition of his home just as much as Peggy takes pride in her ability to sell them. So much so, in fact, that she's willing to sacrifice one of those sources of pride in the interest of showing off her own. She gets caught up in the thrill of having made a successful home sale that no one else could have done, and winds up in a bad situation as a result. This is in character for Peggy, whose ego is the source of many plots throughout the show. Often, this manifests in the form of Peggy's ego being challenged, and then her pushing back against such a challenge. This is how Peggy got her realty job in the first place. But in this episode, it's the opposite. Peggy's ego is supported, and she ends up getting carried away as a result. The amount of stress she dealt with in trying to put on the performance and having her boss get involved could not have helped. But Hank then gets put on the spot as the theory is suggested to make the house unsellable to get them out of the deal. Just as much as Peggy would hate to lose a sale, Hank would hate to fail a home inspection. But this episode isn't about sales and passing, but egos. So even though Hank fails, he still gets to feel good about himself when the home inspector rightly identifies the true source of the damage.
The Courtship of Joseph's Father Dale brags about being the father of the star quarterback of the Tom Landry Middle School football team, but when Joseph starts to attract the attention of Spencer Academy, a private school, Dale starts to demand bribes from the administration to send his son there. But Joseph doesn't want to leave his life and his friends at Tom Landry and announces as such, so Dale overrides his wishes and sends him to Spencer instead. But during a gala, Dale begins to realize that he doesn't fit in with the other parents due to not being able to spin as much as them, and Joseph realizes that he doesn't fit in with the other kids either. So to continue to give his son the best life possible, Dale drops him off at a rich family's home and attempts to disown him. But they simply bring the boy back and he stays at the hills until Nancy comes back. In the end, in order to pay back all the bribe money he accepted, Dale hosts a fundraiser of his own and the community comes together to get Joseph back to Tom Landry. This episode paints Dale in a terrible light relative to his usual depiction. We've seen before that he's a great dad to Joseph despite not being his father. Here, he's taking pride in the exact opposite fact. Dale enjoys that Joseph is his offspring despite acknowledging that he's done very little to properly foster his son's talents. Made worse by the fact that he's actively harming Joseph's adolescence as he fails to understand what his son wants out of life whenever he's not actively preventing him from fulfillment. And then, when Dale realizes that Joseph is not receiving a proper introduction to the others at Spencer Academy, rather than acknowledging that it was his wish to send a son there and not his son's wish to attend, he starts to sacrifice things that don't mean anything to him to promote his ideals, even sending his son away to live with another family as he starts to think that he doesn't deserve to raise Joseph, again, taking credit for being his biological father instead of anything else. But just as much as Dale raises a boy he didn't father, the rest of Arlen also supports a child who isn't theirs in a biological sense by raising the money to get him back home, hopefully teaching Dale the values of how it takes a village to raise a child in the process. Strangeness on a Train Peggy is looking forward to a staged mystery train to celebrate her birthday in spite of her historical record of having disaster strike at every birthday party she's had in recent memory. The alley dresses in disco-themed costumes and boards the train, with Luann getting invited to participate in the role of one of the actresses who no-showed. But shortly after the party starts, Luann spoils the mystery and Dale announces it to the whole cabin. Then, once the train takes off, they find out all the food spoiled and they're in a dry county so they can't even drink. Peggy runs into the bathroom to cry over another ruined birthday, until Hank enters to comfort her, and the two have relations in the bathroom. But when Con sees a set of footprints on the mirror, he declares a new mystery, finding out which couple got busy in the bathroom. Hank and Peggy conspire to sabotage the investigation by triggering the train's brakes, and the whole party is kicked off by the conductor, stranding them in the wilderness. But when the disco-clad party enters a local bar, the locals are entertained by their outfits, and the party begins in earnest. A lot of what makes something enjoyable is the mentality you take into the experience, as much of Puggy's terrible birthdays are the result of things outside her control as they are within her control. When the mystery aboard the train is spoiled and the food is ruined, she's able to enjoy herself with Hank by revisiting their love life, claiming some small victory from the clutches of the evening's events. Likewise, at the episode's conclusion, Peggy and her entourage are able to enter a bar together where the inhabitants enjoy the costumes and claim that Disco is back, something made possible by the number of people clad in matching outfits. Had Peggy and Hank entered alone, they may have simply been looked at as weird, but the fact that it was a group of people dressed the same is what made it into a good night, and of course, for all those people to know that Peggy has a history of bad birthdays and yet who attended her train party anyway is also a testament to one of the potential sources of joy she might have found from the night. People are willing to put up with the risk of another disaster around their friend, or in Dale's case to laugh at her misery, and that alone is a sign of how much Peggy has. Cops and Robert Bobby gets accused of throwing a can at the school officer, Officer Brown, and has to shadow him for a week as punishment. While shadowing the officer, Bobby encourages him to take more interest in his work by catching students he knows have gone truant. Meanwhile, Hank is upset about having been ripped off with a forged autograph, and while failing to return the picture, mistakenly believes a man, Barry Rollins, has pickpocketed him and steals his wallet. But when Hank realizes his error, he tries to return it, only for his messages to the man he robbed to come across as vaguely threatening. So Barry plans to get even to stop being a victim, and when Hank arrives, he attacks the alley with the baseball bat. They take shelter at Bazoom's, a restaurant known for its skimpy waitress outfits that Dale has been working at in an attempt to make a sex discrimination suit. 
While there, Dale plans to make a distraction, while the others flee. But when Barry tries to chase after them again, he trips and pulls down Dale's shorts, ultimately getting arrested outside the restaurant when Bobby and Officer Brown show up, having seen the chase from before. In the end, Dale tries to sue Bazooms for a hostile work environment, and while the women there make a case, he gets fired for failing to ring up orders. The first seasons of King of the Hill frequently made a point of Hank's anger issues being central to his character. Here, these issues are shown in a much more potentially dangerous trait through the character of Barry Rollins, whose anger gets the best of him as he begins to chase Hank around with a baseball bat after chanting to himself about revenge. It's implied that he spent his life as a victim of other people's wrongdoings, something much like the conceit of most episodes of the show. Hank is wronged by somebody, he gets angry, he sets out to fix the problem. The difference here is how that fix manifests itself between the two characters. Hank's idea of getting even is about doling out justice, making sure whoever was in the wrong is aware of what they did wrong and educated about it. Barry only wants to get even. He prioritizes revenge against other people over actually ensuring justice, that the punishment itself is more valuable than the punished party understanding why they're being targeted. It's worth pointing out the way in which these two characters differ when being confronted for their actions. Hank tries to do the right thing and return the stolen wallet when he realizes he's made an error, but when Barry is caught by the police, he makes excuses for what he did. It came from the garage. Hoping to spend some time with Bobby, Hank starts to construct a boat for the Arlen Regatta alongside him. But their efforts are stopped when a bat is discovered living in the garage, and Hank is too afraid of it to go near. With Hank's phobia preventing him from helping, Bobby is left to do all the boat work himself, also doing many of Hank's other responsibilities, and soon, reorganizing the garage Hank is too afraid to enter. So Hank turns to his friends for help in overcoming his fear of the bat, being brought to a local bridge to be exposed to them at sunset. Bobby is at the same location, showing off his boat's seaworthiness to his friends, only for the boat to start sinking due to his design flaws. Hank is rescued and rushes into the water, not to save his son, but to save their boat, which he's able to do in spite of sailing directly beneath the bat bridge while doing so. In the end, Hank still hasn't overcome his fears, although he's glad to see Bobby and their project doing okay. In the B-plot, Peggy starts reading educational novels from the local bookstore's bargain bin, only to run out of them and read romance novels instead. Hank, who has normally been a stoic, seemingly flawless person, is revealed to have a phobia of bats to his son, resulting in Bobby learning that his dad isn't perfect after all, and immediately allowing this knowledge to go to his head as he starts to take over the spaces that he usually avoided, out of respect for what Hank wanted. Peggy mentions that this is something that every child ought to go through eventually, having one moment where they learn their parents are flawed individuals and, in the process, becoming more in touch with them as they go from perfect people to people who can make mistakes. These mistakes can then be applied to lessons learned and unlearned from your childhood that are contextualized afterward. Your parents aren't perfect people, they make mistakes, and understanding when they're wrong is an important part of eventually gaining independence from them. Bobby starts to gain this independence during this episode, but due to Hank's continued fear, he takes it too far as he starts to make alterations to the boat that are unwise and inefficient. It's important to realize that your parents can make mistakes, but also that they can be correct more often than you are due to having more life experience. Hank, too, learns that this is an important lesson to teach, not simply admonishing Bobby's poor craftsmanship, but working to fix it instead of taking over entirely. He goes out of his way to face his fears while repairing the boat, just as he tries to face his fears while repairing his relationship with Bobby. Life, a loser's manual. Upon realizing that Lucky doesn't have a credit card, ID, or any other sort of verification, Hank takes it upon himself to get Lucky all of the official papers to make him a proper citizen before his child is born. But as he's setting this up, Luann's father, Hoyt, returns from his work on the oil rig. At least, that's the lie Peggy has been maintaining about her brother to cover up the fact that he was in jail. Peggy tries to encourage Hank to take Hoyt along with Lucky to get them both in better standing, and Hank is at first convinced to give the guy another chance. But Hoyt falls into trouble right away and ultimately has Lucky take the fall for him after being caught robbing a diner, as Lucky doesn't want Luann to discover her father's criminal history. Hank visits Lucky in jail and pieces together what happened, and so he and Peggy conspire to leave a honeypot for the guy to trap him into getting arrested a third time, and soon, Hoyt joins Lucky in jail. 
Once there, they convince him to confess to the crime Lucky was arrested for, for Luann's sake, in exchange for Hank and Peggy coming up with the lie to keep Luann in the dark once more. In the B-plot, Dale builds a watchtower that is just under the zoning board's guidelines, only for it to collapse while Khan is trying to get it taken down. The Hill family tries to cover up Hoyt's exploits from Luann, fearing what might happen to her if she finds out that he's been in prison rather than fleeing his wife on an oil rig. She spent so much of her life fleeing her childhood that finding out more context about the events can only make it even harder to mentally leave that headspace. And her primary person to look towards to get further from that life is her husband, Lucky, who Hank is actively trying to improve as the two go around making him into a more upstanding member of society. But as Hoyt spends more time in Arlen, he starts to negatively influence everyone around him, including Luann once again. Torn between defending his actions to keep Luann in the dark and condemning his actions and revealing the truth, the family finally decides to prevent future risk. Lucky also gets to shine here as his desire to keep Luann from falling into a hole that he himself once lived in gets shown. He's street smart enough to immediately catch on to the lie of Hoyt's oil rig story, and person smart enough to catch on to why Hank and Peggy are trying to keep it a secret. He's willing to put himself in prison to stop Luann from slinking back into the lifestyle he wants to elevate her out of, valuing his position in society less than hers, in order to show his selflessness. Season 13 As is typical of the last few seasons of King of the Hill, Season 13 begins as the latter half of Season 12, and then continues on with this tradition by having several additional episodes that never got to air until after the show's run was finished. These episodes being aired almost a year afterwards, when syndication was moved to Comedy Central and FXX, as well as Adult Swim. At least on these networks, there was no chance of sports programming running long and postponing original air dates. This is the final season of King of the Hill, the show failing to be renewed when it was announced that Fox would be making room on its schedule for a Family Guy spinoff by Seth MacFarlane. This was a decision made in spite of steady, consistent ratings for the show that held strong even in much later seasons, as well as hopes that other networks like ABC could pick up broadcasting rights as they were already the host of Judge's new comedy, The Good Family. But when these rumors were quashed, it seems as though season 13 would be the final season of King of the Hill, barring rumors of a revival down the line. Diabolic Shock After having two blood sugar spikes in a week, Bill is checked into a hospital with a Dr. Wiseman, who tells him that if he continues to ignore the advice of his other physicians, he'll end up losing his legs to diabetes. Taking this to heart, Bill gets a wheelchair and starts to live his life in it, asking the alley for help fitting his house for his lower height and moving around. But while he's at the park, he meets a man named Thunder, who leads various sporting events for wheelchair-bound athletes. Thunder is able to convince Bill to drop his defeatist attitude towards his disability and to participate in a league, eventually becoming more self-confident and getting into better shape. But this stops when Bill drunkenly exits his wheelchair, revealing that he could walk the whole time, and the rest of the league turns their backs on him. He goes back to moping for a while as he's no longer inspiring, until Hank and Thunder are able to convince him that overcoming his pre-diabetes is something worth taking pride in, and he uses his newfound confidence to kick Wiseman's ass. After learning of Bill's diabetes, Peggy decides to fix Bobby's diet by giving him more vegetables, which Bobby slowly comes around to after losing his taste for processed sugars. Despite never having a physical disability, Bill is still immobilized out of a loss of his confidence in his ability to walk, that he's become so convinced of his uselessness to society, he's given up on ever being able to accomplish things without help. This kind of self-defeating mentality is what made his diabetes happen in the first place. He's been warned before about what might happen if he doesn't change his lifestyle, then failed repeatedly at actually following a diet, to the point that he believes he doesn't have it in him to do so. But by working with Thunder, he's able to drop the thing that made him convinced he was disabled in the first place, regaining his belief that he can change for the better, and then going back out into the world to practice that. So when Bill reveals that he can walk, it's not just a sign that he's no longer physically disabled, or rather that he never was, but a sign that the mental blocks towards walking are gone as well. And in the end, this is what he's praised for overcoming, the exact same thing Thunder tried to convince him to do during their first meeting. Whether you're in a wheelchair or not, convincing yourself to try and improve your life is still just as difficult an obstacle to overcome. Earthly girls are easy. 
When the Arlen Bystander publishes an article about Strickland dumping all tanks into the river, Buck tries to fix his business's image by going green. But when turning up the thermostat and carpooling proves to be too much work for him, Buck instead gets the idea to buy carbon offsets from Dale, who's exploiting Bobby and Joseph's sudden enthusiasm for planting trees to do the work for him. But when Dale realizes he can make money from selling offsets and not actually doing anything, he gets into trouble with Buck, who's putting on a concert in the woods he thinks he's planted, as there's no actual forest to host the concert inside of. So Dale and Buck go to an old gun club friend of Dale's to rent his trees, pretending it's Strickland Forest for the benefit concert, and the concert goes off without a hitch. Bobby, witnessing these events unfold, starts to realize how little his efforts matter and gives up on maintaining any of the trees he's planted. So Hank goes on stage to tell the concert goers the truth. None of the trees are new, and they've been around for years. But instead of decrying the fake activism, they're just happy that nothing was destroyed in the process. So Hank takes it upon himself to tell Bobby to not give up on something he started, and that doing a little is better than doing nothing at all. The tragedy of the commons is a phenomenon in which a publicly used resource is depleted due to people overusing and misusing it, often in an attempt to do so before it runs out entirely. Like a field many people trample on preventing grass from growing in, the environment can feel the same way at times. No matter what individual efforts you make to recycle waste or use less plastic and cut down on your personal emissions, there will be people out there who use significantly more than you on an individual level that will offset any amount of good that you can do in your lifetime, no matter how hard you work. As depressing as this fact is, it shouldn't mean that you ought to give up completely. Just because a fight seems unwinnable doesn't mean you shouldn't at least try to do your part. In fact, many of the biggest polluters actually benefit from this sense of apathy that their waste production generates. If people have given up on individual change, they're much less likely to try to enforce larger scale change either, whether that comes in the form of simply purchasing offsets or arguing for more sustainability in their supply chain. Square-Footed Monster Hank and the rest of the alley assist a property owner in refurbishing one of the houses on their street, only to be horrified when Ted with Sonasong buys it, then tears it down for a quickly made McMansion, with the intention of flipping the house for a quick profit. They put up with weeks of construction and debris until it's done, trying and failing to find a legal loophole to get it out of their neighborhood. Then, as Ted awaits a buyer, a storm blows in, with the house beginning to collapse, taking the nearby homes with it. So Hank and the rest of the alley have to quickly team up to tear it down themselves, and when Ted assesses the damage, he threatens legal action. Hank makes a case for why the house needed to be destroyed, which is ultimately won when they bring in a lawyer able to cite case law to defend their actions. Ted strikes back by selling the property to the city to construct a power substation, though with a bit more arbitration they're able to get the rights to construct a more modest house surrounding it to at least insulate the noise in view. In his attempts to flip property for a quick profit, Ted winds up endangering the people immediately surrounding the house, not to mention the potential resident who could have been underneath the falling roof. It's not just Ted who thinks this way, though. At the start of the episode, the seller requesting that Hank and co. fix it up was purely interested in curb appeal, making the house look nice enough to sell with no regard for whether the drains went in the right direction or the foundation was solid. Cost-cutting rarely actually saves money in the long run, only creating a bit of short-term wealth and then passing on the danger to the next person to hold on to the end product. More often than not, this means the people at the top of the supply chain profiting off the misery of those at the bottom. Ted Wasanasong is even willing to fight against the claims of property damage in court, clearly finding the lawyer expenses less than the potential lawsuit. Again, this is a symptom of a system in which the punishment for a crime is a slap on the wrist compared to the money to be made from committing it. If you pay out less in lawsuits than you save from cost-cutting measures, the products will be made with shoddy craftsmanship by the lowest bidder. And as supplies become centralized under a single owner, in this case, the value of a home being far outside the reach of the average consumer, the risk of losing clients to a higher quality product disappears. Because if every home is made cheaply, then none of them are. Lost in MySpace Buck Strickland discovers that Strickland Propane is losing sales to Thatherton due to not having any online presence. So he has Donna put up a MySpace page for Strickland in order to bring in more customers, and she quickly fills it with videos of the employees goofing off and getting drunk. Hank is upset about her airing the employees' dirty laundry online, but Buck appreciates the uptick in business from the page and promotes Donna to assistant manager. 
This power goes to her head, and she starts ordering the rest of the employees around, refusing to hear complaints from them that aren't online. When Hank posts that Donna is an idiot, a flash mob of her followers arrives at Strickland and attacks Buck believing that he's Hank, getting Donna fired. She then changes the Strickland page to be an anti-Strickland page, and nobody knows enough about her to visit her in person to ask to have it removed, making Hank scroll through years of her blogging to find out enough personal details to find her in person. Eventually, Strickland meets with her in person, and she admits that she only took over the blog in such a way as she was upset with the lack of respect she was getting at work, an issue which they're able to talk out then and there, with Donna getting her job back as manager of Strickland's social media presence. In the B-plot, Dale rents and loses a truffle-sniffing pig, then borrows Ladybird to track it down. From internet fights to road rage, being semi-anonymous causes people's behavior to change as there's no immediate consequence to their actions, nor is there a face to put to the actions being made. Donna is able to incite violence against Hank for disagreeing her when the interaction takes place online, but when she's confronted in person, she shrinks away from the fight and is more reasonable in asserting what she actually wants. This was a more revolutionary idea back when this episode aired in 2008 compared to today, where people are much more willing to accept the idea of a person's private and public personas being distinct, to the point that you're listening to a video by a guy whose avatar is a jog drawn in MS Paint going by video games instead of a human being. The conflict of this episode comes down to Donna being unsatisfied with her real life, going online, and inventing a newer curated persona that she can use to be more comfortable with self-expression and airing her grievances. Itself, this is a story of misplaced values, but it's all amplified by the fact that the real-world consequences still exist for a person's actions on the internet. Attacking at Strickland propane for a personal grievance can cause the business to lose money, and a situation where people let virtual proxies fight over their problems will always result in a less centralized version of the argument benefiting nobody. No Bobby Left Behind Bobby is struggling to maintain decent grades in school, something Hank attributes to his lack of work ethic and that the school attributes to belonging in a special needs program, something Bobby is placed into alongside all the other D and C students in order to keep standardized testing scores high. As the weeks leading up to the standardized tests approaches, Principal Moss puts more and more students into special ed, in the interest of weeding out anyone who has a chance of failing and costing him his job and the students are bribed to pretend to belong in the class with the promise of a trip to Alamo land. But when this trip arrives and the students overload a boat ride, falling into the water, there's a panic as the parents start to blame Tom Landry Middle School for not properly chaperoning them. So Principal Moss turns to Hank for advice on what to do, and Hank suggests taking the kids out of the special needs class so they can take the test properly to prove that they're not unsupervised special needs kids, but regular kids misbehaving. Despite the school pooling efforts to bump up their scores, Principal Moss is still fired when the scores are actually lower than in previous years, though at least Bobby is able to get a passing grade. People often excel at whatever they're measured in. If you value math and reading skills over everything else, then that's what students will be more gifted in showing. If you value real-world skills and focus on testing those, then you have students with better general knowledge. We've seen that Bobby is a charismatic comedian, usually well-liked by his peers, but that's not something that can be measured by a test, and thus, Bobby is viewed as a subpar student. And due to not having the resources to personalize curriculums and identify who is good at what, the school system is forced to make as generic a curriculum as possible, leaving anyone at the edges of normalcy out. And the less the school has to work with, be it through a lack of funding or lack of caring, the more students there are who can be considered abnormal and thus pushed to the outskirts of what kind of proper education they ought to get. And all of this is to say nothing of the students who genuinely belong in the special ed programs, now being placed into overcrowded classrooms full of students who absorb the limited resources they're already forced to make do with. And while likely for reasons of taste we never see this end of the relationship, we do see the opposite happen, with the gifted classes having their textbooks and teachers confiscated to help patch the gap in education left by Principal Moss's earlier attempts. A Bill Full of Dollars Peggy, Dale, and Min get together to try to raise money through stock trading, with Peggy hoping to buy a new television with her share. They struggle to make any profit for a time before realizing that they need to research what the average American consumer wants, then realizing that Bill is the average American consumer. They track his purchasing habits for a while, and Peggy's finally able to buy a flat-screen TV with her investments, which Hank sets up in the living room. 
But when Hank learns how Peggy actually raised the money, he demands that she tell Bill the truth, and he's ecstatic to hear that someone is actually interested in listening to him. So much so that when he's taken to an electronics show to make more average purchases, the pressure gets to him and he struggles to pick anything out, with the investors abandoning him as it's impossible to get an unbiased opinion out of the guy. But Bill still believes that he's capable of making great stock picks, and mortgages his home to invest, losing everything afterwards. Feeling responsible for this, Peggy and the rest pool their money together to get his house back, only for Bill to reveal that he's declared bankruptcy, the prospect of which entices Buck Strickland to pay attention to him as he himself might hide some assets this way one day. It might be comforting to Bill today to hear that there's no such thing as a consumer who's not being listened to when it comes to their purchasing habits. When he realizes that his impulse spending produces some value for the people nearest to him, he's able to take pride in his consumerism. But that's pride sourced from the fact that those who are watching him are physically there, people that he knows personally. When Peggy and the other investors abandon their pursuit of Bill's shopping habits, he's left to a more generalized feeling of want to recapture that thrill of having his habits observed. And while this at first leads him to ruin, it ends with him getting exactly what he wants, despite having to declare bankruptcy to get it. Part of what pushed him into this mentality was Peggy, Dale, and Min's greed, that they would exploit him in this way for their own personal gain. But this isn't too valid of a way to interpret the events, as Bill was thrilled to know that he was wanted in any way. If anything, the only thing Peggy did wrong was when she stopped paying attention to Bill later on, something that wouldn't have been an issue if he was unaware in the first place. But Bill had a right to know he was being followed and why, and so the only person who can be blamed for his bad decisions is himself. The investor group can't be held culpable for a desperate person holding them hostage with his emotional dependence. Straight as an arrow. Hank grows tired of Bobby being unable to do things himself and looks for a way to straighten the boy out. He finds a potential answer when Peggy, now in charge of the Arlen welcome wagon, meets a new family that's looking to re-establish the Order of the Straight Arrow. So Hank and Wesley organize a group to get the local boys involved and independent, only for Hank to be upset with Wesley's refusal to do anything too dangerous like giving the boys knives or letting them build a real fire. Hank can't get Wesley to plan anything too educational or dangerous for the boys, so he takes it into his own hands to have them experience a real campout overnight once Wesley steps out. The kids are finally able to have some fun for once, but when Hank opens the door to let them get some fresh air, Wesley's children run into the wilderness. So Hank has the other boys track them down using basic survival skills until they're cornered and lured into a trap to be brought back only for Wesley himself to be waiting, upset that Hank would be so lax with his children who were suffering from some sort of mental impairment. Hank agrees to let the other man raise his kids the way he wants to, and returns to teach Bobby how to use a knife. In the B-plot, Luann and Lucky try to collect on the wedding gifts they never got. It's not much of a shock that children used to be much more free-range, for lack of a better term, than they are today. Some of this is a direct result of the reduction in the open space children have access to. Open fields have become parking lots, swimming holes are used to dump chemicals, the old climbing tree got chopped down for timber, so the average child today is extremely limited in his non-internet options for a third space, aside from school and home. But part of it is also an increase in the fear that parents feel over the safety of their kids, this in spite of a provable reduction in kidnappings or murder across the developed world. I've already spoken about the negative results of overprotective helicopter parenting in this review, but the end of this episode has Wesley mention that his children have genuine diagnosed mental disorders, and he keeps them close as a result. And he has a point, considering that those kids immediately got lost in the woods the moment they had the chance to do so. Through the episode, they were compared to Bobby, being more well-behaved, but only while they were kept on a short leash. Part of parenting is loosening your grip on your children bit by bit until they don't need the control, and Wesley trying to apply his parenting logic to the entire order of the straight arrow is just as much of an issue as Hank not properly watching after the ADHD-riddled children. Lucky C, Monkey Do Luann and Lucky are preparing for their baby shower, with Peggy offering all the parenting advice she's accrued over 13 years. But during the shower, Lucky's sister Myrna arrives and begins to criticize Peggy's choices of gifts and advice, saying they're outdated and bad for the baby. Peggy and Myrna feud over how Luann ought to raise her kid, culminating in the group taking a parenting course where Luann has to unlearn all of her parenting tips, and ultimately decides to go along with her sister-in-law's more modern parenting style. 
Hank convinces Peggy to accept that it's Luann's decision, as it's her baby, until she sees the room the child will grow up in and realizes that Marina's sterile parenting style will result in the baby becoming emotionless and boring. When Luann starts having contractions and needs to be rushed to a birthing center, she starts to suspect that Peggy was right, and Peggy works with her family to get the expecting mother to a real hospital, where Hank convinces Luann not to go along with Peggy's idea, or Marina's, but instead to have her child the way she wants to. In the end, Luann gives birth to Lasagna, or Gracie Margaret Kleinschmidt. In the B-plot, Bill tries to track down a fast-food drive through worker at a call center in Arizona, only to turn around and go home when he discovers she's 17. Luann has devoted so much time and energy trying to escape the cycles of her past, succeeding in becoming happily married to a man who treats her well and even has a child on the way that she's eager to raise in a loving environment, unlike her own childhood. And just like Luann, Myrna also wants to avoid that future for her children. She's taken more actionable steps towards ensuring that her kids get the most up-to-date, scientifically proven means of raising kids properly, rather than relying on traditional wisdom or careless care, like whiskey on a rag or a children's toy made with lead paint. But the difference between Myrna and Luann is that Luann has accepted a mixture of her past and present lives, taking the best aspects of both of them. But Myrna completely rejects all of the traditional knowledge in favor of more provable concepts, even making this change aesthetically. The narrative of the episode does not promote one of these ideologies over any other one, showing Bobby to be empty-minded and slow, while Myrna's children lack individualism and personality. And so instead of picking one option over the other, Luann is able to break the cycle of breaking the cycle by not creating a cycle to break, raising her child the way she sees fit. What happens at the National Propane Gas Convention in Memphis stays at the National Propane Gas Convention in Memphis. Buck Strickland is getting inducted into the Hall of Flame at the National Propane Gas Convention in Memphis, and he brings Hank along to keep him sober during the induction. Hank brings his family along for the trip, and for a while everything is going well. But Buck finds out there's another Strickland propane operating out of Tennessee, and discovers it's run by his bastard son, Ray Roy Strickland. The two have similar personalities, drinking and womanizing, and while spending time together, Buck ends up missing a Q&A session prior to the induction. But when Hank tries to wrangle Buck away from his son long enough to accept the award and gets rebuked, he storms off to get drunk at the hotel bar, eventually going up on stage to introduce his boss where he goes on a drunken rant before vomiting in a woman's hair. Peggy, realizing what's going on, approaches Buck and Ray Roy, threatening them to do her husband right. She then uses her influence with the First Ladies of Propane to bring them to a spa day while Buck invites the board of directors to a party in his penthouse, with the two groups converging on each other, something Buck uses to blackmail the propane convention into undoing the reprimand on Hank's record and ultimately offering him a position in the Hall of Flame as well. Hank has always had an unwavering sense of loyalty to his boss, and this is a loyalty that is consistently perceived as a weakness of his character. Hank is so poor at judging a person's personality that he's consistently taken advantage of and exploited for other people's gain. But this episode ends by inverting that relationship. As much as Hank believes he depends on Buck, Hank in reality is a person that Buck depends on, incapable of controlling himself without his employee's guidance and having all of his personal accomplishments truly be the result of Hank's loyalty. And at last, this loyalty is properly rewarded with something other than more work. Hank has always worked harder than everyone else at Strickland Propane, with the hard work being rewarded by being singled out for more assignments. But now this loyalty is properly recognized not by the narrative, but by Buck Strickland himself, who's just now realized that his life-ruining tactics are affecting the people closest to him. It's already made his bastard son turn out just like him, and he can't stand to see it happening to a drunken, miserable Hank. Master of Puppets Hoping to keep the flame of their marriage alive, Hank and Peggy go out on a date night where they lose track of time and forget about Bobby in a parking lot. He grows upset with them and mopes around the house until Peggy tries to make it up to him by spoiling him with a fancy breakfast and blaming Hank. When Hank starts to suspect that he's being used as a scapegoat, he tries to counter-bribe his son with gifts. Bobby begins to realize that he can be spoiled by his parents as long as he pretends to be upset about the events of that night, and gets more and more attention, eventually being allowed to go to a Kane Skretberg concert. But when Hank and Peggy see each other trying to one-up their gifts, they both realize that they shouldn't be competing for their son's attention, but working together for it. 
Hank and Peggy then follow Bobby around everywhere, giving him more attention than he wants and following him to the concert where the presence embarrasses him. In the end, Bobby admits that he was faking hurt feelings to be spoiled and that he wants some time alone. So Hank and Peggy go back to having date night while Bobby's allowed to attend the concert he wanted to go to. While Bobby at first appears upset about being forgotten about in the parking lot, the reality is that he's still holding some resentment over his parents spending time together instead of with him as he was at the start of the episode. Upon realizing that complaining about not getting attention gets him more of it, he starts to exploit this, in part because he's afraid his parents might neglect him again and in part because of the basic greed or a sense of getting revenge against Hank and Peggy. And this greed can play off the sense of guilt that Peggy and Hank felt in the first place, that they have to make up for a wrong they've done at first and later on one-upping each other in an attempt to not be the bad guy of the situation, an emotional state they could only feel if in some small part they suspected themselves of being the bad guy in the first place. But rather than going deeper and deeper into the recesses of being bad parents overcompensating, Hank and Peggy instead work together to become good parents overcompensating. Once they start to smother Bobby with attention, giving him exactly what he claimed to want, he starts to loot out on attention from other people and a sense of affection not in time spent together, but the mentality behind that time. Bobby used being abandoned at the mall as a justification for his anger instead of his real feelings, so when he actually got what he claimed to want, it wasn't at all what he needed. Bois my nose. Hank and his friends are harassed by the Mustangs, the high school football team who beat the Longhorns at State 23 years ago when Hank's ankle broke. Tired of their annual tradition of rubbing in their victory, Hank challenges them to a rematch, recruiting his old team to get together and win back their bragging rights. But during a practice, Hank's nose is broken by one of Bill's tackles, and he's woozy enough from the blow to pass out, his family taking him to a plastic surgeon to have it fixed. But after the surgery, Hank is excited to have a fixed nose, but keeps flinching away when incoming punts and passes come his way during later practice. He tells his team that this is due to the injury continuing to affect his performance, but Peggy sees through the excuse and deduces that he's afraid to play in the rematch and potentially let down his team again. But after a pep talk from the rest of the waiting room at the surgeon's office, he decides to go back into the match and ultimately manages to win, with him and his team celebrating by tracking down the Mustangs at their offices and homes to rub it in. Hank opposes most changes in life, in this case, even rejecting changes that could be for the better as he turns down the opportunity to relive his biggest regret and undo what happened back then. By replaying the match, he can get one of two outcomes. Either the Longhorns win and Hank is able to undo those years of harassment and shame, or the Longhorns lose and Hank finds that those years were all justified, and that there's nothing he could have ever done. Nor was it wise to try. Because sometimes it's nicer to have a dream of fixing things than it is to know for sure that there's nothing you can do. People put some value on daydreaming of a better world. But this daydreaming of a better world is ultimately worthless, especially when it gets in the way of taking actual steps towards fixing things. Instead of trying to reclaim his past glory, Hank instead tries to excuse his way out of the attempt and move on from it. But when he stops daydreaming and starts to act, he finally gets the chance to act. And this is how he manages to win. It's a happy ending to the episode that frankly didn't even need to be shown. The real optimism in this episode does not come from Hank winning a football game, but from deciding that he wants to try to win. Uncool Customer Bobby joins a cotillion club to try to become more refined, largely to meet girls who don't already know him as a comedian. While Peggy is with him there, she meets Cat Savage, a trendy woman who seems to be up to date on all the latest fashions. Hoping to become cooler, Peggy starts to spend more and more time with Cat, who seems to be interested in Peggy despite her lack of connections to what's hip. Bobby, too, is smitten with Cat's daughter, Michael, and hopes to get an invite to her birthday party to continue to woo her. But when the two manage to snag an invite, they realize they don't know enough about what's popular and what fits in, and so they begin to research trends by doing the opposite of what the guys in the alley know about. Upon arriving at the party, their choice of attire spooks a pony, spilling punch on Michael and getting them the ire of the partygoers. So they hide in a back room, only to find a shrine to coolness that Kat has set up. She catches the family in her cool room and admits that she dedicates her entire life to trying to be hip, to the point of not having any personality of her own, and that she was trying to get to know Peggy better because she was so uncool. In the B-plot, Hank finds a restaurant with an open seating arrangement and tries various schemes to avoid sitting next to strangers. 
Peggy Horror Picture Show has already made a similar point to this episode, that in spite of Peggy's insecurities about herself, there's still some value in who she is, as there will always be some people who find that personality valuable in a way. Here, there's a difference between the episodes portrayed in that Peggy is seeking out something opposite from what Kat has, rather than seeking out something unrelated to the drag queens. The drag queens and Peggy both found a common ground that was revealed to her, but Peggy here is seeking something that she's more aware of by emulating the actions of another consciously, instead of by chance. But Kat's trendy lifestyle is something that is entirely without substance. The perception people have of her is entirely accurate to who she is, rather than being a reflection of which her traits they're able to perceive. That is, as long as you know what she owns, you know who she is. There's no mystery. And so there's a sense of irony in the fact that Peggy is so thoroughly researching how to be cool. As insincere as this action appears to be, it turns out to be exactly accurate to Kat's lifestyle, just as Peggy was trying to accomplish. Nancy Does Dallas when a student brings a possum to school, Nancy does a report exaggerating the danger in the story that gets Tom Landry Middle School riled up, with Bobby suddenly taking home security very seriously. The story also gets Nancy a job as an anchor in Dallas that she takes despite having to be separated from her family. Dale uses the opportunity to refrigerate his house while Nancy's too far away to stop him, ultimately shorting a circuit in his home and trying to steal power from Hank, where Bobby stops him by crushing him under a bookcase. Back in Dallas, Nancy starts plotting to sabotage the careers of her co-workers in order to rise to the top herself, eventually managing to get a position in a parade float. But she shows up drunk to this parade, having celebrated too much the night before, and falls to the ground humiliating her and losing the position, where she has to then go back to Arlen. Upon seeing her cancel plans to rise back to the top to take care of Dale, Hank and Peggy realize that her self-destructive tendencies are actually held back by him. We've seen Nancy's ambitions before in episodes like Gone with the Windstorm, where she's eager to put her safety at risk to advance her career, as well as episodes like Hair Today, Gone Tomorrow, where she's willing to cheat on Dale to keep her looks intact. But her ambitions have always been held back by her relationships to other people when they're not mentally restrained by her own anxiety. So when she's free from both of these inhibiting forces, no family to take care of, and her ego sufficiently satisfied by the promotion, Nancy becomes a much more terrifying force, and one that's not entirely direct in what she's destroying. Because any career that's advanced by sabotage is a career that can be taken down by the same forces brought back on it. Had she worked her way up the legitimate way, as she's done before, then she'd be more capable of holding it using the same work ethic that got her there. But once Nancy rises to the top, there's no one else left to sabotage to keep that position, or rather, there's one person she can still destroy, herself. So when Nancy returns to Arlen and her energy is split between her career and family, the destructive aspects are the first thing to go. She can barely do more than work while monitoring Dale, and this prevents her from destroying herself in the collateral damage that she creates. Born Again on the 4th of July Hank grows upset with Bobby's lazy nature as he refuses to assist in setting up 4th of July decorations, instead skipping church and stealing from Peggy's purse in order to order a pizza. Overhearing their lamentations, Lucky volunteers to take Bobby to his church, a fire and brimstone style of preacher who will scare the boy straight. This works too well, as Bobby starts preaching about fornicators at the mall, getting dragged out by security. Meanwhile, Hank is leading Rainy Street in a war against Milton Street over who can have the best celebration, buying fireworks from John Redcorn and creating a massive paper mache Uncle Sam statue. But when Bobby learns that Hank skipped church to work on his display, he views the statue as a false idol and destroys it. Hank and Rainy Street consider this to be the work of Milton Street and set out to sabotage their display, eventually escalating this conflict to an all-out war with rotten fruit and fire hoses. But when Bobby admits to Lucky that he was the one to destroy the statue, Lucky tells him to confess to the neighbors to stop the conflict. He does this and is forgiven, though Bill assumes he's merely a decoy and throws a flare into fireworks shed, which blows up most of the neighborhood. Bobby's newfound obsession with religion is something that puts him into parody with the obsession the rest of the neighborhood has with patriotism. He starts to believe in fire and brimstone visions of hell, then prioritizes a show of his faith over any actual practice. Bobby goes to the mall to shame others, then takes out his frustrations with the rest of the family by destroying their celebrations. Likewise, Hank and the rest of the street share a similar reverence of their holiday celebrations, not so much making a show of their own patriotism for the sake of expressing their love of country, but because they're trying to make someone else look bad in the process. When your faith, 
be that faith in God or faith in your country, is expressed exclusively by putting others down, it doesn't paint a decent picture of what the core of your beliefs are, whether you really love God or America instead of simply hating your neighbor. The whole neighborhood breaks out into a civil war in the interest of making themselves look good, just like Bobby attacking a celebration to make himself look pious. The real show of good faith would have been to keep your beliefs to yourself and the others who share in them, making yourself look good because you are. Serves me right for giving George S. Patton the bathroom key. The Hill family receives a call from Dee Dee regarding something she's meant to give them. They theorize about what it might be when Hank realizes that he knows next to nothing about his father. Bobby, too, realizes he doesn't know as much about Hank as he wants to and sets out to interview him repeatedly. Eventually, Dee Dee arrives and drops off a list of things Cotton wants Hank to do after he's dead, mostly returning items and harassing the woman he used to know. Hank mostly does these things alone, as Dale and Bill are arguing over a can Dale threw into Bill's yard and refuses to clean up, going through a due divorce. But when Hank finishes the list, he receives a key to a bus station locker containing Cotton's final wish, that his ashes be flushed down a toilet used by George S. Patton. When Hank arrives at the bar containing the toilet, Dale and Bill enter, arguing loudly over who should have the honor of assisting Hank, which gets their stunt noticed by the bartender and the group is thrown out. But after a pep talk from Boomhauer, the others decide to try again to get into the bar, with Bill starting an argument over which war was the worst to distract the others as they enter the bathroom and finally give Cotton his final resting place. Upon returning home, Hank is happy to know a little more about Cotton by learning a little more about his friend circle, and he agrees to answer some of Bobby's questions. As dissimilar as Hank and Cotton are, they did share one thing in common, in that both men were extremely private people. And while Hank is certainly more introverted than his father was, that doesn't necessarily conflate with openness. Cotton was always eager to brag about his accomplishments, but he rarely opened up about who he was any deeper down, just as Hank is quick to tell strangers that he sells propane, but never why or what he loves about it. And Hank recognizes that this is something he's inherited from his father, and thus something he's likely to pass on to his son. So he sets out to do something about it after making this connection, and attempts to be more open with Bobby, unlike the relationship he had once with his father. And yet, for all the privacy both men had about them, this wasn't something completely true. They kept their emotions close, but not the results of those emotions. If Cotton was mad, he acted on that anger. So you can tell a little bit about him from the things that made him mad. And you can tell a little bit about Hank from what he's motivated to do. Likewise, you can also tell a bit about a person from the company they keep, with Hank learning about Cotton through his old war buddies, and the missed opportunity for Bobby to learn about Hank not through a direct interview, but getting to know the rest of the alley. Bad News Bill Hank is dreading to sign Bobby up for another season of baseball due to his son being terrible at it. While fitting him for equipment, he discovers a South Arlen League, one where Bobby can get a clean slate instead of being the player people dread to work with. During tryouts, he meets Coach Bradford, who's overwhelmingly positive towards Bobby's ability and chews out Hank for giving up on his son. Over the next few weeks, Bobby starts to genuinely improve at baseball under Bradford's coaching, though the coach also refuses to allow Hank near the field until he can prove he's ready to start supporting his son in earnest. So Hank has to work at the concession stand underneath Bill, who is much more enthusiastic about being around kids, until he has the opportunity to substitute as a catcher behind the plate. For a short time, Hank is excited about being near Bobby and playing ball with him, until Hank hits a kid too hard while tagging him out and gets banned from the league. Undeterred, Hank hides in the bushes near the outfield to cheer Bobby on in secret, only for Bobby to continuously miss hits coming his way. When it becomes clear to everyone but the coach that Bobby is the team's weakest link, Hank finally rescues his son from the game and, while driving off, mentions that Bobby has plenty to be proud of other than baseball. Bobby thoroughly does not believe in himself through this entire episode. Even from the start of it, he's more excited to play baseball for the new opportunities to make jokes with the equipment than he is to actually play the sport. Being a pro at baseball is far enough from his desires that he doesn't even bother to imagine himself in this situation in the first place. But once he gets a coach who starts to motivate him, Bobby is able not to believe in himself, but to believe in someone who believes in him. Coach Bradford encourages Bobby to try his hardest and sets unrealistically high hopes for the kid. But there's a difference between a hope and a dream. A dream is a more vague ambition that one works towards, while a goal is something concrete you hope to achieve. And so the issue here is a miscommunication of these goals. Hank wants a son who plays baseball not to be the best, but to do his best. 
And so when Bradford tries to encourage the former of these ideas, he's only setting Bobby up for eventual failure, even if he achieves the latter goal. Because while it's nice to try your best, this shouldn't be something done out of a desire to achieve greatness in anyone's eyes but your own, and this can actually make self-improvement harder as you compare yourself to the experts instead of where you were last week. Manger Baby Einstein Luann is lamenting that she can't go back to work as a hairdresser while also raising Gracie, but upon learning that infants respond positively to her manger baby puppets, she begins to go on tour with them, doing children's parties before being scouted by John Redcorn's children's entertainment company and getting DVD deals. She starts to neglect her family and dedicate herself full-time to making more manger baby content, but the sales don't last forever and she starts to lose out to other acts. Desperate, Luann tries and fails to reinvent the manger babies in an edgier format, dropping Gurgle Gurgle and stealing a character from Dale's attempts at a children's book. Dale is upset about the sabotage and plans to destroy the manger babies in a dryer, ruining Luann's career even further as her new DVD wasn't selling either. But later, when Luann is out with the rest of the family, she encounters both John Redcorn and her old puppet, getting reinvigorated to become a mother, in part because Lucky was struggling to raise Gracie on his own, and in part because of Hank straightening her out with a speech about responsibility. Luann struggles with her identity in this episode insofar as she's forced to make sacrifices to that identity in the interest of motherhood. She spent several seasons working hard to ensure that she could become a stylist, only for her stylist dreams to be lost in the pursuit of raising Gracie. Likewise, she also rejects going back to her daughter and her family in the pursuit of maintaining her new career as the creator of Manger Babies, another thing she worked hard to get to. And so, for the affordance of having to give up on so many dreams, Luann struggles to find happiness while raising a child. Even if she and Hank recognize that it's her responsibility to be a mother to Gracie first and foremost, there's still something lacking in her life if she can drop everything about herself in the interest of motherhood, as if all those years amounted to nothing. By the end of the episode, Luann does manage to find some middle ground between her old accomplishments and her new responsibilities when she rediscovers Gurgle Gurgle at the restaurant. While the rest of her manger babies may have been destroyed by both her child Gracie and the man-child Dale, she can still retain some of her old love of her puppets by adapting the ideas to her new life. Uh-oh, Canada. Boomhauer does a house exchange with the Canadian family, the Huskins, over the summer, despite Hank buying a set of patio furniture and a new keg with the intention of spending the season drinking. Hank insists on being a good neighbor to the Canadian family, in spite of everyone else's concerns about them, but is soon appalled when Gordon Huskin starts to imply insults about the US while talking up Canada at every chance he gets. These insults ramp up as they start to feud more openly. The Huskins call in a noise complaint, to which Hank responds by being a worse neighbor, and this culminates in a game of lawnmower chicken after Gordon mows Hank's lawn that ends when both men are pulled over for DWI or MWI and arrested. Hank is bailed out by Buck Strickland, but Gordon, being a foreign national, doesn't have so much luck. But when Boomhauer comes home with the French-Canadian woman and wants his house back, Hank volunteers not only to let the Huskins stay with them, but sells his keg to get Gordon out of jail. Even though he doesn't seem grateful, Hank still believes he did the American thing. Hank and Peggy at first try to be good neighbors to the Canadians only for their kindness to be insulted, as the Canadians make fun of them, their beliefs, and imply that they're better. And while this results in an awkward block party, the situation gets escalated when they have the police called on them, with Hank reaching a breaking point of violating every self-imposed block rule he's ever believed in order to prove a point to his neighbor. This behavior is responded to in a predictable way, more escalation, and soon Hank and Gordon are both thrown in jail. It's easy to do the right thing when the right thing is the easiest thing to do. Hank doesn't have to go out of his way to be welcoming to the others, and it's a small amount of effort to be welcoming. Later on, their neighbors are less than kind in return, and being polite becomes a more difficult task, the one that Hank still begrudgingly tries to do anyway. It's being the bigger man in the face of someone unwilling to respect that that truly makes a person kind, however, and Hank refuses to learn this lesson, resulting in the loss of his ability to ride his lawnmower for six months. But he later recognizes that the Huskins are just a family from a different culture with a different way of bantering. Rude or not, Hank doesn't really have the right to claim to be a good neighbor and a good American if he's willing to let those ideals rest on being a bad neighbor. The Boy Can't Help It 
Bobby is struggling to find anybody to go to homecoming with as he waited too long to ask, but then a trio of girls approaches him, considering Bobby a good project, and they collectively decide that all three will be taking him to homecoming. Over the next few days, they start to give him makeovers, take him shopping, and have him fetching drinks and acting like a monkey for them, things that Bobby is eager to do in the interest of spending more time around women. But Hank is unsure of the relationship Bobby has as the girls don't seem to actively respect him, though his real issue comes down more so to the fact that Bobby is not doing the traditionally masculine things in the group, something that Hank grounds his son for. Later, on the night of homecoming, Bobby is taken to the underside of the bleachers of the homecoming game, where he and his friends are immediately made uncomfortable by the character of the other people there. When Hank learns that Bobby snuck out, he drives over to the game to get his son, only to find Bobby moping around as he finally realizes that the girls never considered him as anything more than a pet. But when a few guys start to harass his old friends, Bobby finally steps in to defuse the situation, and he and Hank leave after escorting them out. Hank, Bobby, and Peggy all end up having different takes on what's really going on in this episode, all three of whom are slightly correct, but mostly inaccurate. Peggy comes to the defense of Bobby as she views his relationships as being groundbreaking, an inversion of the old-school style of dating that frustrated her when she was younger, and something she's happy to see as being done away with. Hank takes exception to the fact that Bobby isn't being treated with respect, something he conflates with taking a lead in the relationship and earning the respect from others. Bobby is just happy to have homecoming dates. He doesn't stop to consider why it was that he wanted to go to homecoming with the girl in the first place. And so all three characters care more about performing in action without asking why. Hank thinks that men ought to do manly things because they're men, and that they're men because they do manly things. He does not consider if there's any benefit to doing things in this way, or value in changing things up. Peggy likes the idea of breaking down gender roles for the sake of doing so, and overlooks whether these girls obsessed with Bobby have any ulterior motives. And Bobby wants to go to homecoming with the girl, even willing to ask someone he barely knows just for the sake of showing up with someone. This is why he's able to be taken advantage of so much during the episode, because he knows what he wants, but not why he wants it. To Sirloin with Love Peggy leaves Hank and Bobby alone for a girl's night, which Hank is nervous about as he has nothing in common with the boy. But while they're out at a steakhouse together, Bobby starts to criticize his cut of meat and is overheard by the coach for the local community college's meat grading team. Hank is ecstatic at the idea that his son will be on a team, and he supports Bobby's efforts in the new activity, up through a competition where Bobby chokes and misgrades a cut, getting the team fourth instead of first. They still qualify for state in spite of Bobby's error, and Hank cheers up his son by reminding him to focus on that instead of the mistake he made but the rest of the team doesn't see it the same way, and they give up on Bobby, later alienating him further when they attack their rival team at a restaurant instead of playing fair. Bobby quits the team as they're too competitive, much to Hank's anger, and so Hank sets out to cheer on the meat grading team at state without his son. But when Bobby sees a him-sized grill brought to the house, Peggy explains that Hank's real reason for supporting him was not about winning or losing, but having something in common. So Bobby sets out for state, only to learn that the rest of his team was bus-jacked on their way over, forcing him to participate by himself. He makes it to the final round, and then goes against the rest of his late-arrival team by pointing out a flaw that only he noticed, winning state and celebrating with a barbecue that the rest of Rainy Street gets invited to. The intended finale of King of the Hill, and something that's meant to reflect the core themes of the show as a whole, while also resolving them in a satisfying way. Bobby and Hank have always had a generational gap between them, something that prevents them from finding common middle ground not only because of a lack of shared interests, but because of what is effectively a difference in the language between the two. Even when Hank and Bobby begin to bond over judging cuts of meat, there's still a small amount of distance as they both have differing motivations for getting into the activity. Bobby is only there as he's trying to make Hank proud, something he conflates with success in the competition. The higher he scores, the more proud Hank is of him. It's not until seeing the grill and hearing Peggy's explanation about it that he learns Hank's real reason for supporting Bobby. He was not cheering for the meat examination team, he was cheering for his son. And so Bobby goes into the state championship not with the intention of being a team player or winning or doing his best, but with the intention of putting on a performance that Hank would be proud of. And if he does his best and wins it all, that's just a happy coincidence. After 13 seasons of being on different pages, the two finally like the same thing and for the same reason. Season 14? 
Several episodes were held over from earlier in Season 13 due to scheduling conflict with sporting events that ran late, meaning that when King of the Hill was cancelled, it ceased airing new episodes at a time when there were still new episodes to air. While the usual method was to simply air these episodes during the next season's run, there was no next season to run the episodes through, and as a result, four orphaned episodes got awkward air dates after the spiritual finale for King of the Hill. This is not so much a secret 14th season, as it is a season 13 and a half. The Honeymooners Hank learns that his mother, Tilly, is getting married, but instead of marrying Gary from earlier, she's marrying Chuck Garrison, a guy she's known for a few weeks. Hank and his family go to Arizona to attend the wedding, where Hank tries to suss out his mother's new fiancé, but everything seems to check out and he eventually decides to approve of their union. But shortly afterwards, the older Hills arrive in an RV, parking in Hank's driveway and arguing over things like Tilly's driving style and impulsiveness. Hank is upset at first, but this turns into confusion when he learns from Chuck that he was against the RV and wanted to stay in a safer lifestyle. When Hank and Chuck plan to sell the RV and have the couple settle down, Tilly grows upset and drives away to see some wildflowers and a Mark Twain festival. So Hank and Chuck race to track her down before her aggressive driving and incoming flash floods get her killed. But in their rush, they're the ones who get stuck and Tilly has to rescue them, ultimately concluding that she wants more risk in her life and that Hank does not have to clean up after all her mistakes. Tilly's behavior in this episode almost comes across as contradictory to her usual personality, that she would go from a shrinking housewife trying to emotionally dissociate from the chaos of her abusive husband, to an adventure-seeking world traveler searching for her next poorly planned thrill, and it might come across as an assassination of her character, but instead it plays more into the idea that Tilly Garrison is really just a person whose true personality has been neglected for so long, due to her presumed role in the household, that she's finally able to express herself in her later years. Chuck and Hank are extremely similar personalities, both sharing interests and wanting Tilly to leave a more reserved life. Tilly then marries Chuck, argues with him, and then finds love after all, but this is not a contradiction either. Tilly is fully aware of her son and her new husband's desires to pick up after her and make sure she's always staying safe against her wilder impulses. This is the exact reason she married the guy, however. As much as she wants the risk, she still recognizes the need for a person in her life to keep her worst impulses in check without stifling them outright. Two things that Cotton never would have done, nor things she could have done herself. Bill Gathers Moss Realizing he has a boring life, Bill decides to get a roommate. He has the alley help him search, and they shoot down several options, including a former Playboy bunny. Meanwhile, Bobby and Joseph are camping out in the school to catch a ghost, when they discover their ghost was actually Principal Moss, living in the school. When Hank discovers this, he compromises both problems by having Moss move in with Bill, but Bill doesn't get along with the guy and goes out of his way to ask Katie, the Playboy bunny, to live with him instead. But she quickly falls for Moss and the two begin to date, making Bill begrudgingly accept both as his roommate. Over the next few days, Katie starts to bring over her ex-husband as he runs a counterfeiting organization out of Bill's house, with Moss pushing the products at Tom Landry Middle School. So Hank finally steps in to fix the issue himself, only for Bill to beg him to fix it on his own. He does this by inviting Octavio and his siblings over, causing a turf war to break out that's shut down by police intervention. In the end, Bill returns to living alone with a new appreciation for his boring life. Opposite the previous episode, in which Tilly wants a more interesting and unpredictable life, Bill here settles for a more boring existence, as the unpredictability he just experienced wound up for the worse. Though the episodes have similar middle sections and motivations for such points. Bill is looking for more interesting experiences in his life, just as Tilly is, and has to fight against what Hank wants, just as she also did. But the difference occurs near the end, when both characters get what they pretended to want. Tilly receives the excitement of a new life without so much safety, while Bill gets that excitement as well, only he wasn't seeking that, but companionship. Tilly had companionship but grew bored of it, Bill had excitement but wanted something more boring. What he was searching for from the outset was not so much companionship, but the idea of companionship he learned about from television. In this sense, not looking for a person to share a living space with, but a person with whom to share thoughts and emotions. 
but as we see later on, this would have been a totally one-way street due to Bill's lack of ability to stand up for what he wants. He simply pushes people towards one option and hopes that things fall into place. And as he lacks the ability to be forthright with what he wants, he also can't push back when he doesn't get it, meaning he's unable to kick out Principal Moss and Katie, nor can he shut down their counterfeiting ring. when Joseph met Lori and made out with her in the janitor's closet. Joseph gets in trouble at school for making out with his girlfriend Lori in the janitor's closet, and Dale comes to pick him up. Hank is concerned about Joseph growing up without proper guidance and encourages Dale to give him the talk. But Joseph does not respond well to this talk and he refuses to acknowledge his father anymore, leading Dale to get stressed enough that he starts to forget his various security measures. Wondering why he's becoming so forgetful, Dale takes an online test that diagnoses him with dementia, and he checks himself into a mental care center for his son's sake. But later Joseph starts to panic about Lori wanting to go further in their relationship, and as Nancy is too busy trying to one-up her co-anchor stories, he has no one to turn to. So Hank tries to get Dale out of the care center, only for its owner to deem him a threat to others, keeping him locked in there for longer. Peggy comes up with a plan to have Dale act so crazy he's required to be transferred to a state institution, and when he does, he's brought into an evaluation where, despite being found a liability, he still gets a chance to give Joseph some proper advice before he's committed. Ultimately, Dale gets let out due to budget cuts, and Joseph breaks up with Lori for trying to rush things. Dale's fear in this episode is hurting Joseph in any way at all. He tries to explain to his son why he shouldn't be rushing into a relationship, but doesn't want to say this in such an aggressive way. He ends up making such a watered-down and simplistic explanation that it only makes things worse as Joseph has learned nothing and now has a resentment for his dad. And when Dale starts to suspect that he's not the right person to raise Joseph because of this, he checks himself into a hospital in order to avoid hurting Joseph further. But in the end of the episode, when he learns from Hank that Joseph is on the way to hurting himself, he finally realizes what he has to do, and his second attempt at the talk to Joseph is much harsher. He tells his son that he's nowhere near mature enough to make such decisions himself. And while hearing something like this from one's own father cannot be easy, it's much easier than having your heart broken slowly over a relationship you're uncomfortable being a part of. While Joseph may eventually forgive his father for telling him a harsh truth, he would never forgive his father for withholding this truth. It's easier to hurt someone close to you in a small way than to allow them to hurt themselves in a large one. Easier, but not easy for a parent. But often the hard things to do are worth doing, and avoiding these confrontations will only make everyone's life worse. Just another manic con day. Min leaves to go on a vacation to Laos and leaves Khan home alone for a few weeks. She asks Peggy to ask Hank to check in on him, and ends up bringing the guy along while brainstorming for Grill Stravaganza. There, he learns that Khan appreciates the construction of grills, and the two get the idea to beat Thatherton by souping up a robotic grill for the event. Khan quickly distinguishes himself in his construction by staying up all night and continuously scaling up construction more and more, as he presents a side of himself with tons of excess energy, and this is something that Hank attributes to the fact that he's convinced Khan to skip out on his medication. But later on, they find him lying on the couch, too depressed to move or do anything else. So Hank, at the advice of Dale, gets Khan's prescription filled illegally in order to get him the help that he needs, only to realize that during his manic swings, he can work fast enough to actually finish the grill on time. So Hank withholds his medication to finish the grill, only for Peggy to shame him for this until Hank finally admits that his neighbor's health is more important than Strickland propane. In the end, Khan is able to use the last few hours of his manic state to finish the project in time anyway, and they end the series eating burgers together. Hank has always been willing to work himself hard in the interest of doing more at his job, putting his reputation at risk every time he associates with Buck Strickland and traveling to faraway places for the guy. So when he sees that Khan's disorder is something that might be beneficial to his workplace, he's quick to withhold the medication he needs in the interest of building a better grill. But perhaps it's the same thing that ultimately lets his guilt overcome him. Hank has been exploited for so long that he knows full well how damaging that can be to another person, and maybe even has some experience in a similar position to Khan. And Khan is the person that this episode is really about. Seeing that his real persona is a manic depressive guy puts the rest of his actions into context. It's the medication that makes him as abrasive as he is. Both his manic and depressive personalities were nicer to the alley than he had ever been. But just because a person's real self acts a certain way doesn't mean that this way is natural. 
Todd is clearly miserable without his medication, so in the interest of his own health, Hank finally accepts bringing back the old him. Because if being in pain is normal, then being normal isn't worth it. Outro As of the date I am uploading this video, there's a planned revival series for King of the Hill in the works. One that's garnered a decent amount of skepticism in the light of various other remakes and reboots of other shows that have failed to capture the appeal of the original. And while I'm still cautiously optimistic that Beavis and Butthead reboot was decent, I think this is also in part due to how King of the Hill was structured. There are a few announced changes about the new show that some are skeptical about, largely in the sense of voice actors being replaced out of demand or necessity, but considering the entire show has been consistent about presenting both sides of an issue, it's likely that these changes are given the same consideration. The showrunners are not the type to haphazardly cave to demands made by an imaginary audience, like Bobby, nor are they the type to stubbornly hold their ground and die on a hill, out of principle, like Hank. Fundamentally, King of the Hill was a show about generational divides, the old clashing against the new, refined against the rough, conservative thinking versus forward thinking, propane versus electric. What King of the Hill is not about is promoting any particular idea or ideology. Generally, when a character is portrayed less than favorably, they at the very least represent an idea or organization that one can get behind, simply misinterpreting the message or purpose of their cause. Because one person's right is another one's wrong, your truth is someone's deception under a different context. And King of the Hill is a show that respects this. Even when a character is correct in a misunderstanding, they're only correct in their own life. Learning and growing from not just your own life circumstances, but those of the people you come into contact with, is your only way to grow in a changing world. To not get left behind as the new replaces the old in the interest of efficiency. And sometimes these changes can benefit from a more experienced set of eyes that can temper the growth-for-the-sake-of-growth attitude of the future, and make it a more refined synthesis of two ideas. Although mostly, King of the Hill was a show about guys in an alley drinking beer.